Podium Publishing presents Rise of Mankind, Publishers Pack, Books 7 and 8. Written by John Walker. Performed by James Patrick Cronin. Rebellion. Prologue. Trell and Endall dodged the blow meant for his face and retaliated with a punch to the gut. His opponent grunted, doubling over to offer a perfect target for a follow-up. An uppercut sent the pirate stumbling backwards, collapsing on a table. Glasses shattered and drinks spilled on the floor, but the man didn't get up. Chaos followed. Men and women started brawling, some with cause and others simply because they enjoyed violence. Trellin squared off with a Garen, one of the fringe alliances of the Keelans. They looked much the same, but Garen coloring tended toward darker skin and black hair. Their eyes didn't have irises, making them somewhat unnerving to other races. Most of them were kind-hearted, but this guy packed a mean punch. Trellin blocked his first three punches, but regretted not trying to dodge. A strike to the face made Trellin stumble, and he dropped low, sweeping his attacker. The man hit the ground, his head bouncing on the hardwood. Dazed, he didn't jump back up, but another brawler took his place. Trellin needed to be careful about how he fought. Too much technique was just as bad as too little. Fighting sloppy when he could be so efficient made it possible for a guy like the pirate to get past his defenses and get a face shot. When the next guy came at him, instinct took over and he blocked the attack by grabbing the man's forearm. The follow-up involved dislocating the guy's shoulder, then pounding him in the sternum. As the guy dropped, he didn't even make any sound. He couldn't breathe and his arm wouldn't cooperate. Someone else threw a glass at him, but it missed. He flipped a table in their direction, causing them to stumble. As they tried to regain their footing, Trellin bound forward and worked their body with a number of blows to the sides and stomach. He moved upward, hammering their ribs and finally giving them a variety of shots to the face. To their credit, they didn't move back until the end when they fell onto the bar where the bartender smashed a bottle of booze over their face. He meant it. A chair slammed into Trellin's back, and he spun to face another opponent, this one a thin guy holding the broken pieces of chair like they were a pair of swords. They only remained stationary for a moment before the fight started. Trellin blocked three shots aimed for his head and threw a kick, connecting with the guy's abdomen. The blow sent him backwards into another table where he rolled over it and landed face down. A different fighter trampled him accidentally, falling beside him. Trellin took the opportunity to dash for the door, bursting outside into the light and away from the action. Another brawl, he thought. How many senseless bouts of violence am I going to have to get into to catch the eye of these bastards? Trellin got outside and inhaled a breath of fresh air. The sun was out, beaming down on the little dusty pirate town so far off the beaten path, no one ever bothered to visit it. A failed colony attempt put it on the registry for the Alliance as a waste of time, so the riffraff took over. Temporary shanty towns sprung up all across the galaxy for less. Blood filled his mouth and he spat it out, moving down the street to find a different drinking establishment. He'd been thrown out of nicer and fled worse. Over six months of working the space lanes, robbing civilian crafts and going toe-to-toe -to -toe with military scouts gave him a lean, tough approach to life. Hey, a voice from across the street shouted, but he ignored it. You there, with the orange hair. Trellin fit the description. He favored his mother's coloring with long orange hair and teal eyes. He sported a beard to help toughen up his overall look. Without it, he lost ten years and held the intimidation value of a pet. Pausing in his step, he turned to look at the person, but as he did, his hand rested on the butt of his gun. What do you want? Trellin asked. To talk to you for a minute. The person addressing him was also a Keelan, though much shorter, standing at less than five-six. His black hair was practically shaved, and he had purple eyes. He wore a black uniform with an aged patch that had seen better days. If he'd been military, he left their employ. They'd never allow someone to let themselves look so shabby. 
I'm listening. For now. Better make it fast. Name's Vil, and I'm hoping you're for hire. What do you want me to do? Trellin narrowed his eyes. I'm not in a good mood, so this better be good. You got a permanent boat? Vil hurried across the street to stand near him. As in a regular crew to roll with? Trellin shook his head. Freelancer, I haven't found a group I'm willing to set up with. Been looking for the right cause. These were the words he'd been practicing for a long time. Every job he took on, he made it clear he was on the hunt for a proper cause, something to believe in. He wanted to work with someone that had a vision of the future and provided some sense of purpose. Most laughed at him, but Trellin knew of a particular group looking for the right folks. Those who fit the bill he was after didn't accept applications, though. They either drafted individuals or took on volunteers they approached. Trellin knew they favored efficiency and, quite frankly, an ability to be ruthless. He'd proven that plenty of times. He developed a reputation quickly, but now it needed to pay off. Trellin doubted Vil could help, but he wanted to hear what he had to say. I know what you mean, friend, Vil smiled. Truth is, I've got a gig for you. You're handy with a gun, right? Handle yourself in a fight? You'd think with this bruise on my jaw, you'd be wondering if that were true. Nah, I saw what you did in the bar. That guy you knocked out was a real piece of work. He'll start a brawl with anyone, especially folks he doesn't know. Must have a lot of friends, Trellin quipped. Listen, I've got a ship with a small crew and we're doing a huge job. Bigger than we've ever been given before. If you're interested, we'd love to have you on board. Vil leaned in close. We actually picked up a contract from a notorious group. One I thought never went outside their own ranks. We're going to make a fortune, man. Trellin's heart pounded in his chest, but he didn't let his excitement show. If these were the people he'd been after, then Vil might be able to move him toward his goal after all. It may not be the actual inn he wanted, but one more check on the list wouldn't hurt. Still, he had to be cautious. If these people were idiots, they'd potentially ruin his progress. You seem a little enthusiastic, Trellin said. How good are your people? Are they going to be idiots? Cause some kind of trouble? I don't want to get into something where I'll look like a fool for going along with it. Plus, I need some more particulars. How illegal is this? What are my chances of doing time in a slam? Hey, relax. Vil patted his shoulder and Trellin scowled. Er, sorry, we're professionals. Seriously, we've never been caught or taken down by the cops. I promise you. We've got this, and I guarantee you a sweet amount of cash to go along with your troubles. Just, you know, we need your gun. Who do you think you need to kill? We're after data at a space station, Vil replied. Off the beaten path, but in the heart of one of the Alliance race's home planets. Place has quite a few Marines, and I'm afraid there's a ground-out portion, too. That's why we need the extra help. We go in, drop security on the planet, then download from the computer banks and get the hell out. Let me guess, Trellin said. No witnesses. We just have to wipe the computers, Vil replied. They didn't specify about killing everyone or not, but I'm sure it would be a lot easier than letting them live, am I right? Of course, that would only be on the station. Can't kill everyone on a planet, right? Tell that to the Orion's light, Trellin thought. He cleared his throat before continuing. Have you ever done something like this before? Yeah, we took a high-value target from the Alliance before. Nailed a scout ship while it was in space dock. Vil grinned. We got a fortune in weapons. In fact, as part of your pay, we'll give you one of their high-end pistols and enough magazines for a month. Plus, we'll take care of all expenses. Anything you use on the trip, we'll pick up. Trellin sighed. I want to meet the rest of your crew before I agree to this. They'd better be as good as you say. Listen, I wouldn't accept a job from the Orion's Light without reliable people. Believe me, Vil gestured. Come on, I'll take you to the captain right now. So you're not in charge? 
Trellin figured as much, but thought he'd poke fun at the guy. What's your role? Requisitions. And I think the captain figures I'm expendable, so he sends me to talk to scary people like you. Vil smiled as if trying to make sure his comment was a joke, but Trellin believed there to be some truth in it. They headed down the street. Anyway, I've been working with these guys for a long time, and they're hyper-efficient. You'll see. I'd better. Trellin's pulse raced, and he had to take some calming breaths. This was as close to the Orion's light as he'd come since he began this assignment. If he could catch their notice here, everything he'd done would be worth it. Providing this crew could handle themselves as well as Vil said, he'd definitely take the job. Maybe then he could move on to his real objective of serving with Krelon Arvax and his crusade. Here's to hoping. Please don't represent a bunch of losers, Vil. I need this. More than anything. Trellin boarded the spacecraft, leery of what he might be getting into. Every new job started out with a sense of danger, a worry concerning the people he was committing to work with. They all represented some unknown factor, and he never knew whether they might be totally psychotic or genuine professionals. And still others wanted to roll the people they worked with, stealing whatever they had and leaving them for dead. Or worse, they turned out to be slavers, luring potential cargo into a trap. He'd had to fight his way out of that particular dilemma twice, leaving behind a lot of bodies before escaping. As he paced up the ramp into the cargo area, he quickly scanned the area for threats. Men hung around nearby, but none of them seemed to pay him any attention. They worked, carrying out various duties without so much as looking up. Large boxes were lashed down, secured to thick metal floor plates. The crew didn't seem too big on luxury. The entire area looked utilitarian, essentials only. Trellin admired people who worked lean. It meant they focused on the job and not frivolous, unnecessary luxury. He'd been putting that face forward in every task he took on, working toward what the Orion's light supposedly valued. They were also a group that didn't bother with the finer things, focusing instead on duty. You're going to love our commander, Vil said. Real stickler like you. Totally focused, you know? Whatever, Trellin replied. Are we meeting this guy or what? Just this way. Vil gestured up the stairs and took them two at a time. As they reached the landing, they took a left into an office. We'll meet in here. The hair on the back of Trellin's neck stood up. If someone decided to attack him in the little room, it would be a rough fight. He'd have to grab Vil for cover, then work his way back out, through the cargo area with all those guys. As he recalled, they were definitely armed as well. That would be quite the brawl to get back to freedom. Another door opened and a bald man stepped in wearing utility overalls and a pistol low on his right hip. His tiny green eyes were made even smaller as he scowled. He sized up Trellin for a moment before sitting down. This a new guy you found? He got a rep? His name's Trellin Endall, Vil replied. You've heard of him. He's the freelancer, been working for pirates and the like. I thought he'd be a perfect addition considering how many people we need for this one. I mean, we can't be at every location at the same time, right? You said two crews for each assignment. The captain nodded. My name's Derelict, but you can call me Captain. What have you all done, Trellin? Hit jobs, Trellin replied. Security details, soldier work. I'm better at the violent part of the craft, but I've got some skill with a computer. You'd be better off with a specialist if you need to go beyond running some apps and breaking down some older style defenses. Good to know, Derelict grinned. Got a resume? Do you? Trellin asked. Derelict laughed. Okay, he seems pretty solid. Did you already talk terms? Sure did, Vil replied. We're good to go if you're fine with him. What do you say? Derelict looked at Trellin. You in? I'd like some more details before I fully commit. I know you can't give me too many, but what kind of opposition are we looking at on the surface? Good news, my friend. Hardly any. 
Derelict stood up and paced. The system's in a state of conflict right now. Those bastards are in the middle of a civil war. Rebels are stirring up trouble, apparently thanks to the Orion's light. I guess insurrection is the way to their heart right now. As a result, they've hired us to hop in and take some important Alliance data. Sell it to them. Interesting. Trellin turned away, pretending to consider the situation. He'd already made up his mind he'd do it. He might never get so close to the terrorists as this opportunity. When do we head out? Ten hours, and it'll be a pretty fast-paced situation, too. Settle whatever debts you've got before then, because we're out of here with or without you. And I'd rather not think of you as an unfriendly sort for bailing on us. If you're going to commit. I'm in, Trellin said. I just have to go pay my lodging bill and grab my gear. I can be back here in a couple hours. Got a place I can bunk down? Yeah, we've got a full crew module installed. You'll be taken care of. He gestured at Vil. Get the contract ready for when he gets back. I want this as official as we can, given what we do. Trellin needed to get to a computer and fast. He didn't have a lot of time to send any sort of message and after he boarded the ship with Derelict and his crew, he'd be off the grid entirely. The next ten hours were all he had left, before he hopefully made contact with his intended berth, the Orion's Light. Chapter One Clea on Twofall sat across from Durant in the engineering section as they ran independent scans on the sphere they took from a secret Keelan monastery. Orion's light terrorists murdered countless people to get their hands on this device, and no one really knew what it did. Unfortunately, it proved to be a mystery to the two investigators. The surface was made of a type of metal not registered with any Alliance database. However, they did know that it was incredibly tough. Scans indicated their most powerful cutting torches might melt it, but they did warn anything inside may be damaged, if not outright destroyed. It wasn't emitting any sort of signal, but they were fairly certain it was some kind of technical device. Though an hour into their probing, Durant did suggest it may simply be a bauble, some kind of decorative object the enemy favored. Clea wondered how true that would be. Orion's Light believed the device might somehow make the enemy their allies. Did they want this thing back bad enough they'd be willing to follow a man like Creelon? Doubtful. Then again, they'd seen some pretty strange things since taking to the stars with the behemoth. Even with her experience prior to joining the humans, she'd visited various sectors and never really been involved in the same kind of adventures. Clea rubbed her eyes and checked her chronometer. They would arrive at Alliance headquarters soon, and already she had meetings popping up on her calendar. Most of them were simple debriefings about the colonies and what they found, but one in particular caught her eye. Alliance Floral Design wanted to speak with her, and they set it at the highest priority. Um, that's weird. Mother, maybe? I guess I could be receiving a bouquet or something for coming back, but it doesn't seem likely. My parents tend to be too practical for such a gesture, especially to put it as a priority one. Clea brought up the business on her tablet and noted they were a simple flower shop. Nothing special about them, except they enjoyed a space less than a block from the council building. They must rake in the business. All those businessmen and politicians who end up going home long after they said they'd be there need something for their spouses. Multiple positive reviews blanketed the Nets' appraisal of their services with only two negative experiences. They were each related to business hours, which seemed strange. No business operated so well, even near the government buildings. Maybe they erase what they don't like. It's not necessarily legal, but business owners need all the edge they can get. What are you looking at? Durant asked. We're studying this device, Clea. I feel like we've gone as far as we're going to get with it, Clea replied. Besides, I got a strange meeting request I'm looking into. Oh? Durant moved around to look over her shoulder. Is it a job interview? Clea smirked. No, Durant, though I guess flower arranging might be safer than what we've been up to lately. 
Unfortunately, I never could differentiate flowers beyond the obvious ones. Tyramines, I know, and Lorndas, I've also got, but beyond those, she shrugged. The rest are just pretty, or smell nice. I'm not a flower person, Durant waved his hand dismissively. They're a waste of money, too, if you want me to be perfectly honest. I mean, who pays for something that's essentially already dead to just display it on a countertop? I call it morbid. You don't do it to other living things. You paint a disturbing visual, Clea said. I hope I don't have to educate you on why people find plants soothing. Oh, they're soothing when they're in the ground, Durant pointed at her tablet. Those people cut them and such, like arranging floral corpses for the macabre to enjoy and apologize with. I imagine the true message of giving a bouquet. Look, honey, I've killed several plants for you today. Do you forgive me? Barbaric. Clea rubbed her eyes. Now you're getting ridiculous. She put the cover on her tablet and stood up. I'm going to lock this thing away for delivery to the Alliance before getting ready for what promises to be a very long day. I'm off to coordinate the engineers in our retrofit project for the fighters, Durant grinned. Those Orion's light bastards will be in for quite the surprise when they meet our pilots next time. Are you sure it's not going to take long? The parts on the current inertial dampeners need to be replaced, Durant replied. Once we do that, they'll be ready for the same type of maneuvers we saw. And then some. I've already run them in simulators. While you're in meetings, we'll test one of the ships before doing it to all of them. On-the-fly updates seems pretty risky. We're in war, Durant pointed out. We have to take some chances, but again, we'll make sure we at least get some good test flights in, both on our fighters and the ships aboard the behemoth. Believe me, the flyers are eager to make this work. I'm sure. Clea grabbed the sphere and stuck it in the safe, locking it down. I'll talk to you later. Keep me informed on your progress. I'll relate it to the captain. Of course, Durant waved at her. You'd better hurry. Wouldn't want to keep bureaucracy waiting. Clea groaned as she left. She hadn't anticipated exactly what her promotion meant because she figured she was staying aboard the behemoth. How much could her job change? But whenever they were near the Alliance capital, she knew exactly how much more responsibility she received. The sheer amount of work they wanted out of her felt surprising. They needed briefings on activities, opinions about engagements, updated reports, and new information for their knowledge base. The list stretched on and on. It got to the point she looked forward to getting back into deep space with the behemoth. Even a battle would be better than sitting in boardrooms, talking about her activities. Some of them were experiences she'd rather not relive over and over. Their time at the research facility seemed to be a favorite for the historians and battle tacticians, and she'd been in the thick of it. Her knowledge was invaluable. Unfortunately for her, that was also the mission where her sister betrayed them. Clea still didn't know where her sibling had been taken or where she was incarcerated. The trial hadn't happened yet, but she'd be expected to testify when it did. That was quite possibly the most dreaded event on her future docket, and she hoped that a recorded message would be sufficient. The bridge bustled as she stepped inside, having a seat beside Captain Gray Atwell. Most of the other command crew were relief personnel, giving the primaries a chance to rest. Clea checked the reports for anything unusual. Nothing jumped out, so she directed her attention at the view screen, which held a lovely view of her green and blue home world. Plenty of space traffic moved about them, moving to and from the various stations in the solar system. Different races, other participants throughout the Alliance, traveled alongside Keelan ships, and they worked together on various projects. Clea found herself introspective concerning the view. This was what life should have been like.
The threat of war looming over them tainted too many feelings, too many careers. Explorers became soldiers and Clea had to wonder if they'd ever be able to make a transition back from a battle-ready state. Even on the verge of possibly ending the conflict with their true enemy, another reared its head. Will we be in a constant state of conflict for the rest of my life? Clea rubbed her eyes, fending off the depression her question brought. Orion's light might not be the biggest threat they'd ever faced, but they proved ruthless and resourceful. It may be hard to put them down completely, and who might jump up in their place? Did they constitute another enemy or just a bunch of criminals? The fact they took down Alliance ships and still managed to escape the behemoth gave them some credibility beyond most brigands. There would always be pirates and thieves roaming around, even murderers and flat-out raiders, but people intent on overthrowing the government, they were rare. These anarchists, or insurrectionists, had to be stopped. Soon. You okay? Gray asked, tapping her forearm. Clea nodded. I'm fine, just mentally preparing for all the meetings I'm about to be involved in. I know how you feel. Earth's councilman is all set up now and ready to talk about some things they learned from home. Apparently the new ship is good to go and we're ready to use it. That means we're free to remain out this way for a while longer for mission work. I have a feeling your folks have something for us to do. They'll always have something for us to do, Clea muttered. Even if it ends up being fetch assignments, our commanders are good at tasking people out. As long as it matters, I'm okay with it. Gray settled into his chair, relaxing his muscles. I wonder if they're ready to consider attacking the enemy yet. I hope so, Clea replied. I want to see that to the end, no matter what else happens. I'm kind of annoyed that no one's told me how my code did, or if we've even sent anyone yet to see what they discovered. I found all that information, and they patted me on the head and sent me away. I could have helped, Gray. You did, Gray pointed out, and now it's their turn to do their jobs. It's not even about the glory, I just want to make sure. They're doing it right? Clea nodded. Give them the benefit of the doubt. They're professionals. I know, I just... Never mind. I get it. It's hard to let go, but believe me, you have to learn. It's important. Captain? Ensign Agatha White interrupted them from the communications station. She was one of the only primary crew on the bridge at the moment. I've received docking clearance for the space station. They are ready to receive us. Very good, Ensign. Thank you. Gray turned to the pilot, a young lieutenant named Shane Grandin. Take us in and get us secure, Mr. Grandin. By the end of this shift, I'm sure we'll all be either on the planet's surface or enjoying some much-needed time off in the station. Agatha, let the ship know to prepare for docking. We are now officially at safe harbor. Gray brought six marines to escort the strange device they brought back from the monastery. Clea walked alongside him, looking nervous. Considering the lengths Orion's light went through to get the thing, he understood her concern, though he didn't expect problems on the Alliance homeworld. They were met by a contingency of guards and all piled into a military transport. Escorts got them to the council building in less than an hour, where they all piled in and took the device to the tech lab. There, Clea and Gray signed off that they had delivered and finally headed off. Gray checked his calendar and frowned. He had a long day ahead of him, and by the way Clea peered at hers, she was in the same boat. Gray grinned. See you sometime in the next couple weeks? Don't be sarcastic, Clea replied, also smiling. Though it sure looks that way. I'll be done by dusk. I won't, Gray said. I trust you'll be seeing the family? Clea nodded. For a late meal, yes. What's your plan? Adam's coming down, so I thought I'd show him around. Gray patted her shoulder. Good luck. I'll see you tomorrow. Goodbye, sir. Gray watched her go before heading toward his first appointment with the Earth Council member. The man had his own office on the 70th floor, 
and the elevator ride up took almost two minutes. Even after living in a space vessel for days and weeks at a time, Gray felt claustrophobic in the small box. When the doors opened, he stepped out and felt a little wobbly. Earth had some tall buildings, but something about them put him off. It seemed ironic, considering what he did for a living, but somehow his mind differentiated spaceship from tall building. Maybe one was mobile and meant to be up high. These buildings, they didn't entirely feel natural to him. He distracted himself by considering what might be on the agenda with the councilman. The man was newly appointed, taking over from the other person who turned out to be temporary. Apparently, Earth sent the first person they could grab, then allowed their actual choice to show up a while later. This one had been an ambassador for a number of years on Earth. His record indicated he had the approval and trust of all the military folks, as well as the civilian politicians. Gray never met him before, never even heard of him, but he felt somewhat ashamed at the fact. He'd supposedly brokered several peace deals with various nations. Something for the history books kids are reading now, not when I was in school. Two guards stood at the door as he approached, and they saluted when they noticed his uniform. Good afternoon, Captain, the one on the right said. You're expected. Thanks, guys. One of them held up a scanner and ran it over him from head to feet. He's clear. Identification confirmed. Gray smiled. Tight security, huh? How many people come up this far? More than you'd think, the one on the left said. We've had some pretty loony customers wander off that elevator. Don't even know how they managed to find this floor or wait so long to get off. This floor wasn't on the secure registry is why. They'll be making it so only people with special ID cards can even have the elevator stop here. Should make your jobs easier, Gray said. Good luck, huh? Yes, sir. Go on in. Gray entered the room and closed it behind him. He expected a moderately sized office large enough for maybe two or three people, but instead he found a massive suite, which could have been an apartment. The desk sat near the wall-sized windows overlooking the cityscape. A couch was pressed against the wall, and a full bar occupied the opposite side. He had his own bathroom as well. Captain Atwell. The ambassador came from behind the desk to shake his hand. The man must have been in his early sixties, with thick gray hair and a thin beard. He wore a gray suit with red piping and expensive shoes. My name is Ambassador Kyle McRenner. It's an honor to meet you. Likewise, Gray replied. You've got quite the place. A bit ostentatious, I know. McRenner shook his head. Please, have a seat. Can I get you anything? Gray shook his head. I'm fine, sir, thank you. Of course. McRenner sat back at the desk. I've read the report of your latest assignment. Quite amazing. These Orion's light figures are quite the menace, eh? You could say that. I sent my assessment to high command as well. Perfect. I do have news from home. The first vessel is 100% operational. They're working feverishly on the next. Your work with the mine has paid off. We've been able to source all the necessary parts and assistance to get it done. Excellent. Gray leaned back in his seat. I'm curious what you know about the attack on the enemy. Are we planning on taking them out soon? McRenner sucked air through his teeth. Honestly, it's too soon to say. I know that the scout mission has been completed, but I've not been shown their findings. I do believe they've invited you to a briefing, however. I'd also like to say they've requested more of our help, specifically from your ship. I've committed us to continuing work here. High Command was okay with that? Oh, yes. With some small convincing. Now that they have a new ship there, they feel somewhat better, but of course, your experience puts you above them. However, that experience is specifically why you're still out here. In order to finish this fight, there are things that have to happen. One of them will involve dealing with those terrorists, I'm sure. They're formidable. Gray said, believe me. 
Yes, I've read your report and I completely agree. McRenner shook his head. Sincerely, I don't know how such monsters exist still. I mean, it sounds like a horror story from our own world. Bad people exist everywhere, Ray replied. And we don't corner the market on crazy, that's for sure. Indeed, there's a mail call for your crew, which I'm sure your comm officer is downloading now. Such things are sent to major settlements and wait in a queue until they can be properly sent to the ship waiting for them. Should be good, right? Yeah, they need word from home. I'd like to make sure they all get a chance to visit Earth again before we commit to any action against the enemy. Not to be glum, but it may well be our last chance to say goodbye. I'll make absolute sure of it, Captain. You have my word. McRenner went to the bar and poured himself a drink. I'll tell you this, everyone here has been incredibly kind. I've not had an easier time working with foreign dignitaries. They're refined to it here, you see. They've spoken with other cultures and worked through the nuances of different. I've found the Keelans to be amazing, Gray said. I'm impressed by their government and how they handle most things. However, those maniacs who jumped in on us while we were conducting an operation recently, they weren't entirely on board with working together. Even after we told them we had undercover people, their actions jeopardized. Yes, my predecessor gave me your write-up on that. I've lodged the complaint formally, and the military issued an apology, but I trust that's not quite what we were hoping for. I wanted the following sentence to be, We will be more careful in the future, but taking down a major pirate base seemed more important to them. If we win the war because of what we accomplished, those buffoons could have jeopardized it. Gray shrugged. They'll need to learn to trust people so they don't put their foot in it. We warned them off for a reason, and it wasn't because we were bored. Understood. I'll bring it up in the next meeting. McRenner tapped his tablet and brought up a series of charts. Now, we have some financials I'd like to go over with you. Go ahead and bring up the sheet I sent to your account, and we can discuss next steps, what the Alliance is now paying for, and how we're doing overall. My favorite part of the job, Gray thought, letting out a sigh. He complied and prepared himself for an incredibly boring 45 minutes. Gray and Clea convened with the military council later that afternoon for an update on the intelligence they recovered from enemy territory. Clea couldn't wait to see what they found. They were about to confirm for her whether or not her data was worth anything at all. Had they gone on that hunt for a good reason, or was it a total red herring? As they sat together at the conference table, Athaday Kroll to Garin stepped into the room. His rank put him at the equivalent of an Earth Admiral, and he must have been in his late sixties. He sat across from them and smiled, a gesture that made Clea feel better right away. If the conversation was going to go badly, he'd surely look more somber. Thank you both for coming. We've already given this briefing to the commanders stationed here, but I was told to specifically provide you with the same information. Before we go on, I want to extend my heartfelt appreciation for everything you did. Locating this data has meant a great deal to the Alliance. We look forward to hearing what you have to say, Gray said. I'm glad it panned out. We were worried it might not turn out so positive. Quite the contrary. Not only did we find what we were after, but we uncovered additional information we didn't anticipate. Kroll grinned. We discovered a recording from one of our own pieces of technology. It was drifting near the system your coordinates led us to, and it contained the first contact with this culture from our perspective. Clea's eyes widened. Wait, are you saying you know what happened to start the war? Kroll nodded. Yes, and a great deal of information about our enemies as well. We now understand not only what caused the conflict, but how it has been sustained and why we are stuck in this brawl until the conclusion of it. 
Some of it may not be entirely shocking, but even confirming suspicions can be disturbing. Shall we begin? Please, Gray gestured. Are we watching the recording? Indeed. Kroll tapped a button on the table and a holographic image of a young woman with black hair appeared. She wore a uniform much like Clea's, but with slight variances. The colors were the same, but the cut was old. Not quite vintage, but definitely several generations of fashion back. My name is Arias Kavilis, and I represent the crew of the Distant Horizon. We have made contact with a new race called Devarans, one of extraordinary talent and cleverness. I have never seen such devotion to professional tasks, and each of these men and women dedicate themselves wholeheartedly to whatever they are assigned to accomplish. This extends to engineering, building, or even the lower professions of janitorial detail and manual labor. Before meeting their leaders, we were allowed to observe their activities and routines. None of them would speak to us, but neither did they shy away from our scrutiny. While they look much like us in that they have the same physical features, they have an odd sense to them, a demeanor I cannot fully explain, something between apathy and severe focus, and they seem totally devoid of emotional responses to outside stimuli, almost as if they do not feel at all. Their architecture differs greatly from ours. They do not favor high buildings, but rather spread out, I saw nothing built over four stories, and even those were somewhat rare. They do, however, build underground, and though we did not see these places in person, scans indicate some structures plunge more than fifteen stories below the surface. The name of their race comes from their religion. The prophet who initially taught the scriptures was a man called Devar, and he supposedly survived encounters with the worst predators on the planet— these trials have gone down in their books as what separates them from common animals, the crucible, if you will. It's one of the reasons we're having a hard time gaining their cooperation. Kroll paused the recording. We've confirmed this message. Things have not changed in all these years. However, they have added something which is never mentioned in this recording. When this expedition made contact, the culture had no space station. Now, our current scans have found a massive structure orbiting the home world and another over their nearest satellite. Do we know the purpose of those? Clea asked. The one near their moon is a fabrication facility. They must be producing their ships there. Though I'm guessing they have more than one, considering the sheer number of them out there. At least we have a name to call them now, Gray said. What about the other one? Staging area for troops and supplies, Kroll said. At least, that's what intelligence stated. Our scans needed to be subtle and could not breach the hull of those places. I see. Gray rubbed his chin. How much anthropology is in the recording? Oh, they go on for a while about that type of thing, Kroll replied. Our enemy seems to have come from a similar place as us. Clear. Have you discussed the theory of precursor races with Gray? The humans have their own theories about it, Clea replied. But yes, we've talked about ours as well. Many believe some other race seeded all of our planets, which explains our similarities and why we are compatible linguistically. After watching the hollow video, we made some assertions about why these people act the way they do. Their planet has all the same types of climates as ours, but their predators are far more... aggressive. Gray's brows lifted. What do you mean? Your planet had large beasts roaming it long before you were born, but they died off, giving way to the rise of humanity. These people did not have the benefit of a million years parting them from such monsters. By our reckoning, there are still predators which eat their civilians alive today. I find it hard to believe they wouldn't have wiped them out, Gray said. Especially with their technology. Intelligence suggests they haven't tried to commit genocide in order to keep their people strong. The threat of death coming from nature gives them an edge. It's why they're so fearless in battle. They've grown up knowing they could die at any moment outside their homes. 
It's why our people thought they were acting strangely when they watched them work. They simply grow up accepting mortality. What's more to the recording? Clea asked. Kroll moved it forward a bit and started again. Arias picked up at a different point in the story. We spoke to the leaders and discovered a deep religious belief system bordering on total obsession and unhealthy zeal. Morality means a great deal to these people, and many activities are considered illegal, punishable by the harshest means. We were allowed to witness a woman who transgressed against their laws be flayed alive by her family, a warning to all of them not to repeat the mistakes. Their list of laws is extensive, and I've uploaded it to our recording. Suffice to say, it took me nearly two hours to get halfway through them, and we were informed we will be held accountable to not breaking them after today. For this reason, we've decided to depart the planet until we can better understand these people, so as to not cause a political issue through some obscure breach of a law. They left? Gray hummed. I'm surprised. Kroll frowned. The part she left out is that nearly every method of punishment for these people involved death, just to highlight some of what they consider criminal behavior. No birth control, honoring elders, obeying a superior, wearing the appropriate clothes, performing duty at the expense of survival, and attending all designated worship, regardless of activity. Clea spoke up. Are they doing that aboard their ships? Do they worship in stages? I don't understand how this works, to be honest. It sounds impractical. And are they killing people on every one of those situations you just described? If you're maimed, you're considered to be useless to the culture, Kroll explained. So, yes, they don't just hurt you. You're going to die, or become beholden to another. They don't have any problems with slavery of their own kind. And we thought Orion's light was bad. Gray said. Kroll nodded. At least they are our own people. We can predict them somewhat since they came from our culture. These fiends are completely alien in their thinking. Their world bred a profound system, and as a result, when their ire was raised, they are bound by divine statement to come after us. What did we do? Clea asked. What happened? Our people made the mistake of sharing our own religious beliefs, Kroll said, or at least theirs in particular. They talked about the precursor theories with their religious leaders and inadvertently roused suspicion. Upon further research, the enemy found us to be moral deviants. The ambassadors were all killed, their ships seized, and the war began. Only we didn't know it. How long between this recording and the first attack? Gray asked. Several generations, Kroll replied. This is where history gets sketchy. Someone made it back from that expedition and was able to bring back the bauble hidden at the monastery. I don't know why all this was kept a secret, to be honest. I suspect they were sent back prior to the destruction of our people, and perhaps they wanted us to stay away because they knew the volatility of the culture might lead to war. You needed a warning, Gray said. Notice that these jerks decided the entire galaxy needed to be cleansed. All people, not just yours. They're not even trying to discover if anyone else follows their beliefs. That may not be true, Kroll replied. We have reason to believe they do probe new cultures before attacking them. If that's the case, then they may have observed your planet, perhaps even destroyed that first fleet trying to leave your solar system. What they discovered from your computer banks may have even been enough to decide you needed to be destroyed. Remember, they need little provocation. Apparently. Gray rubbed his eyes. When do we attack? We're preparing. Kroll looked uneasy. There are some other dilemmas preventing us from bringing the full force of our fleet against them. Believe me, we're working through these problems even as we speak. It's foremost in High Command's mind. I'd love to help, Gray said, if I can. I believe you have another summons, Kroll replied. The both of you. There are some other tasks we need to accomplish. 
Perhaps you'll be able to help to expedite the completion of these requirements. It would not hurt. Gray nodded. Thank you, Kroll. Can you send us the recording so we can watch it later? Yes, it's in your accounts. The rest is quite long, but you'll see to the end what I said. Their final journal entry is disturbing, because I think they knew they'd crossed the line. They wanted to depart the system, but could not. It's a tragic conclusion, to be sure. Lovely. Gray turned to Clea. I have a strange meeting at a florist nearby. I'm thinking of skipping it. Clea's eyes narrowed. I have the same. Kroll grinned. You'll both want to go. It's illuminating. Sincerely, I recommend attending. I believe it's set to high priority. What do you know about it? Gray asked. Enough that you don't want to miss it. Kroll stepped over to the door. Good day to both of you. Clea shrugged. Shall we go see what the flowers are like then? I guess so. Most mysterious moment of floral action I think I'll ever have. Gray paused. And I doubt I'll ever have a chance to say those words together in a sentence again. Come on, Clea. I'll buy you whatever passes for a rose in this place. Chapter Two Gray and Clea arrived at the florist shop and exchanged a confused glance. It looked like every other retail space on the strip, and sat nestled between a shop selling some kind of soup and a shoe store. The way Kroll acted made it clear they were there for an official reason, but whoever used it as a cover definitely had a sense of irony. After all, if they were somehow involved with the military, then they appreciated the gentleness of the flowers and all they represented. Apologies, special events, funerals, and romantic interludes didn't speak of covert operations, which was precisely what Gray realized they must be walking into as they arrived. A branch of the Alliance intelligence community must have been operating out of the place. They entered to a heady fragrance, thousands of flowers lining the walls and covering shelves. A young woman looked up and smiled, gesturing for them to head toward the back. We've been expecting you, Captain Atwell, Sue Anthar on two fall. Just head right through the door and into the storage closet. Um, okay. Clea took the lead, pacing into the tiny hallway and over to the door in question. She opened it up and stepped inside, with Gray close behind her, and as it closed, lights burst to life in the corners of the room, both on the ceiling and floor. The room shook and began to descend, an elevator plunging deep underground. Didn't expect that part. Entirely, Gray said. This is pretty elaborate. I have no idea what this is, Clea replied. Intelligence, I assume, but this is pretty elaborate. No argument there. I wonder if they own the whole block or if this is it. Of course, I have a feeling we're going to be wowed by what we find down there. I have friends in intelligence, and they've never talked about any secret bases on the home world. Clea's cheeks flushed. Of course, I guess that's how they stay secrets. I figured you'd work that one out. These types of things are very popular for our sneaky groups, going way back in history. Spy organizations the world over create nooks and crannies to hide in keeping themselves totally off the grid. The elevator stopped, and when the door parted, they saw a massive high-tech room, with computer banks and hallways leading off to other parts of the complex. Gray stepped off, taking it in with no small sense of awe. It must have taken them decades to dig this all out and get it built. What a sight. Clea stood beside him, taking in the area with wide eyes. I wonder if they'd be offended if I scanned the room. I wouldn't pull out any electronics in here, Gray replied, even if they'd work. Greetings, Captain. A woman's voice sounded from the far side of the room as a set of footsteps came closer. Suanthar as well. I'm glad you both made it. I know our summons can be somewhat disconcerting sometimes, even odd especially considering our current cover. Welcome to our base. 
My name's Siva. As Siva drew near, Gray realized she must be in her middle sixties, with gray hair and vibrant yellow-green eyes. She wore civilian clothes, black slacks, and a matching jacket with a white blouse beneath. She shook hands with them both before gesturing over the technology dominating the primary part of the room. So, what do you think of our little operation? There's nothing little about it, Clea replied. It's fabulous. I can't believe you've had this hidden down here and no one knows. Not even the council, Siva replied. The walls and ceiling are all shielded, and the plants help provide some obfuscation from deeper scans. You're standing in the nerve center of our intelligence-gathering operations throughout the galaxy. Few people will ever see this. By allowing you to visit, I'm hoping you recognize exactly what that means. We won't divulge anything we see, Gray replied. We understand the need for top secret. That said... I'm curious what's warranted the honor of the invitation. I've called in a favor with the council, pulling some strings to get some help with something. We have an operative that's gone into deep cover in an attempt to infiltrate the Orion's Light terrorist organization. Sadly, before you reported it to the council, we knew of their existence. We just didn't realize how dangerous they'd become. Or powerful, for that matter. You didn't report it to the council, Clea asked. That seems, pardon my saying so, but somewhat irresponsible. I understand why you might think so, but again, they hadn't really performed anything nearly as brazen as to attack colonies. Sure, they'd performed some piracy here and there, but their threat level remained in the up-and-coming section, not set for a major performance. Our attempt to infiltrate them came at the idea we might be able to deal with their leader. So you sent an assassin to kill Creelon? Gray said, hoping that the head of the snake would kill the body. Is that it? Yes, pretty much. Our person is highly skilled, highly trained, and he's been forced to do some pretty terrible stuff in order to get where he needs to be. What do you need us for? Gray asked. He's gone missing, Siva replied, gesturing for them to follow. She approached a computer console and tapped at the keys bringing up an image of a rough-looking man in his late twenties with orange hair and teal eyes. A thick beard covered his cheeks and moved down his neck. Gray saw men like this in the Marines, tough and thick, born for real action. This is Trellin Endall. Endall, Clea repeated. I know one of his family members. She was friends with my sister when they were in secondary school. She went into the science division and works at a research outpost. Siva nodded. Correct. Trellin joined the infantry and had a distinguished first tour. We recruited him shortly after he returned for leave and put him on this assignment. Turns out he was pretty clever. He survived a lot of dangerous stuff. I couldn't be prouder of his accomplishments. However, this leads us back to my concern. When did he disappear? Three days ago. He put in a final message to us. We only received it yesterday. He took a job which he was convinced would put him in touch with the Orion's light. Gray frowned. What kind of work? Siva shrugged. Technical smash and grab with some elaborate obstacles. They had to go into the middle of a war zone and steal some data. I don't know if you're aware, but one of our allies is in the middle of a civil war one we believe the Orion's Light helped initiate. Our forces have been too busy prepping to fight the Devarins, so we haven't been able to intervene. Do we have any idea what they were going to steal? Clea asked. What specifically did the message from Trellin say? Siva hit play. Dreamsight, I'm on my way to a gathering of arms in the Novalat system. Orbital Station holds records of value protected by security protocols located on the surface. Infiltration of both simultaneously will be required. I'm on the ground detail and will likely have to kill in order to complete the task. Originator of work is the Orion's Light. This is the chance I've been waiting for. Out. How did this not get discovered? Gray asked. I mean, he's pretty direct with what he's doing out there. 
Our coded messages have yet to be broken by the criminal element. He sends them via buoy which rides other comms, leaving the system. We intercept both, strip our code, and allow the original message to complete its transit a few hours late. Siva smirked. Pretty elegant process, really. We run hundreds of agents like that. So how did you lose him? Clea paused. If he found a way to get in with the Orion's light, these kind of messages won't be easy to send. From what we've seen, these guys give up ties to any previous life they had. They won't be reaching out to their parents or families anytime soon. Not while they're trying to take over the galaxy. True, Siva replied. And I'm hoping that's what we discover, that he's made his objective. The problem is, if he has not, then he'll need help. Unless, of course, he died on that planet, which is a possibility. Either way, we need to confirm his status and determine if we have to activate another agent to work on our objective. Sounds a little cold, Gray said, the way you put it. I assure you I don't mean it to be, Siva sighed. I'm sure you understand my position. As a leader on a large starship, there must be many decisions which might lead to a death. The kind of thing you have to simply put up with and shoulder, right? We do the same thing here, only we have to work hard not to get attached. In many cases, we are the only civilized contact our people have. How are we going to discover the identity of your agent in that system? Clea asked. If they're in a state of war, we'll be walking into a battle more than likely. Indeed. Siva tapped the console and a star map appeared. She pointed at a point of light. This is where you'll jump in under the guise of the Alliance sending aid to the proper government. Your cover is you're there to put down the rebellion and bring order to the area. I want you to send ground troops to the surface to see what you can find out about Trellin in the meantime. Sounds pretty risky. Gray rubbed his chin. One ship. What sort of forces are we looking at? What's the opposition? Stolen civilian craft outfitted for war, Siva said. I've sent you all the details of the people you'll be facing. I expect you'll have no trouble handling yourselves out there. I understand you have Durant Vipurin aboard your ship. He'll be able to help give you any edge you need, right? Gray turned to Clea. He did say he was updating the inertial dampeners on the fighters. If that gets done before we leave, we'll have a pretty big advantage. The Orion's light might be there, Clea said, if they're causing the trouble anyway. We believe they might be, Siva added. They may have helped cause an even bigger distraction to steal the data. Did the pirates get what they were after? Gray asked. Yes, I'm afraid they did. Schematics for a weapon which supposedly can disable a ship's crew once the shields have been dropped. It electrifies the hull and incapacitates the people on board, granting an enemy easy access to simply waltz in and take it. Pretty much a pirate's dream come true, providing they can penetrate their target's defenses. And we didn't even know about them researching it? Clea shook her head. What's going on with this? They planned to share it with us, as it turns out? Siva shrugged. Our allies often operate independently of oversight, and if the pirates hadn't gotten wind of this, we definitely would have used it. Of course, they haven't proved out that it works. No prototype exists. It's all theory right now. Orion's light seems good with relying on hope, Gray sighed. Okay, so to sum up, you want us to go into this fight, side with our allies, and put down a rebellion— while running a secondary secret op to discover the fate of your operative. Correct? Yes, Siva said. And, as a little bonus, I'd like you to get your hands on the storage units from the space station. The pirates were supposed to wipe them, and may well have, but a skilled tech officer may be able to recover the data. That would be good. We can at least try to find a defense to this thing if they're ever able to build it. Clea checked her tablet and nodded to Gray. We have all the pertinent details, including clearance for departure. We could leave right now if we wanted to. All the rest of my meetings have been canceled. Siva grinned. 
I can't have you stuck here playing bureaucracy when you've got things to do. Fair enough, Gray scowled. I'm not sure I'm happy with how this is playing out, Siva. Playing for intelligence tends to get a little messy. Believe me, this is the most straightforward op I've run in a long time. Honestly, the action you're being sent into is necessary anyway. Novalat has a lot of warships they can dedicate to the battle, and if you help them, you won't just be finding out what happened to Trellin, but practically doubling the force we can send against the Devarans. Win, win. Gray looked at his own tablet and smirked. He had a message from High Command giving him the assignment Siva just described. He looked her in the eyes. You have a long reach? Only when I have to, Siva replied. And I need to know what's going on out there. A lot of lives depend on us pulling this operation off, and I need the help of people who have a proven track record to pull this off. I know it won't be easy, but you guys haven't really had anything simple yet. Even the milk run turned into a whole lot of chaos. We'll leave at the beginning of first shift, Gray said. There are some things we have to take care of. Resupply, topping the list. If you come up with anything else for us before we're ready, please send it along. I want as much detail as you can pull up. Also, have someone prepare a full write-up of all ships we might encounter at the site. It'll make the planning easier. Whatever you need, Siva said. My staff is at your disposal. Just use Clea here as your liaison with us, to keep anyone else from figuring out where we are, and who is specifically behind this mission, of course. It wouldn't do to tip our hand at this moment. After all, we've got a lot of bad guys to bring to justice before we can all be considered safe. Right? Gray nodded, tapping Clea on the arm. Let's go. It sounds like we've got our work cut out for us and plenty to do. It was good to meet you, Siva, even if you did offer a rough job to go along with the acquaintance. Stick with us and we'll give you all the best missions, Siva said. The pivotal ones that don't come with any glory but make all the difference. We'll talk soon, Captain. Thank you for your service. Back on the behemoth, Gray organized a briefing to explain the mission. He went through the files, noting that the rebels seemed to be poorly outfitted for the most part. If the Orion's light truly was behind it, they didn't necessarily want their coup to win. In fact, it appeared they were merely trying to cause some chaos. Are we going to find this operative dead? So many things could go wrong on a sanctioned mission with professionals. Gray figured working with criminals made it all the more dangerous. How could an intelligence officer trust these guys? Sure, they might have come from military ranks as well, but those who drift toward such work tend to not be the best at what they do. Still, necessity might drive efficiency. Those who survive for any length of time, even with their hang-ups, might be quite capable. Part of the danger didn't come from inconsistent teammates, but also the threat of betrayal. Because they weren't going for anything resembling actual money, it might have made Trellin safer. The rebel fleet seemed to be stationed at a base on one of the natural satellites, an industrialized moon with several bases, all occupied by those who rose up. However, they also had a pretty reasonable military presence on the home world as well, insurrectionists who turned to open warfare. In short, the system was a total mess. When they arrived, they'd have their work cut out for them. Gray needed to determine a way to get the rebels to lay down their arms and turn their attention to the real threat, the Devarans. The Alliance needed every able-bodied soldier for the fight to come, especially considering where the action would take place. Novalat's people were clever, industrious, and almost as advanced as the Keelans. When they met one another, they initiated more trading than educating though ultimately the Keelans got them out of their system with faster-than-light travel, several smaller systems aboard the Alliance ships came from Novalat Ingenuity. They seemed to have a lot in common with Earth, in that they experienced a number of wars prior to pressing into the stars. Only recently did they find conflict again within their own ranks, and that came from outside sources. Had the Orion's light bastards not shown up, 
they never would have turned on each other again. Their history showed the futility of it. Most of these advanced cultures discovered how ridiculous war could be, and in most cases, did everything in their power to find ways around it. Earth still had skirmishes. Anyone with feelings could still be pushed, but the intent to annihilate faded from an acceptable tactic. The Devarans never lost it, and considering how they lived on their planet, Gray wasn't surprised. Without advancing their own internal ideals, there'd be no way to rise above the sort of mayhem that dominated their lives on a daily basis. If people on the surface genuinely had to worry about being eaten, then Gray understood why they felt conflict was essential. If they won, they'd ultimately be made stronger. But what did they intend to do with what they considered inferior races? Those people who did not live under the threat of being killed every time they walked outside by a chaotic, unpredictable force may not even be within the Devaran's concept of contempt. They might simply commit genocide. All the more reason we need our allies by our side to finish this fight. Gray put together a plan of attack and prepared to present it to the others. It would involve everyone, from fighters to marines to the behemoth, taking an active role in the action. Fortunately, the ships they were facing were inferior technologically. The military vessels would be on their side. At least there was one silver lining to this particular mission. Gray needed to hold on to anything positive. Civil wars were never pretty, and this one sounded like a particularly nasty sort. What ideology did Orion's Light use to push the rebels? He hoped they might be able to dismantle it with the Nolavat people. All things considered, they didn't need bad blood in the ranks on the final push against the Devarans. Adam read the briefing notes as the other senior officers left the room. He'd questioned some of the missions they'd already accomplished, but those came from Earth High Command. The last few assignments, straight from the Alliance, felt somewhat afield from what he expected to be involved with. However, the Earth representative gave them the order. It didn't make it easier for him to stomach, but it wasn't like he had a choice. The orders came and they had to follow them. Whether this was for the best or not, he didn't necessarily know. After all, taking the mining facility back, basically alone, felt like suicide. How much harder could it be to stop a civil war? He saved his protest for a private audience with the captain. While they went through the briefing, he saw the other officers calculating how they'd accomplish their goals. If any of them questioned the sanity of going into a war zone, they didn't say anything, and certainly didn't indicate it by body language or expression. Maybe he thought too much. He'd been worrying about the bigger picture, getting into a brawl with the Devarans, the new name they had for their enemies. He wanted to put boot to ass against them for sure, but this other situation felt like a distraction. He half wondered if they might be sending them away to buy some time to allow their own people the glory of the kill. That doesn't make any sense. They need all the help they can get. It didn't make Adam feel particularly better, but he really did wonder if they were doing everything. After all, the Keelans only swept in to cause trouble for the pirates on their last assignment, despite being warned off. He was glad that the captain logged a formal complaint. Their stubborn action nearly screwed up the entire mission. And they didn't care one bit when we told them what was going on, either. Privately, he agreed with some of the feelings of people on Earth about getting involved with the Alliance. He felt used and didn't like it. However, one of the reasons he kept his opinions quiet came from the fact that they had cooperated so unconditionally with humans to rebuild the behemoth. Combining their technological know-how, the two cultures built quite the vessel. He understood their desire to get something back for all they'd done. They did essentially come in and save the Earth. Their ships truly were the cavalry back then. He wasn't in the fight to see it personally, but the captain gave him a full account. No. Despite his feelings, Adam intended to do his duty to the best of his ability and make sure this mission was as successful as the others. He did worry about their people, equipment, and the ship as a whole. The Civil War may be a red herring for a much bigger problem, and if Orion's light was behind it, he knew they'd encounter something unpredictable. 
One thing the Marines asked at the briefing involved the rules of engagement. Would they be allowed to fire on the cultures fighting one another? The idea of putting down a rebellion did involve violence, but at the same time, they needed to do their best to bring them back into the fold. Those were soldiers, or at least able bodies. They would be needed for the fight to come. They couldn't go in and murder the people who were in defiance of their home world, or they'd alienate them completely, potentially driving a wedge between the two factions that would take generations to fix. No one had time for such an event, and certainly, the families caught in the middle would be dramatically impacted. Not that they necessarily had to worry about such things in order to get the job done, but the captain seemed intent on finding the right way to do the job. Not necessarily the most expeditious. That meant they needed to find a balance between firing and killing. Gray hoped they'd be able to find a diplomatic way to fix the situation. No one at the table felt confident. Then there was the secondary assignments involving a marine drop on the primary world. They needed to find evidence of an intelligence officer. Alliance High Command supposedly gave them the assignment, but Gray and Clea acted fairly suspicious when asked about it. This led Adam to believe someone else in the military might be pulling the strings. Perhaps the intelligence agency itself, but there was a good chance the captain didn't even know who told them what to do. After all, the spies could just as easily have the generals or politicians deliver the message to them. That's how the human organizations worked. They used the overt faces of those they served to get their points across. Adam looked over the proposed number of ships involved in the conflict and shook his head. The argument behind their involvement in this assignment was the size and potential fire the behemoth represented. When they arrived, the rebels would see what force was brought to bear against them, and they'd give up. The hope didn't match reality in his mind. They should all know how zeal worked by then. Orion's Light and the Devarans gave them plenty of examples. If these rebels maintained half that intensity, then even a ship as potent as the Behemoth wouldn't exactly do much. In fact, it might only intensify the feelings of defiance. Of course, they might be far more realistic than those I'm comparing them to. If so, then we've got a real chance to convince them to settle down. Adam went back to the work of organizing the different departments and preparing for the action ahead. They'd be leaving in less than ten hours. That gave him plenty of time to finish his plan, grab a meal and a full night's sleep before they'd be involved in what promised to be an incredibly long set of shifts all of which he'd be up and available for. Let's hope everyone's up to the task, and that Durant will be able to finish his work on the fighters before we head out. Considering the resources brought on board to speed it up, I'd be shocked if he didn't. But regardless, we're about to be hip-deep in some of the messiest fighting we've seen yet. Here's to hoping it turns out better than my fears are leading me to believe. Chapter 3 In and out, they said. Trellin considered the words, cursing the briefing and the captain who so arrogantly thought taking the data from the space station would be simple. Everything has gone wrong and we're still alive. I suppose we've got one failure left, but there's still time to get ourselves killed. They jumped into the middle of a massive battle between the rebels and legit military, using the cover of explosions and weapons fire to sneak toward the station. Once within range, Trellin and three other men took to drop pods to get into position on the planet's surface. This would allow them to do their part in taking down the security. Only when they landed, they found the planet in a vastly more dangerous state than they were led to believe. The rebel forces established a serious beachhead and were making a very real play to take several regions of the planet. The coordinates of the facility they needed to infiltrate also caused problems when they landed nearly five kilometers off course. Nothing's ever simple. Four of them were assigned to take the necessary building with the idea being a small squad might be sneaky where more people would raise suspicion. If they were caught, it would be easy to explain them away as some opportunistic criminals profiting from the chaos of the conflict. Their drop pod didn't have any windows, 
but he watched their surroundings on a small holographic screen. Ships exploded all around them, civilian craft utterly decimated by the military. He had time to monitor their communications, surprised to find they offered no quarter, no chance for surrender. These people do not care. They must be seriously over this uprising if they're being so casual about killing their fellows. I know they're technically traitors, but wouldn't it be better to pull them into the fold rather than... this? They broke atmosphere and found another battle. Fighters clashed in the sky, rebel pilots somehow getting their hands on military vehicles. We must be in the midst of the final battle, the last skirmish before one side or the other folds. Trellin watched helplessly as they nearly collided with some hapless pilot, narrowly missing them. Someone hailed them, but the request for communication ended abruptly. A quick scan check showed the source had been destroyed, shot down by one side or the other. The hardest part of this particular war was determining who was on what side. Anyone could be a rebel, using any sort of vehicle or weapon. Their rough landing jarred his bones, but he had to shake it off quickly as they slid to a halt. The plan involved them hijacking another vehicle to escape the planet's surface, but the idea seemed far more dangerous than it had. Someone up there would take shots at them, regardless of what they left in. There was no such thing as a universal friend or foe in the midst of a civil war. They landed in the middle of the farmland surrounding the facility they needed to take. All around them, fields stretched in every direction, interrupted by the homes of the people who tended them. A quick check indicated there were few people around, which meant they wouldn't have to deal with civilians or the military. Free from the craft, they checked the computer for direction, and his partners began to complain. He only vaguely recalled their names, each a handle more than a birth designation. Malice, Crowbar, and Hitback, respectively. They represented everything Trellin came to dislike about pirates and criminals in general. Mean-spirited, brutal, and crass, they seemed excited at the prospect of killing people when they arrived at the facility. And I thought I got off easy coming down here. They're surely going to try to wipe out everyone at the space station. At least here there was a chance we wouldn't have to, but with this crew, I have no guarantees. Trellin loaded up his tablet and ensured it was linked to his wrist computer. The rest of his weapons were secured, a pistol on his right hip a submachine gun on his back, and a blade strapped to his left leg. They didn't bring any grenades, which he felt was a mistake, but the cheap asses running the op wouldn't spring for them. The four of them started their jaunt to the facility, and Trellin considered the other half of the operation. With the fighting going on around them, the station might have been locked down hard. Getting on board would be a challenge, never mind trying to reach the computer in question. This whole task might be doomed already. And if the Orion's Light finds out we failed, I'll have ruined my chances to join up. Nobody. Crowbar barked at him from up ahead, motioning with his bald head to the right. Get point. I want to check something out. You're not in charge, Malice said. And you're not deviating from the mission again. Remember what Derelict said before. Shut it before you become a casualty of this mission. Crowbar glared at both of them. I won't be long, but there's loot over there and I'm not leaving the planet without it. Your pay isn't enough, Trellin asked. Seriously, we've got another three kilometers to go and you're thinking about stealing? You want to carry whatever that is around with you because you'll have to catch up and probably fight holding on to extra loadout. Now, I don't know how good you are, but I'm guessing not very, so you might not want to limit yourself. What did you say? Crowbar advanced on him, glaring him in the eyes. Step back or we're doing this mission with three, Trellin warned. You know I care about you as much as you do me, so getting in my face isn't smart. Focus on the task at hand, get your pay, and we go our separate ways. That's what I have to say. Come on, Hitback complained. He was wiry and tall, covered in scars. His name must have also meant gets hit a lot. Can we stow this nonsense? There's no time. We have time, Crowbar set his rifle down. For the beating I'm going to give this guy. 
Malice sighed. If he kills you, I'm not going to feel bad. We're in the middle of a field and you're thinking about robbing a house, Trellin said, which, by the way, probably has nothing in it of value to you. These are farmers, not nobles. Just get on with the mission. Crowbar took a swing at him, and Trellin backed away, easily avoiding the blow. Another two punches came at him, and he quick drew his pistol, firing as the barrel matched up with Crowbar's face. The gun barked in his hand, and his opponent's head jerked back as he dropped to the ground. Dead. Malice descended on the body in a moment, and at first, Trellin thought he might be checking to see if he was okay. When he started rifling through his pockets, Trellin was reminded what type of people he'd been saddled with. Hitback shook his head, actually chuckling at the display. You warned him. Now I've discharged a gun out here, Trellin said. If anyone's paying attention and doesn't think it's the war, we need to fall out, quick. Either of you two want to talk about what just happened? Malice laughed. Not at all, newbie. Let's just go before you decide to shoot us too. I'm not a fan of that plan, Hitback said. I'm good, but this is going to be harder with only three of us. They got moving again, but Malice kept talking. Nah, Crowbar was useless. We only brought him along to soak a few bullets. Not like he had anything to contribute. You really handled yourself with him, newbie? Stop calling me that, Trellin muttered. It's not like I'm sticking around with you yahoos. As they drew closer... The facility came into view, a large metal structure which, according to the map, was a power facility. The obfuscation made sense. Trellin wanted to know what they were stealing, and he hoped he might be able to gather the information from the computer. He lied to the others about his skill. They only needed to think he was a gunman. If they had any idea just how good he was in other fields, they would have been suspicious. After all, thugs didn't tend to be diverse and he didn't want to cause friction with their captain, derelict. People with expansive skills led idiots like Hitback and Malice. They didn't run around with them. Not for very long, at least. Trellin dropped low and drew out his binoculars, but his two comrades kept moving. Hey, get down, you fools. What are you doing? Going to the facility. Hitback gave him an innocent look. Are you tired? Of how stupid you are, yes. Trellin gestured sharply. I'd like to get a look at the place before we go running in there. Would you mind? Both of them seemed surprised at the notion, and they returned to him, crouching. Never thought about it. How have you guys ever managed to do any of this type of work? Trellin peered through the binoculars at the facility. We just sort of run in and kill stuff, Malice replied. Worked great before. This is higher stakes, Trellin said. Just hold tight. There were two guards standing near the door, looking nervous. Likely they were worried about the action happening above them and less than three miles to the east. Surely they stayed in touch with the combat going on around them, and they probably wondered if the rebels planned to bother them. They're likely basking in the lie of protecting a power station, but I'll bet other municipal utilities don't warrant armed guards. Of course, in the midst of a war, who's to say what protocols change? There are two guys at the doors, Trellin announced, switching his binoculars to a scan setting. Other armed individuals filled the base, and his computer counted them up. Fifteen in all. He sighed, turning his head away. Part of him felt like these folks wouldn't be particularly well-trained. Guards, rather than soldiers but then there was a good chance the military might be protecting this facility to keep people away from the schematics. Could they afford to leave top-notch soldiers there, considering all that was going on? They'd have to find out the hard way, and with two morons watching his back, he didn't have a good feeling about their chances of survival. What's wrong? Hitback asked. You look like you ate something bad. There are a lot of people in there, Trellin said. Armed guards or soldiers. It's impossible to tell without seeing them fight. Uh-oh, Malice hummed. Too bad you killed Crowbar. We could have sent him in and seen how they dealt with him. Hitback chuckled. Trellin didn't feel like Crowbar deserved much respect, 
but the fact that two men who knew him so casually talked about letting him die disturbed him. These people were not going to operate as a team, and the operation just became a lot more dangerous and perhaps impossible. I told that idiot Vil I wouldn't work with guys who weren't pro. I'm going to beat his ass when I see him again. Okay. So we have to take this slow if we want to have any chance of getting out of there alive. Never mind making our target. Do you guys understand? What do you mean? Malice asked. We can't reveal our position or intention until we absolutely have no choice. That means taking out those two guys quietly and without alerting everyone inside. They have cameras, Hitback said. You can see their lights from here. They're watching the guards. Trellin pulled out his tablet. I can take care of those from here, but we won't have a lot of time. Please tell me you brought knives, or at least a quiet weapon. Yeah, we've got some cutters. Malice drew out a wicked-looking curved blade. It looked ceremonial, though Trellin had no idea what religion might use such a thing. Hitback pulled a straight, modern-looking knife with double edges. We're ready. I want both of you to separate, go different directions, and loop way around. Get to the walls where you won't get picked up on those cameras. When I see you nearing position, I'll interrupt the feed, and you take those guys out. When they're dead, I'll meet you. But start breaching the door. If it's unlocked, hold tight. We'll enter together. Sound good? You're pretty sound at all this, Hitback said. Way better than the captain ever is. We're on our way. Just don't screw up with those cameras. Trellin offered a sarcastic smile. I won't. Just hurry. We've already lost a lot of time by having a run up here in the first place. The two men dashed off, leaving him alone to contemplate the situation. He wondered how hard it would be to get in on his own. Letting his two fool partners get into the thick of it might offer him a chance to burst in by himself while they caused a lot of chaos. He thought about the various possibilities of going it solo, considering each option carefully. Fifteen common soldiers may not be able to take him, but he already felt bad that he'd be responsible for several more innocent lives being lost. Despite how he'd been living, he hadn't lost his conscience. A fleeting thought touched the back of his mind. How would he ever integrate back into regular Keelan society? If he succeeded and got to go home, what would happen? He'd done too much, seen too many things, killed too many people. Any other government representative would be going to prison. Once he had a chance to slow down and think, he knew he'd be messed up. All the therapy in the galaxy was unlikely to save him. The two idiots found their positions and crept along the walls. Trellin decided not to betray them and instead tapped away at his tablet. The security was fairly tight, but not against the best code-cracking software available to an operative. He was in and controlling their cameras in a few moments. Tapping his earpiece, he spoke softly. Turning off the cameras now. On my mark, get them. Luckily, they didn't reply and merely stood still in anticipation. He counted it down. Three, two, one, go. The two dashed forward just as Trellin tapped his tablet, taking down the cameras. Hitback leaped in the air and tackled his target to the ground, stabbing him half a dozen times. Malice went for a more subtle approach, grabbing his target and sliding his nasty blade across the man's throat. Trellin put away his tablet and dashed forward, drawing a blade of his own. He arrived less than a minute later and checked the bodies, pulling out an identification card. It became their way into the building, and after he scanned it by the door, it opened up, revealing a short hallway leading to a larger room for staging replacement parts. This place normally would be for civilians keeping the power going for the farms around here. I wonder what the agricultural workers get for allowing them to host the security for a space station here. If they even know about it. There are thirteen guards left, Trellin muttered. They're not all together. As we move through this place, we need to take them quietly. Got it, Malice nodded. Who's taking point? Trellin sighed. I will. Give me a good six to ten feet, though. I don't need you breathing down my neck. He paced into the main room, noting two doors heading off to the left and right. He checked his wrist computer, bringing up the schematics. 
Fewer men seemed to be stationed to the right, and all corridors led to their destination. He chose to go that way, risking fewer engagements early on. Using the security pass he took from the guard again, Trellin stepped into the hallway and paced along as quietly as possible. His companions, on the other hand, plodded along like herd animals, and he gave them a sharp look, placing his finger to his lips. Slow down and be quiet, he rasped, or you might as well pull out your gun and start shooting people. A soldier rounded the corner just as Trellin turned away from his companions. The man's eyes widened in total shock, and Trellin didn't waste the moment. He dashed forward, grabbing the man by the back of the neck and driving his blade into his throat. His victim's mouth dropped open and he tried to scream. Only a death-rattling gurgle escaped him before he fell to the floor, dead. Trellin cursed the others for their distraction and stepped over the corpse, heading toward their destination. Of course, the soldiers placed the computer in the very back of the complex. Fortunately, not in the basement. They reached another corridor with several others leading off to the different parts of the complex where the generators operated. Trellin kept moving specifically for the security center. He got halfway down the hallway when the alarm went off. So much for subtle. He put his knife away and prepared his submachine gun. The others followed suit, taking his lead when he pressed against a wall. These buffoons probably have no idea what to do in an actual combat situation. Bar brawlers and thugs tended to have little in the way of military training, and those few who did seemed to forget it. Guards came bursting out into the corridor, and Trellin opened fire, discharging several three-round bursts into his targets. Of the five who emerged, only two survived the opening salvo, and they fell back into the safety of where they'd come from. Malice started screaming, holding the trigger down and spraying his entire magazine at the hallway. As his weapon clicked empty, he cursed and started reloading. A man peeked out and took a shot at them, but Trellin was already in motion. Hitback stayed close as they reached the wall and momentary safety, but Malice was working on his weapon. A bullet caught him in the chest and he dropped like a stone, rolling on his side and crying out. Not at all surprising, Trellin thought. Here comes the final shot. Sure enough, the soldier fired three more times and the second one caught the ailing thug in the face, ending his moaning. Before the man could withdraw to safety, Trellin fired a single shot into his hand. The man screamed as his weapon fell to the ground and one of his companions leaned out to fire back. Hitback took two shots at the guy, both connecting with his face. Surprising. Maybe Hitback will survive this mission after all. Give it up, Trellin shouted. You don't stand a chance. I know there's only one of you left in there. I hear more coming, Hitback said. At least half a dozen, maybe more. Trellin glanced at his wrist computer, confirming his companion's fears. They needed to take out this guy in hurry if they expected to finish the mission at all. Worse still, his computer caught a shuttle approaching, a large military transport. They'd have at least another 30 people, if not more, to get through. This just became a suicide mission. Those bastards. We're in a lot of trouble, Trellin muttered, creeping toward the corridor. He raised his voice. I know you've got company on the way, but I'm going to tell you this. If you don't surrender, I guarantee I'll kill you in a second. Our deaths won't matter much to you when you're gone. We already wiped out your buddies. You want to go too? Nothing happened immediately. You have exactly two seconds to drop that gun or I'll finish this. The gun hit the ground and the man came out with his hands up. Please, don't shoot. Hitback blew him away, firing once into the man's head. As the body dropped, Trellin glared at him. He shrugged his shoulders. What do you want? The guy was a liability. Let's get this done. An argument died on Trellin's lips, and they rushed into the corridor, making the security room. He grabbed one of the bodies and dragged him into the security room before locking the door. Hitback opened his mouth to ask, but Trellin pointed at the console. Do you want to finish this or what? Get on there and take down the security. I'm going to try to get us out of this. Trellin stripped the guard and did the same, swapping his garments for the uniform. It was a little tight, but would do in a pinch. The boots were a problem and would definitely give him a blister if he had to go too long on them. Providing the reinforcements didn't know who he was, 
he'd be able to at least get outside. There was the matter of the guys stationed in the facility, but he had to take a chance if he wanted to get away. Smearing blood on his face, he obscured his features, leaving his weapons on the body. He smashed his tablet and wrist computer, scattering the pieces across the floor. We're in, Hitback muttered, and they've got access to the computer up there. Done deal. How are you going to get us out of here? Trellin frowned. I'm sure they'll do something for you. He fired the soldier's weapon, taking Hitback out with a headshot. He then fell back against the wall and waited for his chance to escape. The bodies of the criminals were in plain view, so he hoped the guards wouldn't burst in shooting. The door burst open and men stormed in. Trellin immediately gestured. There are more of them. They said they were going to sabotage the generators. At least five more. Are you sure? The lead soldier called out. We didn't see anyone on scans. They've got some kind of strange tech that masks them. Trellin shook his head. I don't know how they did it. Crept all the way in here without detection. Fall out, get yourself some medical attention. Can you walk? Yes, sir. Trellin looked down. Do you want me to go with you? I, I think I can still fight. No, get outside. We'll debrief you later. Trellin felt a moment of excitement as his plan started to work. He followed the men down the hallway and made for the exit as quickly as he felt proper. Sweet Freedom was only a few hundred feet away when someone called out. Jurens! Hey! He didn't stop, but glanced down at his name tag, cursing. Stop there for a moment. Are you okay? He rasped, trying to fake sounding hurt. I was told to go outside. Wait up. The suspicion in the soldier's voice worried him. Did you get injured? Um, yes. How? Leave me alone, man. I just want out of here. Stab wound. Can I see? I can help you. Outside. You sound a little off, buddy. Are you sure you're okay? I've been stabbed. Trellin made the hallway and picked up the pace, keeping just ahead of the man. Even with the blood all over him, he wouldn't fool someone that knew the dead guy. So no, I'm not really entirely okay. Slow down. I'm bleeding here. Trellin saw the door and his heart sank. There were dozens of men milling about out there. He didn't have a chance. They'd catch him for sure. I just need some air and a medic. I'm following orders here. I am a medic, you idiot. Now come on. Trellin reached the door at the same time as the insistent man following him. The guy grabbed his arm, eyes widening. You're not Jurens? Trellin met his eyes and shook his head. I'm not. He pulled him back into the room, just out of sight of the others. He'd probably get caught, but he needed to buy another few seconds, just to get out in the open and away from those who might recognize the uniform. Drawing the man close, he covered his mouth and struck him hard on the side of the neck. The man's eyes fluttered and he collapsed. Trellin caught him and half carried him outside. Help! A little help here! This guy got hit with something! A couple medics rushed forward and took him away from Trellin, dragging him toward the shuttle. Was he shot? Trellin shook his head. I don't think so. Beaten, I think. Thank you, soldier. Are you okay? That's a lot of blood. I was behind someone when they were shot. Real mess. The medic gave him some space, and Trellin immediately started for the far side of the building, away from the shuttle and all the soldiers milling about the area. He got within sixty feet of the corner, his heart racing with anticipation. If he could round the corner, he had a good chance of escaping, especially if the soldiers hadn't sealed off the perimeter yet. Hey, soldier! Trellin knew the voice was directed at him, but he pretended not to hear. I'm speaking to you. Don't walk away from me. What's your name? Rank? And just like that, he felt his plan fading into failure. Name's Jurens, Trellin replied. I'm just checking the perimeter, sir. Jurens? Trellin heard a weapon cock. Put your hands up right now and get on your knees. Sir? 
Trellin glanced over his shoulder, complying with the first part. Is there a problem? Aside from the fact you're not Jurens? The man glared at him down the sight of an assault rifle. Jurens served under me for three years. You're definitely not him. Now get on your knees. Immediately. Trellin looked around, considering the possibilities. He could try to run for it, but the man had him dead to rights. All he had to do was pull the trigger. No aiming required. Surrender was certainly an option, and if he absolutely had to, he could use his immunity code. But when or if he did, that would end his mission completely. He'd no longer have any cover. Maybe a stint in their prison will help the cause. Might prove my value. Of course, getting caught isn't really doing me any favors to show I have skills. There must be a way out of this. Trellin dropped to his knees, keeping his hands high. He looked around again, noting only one man approached him. He didn't call for help or backup. As he came closer, his weapon would only become a liability. He should have slung the rifle and drawn a sidearm, but his decision might be the way out of the situation. You're going to hang for this, you animal. Trellin figured he must have been less than five feet away. He counted the man's footsteps and heard the jingle of handcuffs. Now he's carrying that cannon with one hand. The man's shadow blocked the sun, and Trellin made his move, fading to the side and spinning. His raised hands allowed him to block the gun to the side, but he cursed when the man discharged a round. He grabbed him and snapped his neck, taking the rifle and rising. Traitor, be careful, everyone. This man just attacked me. Trellin doubted anyone bought it, and as they started toward him, he contemplated using the rifle or hauling ass. When the shuttle suddenly exploded, the situation was taken from his hands. Bodies flew in every direction, some of them in pieces. The concussion tossed Trellin back several feet, and he landed on his back, the wind torn from his lungs. He gasped, rolling to his side as he fought to breathe. His ears rang, but distantly he heard cries of pain. People who hadn't died in the explosion were torn up, likely dying if not maimed for life. Trellin crawled, dragging himself away from the action. Another ship was coming, and if it happened to be the rebels, they wouldn't be kind to his uniform. Maybe it's my extraction. The thought made him chuckle. There was no way the pirates would come down and commit such a blatant and violent act. At best, they were on their way out of the system, assuming all hands lost on the surface. They're mostly right. Attention, a voice blared over a loudspeaker. We are with the Orion's Light. We are landing, and if anyone fires at us, we will execute you on the spot. Do not come out of the power station. We'll be taking it over momentarily. Again, do not pretend to be heroes. You will die. This is your one and only warning. The fates just blessed me. Maybe. Trellin rolled on his back and sat up, staring at the high-tech shuttle that set down near the debris of the other ship. He recognized the symbol emblazoned on the side, the cut of the craft and the weapons sticking out of hard points. He'd studied them extensively in preparation for just such an opportunity. If they'll talk to me, this might have worked out after all providing they don't shoot me in the face. Chapter 4 The regular bridge crew reported in and took their positions, preparing for their jump into the combat zone. Each of them received their briefing and knew they'd probably be on duty for an extended period of time. Secondary staff brought them well away from the planet, into deep space where they'd make the jump without risking any smaller craft around them. Lieutenant Oliver Darnell browsed through the information they had on the culture they were about to visit. Their technology varied little from the Keelan variety, mostly through adaptation with their own advances. He paid particular attention to their offensive and defensive capabilities and found notes from Durant. The engineer remembered his internship when he helped assimilate the Novalat technology into their own. After a brief study of their advances, he was able to point out how they'd improved and what to look out for. Prior to involvement with the Alliance, they had been a peaceful people, 
focusing on exploration and science. This meant their sensor technology was amazing. Ollie compared the figures to theirs and found it close enough now that they didn't have any specific advantage, especially in the civilian sector. However, first contact with them found they'd nearly mastered the art of analysis and shared everything they knew. Defensively, they fell in line with any other ship in the Alliance Navy. Their shields and armor came straight off the same assembly line. Weapons mirrored this with only a few changes to take advantage of their tech crew training involving sensors and pinpointing targets. Ollie figured Durant's upgrade to their own AI for the turrets was likely the same thing. Only the Novalat people were able to make necessary corrections with a more efficient computer protocol. I like what they've done, and the fact we've got all these files in the database makes it a lot easier to anticipate what we're about to hop into. Ollie brought up a list of civilian vessels they might encounter and frowned at the versatility. None of them would be able to stand up to the behemoth, even if they were outmatched over 100 to 1. This might be easy. Even thinking it made him curse under his breath. The last thing he wanted to do was jinx the mission through flippancy. He turned his attention to running combat simulations, testing what the computer thought of their chances to penetrate shields and armor, performing disabling blows instead of destroying their opponents. He shared the data with the rest of the bridge crew through his regular report, then turned to the countdown. They'd be jumping shortly, but not all the departments checked in yet. Ensign Agatha White on communications tallied those results and sent them to the rest of the crew in her report. When they all flipped over to Green, she'd make a general announcement prior to their departure. Alliance messages indicated they needed to anticipate action the moment they arrived. This meant the behemoth pilots would have an exciting time with the jump as they were already in their cockpits, prepared to launch at a moment's notice. Each of their vessels would be locked down, secure to the hangar. Ollie couldn't imagine being in a tiny box like that through one of the least comfortable experiences aboard the ship. Even with the upgrades that made it vastly more pleasant since their first jump, he didn't like it. Some of his friends aboard swore they didn't even notice anymore, but he called them out. His stomach pulled a gymnastic routine every time they hopped to a new sector. All departments reported in, Agatha said. We're prepared for departure. Very good, Gray said. Double-check course and arrival, Ensign Marcus. Leonard had likely been staring at the information the entire time they sat there. He answered immediately. Course laid in and confirmed, sir. We are ready to go. Go ahead, Redding. Ollie inhaled a deep breath and let it out as the ship began to shimmer and hum. The sound lasted less than a minute before the view screen went blank and they were suddenly somewhere else, light years away. He immediately got on the scanner, swallowing back his nausea and looking for a distraction. How deep are we in it already? Scans came back with a lot of debris. They arrived at the site of a fairly recent battle, but no action was happening within 100,000 kilometers. He did pick up a large force on the verge of engagement near the third planet in the system, the home world of the Novalat people. He brought it up on the screen. We're not in any immediate danger, Ollie said, but those guys are about to start something not too far away. You'll notice on the left, we've got some civilian ships mixed in with military craft. Stolen, I guess. Probably, Gray said. Adam, get Ravente on the line and tell him to stand down from launch until we give him the signal. We'll close in and let them jump right into the action. Yes, sir. Adam started speaking quietly into his calm. Gray continued. Clea, Agatha, do we have a frequency for our allies here? Agatha replied. Yes, sir. I'm ready to transmit. Get them on the line as quickly as possible, Gray said. The last thing we need is for them to band together and attack us. I've had enough being that invader. Ollie took down the tactical display so the military commander could fill the screen as Agatha connected. Please identify yourselves, the Novalat said. His brown hair was flecked with gray and he looked quite human except for the vibrant blue eyes bordering on teal. You're transmitting a friend signature, but I've never seen a ship like yours. This is Captain Gray Atwell of the Behemoth. The Alliance sent us to help. 
We'll transmit our authorization from them to you. We'd like to get you out of this mess if we can. Your ship's certainly big enough to make quite the statement. My name is Anthar Duberis. We've been at this a while. I know the Alliance has had some troubles, but we could have used their help weeks ago. We were in the midst of another operation, or I'm sure they would have sent us sooner, Gray replied. Can you give us a rundown on what's happening? It looks like you're about to engage in quite the fight. The rebels are relentless, Duberis grunted. They send waves after us, trying to break down our resolve. They've managed to send troops down to the surface of our planet, taking out power facilities and occupying some of our remote communities, which, unfortunately, provide food for our people. We're fighting a nasty guerrilla war, I'm afraid. What are your rules of engagement? Gray asked. Are you destroying these vessels? They've been leaving us no choice. We don't want to be killing those we have worked with and live beside, but their tactics have been absolutely ruthless. Understood. Gray turned to Redding. Get us into position to help with this battle. Maybe a little show of our force will help settle some of this situation. The ship began to rumble as Redding complied. Duberis' expression softened. Thank you for your assistance, Captain. Do the rebels have access to one-man fighters? Gray asked. We're prepared to launch our squadrons to attack, but could just turn to bombers if they don't. Some of our best pilots are on the wrong side of this fight, I'm afraid. Duberis shook his head. I'll send you the schematics for our vessels. They're quick, small, and maneuverable, but still pack a pretty nasty punch. I hope your people are quite good behind a stick, because they'll definitely have their work cut out for them. I think they're up to the challenge. Gray nodded to Adam, though Ollie didn't know what the signal meant. We're going to keep you on the line, but mute for a moment. Please let us know if there's anything you need before we arrive. I see the ETA for us to be engaged as less than five minutes. Thank you again, Captain. Please hurry. I'm praying your presence will prevent at least this battle from happening. Clea came close and leaned over Ollie's console, speaking softly. I want you to start performing broad sensor sweeps of the area. There's a chance the Orion's light may be present here still, and I want to find out long before they cause trouble. Ollie looked at her with wide eyes. Ma'am, why would they be here? This is a civil matter, isn't it? I did some reading earlier, and the analysts believe we're dealing with workers who haven't been paid fair wages. They're talking about civilians unhappy with work conditions. Someone stirred these people up and gave them the idea that a violent solution would get them what they want. Clea patted his shoulder. Just perform the sweeps and send me the report right away if you discover anything out of the ordinary. I assume they'll be automated so you can continue your regular duties? Ollie nodded. Yes, ma'am. I'm on it right now. As she left, he felt a growing sense of alarm. Prior to jumping into the area, he didn't like the idea of getting involved in the fight, but he didn't worry about it. Now, with the terrorist group involved, the ante had been effectively raised. If they now had two sides to contend with, then this was going to be a rough mission after all. Gray looked over the reports concerning their fighters and wished he could shake the bad feeling he had about their upgrades. Durant's message stated they were ready to go and tested. He brought a team of 50 engineers on board, and they busted out all the ships at the same time. They even managed to replace the ones they lost with some of the Alliance variety. The new inertial dampeners would definitely give them a major advantage, but if something went wrong, pilots would die. Horribly. He had to trust Durant, but his gut wanted to complain a little longer. I guess I'll find out soon enough. Gray turned to Adam. Are fighters ready? And willing, sir. They state they've picked up some signals of enemy fighters out there. We've tuned our friend or foe identifiers, so we should be good to go. Are the Marines ready? Adam hesitated. Yes? He lowered his voice. You probably want to tell them about that part. I know it seems to be a secret, but I'm sure they need to know. Gray nodded. It's a dual mission as well. I'm having people visit two of their sites. He turned to Agatha. 
Bring Duberis back online. Duberis appeared on the screen, peering into the camera. What is it, Captain? We need to land some Marines at multiple locations, Gray said. It appears the Alliance may have some information about one of the attacks you faced, and we'd like to investigate. Can you grant us permission to land these men? Send me the coordinates. Gray tapped at his computer, sending out the landing zone on the planet and the space station. He watched Duberis' eyes widen. Captain, we've had quite a bit of action in that section of the planet. Rebels have effectively taken over the area, cutting off our food supply. If you're going to send men down there, I'd ask you to help reestablish access to the resources. We can do that, Gray replied. What about the space station? It was recently burglarized, but you're welcome to visit. We do not currently have any men on board. Unfortunately, the thieves murdered our people, and we have not had the luxury of taking it back. Or at least occupying it. Thank you. Gray turned to his computer and began inputting a new set of orders for the ground crews. We'll be launching a variety of ships soon, and the next time we'll talk, we'll be in coordination of the fight. Talk shortly. These folks sure are desperate for the help, Adam said. I wouldn't be surprised if they raise a big stink with high command when this is all said and done. I'm sure many of the cultures working with the Alliance will have something to say when the war's over, Gray replied. But one thing at a time. Get our fighters out there and some escorts for our troop transports. We're ready to start the party. Wing Commander Megan Pointer rolled her shoulders, trying to stretch a little in the tight confines of the cockpit. Her mind drifted to the various missions she'd flown since joining the behemoth, the different people they lost, and the violence they'd been part of. Each operation was a little different, but despite the variation in enemies, the battles began to blur together. I can't even say I'm looking forward to the end of the fighting. Whatever the right answer is concerning conflict, I probably don't have it. Without a struggle, what would I even do? I can't imagine ferrying people around. I need this. And that might be a problem in the near future. The others in the ships around her were quiet, as they waited for the order to get into action. Some of them would be on escort duty, while others would engage the rebels who were about to attack the legitimate government. Panther Wing was assigned to combat. Their rules of engagement were pretty liberal as well. They were told not to hold back. Seems weird in the middle of a civil war, but I guess they want to make a point about uprisings. The situation would be a lot harder if she knew these people, but the concept of what they were doing bothered her. She didn't want to hurt civilians, and that's what these people felt like to her. However, as she read the briefing, her gut feeling was overwhelmed by the statistics and facts. Most of the combatants on the rebel side were seasoned soldiers, men and women who had served the Novalat military and turned on them alongside the other colonists in the area. They would be a challenge, and some of them were highly decorated, having gone against the same enemy as the behemoth had. This made the situation a lot more dangerous and certainly volatile. When the information came across her screen that the Orion's light might be involved, it didn't surprise her in the slightest. Those scum had been stirring up trouble wherever they could, and this certainly didn't seem any different. If we don't take care of them before finishing the war, they'll be a thorn in everyone's side for a long time. Especially if they're allowed to scatter. We practically need to deal with them first. Even if we do risk another attack by the jerks who started all this in the first place. Wing commanders, Ravente's voice filled her helmet. You'll be launching in just a moment, and I want to tell you that the battle's about to get very hot. These guys look like they've got some decent tech, but with the upgrade to your inertial dampeners and your training, you should be able to outfly them easily. Just be careful about pushing the envelope and make sure you're covered. Watch the friend or foe identifiers as some of these ships look a heck of a lot like our allies. Finally, our secondary objectives are just as important and involve making landfall on the planet and taking that space station. You'll be in charge of keeping the Marines safe along the way. Does anyone have any questions before I begin the countdown for launch? No one spoke up, and Ravente took the silence to mean they were good. Watch your screens. You'll get the message to go shortly. Good luck, 
and Godspeed. Scanners showed the fighting began between the two sides. The behemoth would be involved any second, probably in every way. The rebel capital ships, if they could even be called that, were mostly in the destroyer class, with one battleship large enough to be a major concern. Intelligence suggested at least two more large ships out there somewhere. Bombers could probably take that down, but I'll bet they want to capture them before the fight's done. Trashing a perfectly good warship on the eve of the greatest battle in history wouldn't go over very well with anyone. Megan got the green light for launch and jammed her throttle forward, hurling out and away from the behemoth. The rest of her wing followed behind, forming up in a vanguard as they maneuvered toward the action. Large civilian craft, outfitted with weapons, took pot shots at the military, harassing them as their battleship moved into position. The smaller craft, stolen fighters primarily, engaged with their military counterparts. They were evenly matched, as was indicated by the distinct lack of success on either side. Megan felt confident they'd turn the tide, likely in a pretty dramatic way. She checked her friend or foe identifier and it seemed to be working properly. Marine dropships tore off away from the main body of behemoth fighters, heading off on their missions. Megan didn't know specifically what they might be looking for or trying to accomplish, but quelling an entire attack force seemed unlikely, especially considering they didn't even send all the men on the ship. Maybe they'll take key positions and turn them back over to the military, but I don't see why the Novalant ground forces couldn't do that themselves. All right, Panther, Megan addressed her wing. You know what to do. Stay together and let's get rid of these guys. Be careful about pushing your dampeners just in case there's a problem. You feel resistance you don't expect? Back off. Otherwise, we're weapons free to engage and take this area back. The team reported back, including their newest member, Lieutenant Tara Galloway. She replaced poor Leslie, who had been murdered by the Orion's light leader in cold blood. Megan looked forward to another chance against those bastards. She'd love to be the one to fire the shot that took down their capital ship. Time for that later. Twenty seconds to contact. She received word from their allies, the commander of one of the wings reaching out to her. He committed his forces to keeping out of their way and staying back near their capital ships. This afforded Panther Wing an easier time intercepting the enemies and bringing the fight to them. Without fear of shooting one of our own, I like it. Good thinking. They weren't trained with the Ally pilots, so the chances of them being of any value to one another in close quarters were slim. However, working in tandem at distance, they should be quite effective. Taking a quick count of the various enemy ships in the area, she tallied them up at 25 enemies. Jesus, they stole an entire flight. This is going to cost the government a lot of money. Sorry about that, guys. In advance, I mean. Ten were already engaged, but fifteen were still moving into action. Panther maneuvered to intercept, coming in at two-to-one odds. She admired their flight patterns as they approached, noting that they followed a similar discipline of pairing up wingmen. They remained in tight formation, despite the fact an enemy force was barreling down on them. Megan sent an updated attack plan to the rest of the wing, presenting them with different angles to go after. Twenty seconds from a firing solution, the wing broke up into twos, some going low while others heading for a flanking position. Megan's second, squadron leader Mick Torren, flew below her and to the left, giving them both space to maneuver. The enemy ships broke their formation, pulling some serious Gs as they separated. They must have pushed the limits of their inertial dampeners to allow them such a dramatic motion. All reports suggested their technology actually fell short of what the behemoth had on board, so they should have been outmatched. And how disciplined can they possibly be after rebelling against their government? Megan pulled up, following two of the enemies as they jammed their afterburners. She came in behind them allowing the computer to start working on a lock. They didn't seem to have any intention of turning or engaging, and as she got tone, she fired a missile. The projectile lurched ahead of her, unconcerned about speed restrictions and dampeners. As it approached, its target twisted to the left but couldn't escape. Her attack struck the rear engines, easily penetrating the shields and causing a massive explosion. The pilot bailed out, but only barely before the entire ship disintegrated around him. 
Mick took some shots at the other with pulse cannons, but it managed to twist away, spinning in place and coming back at them. Now we've got your attention. It opened fire and they split, allowing the enemy ship to pass between them. Megan quickly checked her scanners and noted that her entire wing had been pulled away from the mainstay of the forces below. She frowned, pulling around to continue her engagement. What exactly were they being distracted from? Panther had been sent to deal with these. The other wings were protecting the marines or screening for the behemoth. There must have been something down there the enemy didn't want them to mess with, and it got Megan curious. If they all disengaged and went back to where they'd found these guys, what would they discover? Panther? Megan began. This might be dangerous, so be ready. We're going to break off from these guys and head back down to where we found them. Believe me, they're going to try to stop us, and that's when we take them out. There's a lot of debris down there, Mick said. I'm sure they were just moving to a place they could safely maneuver. Let's find out. Megan redirected her ship and jammed the throttle forward. As they raced back to their earlier location, sure enough, the enemy vessels engaged aggressively. They led with their cannons opening up as soon as they were within range. None of them even bothered with targeting. They were just trying to warn them off. Still think they were safety conscious? Panther Wing broke off in several directions, getting back into the fight. A couple of shots narrowly missed Megan, skimming the shields over her cockpit. She jostled her controls down and the improved inertial dampeners whined with the suddenness of the action. She literally nudged herself a few inches while going full speed forward without the slightest bit of tension. Good job, Mr. Durant. Two enemies came at her, playing chicken. She let the computer start targeting them and prepared to fire when they beat her to the punch. Megan didn't want to lose the firing solution, so she dropped down slightly, still with them in front of her. Panther IV, Flight Lieutenant Shelley Brown, came out of nowhere from the right, incinerating one of the two attackers with a barrage of pulse cannon fire. The other one broke off, spinning away to chase after Brown. Megan ignited her afterburners and gave chase, quickly catching up. She fired a couple times, her cockpit instantly heating up until she was sweating. The blasts were clean misses, but they gave her some perspective, allowing her to adjust for the next attack. She came in from slightly above and behind, letting another barrage go. The enemy's shields flared at the first three blasts, then flames erupted from the top. She didn't stop, continuing to fire until the entire ship turned to dust. An alarm went off in the cockpit, a warning of proximity. Megan checked her scanner and cursed as one of the enemies came from below. A couple shots smacked her shields before she could spin away, getting out of their firing solution. Relax, Mick said. I've got this one. The blip on her radar disappeared just as a flash of light erupted from her left. Thanks, Megan muttered. I can't believe they got the drop on me like that. The engagement continued, with their wing coming out on top. She checked their opponents and they'd already lost seven of their fifteen ships. Evening up the odds, but we've got a lot of work left to do. And there's the matter of whatever they don't want us to find. Someone has to check that out. Giant Control, this is Panther One. Megan temporarily pulled away from the fight to give a report. We're doing fine against the enemy, but they're really concerned about whatever they were escorting down there. Recommend you send someone to take a look. We're a bit busy at the moment. Understood. Ravente's voice filled her helmet. I'll send over Tiger to have a look. Any ideas at all? Nope, but they left the area just as we engaged, then came back hard when we tried to see what they were leading us away from. Feels fishy, and potentially dangerous for our allies. Good call. I'm on it. Stay safe. Megan flipped her ship and went back into the action, throwing herself into the fray. These ships might be the only ones in this particular wing, but she knew there were more out there waiting for their chance. The battleship might even carry a few, and if it did, they'd be launched soon enough. Then they'd really be in for a fight. As if this isn't one. My perspective has been seriously screwed up through this campaign. Chapter 5 Gray narrowed his eyes at the various reports spilling into his console. The fighters already met the enemy and had downed several. 
The Marines were on their way, and the behemoth was nearly in range to start some trouble for the larger of their opponents. As far as the battle went, things seemed to be going fairly smoothly. Adam turned to Gray, keeping his voice low. Sir, Revente just sent me a message about something they're investigating. Our fighters believe there may be something out there the enemy is trying to hide. Get Ollie to scan the area, Gray replied. Maybe he'll figure it out before our other ships get into harm's way. Yes, sir. Adam moved off to comply, and Gray returned his attention to the other reports. The battleship moved into position, ready to start trouble. He figured some, if not all, the crew initiated a mutiny and joined the rebel forces. He couldn't imagine what might cause soldiers to turn on their commanders in such a way. Unless their commanders were part of the plan. The thought made him nervous. It would mean the Orion's light had far more influence than he imagined. Having seen Creelon's actions with the colony firsthand, Gray thought of them as thugs more than provocateurs. They didn't seem subtle enough for such work, let alone capable of initiating a full-on civil war. Reading a massive energy reading in the area, sir, Ollie announced. Our fighters should pull back. It's unstable. I think they were escorting bombs. Gray stood up. What kind of bombs? Um, Ollie hesitated to reply. Big ones? I'm trying to figure out exactly how dangerous they are now, sir. I'll have a full report in 20 seconds. Call off our fighters in the immediate area, Gray said. Redding, how close are we to the battleship? Firing solution in less than two minutes. Redding paused. I can increase speed and be firing in 30 seconds if you prefer. Do it, Gray pointed at Clea. Help Ollie figure out what he's scanning. This is a surprise we don't want to learn about the hard way. Tension increased as their seemingly simple operation possibly turned to something else. The battle between the government and the rebels had been going on for a while, so it stood to reason they wouldn't be total pushovers. However, the impression Gray received from all the reports was that the legitimate military merely needed a boost to get over the finish line. The fact some of their own rank helped lead the rebels made the situation a lot direr. Gray checked on the fighters and his heart throbbed in his chest when he saw they'd received no casualties. Yet. The voice in his head cautioned him against early optimism. The tactics employed by the enemy meant they were certainly going to provide quite the level of resistance, more so than anyone was given warning of. We're in range, Redding announced. Permission to fire on the battleship? Sir? Agatha interrupted. I'm getting a hail from that battleship. They're urgently requesting communications. Oh boy, Gray sighed. Duberis will love this. Put them through. A face appeared, far younger than the commander of the military forces, but hardened. Gray guessed he'd seen plenty of skirmishes in his time and probably led these people by example. He stood up straight as their connection established and cleared his throat before speaking. This is Suanthar Tauki of the Vigor. This is not your fight. Please turn around and disengage immediately. We do not wish to fight you. We're working to bring order to this system, Gray replied. That means establishing a peaceful resolution on behalf of the legitimate government. I represent the Alliance, and we're here to settle this. You don't have any idea why we're fighting. Do you? Gray asked. Our people have been oppressed on the colonies, practically made indentured servants. We've demanded they treat us equally, and they chose not to, so we rose up. Tauki shrugged. Now we'll take their planet and force them to our terms. It's how every great society cleans up the rubbish. That's not the story we've been told, Gray replied. And if you're so dead set on a resolution like you described, then stand down. We'll call a ceasefire and work this out at the diplomacy table instead of over guns. Otherwise, I'm afraid we're going to have to disable your craft and achieve our mission. Are you so sure you can handle us? Tauki gestured over his shoulder. We have another incoming. Then I suppose we'll have to take care of you quickly so we can be ready. But please note that this is unnecessary. Gray sighed. Please, consider our offer. We'll ensure that everyone is treated fairly during those talks. Our benefactor said the Alliance would issue such lies if they ever showed up. Tauki sneered. 
Now you've proven they were right. I'll see you on the battlefield, and we'll settle this like warriors. Prepare the souls of your people. I intend to send them on their way to whatever afterlife you believe in. The connection dropped, and Gray felt Adam's eyes on him. He shook his head. Redding, I believe you said we were within range for a firing solution? Aye, sir, I'm prepared to fire on your mark. Then by all means, Gray said, motioning toward the screen. Fire at will. Captain William Hoffner led the forces heading for the planet, strapped in near the pilots. The rest of his platoon, a group of hardened, battle-tested marines, sat nearby, clinging to their rifles as they plunged headlong into a battle zone of fighters and capital ships on the verge of serious action. He took a steadying breath and prepared himself for the landing. Their mission involved checking out a power facility and potentially reclaiming the farmlands supposedly held by rebel forces. Intelligence suggested the opposition would be well-armed and extremely dangerous, prepared to fight to the death to hold the ground they'd taken. The surrounding towns and cities relied on the resources being held, so the behemoth offered to take them back. The secondary objective involved discovering any data on an Alliance intelligence officer who had been operated in the area. The way Lieutenant Colonel Marshal DuPont gave him the orders, though, made William suspect a higher importance for the objective. After all the time he spent in the military, Captain Hoffner knew when something classified was being withheld. I doubt we're going to find him down there, if that's what you're hoping, Hoffner had told DuPont. If the guy was working this area, surely he'd be long gone by now. Or dead. Whatever evidence you can find will be good enough for us. DuPont replied. Just make sure you get this done right. Scans, body checks, the works. The resources are your primary objective still, though. Don't forget that. Hoffner didn't push, but he understood the overall sense of the situation. What made him curious, and he wished he'd asked when he had the chance, was what the intelligence agent was doing on the planet. They all knew the rebels were active, and they also understood that the Orion's light were involved. What else could a spy need to know? Whatever they stole on that station, I'm guessing it has something to do with that. Probably some classified personnel data or weapons. Those two things tend to get a government up on their hind legs for action. One minute for Atmo break, the pilot announced. Hold on tight, we're about to enter the combat zone. Hoffner looked out the window and winced at the energy blasts flying back and forth between the two factions. Their own fighters engaged the enemies, flying in wild maneuvers to get decent firing solutions. A ball of fire appeared to his left, and another dead ahead, ships exploding from core detonation. The gunner for their shuttle sat in the co-pilot seat, and as he began to unload, the entire ship warmed up. Even their environmental suits couldn't completely protect them entirely from the increased temperature, and while it didn't cause any discomfort, they sure as hell felt it. Other ships went down around them and the gunner calmly called his shots with all the passion of a golf commentator. You sure he's killing people? One of the marines shouted out. Or is he just tickling them? I can't tell by the way he talks. He's just a sociopath. Someone else dismissed the situation. Or he thinks he's playing a video game. Either way, as long as we get on the ground in one piece, I don't care if he starts singing a country song. Let those guys do their jobs without criticism, I say. No criticism, the first Marine replied. I was just curious. I hate to think what the dude's like in bed. That's enough, Hoffner cut the talk short. Let's focus on the objective and keep the colorful commentary to a minimum. You guys have a lot to do in the next few hours, and I expect you on your toes. If there are rebels down there, we're going to have one hell of a fight. We're outnumbered, but not outgunned. Remember that. The plan involved letting the pilots do a buzz over a couple LZs, dropping bombs to distract the enemy from the deployment of troops. They'd land three kilometers away from the power facility and make their way over there on foot, engaging hostiles only if necessary. Once there, they were to take back the facility, then sweep the farms for any other occupying soldiers. Straightforward missions always seemed like the hardest to keep on track. Whenever someone thought things would go smoothly, they tended to twist, throwing some kind of fly in the ointment. Hoffner was prepared for such an eventuality, 
but he didn't have to like it. At least they were being deployed into a situation they were accustomed to. Straightforward combat. With a side of investigation. That's the rub, huh? Pilots confirm our path is clear. We're heading into Atmo now. The ship began shaking violently as they descended toward the surface. Hoffner held on tightly, scowling as he considered the helplessness of being passengers aboard a dropship. He'd seen them torn out of the sky plenty of times before. All hands lost. He never entirely got over the anticipation of death on a drop, the thought they might all be gone in the blink of an eye. The others used various methods to fend off their own concerns. Bravado, sleep, silence. Each had their own way, but they all amounted to the same thing. Whether they were afraid or simply adrenalized, each man knew this drop might be their last. The noise kicked in from turbulence as everything started rattling around him. Two fighters accompanied them close by, their engines screaming and competing with their own. Another four ships rocketed past them, plunging toward their targets, a rebel camp they were instructed to take out. Hoffner leaned to watch out the window, but only managed to see an eruption of fire some distance below them. The speaker in his helmet crackled as the pilot spoke up again. Our distraction is in motion and we are making our final approach for landing. Be ready to disembark and we will extract at the appointed time. Hoffner felt himself relaxing from the news, which amused him considering what they were about to do. A moment later, everything changed as the ship rocked from some kind of impact. We've been hit. The pilot's calm bordered on insane, and Hoffner began to agree with the Marine who talked about the man being a sociopath earlier. Superficial damage, but it was from an infantry-held weapon. We need some cover fire down there. Get these guys something else to worry about rather than us. A shoulder-mounted rocket. Thank God for the shields. That could have been bad. Will you be able to make it back to orbit? Hoffner asked. How bad was the damage? They got our wing, but it was all concussive. We'll make it back and just need a little welding job to get her back up to 100%. Don't worry about us, sir. We've got this bird just fine. You guys take care of your part so we can get home. I'm glad you're so nonchalant about being tapped with a rocket. Hoffner kept the thought to himself and just shook his head. Maybe they're like us, in that they can't give in to worry or concern lightly. Whatever's going to happen will, and sometimes, there's not a whole hell of a lot we can do to stop it. Ten seconds to the LZ. Hoffner related the information to his men. Get your asses ready. I want boots on the ground the second this thing slows down. At five seconds, the Marines disengaged their safety harnesses and prepared to disembark. The ramp opened and wind buffeted them as it rushed in. The men prepared themselves, holding tight to the safety straps overhead. Engines cried out as the ship lurched, the nose pulling up to reveal the ground beneath. They were less than eight feet up when the first of the soldiers hopped out and started securing the perimeter. Others followed suit and soon the platoon formed a solid circle for the captain to join them. The ship pulled up and rocketed back up, hitting the afterburners for a swift trip back into orbit. Their environmental suits not only protected them against hazards, but they also held a decent amount of armor. The enamel fended off all but the absolute best scanners as well, granting them a moderate amount of stealth. Considering the technology in the briefing, it would be more than enough to get close to the base without detection. Hoffner checked his scanner to catch their bearings and pointed off toward the south. We're this way, men. Let's fall out and get that power plant back in ally hands. The Marines filed out, taking up a staggered position as they hurried across an open field toward a tall structure some three kilometers off. Explosions rocked the landscape on either side of them as combat raged across the region. They were eleven men amidst armies at war men and women killing each other over a civil dispute. Intelligence stated the biggest action would take place quite a ways away from their current location. Where they were heading was practically considered no man's land, comparatively speaking. Desolate, mostly fields and farmland, the power plant was put in place to provide energy to the families living out there. The real action took place at mining facilities and fabrication buildings, Hoffner didn't think manufacturing would come into play for victory in this conflict. 
No one was going to build another ship in the time it took to put down the rebels or have them unseat the government. However, the sooner they held those resources, the better off they'd be when or if they won. Hoffner kept a close eye on the scanner, noting there were forces surrounding the building. Checking the latest report stated the government had not taken it back themselves. The last thing he needed was to take down a bunch of legit soldiers who somehow struck back against their enemies. The briefing stated they'd be wearing the right uniforms to look the part, which felt suspicious. Why would they bother to do so? Surely they didn't want to get shot by their own people. Something had to differentiate them. He hoped to find out, so when they went after the farms, they'd know specifically what to look for. The power facility had two entrances. The front provided some security where people were forced to check in through actual armed personnel, then a reception area provided people with a place to wait for whatever meeting they hoped to attend. The other was a side door, which, according to Intel, had been welded shut and barricaded. Explosives might get them in, but the noise would make it an unnecessary advantage. They might as well go head-on if they were going to blow something up. In any event, they crouched low some hundred yards from the facility and observed through binoculars, gauging to see what they had to contend with. Hoffner's expectation of an occupying force involved a perimeter guard, either roving or stationed at the back. If he had his way, he would have put someone on the roof to spot people, but his scan showed no one up there. This left anyone that might be walking around, but even that, with their decent view of both sides, turned up no real activity. Contact, Private Dorans muttered, east side of building. Hoffner redirected his binoculars and frowned. An armed man indeed came around the side of the building and looked like a patrol, until he stopped and started to relieve himself on the wall. Sir, Private Goodman spoke up. What kind of yahoos are we dealing with anyway? Why couldn't the military take this place back? They're occupied, Hoffner said. Apparently so was the privy, Dorans added. The other marines chuckled softly. Let's just get this done. Hoffner noted no one was in line of sight of this guy. They must have really thought they had the area locked down. He wore the uniform of the security staff of the building. Corporal Lorenz, take the shot. Lorenz carried their sniper rifle, a high-powered suppressed affair, and zeroed in with his scope. It only took him a moment, and just as the target pulled up his fly, the weapon discharged. Hoffner watched the man's head jerk to the right, a puff of red expelled from the other side as he dropped to the ground, dead. Nice, Dorans said. Move out, Hoffner said, pressing forward. Lorenz, give us some cover from the east and let us know if anyone shows up. Tossy, you take your boys around the west side and we'll meet up at the front. Careful about windows and watch your scanners. You don't want to get surprised on this one. They all pressed forward, hustling until they arrived at the back of the building. Lorenz rushed off for cover near a small hill which should have given him a decent vantage of the area. When they got to the back wall, they separated, moving to their respective corners before preparing for the mad dash to get the length of the building. Without cover, anyone who peeked around the corner and saw them would have a clear shot to open up. Their weapons may not have the impact to cause serious damage with the environmental armor suits the Marines wore, but Hoffner wasn't willing to risk it. Protocol required him to take up somewhere in the middle of the squad, but he never felt comfortable hidden away. Instead, he led his part of the team, taking point until they reached their destination. He'd allow one of the others to take over when they were about to breach the building, but until then, he needed to have control over the short distance they were rushing over. They ducked several windows along the way and approached the corner cautiously, noting the scanner showed a good half-dozen men near the front door. Corporal Geralt took the other team, and his voice piped in through their secure comm network. Contact. Three tangos in casual guard. They seem to be occupied with a tablet. If they're on scanners, they clearly don't see us. Get in position for takedown, Hoffner said. We'll stay in cover, and when they're gone, we'll converge on the door. On my mark, Geralt called. Link targets. Aim. Fire. A dozen suppressed shots went off, and the targets on Hoffner's scanner each winked out. Move out, 
Hoffner and his team rushed over to the door and were met by the rest of the platoon. The bodies on the ground were not dressed in the uniforms they imagined they would be. Each wore the Orion's light garb of black, and their weapons were much better than anticipated. This is interesting, Geralt said. Captain? Hoffner hummed. He didn't anticipate the light to have occupied the base. They thought they were facing rebels. Still, the objective didn't change. Taking it back, regardless of who held it, stood. He moved to the door and checked, noting it was not locked. We can go in, he said. Let's get someone on this network and patch into their cameras. Private Tully plugged in and a moment later their HUDs showed the various cameras. Hoffner cycled through them, counting more than 20 soldiers inside at various locations. Why do they want this place so badly? He turned to the others. There are too many in there to be sneaky. We can try it first, but I'm guaranteeing we'll have to go loud sooner than later. We're ready, Geralt replied. I'll take point. After you, Corporal, Hoffner stepped aside. Geralt pushed the door open and let his rifle lead the way, pacing quickly into the lobby. Hoffner followed close behind and they both had to fire immediately, taking out a man who stood behind the reception desk. The body hit the ground and took the chair with him making a clutter. A voice from down the hallway to the right called out, What was that? The Marines moved into the lobby and took positions to guard all the entry points, including the one they'd just entered by. A man came to explore, poking his head in. One of the Marines popped him right in the forehead, dropping him to the ground. Someone else cried out, shouting for an alarm. That was a gunshot! Help! We've got intruders! Go loud, Hoffner said. Disengage suppressors. The extra velocity was less important than the intimidation value of a loud shot. When they opened up on the next people to show up, their opponents would definitely know what they had to worry about. Geralt and his team moved over to the left side hallway, prepared to take it. Hoffner directed his men that direction as well. Lawrence, you've got to watch our backs. We're taking this facility now. Got it, Lawrence said. I won't let anyone in, sir. Hoffner prepared to go first, and a volley of gunfire riddled the hallway, slapping the wall behind them. He crouched, returning fire, albeit blindly. His men joined in the fun, lighting the area up. They heard another person cry out, warning his companions of what was coming, but seriously overestimating the force attacking them. There's an army at the door, he yelled. Get some grenades! You heard the request. Geralt said. Toss them some grenades, guys. Let's be conservative with those when we get closer to the control center, Hoffner warned. I want this place in one piece when we're done. Just being friendly visitors, sir, Geralt said. Fire in the hole. Hoffner glanced over his shoulder and saw several men chucking the explosives down the hallway. As they began going off, the screams went from fear to pain as at least a few of their targets were caught in the blasts. Hoffner risked a glance down the hall, trying to use one of the cameras to see how many they faced, but the connection was scrambled. They've locked down their own security, Hoffner said. Scans? Blocked, Tully said. We're doing this the old-fashioned way. Fair enough. Anyone got eyes on the guy down there? Private Warner fired his weapon and a wet splat resounded down the hall. Not anymore, sir. Good shot. Hoffner looked back at the men. We have to get down there. I'm on it. Warner pressed forward, moving at double time. A man followed him six paces behind. Geralt and his team already took their own hallway and Hoffner closed behind his. They reached the next room and all hell broke loose. Men dove for cover, opening up as a contingent of Orion's light burst into the room. Hoffner fired his weapon in short bursts, tearing through a man's leg and another's stomach. A couple rounds tapped his shoulder, and he rolled to the cover of a desk, hoping it was made of more than flimsy wood. The firefight might have lasted all of a minute, but it felt like an eternity. I'm hit, Warner cried out. Clean shot on the left arm. Hang in there, Tully replied. Tango down. Hoffner leaned out and took a shot, blowing half a man's head off. The rest of the Orion's light troops fell back to their own cover, putting them into a temporary stalemate. You going to be okay, Warner? Yes, sir, I'm fine. Geralt, how are you doing? 
We just engaged the enemy in some makeshift living quarters, Geralt replied. They're neutralized, permission to converge on your position. Granted, Geralt's on his way, so let's keep the shooting down until we know we're not taking pot shots at friendlies. Hoffner checked his scans again, but they were still scrambled. Damn it, Tully, what'll it take to get our tech back online? A terminal with access to their devices, sir. I can disengage if I can wire in. Understood. Probably in the command center, Hoffner sighed, which is exactly where we need to be anyway. If we get there, we're done with the mission and won't need our scans anymore. Not until we're back outside and ready to take the farmhouses. Give it up, one of the enemy shouted. We have you outnumbered. Not outgunned. Geralt's voice rose above them and a rattle of gunfire resounded throughout the complex. Hoffner risked a glance and saw bodies dropping to the floor. Blood slicking the metal. Geralt and his men entered the room. Tango's eliminated. Good work, Hoffner rose. Do we have any idea how many we've taken down? Quick count? Geralt yelled. A few moments passed and the figure came back at 13. There are seven more people hiding out in here somewhere, Hoffner said. Let's sweep this place and be careful. If they've held up in a room, they might be dug in. Use flashbang grenades for smaller areas. Move out. They systematically had to go from space to space, checking each for the errant enemies. Hoffner kicked in a door for Warner, who tossed in the grenade. Someone screamed and two Marines went in, blowing him away as he writhed around in blind agony. As they reached their destination, they only encountered three total Orion's light, meaning four might be protecting the consoles within. The doors were metal and slid open so they wouldn't be simple to breach. Explosives would do the trick, and they might be able to hack their way in through the panel to the left. However, regardless of their tactic, it would take more than a few moments to initiate any particular plan. Sir? Lawrence's voice piped in. I'm picking up a distress call from within the base. Looks like they're calling for reinforcements. Geralt chuckled. It's a little late for that now. No doubt. Offner hummed. He raised his voice. You want to live in there? Surrender and we'll ensure you get fair treatment. Otherwise, we're going to pop those doors and take you all down. You have five seconds to make up your minds. We have reinforcements on the way, one of them shouted back. And we can hold out for them to arrive. Okay, that's a fair assessment of the situation. Hoffner turned to Tully. Can you get these doors open? Might take a few minutes, Tully replied, but yes, sir, I believe so. Geralt, what about explosives? Can you blow these in such a way that you don't destroy the tech on the other side? Geralt sucked air through his teeth. It'll be a challenge, sir. These are pretty tough. We don't seem to have a lot of time for trial and error, either. Warner spoke up. Pretty sure we can hold this against their reinforcements and take our time. Especially with Lorenz out there. He'll kill whoever tries to get inside. Let's not rely on that, Hoffner said. Besides, holding this position will be a lot easier when we have control of the security system. Okay, Tully, get to work. Let's try the subtle way before we head into full-on destructive mode. Much as I'm sure the rest of you would rather blow something to hell. Tully got to work and Hoffner stepped away, attempting to establish contact with the behemoth. Something about the power plant interfered with long-range comms, and they'd need to be connected directly into the system to get any meaningful messages out. Damn it. This put heavier emphasis on getting into the control center as quickly as possible. All right, team, let's secure the building and get some people back in the front lobby to hold it down. Hoffner directed three Marines to follow him. Tully, let us know the moment you're ready to get through. Geralt, you're on security detail here. Back in the lobby, he positioned his men by the door. Lawrence, you got anything? Scans indicate incoming shuttles, Lawrence replied. Two specifically? They are six minutes out. Any more data about them? Lawrence sent the information over to him. High capacity, it looks like. Probably twenty guys in each, and they're heavy. I doubt ground ordnance would take them down. Understood. Hoffner hummed before giving a quick briefing. Team, we've got 20-plus men incoming, and I'm sure they'll be intent to take this place over our dead bodies. 
Tully, no pressure, but you've got less than six minutes to get in there so we can communicate with the ship. If it looks like you won't make it, Geralt gets to blow the doors. Let us know in three minutes. Yes, sir, Tully replied. We're preparing for a fight up here, guys. Let's just hope we can get what we need to ensure we win it. Chapter 6 Sergeant Bobby Jenks watched through the front viewport as their shuttle docked with the space station they were supposed to take. The place was big enough for a small force to live up there and work on some kind of scientific study assignment. His people were to get in and reclaim it from rebels, then download all the security footage for the past week. His men stood poised and ready. When the doors opened, they anticipated a firefight. Jenks stepped up into the lead and held his rifle up. The inner hatch slid open and he stepped inside, moving to the edge. Others followed suit, taking what little cover they could. As the airlock closed behind them, the next portal slid to the sides. Gunshots erupted, firing into the area and slapping the walls. Luckily, the bastards were using safe rounds that couldn't penetrate the metal of the walls, but were thrown quite fast enough to go through human meat. Even with the environmental armor, Jenks knew a single round would be enough to take someone down. His people returned fire and they initiated a nasty battle. One of his guys took a shot to the face, shattering his helmet and causing blood to splatter the wall behind. Someone inside screamed and Jenks peeked in, taking some shots as several bodies fell to the ground. Marines spilled in, rushing for new cover to get better positions. The battle raged for almost five minutes before the enemy fled the cargo bay, retreating deeper into the station. Jenks put two men on each of the three doors and called for a roll call. They lost two soldiers in the initial strike, both men shot in the head during the exchange. There wasn't time to mourn them, but that didn't stop the men from adopting a somber silence. Jenks checked his scans and plotted the best course to get them through the facility to the center of the station. It would be through some pretty open areas with plenty of doors, lots of space for men to hide in and conduct ambushes. This type of fighting tended to be the nastiest, only matched by brawls in the suburbs. They didn't have a lot of time and wanted to get through the action as quickly as possible, but in order to maintain any level of safety, they needed to check every corner and room. That meant going slower than any of them wanted, especially considering how fast they could get pinned down in a hallway or a single room even. Jenks organized his people. They loaded the bodies of their fallen onto the shuttle, then sent it on its way. When they finished the mission, they'd call for a pickup, but for the moment, they were on their own. Jenks once again took the lead, and they moved into the hallway, which should have taken them to the control room the quickest. He led with his weapon, two men on either side of him and slightly behind. The rest took up the rear, watching out for anyone wanting to dart in on them as they moved along. The man on his right shouted, Contact! They'd barely gotten ten feet in when one of the enemy stepped out and took a shot. Jenks snapped off a round and connected with the man's forehead, dropping him like a sack of potatoes. His men checked the rooms as they passed by doors, ensuring they wouldn't encounter any surprises. The tension lasted until they reached a flight of stairs beside an elevator. The elevator dinged and opened. Two men darted out with weapons drawn. They leveled their guns but weren't quick enough for the marines who riddled them with bullets, dropping them before they could even twitch. Stairs, Jenks said, dreading the tactical disaster they could be. He started up first, clearing the top before advancing. At the landing, they paced through the door and had to fall back as gunfire stitched the doorframe, nearly cutting Jenks's face off. Grenades! Men chucked in a couple of frags, and they heard cursing from within. The pops gave them their cue and they rushed out, engaging in another deadly firefight. Body parts were scattered on the ground from the frags, pieces of the men who didn't get out of the way fast enough. The second Jenks took a shot, something wet slapped the side of his helmet. Blood. One of his men went down, holding his shoulder. A sense of relief washed over him when he saw the man shove himself back to the door. At least he didn't lose another one. Close quarters fighting tended to be some of the worst. Two people fled the room, the last of the resistance in that area, and Jenks popped one in the back. The other took a blow to the knee and went down, spinning to return fire. The Marines took cover, exchanging shots. 
Someone finally nailed him, scoring a three-round burst that danced up the man's stomach and ended with his chin. Area secure? One of the men shouted. Jenks knew they didn't have much time. They couldn't slow their momentum for fear that they'd get boxed in, but their wounded needed a moment. Two soldiers took position at each door to guard it while Jenks moved over to the wounded guy, Martel, and crouched beside him. How is it? Pretty bad, Martel replied. I can't move my left arm. I want you to dig in over there and wait for us to finish the op, Jenks said. Corporal Sampson, stay with him. Can I speak to you for a moment? Samson asked. Please? Jenks took the corporal aside. What is it? You're going to need every gun in there, Samson said. This has been some dirty fighting and we've got to press on to that corps to take it over. These rebels aren't just upstarts. They're trained military men. We might even need some reinforcements from the ship, to be perfectly honest. Jenks weighed the man's suggestion and nodded. I don't want Martell here alone. Let's see what we can do and what the ship says. Thanks for your opinion, Samson. Cover the area. Yes, sir. Jenks got on the comm and contacted the ship, tapping his foot as it took a few moments to connect. This is Giant Control. Please come in. This is Sergeant Jenks aboard the space station. We've encountered heavy resistance and have casualties and wounded. We're going to need some backup. This is far worse than Intel suggested. Stand by. Jenks grunted, annoyed at the casual tone. Considering what they were going through, he wanted some more urgency. A sense of concern or anything other than the direct way that person talked. He wasn't calling to pay a bill. He needed some damn help to avoid more deaths. This mission grated on his nerves. This is the Lieutenant Colonel? Jenks heard the voice and practically stood up straight despite not being in the room with the man. Report? Jenks told him what happened so far in a truncated manner, getting it out quickly. We don't have a lot of time to talk or negotiate, sir. We need help yesterday. Understood. I've got another team prepped and standing by. Sergeant Walsh and his platoon will join you shortly. Can you hold out for the ten minutes it'll take for them to get to you? Jenks weighed the options and didn't have any. They might be able to press on and succeed, but it would come at a pretty high cost. If they dug in and waited for the help, they very well might be overrun in ten minutes. Still, they'd have to try and see what happened with their luck. Because it's been so damn good so far, Jenks sighed. Yes, sir, we can hold out. Just tell Walsh to get his ass here on the double. Sir? Don't worry, Sergeant. We're on it. Just hang in there. Help's on the way, Jenks called out. We just gotta hold this room until they arrive. The Marines moved into position and prepared for the longest ten minutes of their lives, and Jenks practically willed his friend to hurry. Shave some time off that clock, Walsh and I'll buy you dinner for the next six months straight. We're counting on you, man. The behemoth opened fire on the battleship, their initial salvo crashing into the enemy's shields, causing a massive flare-up that brightened the space all around them. Thanks to Durant, they didn't have nearly the recharge and would unleash another full-powered attack in less than half a minute. Damage report came back quickly on their target. The concussion of their attack caused minor systems failures and Ollie was able to provide some real-time feedback on the state of their shields. After the first attack, they knocked them down to 60%. Considering how devastating the behemoth weapons could be, they might end the fight fairly fast. Gray read the numbers and turned his attention to Clea. I'd rather disable the ship than destroy it. Options? Clea scowled at her tablet for several moments and tapped it three times. I've identified key subsystems which are easily targeted without risk of total destruction. We'd want to take their weapons and engines out, but leave the defenses as intact as possible. Without their shields, we might lose the ship from a random fighter striking them. Do you think it's possible to do what you're suggesting? Gray asked. I'm looking at what we've already done, and it seems unlikely we can be surgical. The enemy's attack struck their shields, causing the ship to rumble. They used standard pulse beams, much like the behemoths, but not even a fraction of the power. Ollie held up his hand as he checked on how badly they were hurt. He finally shook his head. 
Shields at 90% and climbing back up. Reading fire when ready, Gray said, turning back to Clea. Well? Yes, we can reduce the power of our weapons as needed, Clea replied. But I need to perform the calculations to ensure we're not wasting our time. It'll take a moment. We have the time, since we do have to reduce their overall defenses to at least below 40% to cut through the shields at precise locations. Go for it. Gray turned his attention to the reports from the other groups. The fighters had their sectors under control and were brawling the enemy ships with good results. The marines on the planet hadn't reported in yet, but that didn't mean a whole lot to him yet. If they weren't able to get a message out soon, they'd have to take action, but he trusted Marshall to do what was right. The space station was another story. The report looked grim. They called for backup and already lost some men. The intel on the station suggested minimal resistance, but the way Sergeant Jenks told it, they were fighting a well-fortified and trained occupation force. Definitely not expected, especially considering a group of thugs were supposed to have taken it over recently. I guess those criminals just paved the way for this force to get in there and cause trouble. Agatha, give the enemy one more chance to surrender peacefully, Gray said. Just after our next volley, make the call and see what they say. Hopefully they'll understand they really don't have a lot of hope against us. Sir, Ollie called out. I've got bombers incoming. I'm on it, Adam said. Automated defensive guns are ready, but I'm having Ravente take those guys out before they get too close. Sounds good. Those might be a real problem, even if our enemies here aren't proving much of a challenge. Clea spoke up. Durant states that the generators are holding fast and are performing at peak performance. Our recharge rate is nearly tripled what it was before his enhancements. Redding, you should practically be able to fire nonstop. The time between blasts will be less than 15 seconds. Gray exchanged a wide-eyed glance with Adam. Well, that sure would have been nice when we faced the enemy near Earth. Can't argue with those numbers, Adam said. Hammer them, Redding. Aye, sir, firing another volley now. Let me know when those fighters have engaged the bombers, Gray said. I want to know the second we're clear of those guys. It's a stress we don't need. They're redirecting our forces now, Adam replied. ETA less than a minute. Sounds good. Everything's under control, folks. Let's keep it that way. Megan and her wing took down the forces around them and were about to engage some incoming fighters from the battleship. She checked her messages, hoping for something from Tiger Wing, but they hadn't reported yet. They were formed up, ready to dive into action when Ravente piped into her helmet. We need to redirect Panther Wing to take out a squadron of bombers en route to the behemoth. Disengage your current targets and take the new ones out. Sir, did you find out what the enemy is escorting? Megan asked. Are you sure we should be letting it go? Tiger's on it. Get those bombers or it won't matter to us. Megan cursed under her breath. Panther, we've been redirected to take out some bombers. Follow my lead as we get out of here. She redirected her fighter, following the course Ravente plotted for them. She checked the scanner and frowned. Sure enough, five large and slow-moving ships were moving toward the behemoth, escorted by four fighters. She highlighted them for the rest of her crew, assigning the lower four to take out the maneuverable ships while she and the others went after the heavier of them. Scans indicated the bombers were heavily armored with powerful shields spawned from a reinforced separate generator. They weren't close enough to one another for a single blast to take multiple ships out either. This meant they were going to be dropping missiles and a whole lot of pulse blasts to put their targets down. You worrying about what I am? Mick asked. Probably, Megan said. These guys look pretty tough. We'll find out in 25 seconds. Enemy fighters are breaking from their escorts, Lieutenant Tullifson said. We're moving to engage. Panthers two through four stay on me. Five through eight, you know what to do with those fighters. Megan sighed. We'll rendezvous with the following coordinates. Stay sharp. We've got this. Ravente's voice filled her helmet again, and she nearly snapped at him that it wasn't a good time. Megan, we know what they're escorting. Kind of busy, Esteban. It's a bomb, and they seem to be heading toward the space station our marines are on. The hair on the back of Megan's neck stood up. Any idea why? Intel suggests they're going to attempt to knock the station out of orbit and put it on the capital. Christ, 
Are our allies going to do anything about it? They're trying, and Tiger's doing their part, but when you finish those bombers, I want you back in that area ASAP. Got it? Megan shook her head. Yeah, I've got it, but this isn't going to be a fast fight. These things are tough. Understood. Do what you can and back up Tiger. I'm launching more ships now, including the bombers. Great. We could use all the help we can get. Thanks, Esteban. I've got to focus on shooting things now. Megan's targeting computer zeroed in on the first bomber just as they started firing turrets back at them. She pulled up, dodging the blasts as they blurred past her. The others around her did the same as the enemy fighters disengaged from their charges and fell out to meet the rest of Panther Wing. Mick dropped down low beneath her, firing at one of the bombers. The shields flared but didn't go down, and the ship kept moving at a methodical, deliberate pace. Megan took a couple pot shots, but she couldn't maintain a steady course with them still shooting at her. She climbed, then spun, working on a firing solution away from the turrets. Unfortunately, the bombers had some on the top and bottom. It gave them an incredible firing arc, and they may have been using AI to guide them. Megan called for her team to fall back out of range, to regroup so they might make another push at their targets with a different tactic in mind. They're hyper-accurate, Flight Lieutenant David Benning, Panther 3, called out. They snagged me five times, shields held. One of them shot down my missile, Flight Lieutenant Shelley Brown added. Took it out before it even got close. Okay, we have to overwhelm them then, Megan said. Form up and concentrate all firepower on my target. We'll take him down, then spin around for the others. If you can, focus on the engines. Hopefully, that'll at least slow them down enough to keep the behemoth safe. Bombs away, Mick shouted. One of them lets him go. Panthers seven and eight, Megan said. Take out that ordinance before it reaches its destination. The rest of you follow the plan and let's take care of this. Now. They formed up and hit their burners, firing the second they were in range. The turrets unloaded, but the combined firepower of four fighters easily overwhelmed the shields and caused a reactor explosion. Panther Wing pulled up and rocketed away with blasts following them from the other ships. I was hit, Mick said. Checking systems. Me too, Shelley added. No damage. One down, Megan said, letting out a sigh. Four more to go. Where the hell's our backup? You called for some assistance? Wing Commander Rudy Hale piped into their communications, one of the leaders of a bomber wing. Megan checked the scanner and saw his unit incoming. We thought you might need some help with the bombers before we go help Tiger. These guys can take a lot of punishment, Rudy, Megan said. And they've already fired off some bombs. Your guys seem to be on them, Rudy replied. Yep, they just took them down, but let's not give these guys another chance, huh? Megan watched as the bombers engaged, lumbering closer with their own massive turrets. The superior technology tipped the scales, and Megan redirected her team to hit the bombers from the rear. In a crossfire, the bombers couldn't react to all the threats. One by one, they took them down, turning them to bulbs of orange-white fire. The other members of Panther rejoined them. Fighter threat eliminated. Wait, Rudy called. One of the bombers got through. He's about to fire. I'm on it. Megan hit her afterburners, screaming toward her target fast enough to be pressed into her seat. As she approached, she saw the blue glow of its engines and the bombs dropping from the bottom of the craft. She dropped down, avoiding some turret fire and let loose a barrage of pulse blasts, aiming for the ordnance. The bomber tried to dodge, but it didn't have the maneuverability. Her shots caught the enemy's payload and knocked out the propulsion. The impact must have been enough to make it think it reached its destination because the resounding explosion annihilated the bomber and the shockwave made Megan's shields flare up dramatically. Whoa, she spun away, heading back toward the others. I did not expect that. You should have, Rudy said, considering what you just shot. Come on, we've got to stop this thing from getting to the space station. I hope you're a better escort than these guys had. Sergeant Dylan Walsh led two shuttles worth of troops to the space station, plowing through a massive battle area of fighters and capital ships duking it out. Their fighter escort was stretched thin, 
with only two vessels attached to them. Still, they had turrets, and that seemed to be enough to get them through. They performed a hot dock, which meant they didn't slow down until the last possible second. The thrusters engaged, forcing them all deep into their seats as the G-force intensified. One of the pilots called back and let them know they'd be ready to deploy in less than ten seconds. Walsh wished they'd have taken thirty to ensure they didn't die before arrival. The shuttle shook as they made contact with the docking arm, and something hissed as they sealed the connection. Go, go, go. The pilot finally found some passion and started yelling at them. We've got the next ship incoming, so establish your beachhead as quickly as possible. Walsh hurried his men out and followed them through the airlock and into the cargo bay they'd found. He deployed his marines to lock the area down as he established a calm connection with Jenks, buying some time for the others to arrive before they charged into the facility in full force. You there? Sergeant Jenks, respond? We're here. Jenks' voice was accompanied by gunfire. We're locked down by an enemy force, but dug in fairly well. They're not likely to take our position, but we've got wounded. How long before you get here, Walsh? Walsh checked the layout of the space station and set the most direct route to get to the other Marines. He cursed. It'll take about a minute at double time. I don't know if we can do that considering how hot this place is, Jenks. You've got to hold out, man. I'll get there as quickly as I can. I recommend you take two directions. That way you might not entirely get locked down like we did. Understood. We'll see you soon, buddy. Walsh quickly scanned for a secondary route, one which might have intersected with the route the previous team already had taken. Chances were better they might already be clear of hostile forces. The computer ran through a dozen scenarios before finally showing him a solution, one which would take the platoon through a number of corridors with minimal need for elevators or stairs. All right, Bravo, you take the route I just uploaded to your HUDs. Alpha, with me. Watch your fire and keep your comms hot. We might be meeting in the middle. Regardless of what you encounter, remember that we're in a rush here, but not at the expense of your lives. We want to get there quick and alive. Got it? The Marines all shouted together, and the two teams went their separate ways, Alpha to the right with Bravo going left. Walsh allowed one of his men to take point as he coordinated the efforts from somewhere near the back. Scans were spotty on the station, as if something were trying to block them, but couldn't quite take the signal down completely. They made it nearly to the end of the hallway before Walsh heard a familiar word. Contact front. Guns went off, heavy fire that caused the Marines to burst through the doors and take cover. They exchanged shots with someone down the hall. Someone chucked a grenade toward the enemy, shouting, Flashbang out! The grenade popped and Walsh's visor instantly reacted, protecting his eyes from the blast. Whoever was at the end of the hall started wailing, but none of the Marines advanced. Instead, one took careful aim and fired several shots. The next cries of pain were certainly real, and the person went silent a moment later. Clear? The Marines pushed on, passing by three bodies sprawled in the area. They hustled, picking up the pace even as they knew they'd encounter reinforcements further in. Jenks hit the comm and let Walsh know it was getting worse. The enemy were overrunning their position and they didn't have long. Damn it. Walsh wanted to throw caution to the wind, but it wouldn't do anyone any good. They needed to get there when they could, and that meant engaging the enemy along the way. He checked the progress of Bravo, but they were having the same luck. They conducted a firefight in a hallway, tearing through the enemy but not quickly enough to make a difference. New plan, Walsh called to his guys. Ethan and Orin, get to the edge of the station and plant some high-yield explosives. The kind that will open this place up like a tin can. Sir, Ethan sounded nervous. Um, they're going to read that you're doing it and it should draw their attention. They don't want to die after all. It might distract some of their forces. Plant the bombs, then get the hell out of there. You won't want to face what's going to come your way. But what if they go off? Put in a safety, Walsh said. Do whatever you have to in order to keep us all alive, but I want that distraction and I need it now. Got it? Yes, sir. The two men ran off back the way they came, and the Marines pressed on with two less in their ranks. I hope that works, or I just handicapped us for no reason. They rounded a corner, and their point man, Rikes, took a grazing shot to the shoulder. His armor deflected the damage, 
but he leaned against the wall and fired back, catching his attacker in the face. The man's head snapped backward and he collapsed to the ground, quite dead. A moment of chaos consumed the hallway as they started a running gun battle, luckily in the correct direction. By the time they reached the end of the hallway, two enemies threw their hands up to surrender, five of their buddies lying dead around them. Walsh cursed under his breath. They didn't have time for prisoners, especially when they couldn't trust whether they'd behave themselves. What's going on here? Walsh asked. Why is this place so heavily defended? We don't know, the first one said. We were ordered to keep it locked down, so that's what we're doing. Cuff them and leave them here, Walsh said. Make it quick. We have to hurry. The men were bound up and the Marines once again pushed on. He checked on Bravo and saw they were getting close to their destination. They might make it before them, in fact. He reached out to Jenks, but the man didn't answer the calm. You'd better not be dead, man. I will take it real personal if you died. Bravo, I'm not picking up our guys on comm, can you? We haven't tried and we're a little busy at the moment, Sarge. Walsh clenched his fist and moved on, coming to the stairs they needed to ascend. Two men led the way, clearing the next landing and holding position at the door. They stacked up and breached, moving in with guns blazing. An enemy went down before he could even lift his weapon and another ran for the door, three rounds stitching his back. Grenade! One of his men shouted and they all dove for cover. The resounding explosion didn't have much impact on them in their environmental suits, but it tossed a table in the air, which landed on one of the Marines, pinning his leg. Walsh rolled on his side, taking aim just as one of the enemies shot the struggling soldier in the head three times. Son of a bitch. Walsh capped him in the forehead and chest, but it was too late. His guy was already down. Secure this room, now! A couple Marines engaged in hand-to-hand -hand melee combat, struggling to restrain a number of the wild enemies. Walsh himself was jumped by a guy who swung a crowbar, whacking him in the shoulder twice. They rolled around on the ground before Walsh pulled his sidearm and unloaded several rounds point-blank into the man's kidney. The guy jerked three times and fell on the ground, blood spilling out of his mouth. As Walsh regained his feet, his men seemed to have gained control of the situation. In all, nine enemies were dead and two Marines. Christ, we're down to five of us out here. Ethan, Oren, did you get the bombs planted? Walsh called over the comm as they got moving again. Yes, sir, Ethan replied, and I think it did the trick because we're being pursued through the outer ring of the station. Keep them on the move and do not engage. We'll meet up with you when we finish our primary objective. Just stay alive. Walsh checked Bravo again, and they were at the final corridor before reaching Jenks's position. He took a deep breath and prayed privately, even as they rushed along to the last stretch of their own trip. Gunfire sounded up ahead, and it sounded like theirs. Is that coming from Bravo or Jenks? Hard to tell. Jenks, he called on the comm again. Can you hear me? You almost hear, Jenks replied, filling Walsh with some relief. I swear you assholes are seriously slow. Wow, glad to see you're feeling appreciative. Scans flickered, but he counted more than 20 enemies in the surrounding areas. Bravo engaged their side. Five men seemed pretty risky to jump into such a mess, but they did have the element of surprise, and more importantly, they were taking their opponents in the flank. The Marines approached a door, and beyond that was a corridor where the enemy soldiers held up and fired into the room that Jenks and his men dug in. When the Marines breached, they would be in the thick of the enemy soldiers. They stacked up and drew grenades, cooking them just before busting in. This should even the odds. The first guy opened the door. Fire in the hole, Walsh muttered as the rest of his men threw their payloads in. The door closed again and bedlam occurred on the other side. Shouts, panic, terror. They came out in equal measure as the victims tried to flee the resounding explosions. Unfortunately for them, the grenades only sat idle for two seconds. Not enough time to escape. When the pops went off, sounds of meat slapping the walls followed. Then the screams turned from fear to outright agony. Guns went off as they seemed to fire randomly. More shots happened elsewhere and the place appropriately sounded like a war zone. Walsh nodded to his men and they opened the door, 
stepping in to finish off those still holding weapons. Jenks, we've got the Western Hall, Walsh said. Please stop shooting in that direction. This is Bravo, the voice came over the comm. We've got the eastern side and the southern side seems to be clear as well. The people there must have went after Ethan and Orin. You two still okay? Walsh asked. Hustling it, Orin replied, but we're fine for now. We'd like to lead them your way? ETA to this spot? Three minutes? You heard them, men. We've got three minutes to set up a welcome party. Tend to the wounded and dig in. Get ready for the final fight here. I'm pretty sure when we take care of this, there won't be anyone left to mess with us. Walsh hurried into the room and found Jenks pressed up against the wall, blood smeared all over his left shoulder. Is that yours? Jenks nodded. Took a shot. There are only four of us left combat effective. I think I'll be fine. You sure? That looks pretty bad. I shoot with my right hand? And steady with that left? Walsh shook his head. Motion? Jenks moved his arm and shrugged. Armor helped a little. Lucky shot to get you so dead on. Up to you, man, but I'd sit it out. Jenks laughed. No, you wouldn't. He crawled to his feet. Let's shore up these wounded and take the rest of these pricks out. We've got a mission to finish. By all means, Hercules. Let's get going. Chapter 7 Tully? Hoffner yelled into the comm. You're at the three-minute mark. Are you blowing the doors or what? I need a no-BS estimate. Now! I got through the protocols, Tully replied. Just another moment. Define a moment. It's relative to how distracted I am, sir, Tully grunted. Less than a minute. Hoffner peered out the door and watched the troop transports drawing closer. They were as big as Lorenz suggested two of them coming in and ready for action. Each probably had the capacity to hold more than twenty men. He only hoped the Orion's light idiots didn't happen to have enough guys on the planet to throw at them. It better be, Hoffner's eyes narrowed. Geralt, get those explosives outside. Let's give them a quick welcome before they're in firing range. A moment later, Geralt came hurrying into the lobby and rushed outside. He set up several large charges and retreated back into the base, long before the ships arrived. Their estimate of their speed turned out to be somewhat exaggerated, but not by too much. As they began a landing sequence, Tully reported that he got the door open. Hoffner heard an exchange of gunfire and someone screaming. His heart raced for a moment before Tully's voice crackled over the comm. Room's clear. I'm establishing a link to the ship and jamming all enemy signals. Fine work. Hoffner directed the other Marines to get into firing position. As these guys come in through the door, you have to hold. Geralt, make sure they think twice about running in here. I'll be back. I just need to access the computer and get us some help. Be back shortly. Hoffner ran down the hall, slowing as he approached the computer room. Four bodies were piled up off to the side, presumably the men hiding out who wouldn't open up. Tully nodded to him as he approached and gestured to the screen. He saw a percentage meter rapidly climbing, approaching 100%. As it finished, Hoffner stepped forward and tapped his own comm, checking if the interference cleared. He felt a wave of relief hit him as Marshall's voice piped over the line. What's been going on down there, Captain? We haven't heard from you in a while. I expected more frequent reports. We took the power facility, Hoffner said, but they jammed us until just now. We're about to be sieged by a lot of guys. He checked the scanner now that it worked and cursed. Looks like 30 total. They're all Orion's light down here. They held this place right under the noses of both the rebels and the military. I wondered, Marshall sighed. Tap the computer and send me any security data it might have. I want to see what happened when they lost the facility. I'm sending down some support as well. The second part of your mission might not matter much, so get ready for an extract if absolutely necessary. Why wouldn't it matter? Hoffner asked. That sounds suspicious. The rebels are flying a bomb to one of the space stations. If they succeed and that thing hits orbit, it's going to be a catastrophic event. People aren't going to be worrying about food at that point. Don't worry, I'll keep you up to date. Just stay alive and get me that data ASAP. 
We'll talk again soon. We're transmitting the information now, Hoffner replied. Talk soon. He turned to Tully. See what you can do with the computer. I'll leave someone to watch your back, but the rest of you are with me. Let's repel these assholes until our relief gets here. Do you really think they're trying to destroy the planet? Tully asked. That seems pretty extreme, even for rebels. I was under the impression those people wanted to take the place over and not wipe it out. Hoffner shrugged. If Orion's light is involved, it's hard to say what they'll be willing to do, or why. We've got work to do. Get to it. The engines from the incoming ships started shaking the building before Hoffner returned to the lobby. As he arrived, the shadows blocked out the sun as they flanked the place, setting down away from the front door. At least they have the sense not to disembark right in front of us. Still, they have to get past our defenses, and that'll be a challenge. Clearly, these guys wanted to take the facility back for whatever reason, or they would have just shelled it from the sky. They'd have time to discover what was so important later, unless Tully figured it out during the fight. Hoffner knew there was data Command wanted, but the enemy's response to them taking the facility helped define its importance. The sound of Orion's light battle language sounded from their left. Hoffner took cover behind a metal desk with good visibility of the door and some of the courtyard. He aimed down the scope on his weapon, allowing it and his HUD to gather information about his potential shot. He knew that to the fence, he had exactly 50 yards, and that to compensate, he'd need to aim less than a quarter inch higher with his weapon to score a hit. Scans from his helmet indicated the enemy were just around the corner, taking cover and preparing their breach. Hoffner hoped Geralt was ready to give them their surprise prior to them busting out something nefarious like grenades. Or worse, shoulder-mounted weaponry. He didn't know how much of the facility they needed intact. They might only care about the computers that Tully was working on. Hold your fire, Hoffner said. Let Geralt's handiwork greet them before we take some shots. A couple scouts came through first, tentatively testing the ground as they walked. They held their weapons low, ready to hip fire. Spreading out, each man's head was on a swivel as they must have felt the danger pressing against them. Another head peeked around the corner, some curious fool who didn't want to wait for a report. Lawrence, what have you got? Hoffner asked. Full contingent of troops. They seem to have all left their ships except the pilots. You've got two in the courtyard and two about to enter behind them. Geralt? When those other four come in, blow the explosives, Hoffner scowled. Lawrence, when the explosions go off, see if you can't take someone that looks important. Oh, I've got their leader targeted, sir. Coordinate. Hoffner watched as the next two enemies entered the courtyard. They drew closer to their companions, quicker than they should have, for sure. Geralt counted backward from three. The resounding explosion when he got to zero shook the walls. It was loud enough to easily mask Lorenz's shot. Officer down, Lorenz said. Body parts landed in various places around the massive pits created by the bombs, four men totally destroyed. This prompted the invaders to aim around the corners into the courtyard and open fire, blindly taking large bursts in their direction. Hoffner called out to his team to remain calm, to let them waste ammo. A few rogue shots made their way inside, but they didn't get close to the cover the Marines were in. They'd have to make a move sooner than later, and when they did, they'd discover their mistake in trying to take the place in a frontal assault. Hoffner's team simply needed to be patient. Sir, Tully called out, I know why they want this place back so bad, and you're not going to be happy. Yeah, I'm not surprised. What have you got? They were rigging this place to go up, Tully said. And let me tell you, it would pack a punch. We're talking... He paused. I mean, huge. Like ruin this entire region bad. The radiation alone would take decades to clean up, if not longer. I'm trying to disarm it, which pretty much means shutting the reactor off safely. That'll take a little time. Couple that with the station coming down and this planet would be devastated. Hoffner shook his head. Makes it all the more important to not let them take this place. Okay, folks, you have the stakes now. We have to buy Tully time and keep these guys busy. This is a failure is not an option kind of situation, so put your game face on. 
It hasn't mattered nearly so much until now. Clea received the data from the surface, which meant Hoffner's people managed to take the power plant's control station. Security footage flooded her screen, and she ran a program to search for images of Trellin. As that happened, she glanced up at the view screen in time to see the enemy battleship get hammered as another salvo battered its shields. Adam reported that the bomber threat had been neutralized and that the fighters were on the way to prevent the next catastrophe. Agatha called out that their enemies didn't respond to requests for their surrender, so the fight continued and promised to get a lot worse for the enemy. Checking the casualty reports, they weren't coming away unscathed, but compared to their other missions, they were proving the superior force by far. Her computer alerted her to finding Trellin, and she watched a moment of the footage. The man helped them take the area and lower the security for the station, but there was more going on there. The military took out most of his force, then Orion's light showed up. They occupied the facility and took Trellin captive, which made him the only survivor. How'd you pull that off? A lack of audio made it so she had no clue what he might have said, if anything. Maybe they just wanted another conscript. If so, mission accomplished. He got where he needed to be, but something told her that there was a lot more going on than met the eye. A few moments later, she received the report that they rigged the facility to explode. Fantastic. They want to completely annihilate this planet's ability to feed itself. Such a blow wouldn't destroy the culture completely, but it would be a demoralizing blow. Their colonies would live on, and yet the loss of something so cherished as their point of origin was unacceptable. The worst part was they didn't know what was about to happen, and if the plan did transpire, they'd likely blame the rebels who might not feel bad about it, but they shouldn't take the blame for something they didn't do. Marshall reported in. Adam's voice distracted her and she perked up to listen. He states that the reinforcements on the station have met up and they're once again pushing to the control center, but the opposition is intense. They're really putting up a fight. At first they thought it was the military rebels, but Marshall's starting to think it's someone else. Orion's light? Gray shook his head. Must be, right? Probably. They're fighting like demons, and we know those guys don't like to give up. Even when it's advantageous to do so. Gray turned to Clea. What have you got? Good news. Clea sent him a quick text to indicate what she'd discovered. At least as far as the mission's concerned. Possibly. Gray nodded. Yes, they might have killed him. Some news is better than no news. Do we know if they got their hands on the weapon schematics yet? Once they take the command center of the space station, we'll be able to find out. Clea tapped at her console. I still can't access anything. They need to open up the connection relays again and give me access. Anything Ollie can help with? Clea looked over at the lieutenant and shook her head. He's a little busy right now, sir. Besides, if the connections aren't open, it doesn't matter how good you are with computers. You're not getting in. Understood, Gray cleared his throat. Damage report on the battleship? Ollie answered. Their shields are at 30% and they've taken some pretty heavy damage here and there. We're ready to reduce power on the weapons for some more surgical strikes. What about our damage? Adam asked. We've had a few system shorts from concussion damage, Ollie said, and three people are in the hospital from being burned during those events, but otherwise, we're doing well. Nothing that we can't fix as we go here. Their weapons are genuinely unable to pierce our defenses. Good news. Gray stood up and was about to say something else when Ollie interrupted. Sir, I'm picking up another ship coming in. Another capital ship? The other battleship they boasted about? Gray asked. Ollie shook his head. No, this is a different make entirely. Wait, it's an Orion's light ship, sir. It's moving into attack range. Great, Adam grumbled. We get to take on two at once now. Again. Maybe not, Clea pointed. Look. They watched the view screen as the Orion's light vessel, all black and bristling with weapons, opened fire on the battleship, laying into it with one of their dreaded continuous beam cannons. The shields flared, then random explosions began appearing all over the hull of the waylaid vessel. Their systems are at 50%. Ollie shouted, 20, 
Reactor is critical. No. Gray clenched his fist, stepping forward. Fire at the Orion's light. Warn them off. Redding redirected and opened fire, but it was too late. The battleship went up in a massive blue-white globe, and as the light faded, nothing remained of the ship at all. Everyone on board and any of their own fighters within close proximity were gone. Clea checked and felt a shimmer of relief that none of their own pilots happened to be close by. They just hopped in and took them out, Gray muttered. Why? Wasn't starting the conflict enough? They had to intervene and kill the people they riled up? We can be blamed, Adam said. It'll just be ammo against us when this fight's over. Any anti-alliance faction might say we used extreme measures if these jerks get away, or worse, blow us up. That has to be why they did it. A PR move that involves snuffing out a lot of lives. Despicable. They're moving to engage, Ollie said. Looks like they want to fulfill your prophecy, Gray said to Adam. Clea, you didn't start the process of throttling back the weapons, did you? No, sir, they're still at full power. Gray nodded. Redding, let's meet them head on. Get up there and fire. Yes, sir. Redding engaged the engines. Weapons are prepared and thrusters are full. Estimated time to firing solution? 60 seconds. Gray continued. Ensign Marcus, get us a micro-jump course. I want a flanking position if we need it. I'm on it. We're being hailed, Agatha said. The Orion's light ship wants a word? Clea watched the muscles tighten in Gray's face as he scowled. Ignore it for now. I'd like them to see what we think of their attack on the battleship before we have words. I'm thinking a little emphasis to our position might make them more amiable when I ask for their surrender. Rudy checked his scanners and saw what they were racing toward. A large freighter pulling a massive cargo container, something too big even for it to fit inside. They probably didn't need the engine power to pull the thing, but even with the extra thrust, they weren't moving too fast, which was lucky. If they'd moved any faster, the behemoth crew would not have been able to catch up and stop them before they wiped out the station. The extra complication came from the fact that several of the behemoth's marines were performing an op on the space station. If Rudy and his people didn't stop the attack, they'd lose not only the planet, but crewmates as well. I'd love a mission that didn't involve all the pressure. Scans picked up the escorts, two wings of fighters. One was already engaged with Tiger, but the other remained attached to their charge. When the bombers drew closer, though, they'd have to break formation, and once they did, the dogfighting would kick in. Rudy's bomber crew had decent defenses and might be able to fend them off, but nothing compared to Megan's team watching their backs. I hope you see those guys, Rudy said. Your team ready? We're already ready, Megan replied. You watched us out there. We're a little low on missiles, but that's why we have pulse cannons, right? I'll take it real personal if you don't come back, so, you know. Yeah, I got it, Rudy. Besides, I think we've got this one. Half of us will stay with you while we break formation and attack. Good luck. See you back at the ship. Rudy watched four of the Panther fighters rocket off while the others continued to escort the eight bombers in his wing. Their target was close enough for a visual confirmation of the payload. They wouldn't have any trouble taking it down with the ordnance they packed. He took a brief second to take in the sight, the sheer immensity of everything going on. Behind them, the behemoth battled a massive battleship. Off to his right, he saw their allies, the legitimate government, in a heavy battle with a fleet of civilian ships and smaller destroyers. Even though it was taking place in the same system, it would take hours to fly from one side of the battle to the other, which is why it had been sectioned out so profoundly. His targeting computer snapped him out of it, letting him know they had less than ten seconds before they'd be in range of the enemy's weapons. He squinted through his cockpit, peering at the battle commencing between Panther and the other fighters. Megan's team really utilized their new inertial dampeners, practically flying circles around their opponents. Here we go. The bombers were equipped with particularly nasty shields and heavy armor. A couple of blasts tended to be inevitable, so they had to be able to take them. As they closed in, everything seemed to speed up. 
Their approach felt rapid. Bombs were ready to fly. Rudy gripped his controls tightly and focused. Pulse blasts flew past him, nearly scorching his ship several times. They didn't have the luxury of juking out of the way or maneuvering like the fighters did. The biggest difference between the two types of pilots was how they approached combat. Bombers needed to have serious nerves to allow attacks to nearly or flat out hit them. Fighters couldn't afford the same luxury. They had to be twitchy. Rudy let the turrets start on their side of the business. The AI had been upgraded by Durant, and they were supposed to be better shots. As they drew closer, and some of the enemy fighters risked both attacks from Panther Wing and the automated defenses of the bomber, Rudy realized he'd get a first-hand view of just how much better his tech had become. Pulse blasts started lighting up the area all around him. A direct hit made his shields flare, but they held. His turret fired until his entire cockpit warmed up, and an explosion off his bow made him wince. One of the enemy had been taken down, obliterated by a solid turret hit to the thrusters. Okay, so they did a serious upgrade after all. Well done, Durant. I like it. We're in range, Rudy reported. Deploying proximity and impact in 15 seconds. Calculating shockwave and transmitting to friendly fighters now. The math came out rough. When their bombs went off, they'd all need to be a serious distance away to avoid damage from the concussive blast coming from the attack. Furthermore, there was no way to know that the bombs wouldn't detonate the massive thing they were taking to the space station. That unknown factor meant they needed to be even further away. Rudy plotted a course back for his wing to take them well out of the range of the assault. As the countdown to deployment commenced, a series of blasts hammered his side. An enemy fighter screamed by overhead, followed closely by one of the Panthers. He watched just long enough to see friendly pulse cannons vaporize his attacker. Turrets wouldn't have been able to keep up with that guy even after the upgrade. Man, these are fast. An explosion to his left caught his attention, an engine on one of the other bombers. I'm okay, the pilot reported. Switching to backup now, but can someone get this thing off me? My turret's having a hell of a time. Rudy directed his own to help, and that gave a little extra incentive to keep away. By default, they were programmed to respond to immediate threats to the ship, to save on power for unnecessary blasts aiming at something they could not possibly hit. This time, they were close enough to make a difference. As they hammered away at the opponent, Rudy's computer went off and he flipped the switches to release his payload. The bombs rocketed away, flying far faster than any fighter should be able to. They went dark some 30 meters out, programmed to only initiate thrusters if necessary for course corrections. It made them nearly impossible to track by fighters because they weren't giving off any particular heat. They had to adjust scanners to find the explosives, which took time. Time the bombs needed to find their target and take it out. Each bomber reported back to Rudy when they finished, and as a unit, they spun around and headed back for the safety of the behemoth. Still pursued, Rudy cursed under his breath and checked his scans. Four fighters still managed to harass them, flying around like gnats taking pot shots. He sent a quick message to Megan, letting her know how long she had before the bombs went off, but also to get some help. You're not being much of an escort right now. Hey, we've got other problems too, Megan replied. And Tiger needed our help. They're on their way back too. We'll all team up on your four problems and solve them together. One of the ships moved in behind Rudy, casually dodging his turret fire. When the bastard shot back, his pulse blasts riddled his aft. The shields flared up, but after five shots and a little dodging, he still found himself at 10% shield. Christ, this guy really wants a piece of me. Other bombers moved closer, firing at the attacker, but he dropped low and sped off. Rudy watched his scans, noting that Megan herself went after him, diving into action. He craned his neck to see the momentary fight. The enemy tried to climb and spin away. Megan met his motion and fired three quick shots. The new pulse blasts went right over his bow, and he tried to compensate, directly into a barrage of fire which tore through his shields and lit up his reactor. The ship erupted in a ball of flame, and Megan returned to formation with them. 
just moments before the bombs were set to detonate. Here comes the biggest boom this sector's known in a long time, Rudy said. Let's hope that's true, Megan replied. Because if that space station had gone down, I'm pretty sure they'd have a competitor. The bombs went off. The cargo ship was instantly annihilated, blown to little more than dust. Its cargo, the massive bomb itself, also went off. It must have been set to impact. When it did, it caused such a shockwave, any floating debris some thousands of kilometers out would likely be set in motion. Hell, that was big enough to nudge a small moon if it had been close to one. Rudy noted that it was rapidly approaching them but losing steam. This is still going to hurt. I recommend everyone hit their afterburners, Rudy shouted into the comm. Now? As the pilots braced for the impending impact, Megan sent a message for all of them to set their shields to double back. At least they'd have some defense against what was coming. They also spread out in case they lost some control. A friendly collision would be a terrible punctuation to the end of the mission. Tiger Wing pulled ahead, down two fighters. In the back of Rudy's mind, he realized that the shockwave might well kill anyone who had ejected during the mission. They might have just lost friends, and there was nothing they could do about it. He steeled himself for the news to come, just as the wave struck them from behind. His computer started buzzing out an alarm, letting him know about the unintended turbulence. Thanks. I feel it in the controls. He fought to keep a straight path, but was jostled some twenty degrees off course. The others were also tossed about, but when it passed them, he noted he had no additional damage. I think the shield trick worked. Some of their ships would need some serious repairs, especially considering how badly they'd been shot up, but everyone made it home on his wing. Cleanup is going to be awful in this area. He checked the roster and noted at least half a dozen ships hadn't reported back to control. Those commanders are going to have a seriously rough time. We're going in for a landing for repair and reload, Rudy said. What about you, Panther? Megan replied. We're out here for the duration, it looks like, but we'll see you soon enough. Thanks for the assist with that bomb. Anytime. Be safe. Rudy turned his attention to the behemoth. All right, folks, let's get home and see if they have anything else they want us to blow up. I'm pretty sure we've got a few more bombs laying around in the hangar bay. Clea shook her head, frustrated at the data she uncovered. She took the scan data from Ollie's work and ran some reports, showing Orion's light activity throughout the sector. They seemed to be working directly with the rebels, even after they attacked the battleship, but some of their signatures were found in the legitimate government's fleets as well. How are we going to root them out completely? They've infested this place. Maybe Dubaris can help. I hope he believes us. Trellin probably hadn't realized how high his chances were of encountering the light in this system. Any operation would have involved some of them either in the background monitoring the situation or being straight up involved. The ground crews were fighting them, but the space station seemed to be ex-military. As far as we know for now, I need the data to see if they got what they were after up there. She checked on the reports from the Marines and sighed. They were still fighting their way to the command center. That place was under pretty heavy siege, too, with all the people they sent. How many military people were on board? Clea figured the rebels also wanted the weapon schematics and sent a large crew to get it. When they arrived, they likely found the place undefended. Those criminals Trellin worked with supposedly killed a lot of people during their raid. And with the security protocols dropped from the surface, anyone could board and do whatever they wanted. The behemoth proved it by landing their own people without incident. The only easy part of the mission, sadly. No one thought they'd encounter so much resistance. They opened fire on the Orion's light ship, directing all of Clea's attention to the new fight. She watched as their opponents attempted to move closer, probably preparing to fire their cannon to see about stripping the behemoth's shields. They showed a valuable piece of intel in that the terrorist organization as a whole wasn't sharing information quickly. Otherwise, they'd know better than to try the tactic with the behemoth. Get ready for a micro jump, Gray said. When they're in range for their cannon, put us behind them. I want you to unleash hell on them as soon as we appear. 
Yes, sir, Redding acknowledged. Our first barrage definitely woke them up. They're moving a little faster. I estimate we've got one more in us before we'll have to react to their attack. As long as you're ready, Gray replied. Ollie, give us a countdown to their attack. Fifteen seconds, Ollie said, at most. That's plenty of time to hit them again, Adam said. Give them everything, Redding. By the time we jump and reappear, the recharge will be complete. Redding fired again, another massive salvo that battered the Orion's light, causing their shields to erupt in a massive flare of white. They turned midway through the assault, giving them a different section to strike as they did so. They closed the distance a little more, and as they did so, Ollie gestured sharply at the screen. They're firing, Gray nodded. Redding, initiate the jump. Yes, sir. Redding tapped her console and the ship trembled and a brief moment of discomfort gripped Clea's stomach. She immediately checked her personal scans and noted the course was solid but not dead on. They were just out of range from another attack and would have to close in to fire. Engaging thrusters? What happened? Adam cursed. How'd we end up so far away? Ensign Marcus? I'm sorry, sir. Marcus replied, frantically checking his console. My mistake. I didn't update the course to take into account the distance our enemy already moved. We'll talk about it later, Gray said. Redding, full speed. We have to hit them before they get turned around and can fire their weapon. We've got a short window for this advantage, folks. Make it count. Clea felt nerves grip her tightly. This type of close action never set well with her. Prior to the behemoth, she'd been assigned to tech crews, which worked deep inside the ship. While they were privy to information the rest of the ship tended not to know, they weren't informed about the tactics being employed during the fight. Knowing what they were up to made it much more real, and though she'd learned a great deal both in command school and serving aboard the behemoth, she still wasn't quite used to the back-and-forth gambles ships needed to take in order to achieve a victory. The responsibility seemed particularly heavy. Thirty seconds to distance, Clea thought. Plenty of time for anything to happen. She took a deep breath and let her anxiety out, turning her attention to the scans where she would watch the action unfold and hopefully witness a swift and positive conclusion to the battle ahead. One can certainly hope. Something caught her eye, a blip near the massive battle between the legitimate military and the rebels causing trouble. The Orion's light seemed to have gotten directly involved in that fight as well though she doubted their allies realized it. She double-checked her findings, and sure enough, a ship much like the one the behemoth faced was firing on the military. Sir, Clea turned to Gray. I need to contact Dubaris right away. Permission to open a comm channel? Granted, Gray spoke distractedly, waving his hand at her. I'm a little busy right now. Understood. Clea sent a hail, hoping the man would be able to pick up. Like Gray, he'd be busy as well, but if he didn't know what they were facing, it might not matter. Their cannon would easily tear through those ships, if it was allowed to. Maybe it was time the rebels find out they were working with terrorists. I only hope it matters to them and they back off. If they're knowingly working for them, then this civil war is already lost. Chapter 8 Walsh directed Ethan and Oren to converge on their position, leading the men they were pursued by into a trap. The plan seemed to be working, according to their scans. As they set up a firing line, their two men burst into the room and dashed to either side. When the nine enemies entered, they retreated to a full barrage of gunfire. None of them stood a chance. Each body danced from multiple gunshot wounds, and as they collapsed to the ground, their scan signatures went blank. Life signs dropped to nil, and after a quick test to ensure they'd finish them off, the Marines prepared to move out for the command center, a final push to complete their assignment. Thanks, Ethan said to Walsh as they moved. Appreciate the assist. We should be thanking you. That was quite a few less people we needed to contend with. Definitely some daring work. I appreciate it. Fall in. This should be the last bit of drama for the rest of the mission. They made their way up several flights of stairs, unchallenged until they reached the hallway leading to the command center. There, they picked up another contingency of soldiers on their scanners. 
Jenks turned to Walsh, gesturing at his own wrist computer, then tapping his head. They switched to private comms. What's up? Walsh asked. I've done a sweep of the entire space station, and there are only four other enemies on board besides these guys. They seem to be held up in non-essential sections of the station, living quarters, which means no action from them. I'm reading ten dug up in there, Walsh sighed. You don't suppose they'll surrender? Jenks chuckled. When was the last time we had something go easily? I hate your memory. Walsh squinted down the hall. Do you think we should at least give them a chance? I doubt they'd be so generous to us, but by all means it would be nice if guns hit the deck without bodies following them. Walsh clicked off the private comm and allowed his voice to be heard beyond his helmet. He shouted in his best drill instructor voice, putting every ounce of command and menace behind it as he did so. The goal was to give the enemy a real wake-up call a moment where they'd realize they would be better off complying than dying. Listen up. We've taken the entire station and we're done playing around with you idiots. Surrender now and I guarantee you'll be treated fairly. You don't, and we'll kill every last one of you here and now. Bring it. Someone shouted down the hall, firing their weapon blindly at them. Jenks shrugged, drawing a wince out of himself. Told you, man. They're lucky we don't turn off the life support, Walsh grumbled. Okay, men, you heard them. Take them out. The command center had one easy way to get in and a variety of narrow access tunnels for maintenance. No one was crawling around in those to get at the enemy without risking a bullet to the face. Tactically, they were off the list for getting around, even with stealth, because they weren't exactly subtle. The moment one of their hatches started opening, someone would know so the only way to take the station involved a frontal assault on the hallway in. With the enemy dug into the outside chamber and probably within, that meant a pretty daring battle to oust them. However, the Marines still held plenty of grenades, and as they advanced, they started using them liberally, each cooking them for maximum efficiency. As the explosions started popping within, the screams competed for the loudest noises. Two Marines went prone at the end of the hall, watching their scopes. Whenever an enemy poked out to return fire, they were treated to a double tap. The first couple missed, but when they finally got someone, they went down hard, their heads bleeding out on the floor. Walsh checked his scanner, noting that five of the ten scan signatures were already nil, and at least two more had to be injured, if not more. He called for a ceasefire, and as the guns went silent, they heard the moans and cries from within like an untended medical wing full of the dying. You guys feel like giving up now? Walsh offered. Last opportunity. Orion's light. Someone struggled to speak, but the first words made Walsh groan. Never give in to you, bastards. Jenks motioned for Walsh to press against the wall. Get ready to move. I think he's got a grenade. They heard something beeping, but it never made its way into the hall. The resounding explosion was followed by a meaty sound, and all but one signature went dark on the scanner. Walsh swallowed hard, shaking his head. The freak committed suicide rather than be treated for his wounds. Dear God. They advanced carefully inside, sweeping the area for traps. The last person was inside the command room. Hopefully he'd be cooperative. Walsh didn't see any reason to fight for a lone gunman, but considering what he'd just witnessed, he wouldn't put anything past them. Body parts were strewn about the area, lending some weight to the conviction of the terrorists. Jenks approached the door, stacking up to the side. Listen up, he called. We know there's only one of you in there. All your buddies are dead out here, so if you don't surrender, we're going to blow you away. Got it? I'm not with them the voice shouted back. They took me prisoner. Jenks turned to Walsh. What do you think? Walsh shrugged. They haven't been deceitful before. He probably is what he says. Hmm. Jenks banged on the door. How do we know you're not lying? How do I prove it? I'm unarmed and will get on my knees. My hands are up, seriously. I don't want any trouble. 
Walsh tapped the door and it opened up, revealing a bald man on his knees holding his arms in the air. His green eyes were wide but still small as he tried to make it abundantly clear he wasn't about to try anything. The Marines advanced on his position and searched him, scanning for explosives. When they found him to be clean, his hands were bound and he was pulled out. Orin, Jenks said. Get on the computer and see if they took the data. Grab anything else relevant. Who the hell are you guys? The bald man asked. What's going on? We ask the questions, Walsh said. Who are you and what are you doing here? My name's Derelict. I'm an entrepreneur. Uh-huh, Jenks shook his head. Is that code for thief or pirate? I can't tell. I admit, I've taken things in the past that might have been of dubious ownership, but I'm mostly a businessman, respected even. With a name like Derelict, Walsh said, how could you not be? Were you here stealing data? Jenks asked. Weapon schematics? Um, is there some self-incrimination clause I can hide behind? Walsh cocked his weapon. Okay, okay. Yes, we were here for the schematics. And did your friends get them? Jenks prompted. And leave you here to rot? Derelict's head dropped. Orion's Light did all this. They killed the rest of my crew and left me here to rot. That bastard new guy betrayed us, I swear. So many jobs we pulled and one person screws up our record. Gets us all murdered by a bunch of psychotics who don't have any decency. You should have seen how they did Lerna. She... Stop. Walsh held up his hand. How'd this guy betray you, and what happened to the schematics? Orion's Light has them now, Derelict replied. And he had to have. The security dropped, we boarded and raised hell. Once we arrived here, the security went back up. We were surrounded. The computer was locked down, and they started executing us. Jenks grunted. Maybe your new guy died and the base he took on the planet was reclaimed. Did you bother to think of that? Would have been a good story, Derelict said. Except I saw the asshole on a monitor with the Orion's light. I bet he worked with them the whole time. Security camera? Walsh called into the computer area. Be sure to get all that stuff uploaded to the behemoth ASAP. I think they'll want to look at everything there. See if you can give one of those experts access to the system. They might be able to find some residual data from the schematics as well. Either way, at least this place is locked down. Yay, Jenks muttered. We don't get to crash into the world. Today, Walsh remarked. At least for today. Secure the prisoner, police the bodies, and tend to our wounded. I'm going to call for an extract in twenty. Trellin stood before the lieutenant of the Orion's light crew that showed up and essentially saved him from imprisonment. They'd brought him aboard a destroyer-class ship, something they likely used in raiding actions for supplies. It reminded him of many pirate vessels he'd been on over the last several months, self-reliant but large enough to get around a large area. The other men toiled around him, moving cargo about and stowing the uniforms they stole from the soldiers, Several of them changed and went back to occupy the power facility, leaving them alone. Moments after those men departed, the ship took off and the lieutenant remained silent in the cargo area. The waiting game lasted nearly a half hour before the man spoke up. You have discipline. I expected you to be asking some questions before now. Trellin tilted his head but did not respond. Does that mean you don't have any, or is that you're too afraid to ask? I have questions, Trellin replied, but I'm not in the habit of badgering people, especially a group I've been trying to join for the past several months. You're a hard crew to catch up with. Really? Why have you been seeking us out? Your ideology appeals to me. I'm sick of working for low-life deadbeats. I want to make a difference in the galaxy, and frankly... With all the war and senseless diplomacy going on, Orion's Light is the only way to do that. Correct, the lieutenant smiled. Joining us is a lot better than being pressed into service, but I don't see why you think you're good enough. I can prove it any way you'd like. The lieutenant peered at him, nodding after a moment. I see. 
one way or another. You don't have a lot of choice at this point. There's always a choice, Lieutenant, Trellin said. I didn't have to come willingly when I was found on the planet, and I'm pretty sure in the situation you were dealing with, I would have been shot before drafted. Too many variables down there while you were taking the power facility. Interesting thoughts. I served in the Keelan military for quite a while. I understand tactical necessity. I'm sure you do. Hmm. I think you'll be of some service to us, but we've got a lot going on right now. Maybe you can do some manual labor to prove yourself further. After what you basically helped us steal, we need to get it installed. We can take you to Creelan when he has time. He happens to be in the system at the moment, at least until we hand over the schematics. So they managed to steal them after all? Trellin said. I'm impressed. The lieutenant shrugged. Sort of. I mean, yes, they got the data, but they died in the attempt. Their captain is all that remains, but the bastard locked down the computer system just after we collected what we wanted. There are other treasures in there, so we're trying to extract the codes. In any event, we'll get those bindings off of you and let you get cleaned up. The next several hours will make a big difference in your life. If you survive. Trellin's hands were released, and he rubbed his wrists while being escorted out of the area. In a guarded set of quarters, he was allowed to clean up and change into a new set of clothes, a gray jumpsuit and black boots. They fit and weren't dirty, so he couldn't complain much, but they felt an awful lot like prison garb. He was taken down to the engineering section, where they put him to work moving things about. Technicians hooked up a weapon directly to the core. He asked what it was, and one of the men commented that it was a prototype, something they took from the Novalat space station. This piqued his curiosity. Did the Novalat people actually build the weapon? I thought it was still conceptual. The Keelan side of his brain tried to come up with ways to sabotage it without jeopardizing his mission, but he knew that he was in too precarious a position to do so. He had to let things play out. The big game, the actual focus of his task, was Krelon Arvax. If he played his cards right, he'd have the opportunity to meet him and join the Orion's Light officially. Apparently, the psychotic bastard met with every recruit, willing or otherwise. Trellin had to decide if it would be a good time to kill him. Without a weapon, likely in the presence of several others, he didn't know whether he'd be able to pull it off. Impatience needed to be checked. Too much was at stake. No, he'd play it calm and speak to the man, infiltrating his enemies deeper. If he could be stationed on the same ship, that would make all the difference. He had to impress him considerably, but how? After seeing so many conscripts and zealots, what would make a man stand out to Krelon? He has some time to figure it out, but not long. Even selling himself 100% might not get him what he needed. Still, his mission was one step closer to being over, providing he remained cool throughout the next few steps. His success may well end up being one of the greatest accomplishments of the Intelligence Division's history. And if he survived to enjoy it, he'd be sure to revel in that fact. When the explosions eliminated the scouts attacking the power station, the Orion's light shuttle took off. One of the Marines cheered as if they'd won some kind of victory, but when Lawrence's voice cracked in their comms, their excitement died quickly. They weren't flying away. They were repositioning. You've got that shuttle moving in to provide some cover fire for their people? My guess is they're going to open up with their main cannons on the front door and blow down enough of the wall to give their guys clear shots at the lobby. Understood. Hoffner broke cover and headed for the hall. Everyone fall back deeper into the station. Those cannons are going to tear this place up, but they can only go so far. Not to mention the fact that our opponents can't destroy this facility completely, or they'll ruin their plan to blow it up. Won't destroying it cause a meltdown? Lawrence asked. Not necessarily, and not to the degree they need. They want this place to explode and send the radiation miles in every direction. Hoffner saw to it that all of his men were out of the lobby before he followed, taking cover some several rooms down. Scans indicated the ground forces were moving in. They must have got their scans to find us, or that cannon would have stopped. 
Damn it. Can you do anything from your position, Lawrence? Negative, sir. The shuttle has shields, and from what I'm reading, the cockpit's got some heavy armor. I'm going to reposition so I have a rear vantage from the advancing forces. I'll do what I can to thin their ranks. Thanks, but be careful, Hoffner replied. You'll be exposed pretty fast if something happens. I'll give you a mark, and you can create a small distraction for me. Sounds good. Hoffner crouched just inside a room, leaning out to aim his rifle down the hall. He didn't have a line of sight on the door, but he did see the edge of the lobby. Anyone who wanted to go his direction would have to step into his reticle, and then it would be over. With several other Marines also in position, they could hold off quite a force. Unfortunately, they had two choke points to guard, but should have had enough men to do so. They needed to buy Tully enough time to shut down the reactor safely, then sabotage it to prevent the enemy from weaponizing it again. But what then? They needed an escape route, and the problem was already rattling around in Hoffner's head. Maybe air support? That shuttle has to be taken down. We can't survive out in the open with it flying around. I'm in position, Lawrence said. You've got twelve guys about to enter? Take some shots in their direction and I'll confuse them a bit. You heard him, Hoffner said. Let's put some fire into that lobby. Several Marines opened up letting several three-round bursts go in the direction of the enemy. Lawrence might have fired, but Hoffner had no idea. The man's suppressor, along with their shots fired, helped mask his attack. Hoffner's scanner showed one life sign terminate. Lawrence called it a moment later, and another afterward. The scanner showed the enemy forces charge at that point, rushing into the lobby. Hoffner steadied himself for the action to come, and as the enemy tried to establish control of the area, one of them stepped into the hallway opposite Hoffner's team. Two shots rang out and the man screamed, then fell silent. More blips appeared on the scanner as additional men poured inside. They rushed the hallways and Hoffner's men opened up, mowing down several of the enemies within seconds. Unfortunately, they had too many forces and they were able to take cover, gaining ground. The Marines fell back, using covering fire to pace themselves and take the next room. Hoffner counted 16 total enemies in the various hallways, probably preparing for another daring charge. He prepared a grenade and threw it down the hallway, not necessarily to cause any harm, but to make them think twice about heading after them. Outside, the shuttle decided to open up, tearing through the roof of the building near the entrance. Crap. If it decides to do that to the middle of this place... Hoffner established a link with the behemoth. We're going to need some air support immediately. We've got an enemy shuttle tearing through the building, and if we don't get someone down here to take it out, we're as good as dead. Understood, Marshall replied. Stand by for an update. Hoffner cursed under his breath, firing his weapon when he saw movement near the door. Several grenades came sailing into the room, and a Marine cried out, Grenades! People dove for cover, keeping their heads down as the tiny explosives popped in various locations, tossing tables over and causing environmental damage to the walls. As they got back to their positions, the enemies charged, and the Marines engaged in a wild firefight at distances no greater than 15 feet. Neither side seemed ready to fall back, but Hoffner knew someone would have to give sooner or later. The shuttle continued to chew away at the building, as if they didn't care whether they killed their own people or not. They don't. These Orions-like characters are insane. Behemoth! Hoffner shouted into the calm. Are you going to be able to help us or what? White-hot pain lanced through Hoffner's body as something struck him in the right shoulder. He dropped behind his cover and looked, his heart racing in his chest. The wound looked bad, but he had enough experience to know appearances were often deceiving. He could still move his arm, so it wasn't as bad as it could have been. Relax, Megan Pointer's voice crackled over Hoffner's calm. We've got our shuttle problem. He heard the roar of some fighter engines overhead, and it made the ground shake. They screamed into position, and pulse cannons cried out in the air, followed by a massive explosion. Lawrence shouted into the calm, but Hoffner had no idea what he was saying. Between their own firefight and the noise from the ships, 
He felt like he'd gone deaf. There are craters out here, Lawrence shouted. They really tore this place up. Shuttle is down. I repeat, the enemy shuttle is down? One thing off our plate. Hoffner let out a sigh of relief. Thank you, Behemoth. And, pilot, we appreciate the help. No problem, Megan said. Now, if you'll excuse us, we have to get back to the action above. Good luck down there. When they engaged their engines, the entire complex shook so wildly, Hoffner half thought the walls might come down. Another Marine cried out and he saw them go down. They were down to eight guys against them, but the fighting was fierce. Each side wouldn't let up and no one stopped shooting. Lawrence hit their comms again, letting them know to hold their fire and stick to cover. His scan blip showed up near the entrance and he came inside, flanking the enemy. His arrival sounded the deaths of four of their opponents as he unloaded his rifle into their backs. Moving to his own cover, he aimed at the other group who'd taken up a position in a room nearby. I thought I'd join the party, Lawrence said. Hope you don't mind, sir. The cover outside would have been pointless if we died, Hoffner replied. Come on, guys. There are only four left. Somehow this translated to charging, and three Marines rushed the enemy position. Hoffner and the others provided support as they burst in and let bullets fly. A whole lot of screaming came out of the exchange, and Hoffner watched as one of the Marines hit the ground hard. However, the blips all changed. The enemy was down. Shore up the wounded, Hoffner shouted, and make sure the enemies are actually done. Tully, where are we at with that reactor? Um, I think I messed up. I'm trying to prevent a meltdown. You have to be joking. I wish I was. It's complicated. Uncomplicated. Now. I'm trying, sir, Tully hesitated. Shit. Thirty seconds. For what? This whole place to go up? Hoffner groaned. Then you'd better hurry, son. We didn't just kill all those pricks so you could fail. Warning, a woman's voice echoed through the hallway. Core meltdown in progress. Please evacuate. You have 20 seconds to reach minimal safe distance of three miles. Warning. Might work if we could micro jump, Lawrence muttered. Tully, Hoffner shouted, come on. Almost there. Hoffner rushed up to the control center and watched the young Marine's hands flying over the controls. He seemed to be entering codes at a wildly fast rate. The captain felt helpless as he observed, clenching his fists. He knew he had to be quiet or he'd just complicate matters, but it was one of the hardest moments of his life to remain silent. Ten seconds remaining, the woman's voice again. Shouldn't she have started complaining sooner? Hoffner asked. It got set while I broke their first code, Tully replied. Five, four, three. Wait, Tully tapped something and stood back. Everyone held their breath. Red lights pulsed overhead, then went white. They looked around, wondering what specifically had delayed their death. Did Tully succeed? It seemed unlikely given the time left but she did shut up and that was a heartening bit of silence. Core meltdown averted, the voice announced. Safety protocols re-engaged. Marines cheered throughout the complex and Hoffner slapped Tully hard on the back. Way to go. Thanks, sir. Tully slumped, clearly too relieved to be excited. Hoffner turned away and went back to the others. Okay, everyone, great work, but we're not done yet. We need to get the wounded ready for extraction and get some extra people down here to take this region back. So far, so good. At least the world won't be annihilated by a radioactive bomb. Now we just need to get these people their food and we'll be good to go. I want sound off for departure in less than ten minutes. Move it. Gray watched the view screen as they moved in on the tail of the enemy vessel. They might only get a couple of salvos off on them due to the miscalculation, but it may be enough. At least they couldn't put the continuous pulse cannon on a turret. They had to turn in order to make it work, and this ship was small enough that a micro jump seemed unlikely. 
Besides the fact we just took a tremendous risk in trying it ourselves, considering how much traffic is out here. Redding fired the weapons, the blasts slamming into the enemy's shields at presumably the weakest point, directly covering the thrusters. As they flared up, Gray turned to Ollie, waiting for the young man to give the damage report. Before he could offer it up, Redding was able to fire again. These recharge rates have become a game changer. The bridge doors opened and Durant entered the room, hurrying over to his new makeshift post against the wall. He logged in and began performing some action, but Gray didn't have time to question him. The eccentric scientist seemed intent on his screen, typing over the touch controls so quickly it was hard to believe he wasn't making a hundred mistakes. Damage report in, Ollie said. Their shields dropped to thirty percent after our first strike. Oh my. The shields flared on the enemy vessel, then a bulb of fire erupted from the top of the right thruster. They'd gotten through and done some damage. Scanning now. Captain, Durant announced. I came up here because of who we're fighting now. I've done some analysis and I believe we're going to want to be careful about taking this ship out completely. Their pulse drive is highly unstable, and if I'm right, which I am, then the shockwave very well might take out our shields. It would be temporary, Adam said, and they'd be dead. I'm not sure I see the problem overall. There are certainly more of them out there, Durant said. And though I can get our shields back online quickly, I'm pretty sure we don't want to find out how badly this can go for us. Clea stood suddenly. Durant, can you drum up secondary internal shield units to key parts of the ship? Durant's brows raised. I suppose, but why? No time to explain. I'm going to send you the locations we need these raised, just in case. Gray frowned at Clea, but as he considered their mission, he appreciated her foresight. Considering what might be out there, a little insurance might be handy. If they explode and take out our primary shields, won't that impact the secondary ones you're talking about? No, Durant said. I'd write them to raise the second our primary generator went down. Very easy sensor work, honestly. No problem at all. Okay, then. Gray turned his attention back to the view screen. The enemy was nearly turned around, despite their damaged thruster. Redding continued to hammer them. Pull us back to extreme range, just in case. Sir, Marcus spoke up. Permission to set a micro-jump course? Feel free, but we can't jump without shields, Gray said. We don't want to hop into something that could cause some real damage. I've got another ship on scans, Ollie announced. Looks like a second Orion's light vessel. The rebels have fallen back to their own. They're only engaged with the military now. I'm still trying to reach Duberis, Clea said. But we've got a lot of interference from the battle. Keep trying, Gray squinted at the screen. How close is this guy? Shields are... Ollie was interrupted by a massive flash that nearly blinded Gray. He was staring at the screen so intently. Gone. They're open. Let them have it. Thanks, Redding muttered. I'm on it. They launched another barrage this one striking the side of the vessel totally uninterrupted by energy defenses. The armor gave way in seconds, and the ship began to flare up from various entry points of the attack. As it caught on fire, the entire thing began to glow. Ollie called out that they had less than ten seconds for an explosion. But the moment he said the words, the ship went up. The shockwave slapped the behemoth hard enough to make her list faster than anti-gravity could keep up, Marcus was tossed from his chair and Ollie cried out. The lights went out temporarily and the ship hummed as the generators struggled to come back online. The secondary shields are raising, Durant shouted. That thing really did knock out our defenses. I never would have thought they could run engines so hot without melting them down. Learn something new. Enough, Gray barked. What sections are currently protected? Engineering, the bridge, and the weapons deck? Durant shrugged. Those were the locations that Clea had me protect. Where's that other vessel? Port bow, Redding called. She fired the weapons, but they didn't respond. Um, we have a problem. Generators will take another moment to come back online, Durant said. 
Then we'll have weapons. And shields again. Might be a little late then, Adam yelled, pointing at the screen. What is that green light? Ollie shook his head. I have no idea. It's got an energy signature I've never seen before. Something new. Clea spoke quietly. They built a prototype. And we're able to get it installed, Gray said. Durant, do what you have to with those generators. Adam, get us some cover out there. A green blast struck the ship and Gray sucked air through his teeth, anticipating a massive impact. But nothing happened. They were bathed in light and didn't so much as rumble. He frowned, tilting his head and turning to Clea. She shrugged. If that's what we think it is, it's supposed to knock the people out and leave the ship unscathed. Ollie, can you fool scans into thinking life signs are minimal? Gray said. Do it now if you can. Um, okay. Ollie started tapping away, but Clea hurried over to help him. The two of them did something, then looked at the screen. We've shown our life signs have dropped below two-thirds. Good work. Gray leaned forward in his seat and watched the screen. Let's hope they don't bother to shoot us now that they believe we're unable to fight back. What's going on? Durant asked. What was that weapon they hit us with? Prototype that knocks out the people on board a ship, Clea replied. Providing their shields are down, the Novalat people built it. We thought there was only a schematic, but as you can see, we're dealing with a working version. Fascinating, Durant rubbed his chin. I can't believe they didn't share it with us sooner. We could have perfected it, perhaps found a way to penetrate shields, or better yet, work without emitting a beam. I wonder if it actually harms the people it hits, or if it's simply something that causes temporary paralysis. Oh my, I suppose we have people on board who will know. Now's not the time, Gray said. Let's focus on staying alive so we can help those people who inadvertently became part of a field experiment for some insane weapon. How long before the generators come back online? Two minutes, Durant replied. I've got them going as fast as possible. Gray turned to Adam. Are we getting some help out there? Bombers? Hangars weren't protected, Adam replied. The people down there are unconscious. Giant control is also down. I'm reaching out to the pilots who are still out there. Panther and Tiger were due to dock, but they can't without the tower to clear them. The decks might be full. They can probably help, but they're running on fumes, both physically and fuel-wise. Crap. Gray rubbed his eyes. Redding, the second weapons are back online, I want to know about it. We've already lured them in with our little ploy. Providing they try to board us, we might still have a chance. If they link up now, we have no marines to provide any protection, Adam said. Whoever's in engineering and weapons will have to hold out. Then let's hope it takes them longer than two minutes to latch onto us, Gray replied. Hang tight, people. This last part's about patience and we definitely need them right now. Krila and Arvax watched the action between the rebels and the Novalat military with passing interest. Regardless of which side won, he succeeded in getting them out of the way of his attack on the Keelan home world. The Alliance High Command would soon be unprotected, and he could finish them off once and for all. But he needed to ensure that these people were thoroughly busy regardless of who won, the destruction of the power facility would wipe out an entire region of the planet, and with the space station going down, they'd not only deal a crippling blow to the population, but they'd erase all signs of their theft of the new weapon. The operation was proving to be quite the success. My lord, a lieutenant saluted him, standing at attention. I have a report. Go ahead, Krelon said without looking up. And be quick. We've lost the space station. Krelon looked up sharply. Excuse me? The space station. Someone's taken it from our people. We lost contact but saw some security footage just before it was taken down. The military? Some kind of well-trained force, yes. The lieutenant cleared his throat. I'm afraid the power facility has also fallen into enemy hands and we lost not only the troops stationed there, but a shuttle as well. 
All hands were killed, including the soldiers we sent to reinforce the situation. And the meltdown? Creelon's heart hammered in his chest. Prevented, I'm afraid. Creelon rubbed his eyes. Do you have any more bad news? I'm afraid so. It was clear the man was fighting through a great deal of fear to even tell him all this. Creelon glared at him as he continued. We lost the whaling mark. It was destroyed by an alliance vessel. The behemoth. Creelon's rage made his hands clench into fists and he rose. Did you just say that Earth ship? Here? What happened? They engaged and we lost. However, there is some good news. I can't wait. Creelon tilted his head. I hope for your sake you're right. Um, well, you see, the behemoth's shields have dropped, and the new prototype worked. Our scans indicate that there are less than two-thirds of the population of the vessel even alive now, and we are moving to take it over. Wait. Creelon lifted his hand. You're telling me that the prototype weapon we just installed is about to attack the behemoth? Yes, sir. It will be a glorious test. Rather, we've proven it works. Tell that ship to get back. Creelon pushed past the lieutenant and hurried toward the bridge. Now, get them to retreat and rejoin us here. They are not to engage the behemoth. Do you understand? But... My lord, we've got them where we want them. We can take the whole ship, add it to the fleet. Fool! Creelon wanted to strike him, but he was in too much of a hurry. The captain on that vessel defeated me the last time we met in battle. I promise you he's got something up his sleeve. And even if he does not, I don't want to risk our prize on the chance we might turn this fight around. Get them out of there, or I'll have you executed. Creelon entered the bridge and sat in his chair. Take us out. Get to the last known location of the whaling mark. Prepare for battle. We have no time to lose, so plot a micro-jump. His people sprang into action and Creelon silently prayed they would not be too late. He knew those earthlings could be crafty, and in this case, they seemed to bring out equal creativity in the Keelans in their midst. He never would have thought he'd find himself faced with his own people capable of outmatching him in combat. But their last engagement was enough to treat him to a special view into human ingenuity. Now he planned to snuff it out completely, or at least drive them off. Undoubtedly, they were responsible for both the space station and the planet. Creelon did so much work to push the rebels to such extreme lengths. To have his plans crumble at the eleventh hour made him wild with anger. This situation may have to be written off, and the only good to have come from it involved the state of disrepair he'd be leaving Novalad in. With help, they'd rebuild quickly and once again join the Alliance. If Creelon had to pull out, he'd need to attack the Alliance almost immediately. And that's if they managed to save the prototype weapon before those fools let it be destroyed. Without that, they'd only have the advantage of their special cannons, and while it might make short work of several Alliance vessels, it wasn't the type of thing to win an entire war. Combining it with this technology made it devastating. Creelon understood the need to remain fluid during combat situations, especially when the theater remained so massive. The violence at Novalat represented the most far-reaching military actions he'd ever planned, let alone executed. It had been working perfectly, too which made it all the harder to justify the potential loss. He began to rage internally. Those Earth people will suffer for their interference. Even if I have to travel to their home world and bomb it myself, they will pay. Chapter 9 Megan organized Tiger and Panther to form up and head back to the Behemoth. They'd been out there long enough to be feeling the effects of a prolonged engagement. The pulse drives needed to be recharged soon, and they were completely out of missiles. As they raced back toward the ship, they saw a massive explosion followed by the behemoth's shields flare up. What the heck was that? Mick asked in her calm. I don't know, 
Unstable drive core? Megan hummed. I'm going to contact Giant Control to see what they've got to say. She tried to connect to them, but had to fight with interference. After a moment, she heard a garbled voice that wasn't quite breaking through the static. The computer couldn't clean it up anymore. Whatever hit the ship really did a number on comms. Another ship moved in, firing a strange light which bathed the behemoth. The calm went dead, not even presenting static anymore. Megan stared for a moment, unable to really fathom what she'd seen. A quick look at the scans indicated the behemoth lost shields completely and their engines were offline. What the hell did I just witness? Megan sent a message back to the space station, reaching out to the marines who had occupied the facility. She got right through and Sergeant Jenks took up the comm to talk to her. She related what she'd just seen and what was happening with the ship. He hesitated for a moment before replying. We've been combing the computers here and though they desperately tried to erase all their activity, there was a weapon here which can knock a crew out. Jenks paused. And we see there was a prototype as well. It was stolen more than a day ago, so they had plenty of time to install it on their ship if they had decent engineers. Apparently they did, Megan sighed. What are we going to do? If the entire crew of the behemoth is out, those pricks are going to try to board her. All we've got out here are a bunch of fighters. The bombers landed a while ago. We have our shuttle, Jenks said. They just docked to help us extract the wounded. The turrets on that thing aren't going to help against the shields, Mick said. We need something else to stop them. Maybe we can just harass them until the behemoth comes back online, Megan offered. It's worth a shot, right? Suicidally speaking, Mick replied. Yes, it's worth a shot. We can't hold out against that thing. If we had missiles, maybe. But otherwise, our hands are tied. If they try to dock, we can take out their link-ups, Megan said. You okay with that? Mick paused. Yes, but we'll have to hang back so they don't focus on us and suddenly decide to keep the playing field clear. Megan agreed. All right, Tiger and Panther, keep an eye out. When that ship gets too close to the behemoth, we sever the link. Jenks, you guys better stay put until this is all over with. You don't need to be flying around up here without a place to go. Can you relate that down to the planet as well? We're on it, Jenks said. Be careful, and let us know if there's anything we can do to help. Will do. Megan engaged her thrusters and directed the wings to the far side of the behemoth. From there, they could observe and wait for the moment when they might be needed. Until then, they needed to exhibit some patience, and considering what just happened to their home, they'd find it very difficult to do so. Gray willed himself to remain still and sitting. He stared intently at the viewscreen, watching the enemy ship draw close. A smarter crew would have opened fire while their shields were down and taken them out, but these idiots wanted to commandeer the behemoth. Because of that, they put themselves in a dangerous position. Even if they did get on board, they wouldn't find it easy to occupy such a large space with three major departments still under behemoth control. Engineering had access to life support and all doors. They'd be able to lock any section down and keep the invaders contained until such time that Marines could neutralize them. They had to cut communications, which meant Clea's attempt to collaborate with the legitimate military had to be cut short. This particularly stuck in Gray's craw, because the longer the fight was allowed to go on, the more Orion's light won. They already caused enough chaos. How had they been able to so easily infiltrate and cause this conflict? Maybe the intelligence agent will be able to answer that question when he gets back. Gray didn't have a lot of faith in the idea. Considering what he was up against and the lion's den he was infiltrating, it would be a miracle if he survived at all. With limited support, his job might well be impossible. I guess the Keelans knew that since they sent us to find his body. That was the unspoken part of the assignment. Find out if he was dead since he hadn't checked in. However, they had to know that the moment he got into Orion's light, he wouldn't be able to send messages anymore. If he didn't go dark, he'd be dead. Clea tapped his arm. Sir, Durant's got an update. Gray looked up at them both. Go ahead. Generators are at 70%, Durant said. 
At 75, I can fire up the engines and give you weapons. ETA for that? Roughly eight minutes, Durant shrugged. Give or take. And ETA for them to be in a position to attempt a docking action? About five, Clea replied. I do have some good news, though. We can only use passive scanners if we want to continue our ploy of being dead in the water. However, I picked up several of our fighters hovering just behind us. They're waiting for something. An opportunity to help, I suppose. To stop them from boarding, Adam said, or at least give them a hard time. Good. Gray stood finally, stretching before glaring at the screen again. What will our limitations be at the 75% mark? Durant replied, Minimal. We have enough generators that I'll be able to balance the load manually and give us nearly full power. Can't you do it now? Adam asked. Sort of. Without having enough power for the balance, it might be unstable enough to cause actual damage to the ship, up to and including a meltdown. We don't want that, Durant sighed. So we have to wait. Fair enough reason, Gray said. You've done wonders with the ship as it is, especially these passive shields. Good thought, Clea. Thank you, sir. Clea nodded her head. If this works out, then I think we're going to have to add this to a valid battle tactic. Certainly, though I hope that it doesn't happen often enough to become an SOP. Gray shook his head. How close are they, Ollie? They're practically right on top of us now, Ollie said. I'd estimate they'll be in position to dock in crew quarters in roughly two minutes. Durant, Gray asked. Oh, we'll need to buy a little more time than that. I'd say at least three. Can one of you type beam communicate to the fighters? Adam asked. Something that the enemy won't pick up? I can, Agatha announced. If you give me just a moment, I can send something that sounds like interference. Their computer will decode it, but the enemy should think it's little more than noise from being too close to us. Do it, Gray said. Tell them to buy us the extra couple minutes, but to be cautious. I don't want to lose any pilots over this. I'm on it, sir. Agatha went to work, and Gray forced himself to sit back down. The next few minutes might be the longest of his military career, and the level of patience required was making his muscles tense. Luckily, there were no other rebel ships around, or they certainly would have opened fire. His mind drifted to the countless individuals aboard the ship who were impacted by the prototype weapon. The Orion's Light proved early on that they lacked any morality. But this, firing experimental weapons, drifted into the realm of war crimes. The ends justified their means, at least to them. Gray shuddered to think of a universe with them in charge of anything but Earth's history was full of cultures run by terrorists. Ollie cursed. Captain, we've got a ship incoming. What? Gray stood up. What kind? Where? It just jumped in off the port bow. Ollie pointed at the screen. Magnifying. Oh, no. It's the final star. The Orion's Light flagship. Gray scowled. Creelon. He turned to Durant. Get me power fast. This fight just escalated and I need weapons. We're almost there, Durant shrugged. I can't make it go quicker. Try. Gray turned to the screen. I don't intend to show my belly to that bastard and his flunkies too close for my comfort. Pull a miracle out of your hat, Durant. I want to show these animals what happens to war criminals. Megan's calm lit up with static and she had to turn down the gain. A light flashed on her computer screen, and as she acknowledged the alert, it began to decode a message. The entire process took less than 15 seconds. A box appeared asking if she'd like to hear what had been received. She tapped yes, and Ensign Agatha White's voice filled her helmet. Wing Commander Megan Pointer, this is the behemoth. The enemy vessel is on the verge of docking. We are close to full power recovery. We have passive shields engaged, protecting three key areas— but much of the crew is currently unconscious or worse. You have to buy us some time. Prevent the enemy from boarding the ship, even if you just harass them. Behemoth, out. Megan sent the message to the rest of the pilots. Once they had a chance to hear it, she cleared her throat. So I guess we're ready to get in there and cause some trouble, huh? 
Let's do it, Mick said. Sooner we dispatch this big-ass ship, the sooner we can get inside and I, for one, could use the recharge. On my lead, Megan said. Form up with your wingmen and get ready. They might launch fighters, so we'll have our work cut out for us in any event. As Megan kicked on the thrusters and propelled herself forward, her body complained at the sudden motion. She'd been out there far longer than anticipated, and it was definitely taking its toll on her. After today, she'd need real downtime if she hoped to recover fully. No one was meant to pushing the limits of a fighter for such an extended period of time. Pushing full speed, the two ships became larger with each passing second. Her computer stated they would arrive in less than ten seconds, about what she hoped when she positioned her teams. The enemy was practically right on top of the behemoth and would be in good position to send out a docking clamp just as the fighters arrived. Megan's finger touched the trigger of her pulse cannons just as the second ship jumped in, appearing some distance in front of the behemoth. She immediately recognized the vessel from their previous experience with them. The final star. The commander of that ship killed Lieutenant Leslie Eddings, a hero of their previous engagement. What I wouldn't give to be in the cockpit of a bomber right now, you brazen son of a bitch. Is that who I think it is? Mick asked. Try not to focus on it, Megan replied. Focus on the task at hand. A docking tether deployed from the enemy ship. Megan fired a barrage of pulse blasts, and even with shields, the force of the blow knocked it to the side, ensuring it couldn't connect with the behemoth. They'd have to pull it back in and align for another try. The rest of the fighters fired at the ship itself, harassing it as they planned. Scans indicated they were launching fighters of their own, ships Megan knew were capable of some pretty outstanding maneuvers. Durant's upgrades were meant to succeed these people, and now the new designs would be put to the test. At the end of a very long mission without missiles. Ah, the fluid nature of combat. Tiger, you keep this thing from bothering the behemoth, Megan said. We'll take care of the fighters. Mick formed up with her as they raced around the enemy capital ship. Turret fire blasted past them, but never seemed to come remotely close. Either the gunners themselves were terrible shots, or they had bad AI. Either way, Megan wasn't going to overthink their fortune. They'd have enough going against them when they met the enemy ships. Four already cleared their hangar with another four on their way out. Mick thrust past her, firing a full spread into the enemies who had yet to establish themselves. The first two took full-on pulse blasts to their tops. Their shields popped, and the first one exploded outright. The second's engines expelled a bout of fire before spinning out of control, slamming into the final star's shields and disintegrating. Wow, Mick. Megan felt like she should be giving him a hard time about the rash action, but it worked. Now, they only had six fighters to deal with. At least until the final star launched theirs. Get back up here and help us fight these buggers off. The enemy fighters closed in, pulling wild maneuvers as if showing off what they believed to be air superiority. They're addicted to their advantage, Megan thought. They don't even know how to fly conservatively, and they have no idea what they're facing. I can work with a little hubris. Should be easier. Team, let's play a game of bait and trap, Megan grinned. I'll be the bait. No one tip their hand until they get close. Then show them that they're not the only ones who have fantastic inertial dampeners. You sure about this? Shelley asked. It's a pretty risky move, ma'am. Oh, I think I'll be okay. Just don't let them take too many shots at me before you get involved. Be right back. Megan jammed her thrusters to full and charged the enemy, tilting her head to focus. She stared through the glass, every sense hyper-aware. As the enemy began to fire, she made the necessary course corrections to avoid their attacks, the edges of her shields taking no more than grazes. As she flew past them at a ridiculous speed, the enemy scattered, far too late if they'd needed to avoid a collision. She pulled up and climbed, turning so she was facing her own team. Four of the enemy pilots formed up behind her. The other two vanished, flying off to some other mission. She didn't have time to worry about it. Dodging when she saw them coming was one thing, but now she had to rely partially on scanners, partially on instinct to avoid being hit. 
As she pushed the limits of her ship, her body complained at the force pressing it into the seat. Blasts flew past her, winking out of existence some distance ahead of her. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw on her scanner that she was rapidly approaching her team, all engines cool as they waited for their chance to strike. Someone got a direct hit on her shields in the rear. An alarm went off indicating her shields were down to 40%. She doubled them up, lowering the power in the front just before she dove to hand off the enemy to her team. Seven vessels engaged four, easily matching their opponent's wild maneuvers. Megan circled around and watched the antics, like some kind of insane aerial show that resulted in four downed vessels. And no survivors to tell their buddies about how we just did. Our secret remains safe for now. Great job, Megan called, but there are two more out there somewhere. They went back around to bother Tiger, Mick said. I've got them on scans. That's it for them, Shelley said. Two against all those ships? Ridiculous. Nevertheless, Megan replied, let's get over there and make sure they've got all the cover they need. I don't want them to deal with any weird surprises, like those jackasses turning themselves into bombs or something. Ollie practically bounced in his seat. He watched his passive scans in total torment frustrated beyond belief that he couldn't use any of his active equipment. The crude data coming in didn't give him much, but he was able to process it into something useful. As he watched the latest feed come in, he clenched his fists. Captain, the final star is powering up weapons. They can fire shortly. Durant, Gray turned to the man. Come on. Okay, okay, Durant muttered. His hands flew across the console. I haven't had a chance to test the power load balancer, nor do I know for a fact that this is going to work immediately, but providing I can get the regulator to kick in and then have the relays come online. Yes, that's good. And now. Everything lit up around them and began to hum. Ollie's computer flashed on and indicated their shields had been raised. Weapon crews reported they were good to go and had a full charge already. Apparently, Durant had them charging along with the generators. The behemoth was 90% combat effective. Durant created the miracle, as asked. You got weapons? Gray asked to Redding. Yes, sir. Who do you want me to shoot? The enemy who was trying to dock is pulling away, Ollie said. Our pilots fended off three attempts to board us before they did. Direct all fire to that vessel, Gray said. Fire point blank while getting us away from them. Shooting the final star just now won't do us much good. When will we be able to micro-jump? Durant answered. We need to be at 100% power for such an action, and right now, we're just barely at 79. I estimated the current recharge rate will be ready for jumps in less than three minutes. We'll have to take it toe-to-toe, -to -toe, Gray said. Reading fire. Clea, get back on the comm and work with Duberis. When we're done with these jokers, we'll be back to getting the rebels to stand down. I want some simultaneous actions going. Yes, sir. Clea turned her attention to the comm, and Ollie returned his full attention to his computers. Redding fired a full barrage into the enemy ship. Their shields flared brightly and dropped down to 10%, just as the last bolt struck them. The concussion force caused some superficial damage to the decks closest to the behemoth. Another full barrage might well cause serious damage. Final star is firing! Ollie shouted, incoming! Normal pulse blasts struck the behemoth's forward shields. The light show was spectacular, but it would take a lot more to cause any real concern. Ollie noted that their shields dropped to 85%, but rapidly returned to 90 before slowing their recharge. If they'd been at full power, they'd already be back to normal. They're charging another weapon, Ollie said. He let out a groan. They're continuous cannon. Won't matter, Durant said. I've already accounted for that. When they figure out we've got a counter for it, it might prevent them from attacking other Alliance ships, at least for a while. Of course, we have no idea what other strange weapons they've stolen from around the galaxy, or who's installing them, for that matter. Fighters deployed from the final star, a dozen blips appearing on scans. Ollie noted they were headed for the other ship, perhaps an attempt to escort it away. He frowned, conducting a thorough scan of the vessel that tried to dock with them. Power began surging from their engine room. 
a familiar buildup of energy. Captain, Ollie announced. They're trying to jump out of here. Redding shook her head. Not today. She made some adjustments on her console and fired again. The behemoth's weapons fired in tandem, each one slamming into the enemy vessel at the precise coordinates of the energy buildup. Ollie didn't need his scans to see the impact. The shields flared and dropped, then bouts of flame erupted from the vessel, orange bubbles against the darkness. The power surge went dark. They've been disabled, Ollie shouted. Thank you, Gray said, but try to relax. The final star fired, their cannons splashing against the behemoth's front shields. Ollie held his breath, hoping Durant was right about being prepared. The weapon hit them for a good ten seconds before dropping off. Shields remained at a steady 78%, far better than they would have fared before. I love having Durant on board. No appreciable damage. Agatha spoke up. Our pilots report they're moving to engage the enemy fighters, but apparently the Orion's flight forces are falling back. Gray frowned. I wonder why. They've got our people outmatched right now. Why not take them on? Adam stared at the screen of his station and inhaled sharply. Our smaller turrets have engaged them. They're charging us, Captain. Durant turned to his own screen and nodded. Commander Everly is right. They're coming straight for us and they are not slowing down. Ollie, shift shields to that side, Gray gestured. Hurry. Ollie tapped his controls as quickly as he could, making the necessary adjustments to their power allocation. He noted a screen out of his peripheral vision showing the scans. The turrets took one out, but they couldn't get them all. Any second, one of the enemy fighters would hit them, and depending on how their reactor went up, it could cause some pretty serious damage. He finished the task just as the first of the fighters slammed into their defenses. The resulting impact made the ship shake, but the shields held. At 60%. They're not recharging as quickly as they were a few moments ago. Ollie checked the load balancing Durant was using, and it was dipping. Ollie lifted his hand. The shields are having trouble recharging after that. I know, Durant replied, waving his hand at him. I'm working on it. Work faster, Gray said. This isn't a situation where we get a second chance. Another ship slammed into them, this time reducing shields to 40%. The final star fired again, just as Redding let loose another series of blasts at the other ship. She began to move them away from the damaged vessel, giving them some distance from both the potential explosion and the enemy pilots intent on throwing their lives away. How do they have the resources to lose these people? The answer to his question seemed simple enough. With Orion's light, the ends justified the means. If they blew up the behemoth and it cost them a few fighters, then they were definitely ahead. Ollie checked the turrets and saw they had taken down another three of the enemy each of which potentially could have brought their shields down completely. When the final star's attack hit their shields, this time there was cause for alarm. The ship itself shook more violently, and the lights flickered overhead. Ollie checked the damage and noted that the forward living quarters took the brunt of the blow. Though the hull remained intact, a variety of systems read offline down there, including the power to lights. I hope no one happened to be down there when we got hit by the other weapon. Ollie's eyes widened. If they get another chance to hit us with that beam thing, these secondary shields might not hold. I thought I had too, Durant said. I have some good news. The ship with that weapon currently can't fire it. They're barely able to maintain life support. The bad news is that the load balancer is on the verge of failure. I've patched it into some emergency relays. The power we use for the temporary shields around those three sections. However, we need to wrap this up fast. We might not have the energy for much more. Understood, Gray said. Redding, redirect your fire to the final star. Before they get their special cannon back on us. Chapter 10 Clea worked with Agatha throughout the fight, attempting to reach Duberis. The interference required them to move through a variety of frequencies, attempting to get through with well over a dozen techniques Clea had never heard of. The communications officer really knew her job, and when they suddenly established a connection, 
Clea wanted to hug the ensign. I'll present the situation, Clea told her, taking a deep breath while Duberis greeted her with some concern. We thought we might have lost you all out there, Duberis said. What's been going on? We engaged the rebel battleship, but before we could take it, Orion's light ships showed up and destroyed it. Clea frowned. We're engaged with two of them now and are in pretty bad shape. However, the reason I'm contacting you is to say that the rebels have been duped. The Orion's Light didn't care about their cause. They just wanted to create chaos out here. Do you have some proof of that? Duberis asked. It'll be hard for me to convince them otherwise. Yes, from our operations on board the space station and down on the surface of your home world, we have Orion's Light bodies and records of their involvement. Furthermore, they were trying to destroy your planet. They didn't want anyone to occupy it, only to cause you enough grief to keep you from helping the Alliance. I see. Duberis cleared his throat. Anything else? They stole a prototype weapon and have used it on us, Clea replied. Getting that weapon was likely the primary purpose of the terrorist operation. We're lucky to be alive right now. However, the ship they installed it on is nearly destroyed. They shouldn't be able to escape with it. That's good news, but I'm sending ships to make sure, just in case. Can you hold out? Clea turned to the scanners and honestly didn't know. If you can micro-jump, that would be a very good thing. We don't have time if you're going to take the conventional route. Understood. I'll come personally. Hang in there. Clea leaned back and turned to Gray. Reinforcements are coming. Not a moment too soon, Gray muttered. Another fighter struck their side. This time, the lights went out and were replaced by the emergency beams on the edges. The computer screens provided more illumination. Ollie called out that the shields were down to environmental, meaning all defensive capabilities were essentially out. Though casual debris couldn't get through, weapons were another story. Clea turned to Durant, her eyes wide. He glared at his console, intent on his work as he tapped away. She'd spent a lot of time with him, but never saw him so fully engaged. He likely never felt the same pressure as he did in that moment. Durant never served on board a combat vessel, and as a result, his closest brush with death might have been when Orion's Light invaded his little sanctuary. I hope you've got something good going, Gray said, because I'm not even sure our weapons are going to be at full power at this point. They won't, Durant said, but I've got another idea. It's a crazy one, but it just might work. I'm all ears, Gray muttered. The behemoth isn't equipped with a full-on tractor beam, the type the Alliance vessels use to pull things in. You guys prefer to do it the old-fashioned way, essentially with tug ships, Durant explained. Final Star fired on them, hammering the ship with a series of pulse blasts. The entire vessel shook, and Ollie began to call out heavy damage on several decks. No key systems were taken out, but it was only through the virtue of the ship's size that kept it safe. That and the final star's inability to target specific locations. Creelon won't make that mistake too many times. We don't have time for a long-winded lesson, Clea interrupted. Well, I have to give some of it, Durant complained. Anyway, I just reprogrammed one of our communications emitters and supercharged it. This will give us a ten-second burst to grab something and move it. I can't guarantee it will work exactly as I suggested since the equipment wasn't designed for it. However, it's worth a shot. What do you propose we grab? Adam asked. The ship with the prototype. Gray's eyes narrowed. Will it handle something so big? It's space, Durant said, shrugging. We should definitely give it a try. The enemy fighters are all gone, Ollie said. The last of them have been destroyed by our pilots and the turrets held up. At least that's over, Gray replied. Durant, make it happen. I'm coordinating with Miss Redding, Durant said, turning his attention to the pilot. If you wouldn't mind getting ready to provide maximum thrust to the, uh, starboard side, away from the ship we're grabbing. Go for it, Redding, Gray confirmed. Redding shook her head, tapping the controls and leaning back. We're ready. She poised her fingers over the throttle and waited for Durant's mark. 
The engineer worked for a good twenty seconds, sweat covering his face. He grimaced a few times, then turned from his position and pointed at the view screen. Uh, thrust it, Marcus muttered. Pretty sure he meant gun it. Can it, Ensign, Adam grumbled. Redding initiated full thrust, the ship veering to the side at the same time. Ollie put the starboard side up on the view screen. They watched as one of the emitters cast a massive light on the ship beside them. Their movement compelled the ship into motion, sending it away from the behemoth and into the path of the final star. The act made their enemy fall back and move, buying them a few moments as the damaged enemy ship very nearly collided with the Orion's light flagship. As the dance continued outside, Durant didn't take time to celebrate. He continued working feverishly, speaking with the people in engineering. Captain, Agatha spoke up. We're being hailed by the final star? Time to buy a little more time, Gray said. On screen. Creelon Arvax's face appeared before them, looking as smug as he did when he murdered one of their pilots in cold blood. He sat in his chair, totally relaxed, despite the fact his ship had just narrowly avoided being smashed into. He tilted his head, as if taking in the scene aboard the behemoth before speaking. We're a little busy, Gray said. What do you want? No greeting. Creelon clicked his tongue. I'm disappointed. But if you wish to get straight to the point, I'm willing. We know you have Durant by Purin aboard. Hand him over and we'll go our separate ways. Fair trade. One keel in life for your entire crew. That would be the ones we haven't already killed, of course. Clea felt Gray's rage beside her, but he took a steadying breath, never revealing his feelings through an expression. Interesting proposition, Gray said. And what, you'll just leave the system? How are you going to get your disabled ship out of here? Creelon sighed. You don't have to worry about that, do you? After all, my deal involves you saving your own lives, not mine. Don't worry about them. They'll be fine. I'm having a very hard time trusting you, Gray shrugged. Call me cynical. What kind of terms are you going to give me that I can trust? Durant waved Clea over and she stepped closer to him. He lowered his voice, whispering to her. The generators are back online. I'm rigging the load balancer to give us full weapons and enough shields to handle at least a single shot. Engineering is directing from our actual engines. In other words, the core itself. Which normally charges the generators which distribute the energy. Clea confirmed. Yes, I'm just bypassing the regulators and essentially fast-starting them. Okay, how long? Nearly instantly, but we're going to have to do some serious work on those generators when we're done. They're going to superheat. Benefit? Clea asked. What do you hope to achieve? We can blow up that vessel they're sitting on top of, Durant pointed out, and see what happens. Clea nodded, moving over to Redding. The captain continued his conversation, banter with Creelon. He did a good job of keeping the man talking. Luckily, he really wanted Durant, or the talk would have gone differently. As she crouched beside the pilot, she let her know the plan. Redding nodded, glancing back at the captain. We have to let him continue his part of this task, Clea said. Please, just target the enemy ship here and here. When we hit them, that will set the ship off. The final star might not get caught in the full blast, but it should drive them off long enough for help to arrive. Besides, they can't be allowed to escape with that prototype anyway. Understood, ma'am? Redding tapped her console. Target locked in. Clea returned to her seat. It'll take me a minute to get Durant ready, Gray said. As in, I'm pretty sure I'll have to tie him up. He's not going to willingly head over to your ship. Very well, Creelon said. I'll give you... Durant nodded to Clea. She turned and had Agatha mute the line. Redding, go, fire. Redding tapped the controls and the behemoth launched a massive barrage into the disabled ship. The beams cut into the hull at the key points listed, including engineering and specifically their core. 
Ollie's mouth dropped as he peered at his console, and he called out a damage report, which ultimately meant catastrophic. They're going to blow, Ollie cried out, like big. Pull us back, Gray said, now. Redding hit the engines, drawing them away from the explosion. Connection with the final star was broken as the enemy pulled away too, everyone retreating from the damaged vessel. Clea gripped her seat tightly, tensing up for the blow she was sure to come. She didn't entirely trust Durant's shield part of the equation, despite the fact he'd been right every time so far. Something about the situation felt like she needed to be cynical, but as they drew back from the massive explosion, the shockwave barely even shook them. The final star veered around, firing their pulse cannons into the behemoth's side. The shields flared, but held. Okay, I won't doubt the man again. Shields deflected the shot, Ollie said, but we don't have another one in us. You bought us a last stab in the eye, Gray said to Durant. If only they would have been closer to that ship when it blew. They're coming around, Marcus yelled. Another pass. Ten seconds. Ollie muttered. It won't matter, Durant said. Mr. Darnell, I believe your scans have something. Ollie looked at his terminal, confused for a moment, but his face lit up. Two ships have just jumped into this area. They're here right now. It's Dubaris, Clea said. The reinforcements. We've got this, behemoth. Dubaris's voice filled the bridge. Hang back for a moment. Both ships began hammering the final star, tearing into their shields from behind. The attack caused the enemy to break off their attack and head away, engaging full speed to escape. One of the two Novalat vessels gave chase, and the other remained close by, remaining on protection duty. You people okay over there? Gray chuckled. Yeah, we're okay. Pride might be smarting a little, but I'm not going to complain about the save. Thank you. You people have done more for us than we can ever repay. It was the least we can do. Duberis hummed. Good news. The rebels have agreed to a ceasefire to see the evidence you found. I'm hopeful. Getting them to a discussion table will be a big step toward ending this idiotic conflict. A lot of people here would like to rebuild. Clea checked the scans and saw that the final star was preparing to jump out of the system. Their pursuer couldn't keep up. Creelon was about to escape again, and she knew there was nothing they could do about it. The captain wouldn't be pleased. Allowing the maniac to continue his operations out there jeopardized the bigger war to come. He's going to become a priority, and soon. We understand, Gray said. The Alliance will do everything in its power to help. Let's escort you back to the safe zone where you can get some facilities to initiate repairs. Duberis said, I think you've all earned some rest, huh? Once our fighters land, we'll be ready to fall out. Give us ten minutes. As the connection dropped, Gray sat heavily in his seat. That was quite the engagement. You heard the man. Square ourselves away for falling out. We've got a lot of work to do before we can finally go home. Trellin's new companions engaged the Earth ship, moving in after their shields went down. During the fight, he remained in the crew quarters out of the way. They didn't lock him in, but the lieutenant made it clear he was not to go wandering the ship. He was expecting to meet Creelon, but then they started a brawl. This might not go well. He tapped into their comms through the computer in the room and listened to the action. They weren't doing poorly, but apparently they were outgunned and knew it. This didn't seem to matter to the zealots who must have thought sheer willpower would win the day. Not wise, even with their special weapon. It turned out the thing worked. They were able to disable or potentially kill a lot of people on board the human ship. This filled Trellin with rage. He hated being amongst a group so ready to casually kill. No matter how long he spent amongst criminal elements, he couldn't get used to the sheer amount of death involved, even by his own hand. This assignment involved getting close to the worst murderers in my people's history, and before this is done, I will have to contend with my own contribution to such things. Trellin clenched his fists as they boasted throughout the ship about their victory, but things started to go bad when they tried to board their prey. 
Apparently the human vessel had some fight left in them, and before long fighters thwarted their docking attempts and the human ship was able to hit them with a couple of pretty major blasts. When the humans disabled them, Trellin became alarmed and really started to worry about whether or not he'd survive long enough to meet up with Krelon. If these fools died, he'd lose his chance again. They had to make it. Or at least he did. Even if it set him back a few months, he'd come too close to simply be snuffed out by poor tactics and idiot commanders. He tried to access the central computer database and engineering from his current location, but the terminal was too locked down. Something closer to the source might get him what he needed, which meant leaving the room. Considering the fact these men were likely going to die, he didn't see any reason to stick around. Trellin slipped out of the room and moved back toward the engineering section where he'd helped them install the special weapon. Chances were good this whole place would go up and that meant they'd lose their advantage, at least for a while. He stumbled when something hit them, leaning against the wall as one of the men rounded the corner. You! What are you doing? The man seemed more confused than accusatory. Trellin didn't have time to explain, lashing out and punching him in the throat with enough force to crush his larynx. The man gurgled, eyes wide as he fell to the ground and choked out. As life left his eyes, Trellin shook his head. It's become far too easy for me to kill. This assignment has done me no favors. Back on task, he rushed down the hall. An alarm blared overhead, lights flashing to indicate the severity of their situation. He burst into the engineering section where men were frantically working. None of them paid him any mind. They were all too busy trying to keep the place from exploding. Trellin moved over to a computer and typed away. The encryption took him less than 20 seconds to penetrate, and he was able to download the schematics to the weapon to one of many external drives installed in the terminal. He pulled it out and stuffed it in his pocket, turning to leave. Hey, who are you? Did you just mess with that computer? The questions came from the man he remembered as the chief engineer. He didn't acknowledge him, moving for the door and picking up the pace. I'm talking to you. Stop. The moment Trellin cleared the door, he ran back down the hallway toward the living area. Escape pods were just down the way, a remnant of the ship's purpose, before it became a raiding vessel. People pursued him, but he wasn't sure he'd have to deal with them. Another explosion made the whole place shake, and he barely maintained his footing as he arrived at the first pod. He's trying to escape, someone yelled. Yeah, he's got the right idea, came the response. We should get out of here. A gun went off. Trellin winced, but didn't feel any pain. He crawled into the pod, noting that the Orion's light men were fighting amongst themselves. As he sealed the door behind him, he strapped in and punched the release. Rockets compelled him away from the ship, far from the action. He'd have control in a few moments, enough to navigate obstacles at the very least. Behind him, a bright light flashed, and he knew that it had to be the ship he'd just been on being destroyed. Only a few moments to spare. That was pure luck. You're a fool for relying on it, Trellin. But it got us by another day. The next step was to get to safety and continue his search for the Orion's light. Somehow he'd get their attention. The schematics in his pocket might be the way. By the time they even thought about building another one, their leader would be dead, and he'd be back on his way home. If only I truly believed, it would be so simple. Epilogue Clea and Gray left the medical bay feeling considerably better about the entire conflict. There were several injuries, but the secret weapon didn't end up killing anyone. As planned, it knocked the crew out. Apparently, Novalat planned to take prisoners, not murder everyone on board. They'd hoped for peaceful resolution to conflicts when they designed the thing. The behemoth returned to port at the Novalat home world, where a ceasefire had been called. Rebel commanders met with military officials, and though tensions remained high, everyone seemed confident that the evidence brought to light would end the conflict. Concessions would need to be made by both sides, but they were close to an agreement. They both committed to helping the Alliance with the final battle, so regardless of the outcome of their own troubles, the armed forces returned to the real fight. Repairs would take no more than a day or two for the behemoth, and they sent a message back to High Command, letting them know the outcome of all their actions. They'd prevented sabotage that would have destroyed an entire region, 
saved a space station, and halted a massive bomb from taking out government property. Coupled with ending the Orion's light influence in the area, the mission turned out to be fairly successful. They left with some casualties, a few of the Marines in particular, but all around, the losses were minimal. Considering what they had done, it felt like they came away fairly lucky. No one had any illusions that the battle against the real enemy would be so easy. The large-scale action loomed, and tension settled over the ship. Everyone, from the captain down to the lowliest deckhand, knew how dangerous the action might be. Even with allies, the chances of coming back unscathed were next to none. They retired to Gray's office and opened a secure link to the intelligence division bouncing it through the FTL relays of Novalat for near real-time transmission. It was voice only, but that would be enough to let them know that the intelligence agent seemed to be alive and very likely in the hands of Orion's light. Siva's voice crackled over the speaker. Thanks for looking into the matter. We've received a message from our operative, though with a full breakdown of everything that's happened. He's got quite the story to tell, but I appreciate you looking into it. Wait, he contacted you? Gray frowned. From where? Escape pod, Siva replied. He was on board one of the vessels you were fighting and had to get out. Apparently you folks blew up his ride. Set him back a bit, but he's confident that he'll be able to make contact again. He's got the schematics, and he intends to give them to Orion's light. Clea slapped the table. He can't do that. That weapon's dangerous. Relax. Siva's tone dismissed Clea's concern outright. He sent it to us, too. We can counter it now, but we have to be cautious about how we do so. After all, he needs the bargaining chip for us to finish off our prey. How are you going to counter it? Gray asked. With who? I'm transmitting them to you now, Siva said. I thought Durant might have a go at it. I figure you guys have first-hand experience with it now and might as well see it to the end. Am I right? Clea still didn't look happy, but she grudgingly agreed. We'll certainly work on it as quickly as we can. Splendid. Siva sounded too happy. I look forward to your return to base. I've got more work for you when you get here. Repair and rest up. We're not done yet, and the attack on the enemy home world is getting close. I'm hoping we can make sure everyone's prepared. After all, a culture-changing event is on the horizon. I trust we'll all have a part to play, in the end. The line went dead and Clea sat back in her chair, looking grumpy. Gray grinned. I guess she rubbed you the wrong way. She's too flippant. This is crazy, what she suggests. And more work for us. What are we, a special operations ship now? That's what we've been doing, isn't it? Gray asked took back the space station from the pirates, saved that research at the facility. All our missions have been off the beaten path of military action. I can see how we got worked into it. The question really becomes whether or not each thing we've done has been directed by Siva. Clea's eyes widened. You really think they've been guiding our action this whole time? Gray shrugged. It's more than possible, but ultimately academic. We've done a lot of good, regardless of who wanted us to. This intelligence agent, though, he's insane. If he truly believes he can still infiltrate those maniacs who are quite content to commit suicide for the cause, he'll need a lot of mental help when he's all done. True, Clea sighed. I suppose we've got a lot of work to do so we can get back home, huh? Home's relative, Gray replied. I think we're going to yours. Earth's still somewhat far off from our list of destinations. But you're right. Let's get those schematics to Durant, coordinate the rest of our repairs, and get moving. Novalat doesn't need us anymore, but the next few days... What we've got going... I think we've reached the turning point for us in this war. Time to see it through to the end, then, Clea said. I'll see you on the bridge later. Hopefully, after a nap.
Totally agree, Clea. Totally agree. Extinction. Prologue. Siva Wifarin browsed the incoming traffic from hundreds of intelligence sources across the galaxy. She had operatives stationed in places her government didn't even know they had a foothold in, and they transmitted data constantly. Her people even managed to infiltrate the Earth government, which took a little body modification to avoid detection. Humans had such a limited set of colors for eyes and hair, after all. Earth people factionalized easily, and it concerned Siva's superiors. An entire anti-alliance group protested their participation in the Galactic Theater, pushing that they should remain isolated. Luckily, the government, and an overwhelming majority, held them at bay. But that didn't mean the Alliance wasn't going to keep an eye on them. If, at some point, those irrational fools ever attained enough power to challenge the authority of the majority, then the Keelans may have to intervene. That was one of the jobs her operative was responsible for ensuring they kept tabs on the various leaders of each group and remained close to them. A little assassination wouldn't be amiss if absolutely necessary, and Siva had plenty of people killed for less. She determined that on her watch, the Alliance world would remain in check and not cause trouble. Though she wasn't able to focus solely on the war, she fully expected those without her responsibility to do so. Patriotism meant a lot at such times. Her people bustled about her, crunching numbers and looking for clues as to threats which might crop up for the Alliance. This went beyond the obvious enemy, the one they'd been at war with and extended to internal and external concerns like the Orion's light terrorists. Such fringe groups were dangerous enough to be a credible threat to security, even if they couldn't necessarily take down the government all on their own. Each of their chaotic agendas meant they could not be ignored. Siva's team constantly worked to infiltrate these groups, to destabilize their ability to operate and ultimately break them down completely. However, in some cases, most notably with Orion's Light, it was easier said than done. Some of these groups were particularly rough on recruits, and few operatives wanted to experience permanent physical alteration for the cause. Trellin Endall volunteered for the hardest task and seemed likely to get the job done with Orion's Light. He'd managed to make contact once and carried something the leadership of that group would desperately want after their last engagement. Luckily, the human vessel Behemoth managed to thwart their overall objective of sowing disorder in an Alliance-controlled system. Trellin took advantage of the situation and did his best to prove his worth. If it panned out, he'd be able to get close to their leader and finish them off. All intelligence reports indicated that Krelon Arvax held the group together through sheer will alone. In this case, cutting the head off the snake would certainly leave the body to wither. The former military commander did not trust anyone enough to be his successor, and since his cause seemed purely selfish, he gave his subordinates only enough power to be useful at their tasks— Free thinking, according to reports, was discouraged for the most part. Yes, they were expected to make clever battle decisions, but their objectives were handed down by Krelon himself, and they were supposed to follow them. No matter what. A couple words caught Siva's attention, and she paused the incoming data feed, peering at the phrase on the screen. She had to rewind, sliding back several paragraphs until she saw what she was after. A ship name, one she didn't expect to ever see again. The Crystal Font. They'd gone to a compromised research facility and hadn't been heard from since. One of the buoys picked up a transmission and relayed it back to high command. Apparently they were asking for some help. But it had been a long time since they were even heard from. What could have possibly happened? Were they stranded in some random system out in the middle of nowhere? How did they survive so long? Siva brought up the ship's records and looked up the Anthar. Kale Rushin, who had been recently promoted prior to his mission, led the ship. He'd been an exemplary officer and blazed through the ranks. High command considered the loss of him and his crew extremely regrettable, and they'd all been listed as missing in action. 
I guess that's no longer the case, but if they truly do need help after this long, I don't think a normal military party is going to cut it. I need to intervene. Siva put in her personal authorization code and claimed responsibility for the transmission, taking the mission away from the military. They'd complain, yes, but she didn't care. The crystal font could be a tremendous intelligence asset. If they managed to escape the attack on the research facility, then survive alone out there for so long, she wanted them on her team. After all, there were plenty of ships to conduct straight combat. She needed thinkers and survivors to conduct missions much like what the behemoth had done. Those groups beyond the enemies at the gates, the rebels, pirates, terrorists, and thugs wanting to bring down their government, those people needed opposition. The crystal font would be perfect. Siva brought up their transmission to see where they were and what assistance they needed. Whatever she had to do to get them out of harm's way, she would, but they sent quite the recording back. As she queued it up, she leaned back in her chair. Her mind began to formulate a plan, even as she started up the personal log of Kale Rushin. Let's hope I'm not wrong about these folks and they weren't stuck out there due to incompetence. Well, if they were, I'll spin it to say we save them for the sake of their families and pull some goodwill for our efforts. Otherwise, I'm hoping we just drafted another ship into our cause. High command will be miffed, but I think I can contend with them. Okay, Kale, show us what you've got. I'm sure this will be more than a little educational. Chapter One Earlier, during the research facility battle, Kale Rushin cut the connection with the behemoth and turned to Wena Phi Devo, his communications officer. He'd committed them to a daring but possibly foolhardy act. The next phase of his plan involved pushing the young Zanthari's skills, and he approached her station to assist as much as he'd be able. The enemy will be monitoring our comms, Kale explained. I need you to send a desperate message to the behemoth. Something our allies' computer will immediately decode, but the enemy will need at least a moment. I don't want it to seem too easy for them. Can you do it and ensure it looks good? Wena nodded, her orange eyes wide. I believe so, sir. Yes. Good. Kale patted her shoulder. Thank them for transferring the data from the research facility back to us, and let them know we'll be taking it to another secret research facility on... He hummed. Scion 6. Sir? Wena looked confused. What is it? The Scion system is barely charted, let alone... Realization swept over her face. Oh, I see the plan now. Excellent, Kale grinned. Right away, please. He returned to his seat and directed his attention to Athen Duzatha, the pilot. I know you're already pushing the engines, but I'm going to need a little more if at all possible. If my plan works, our jump out of here will be... Theatrical, to say the least. Um, Othin glanced back, even as he worked. What exactly does that mean? When I finish talking to engineering, I'll let you know. For now, I need you to set a course for... Elat. That's far enough away from here, and still in the other direction from Earth. When we get there, we'll redirect, so get to working on those calculations. Kale turned to Thyna, the weapons officer. Please don't make it too easy for them to keep up with us, huh? Thyna tilted her head and took to her controls, firing the turrets at the pursuing enemies. Kale did a quick check, noting every shot slammed the lead enemy vessel's bow. Their shields flared as some of the blasts went through, striking their hull and causing sparks to fly. She didn't let up, continuing to fire throughout. Kale clicked over to engineering in the meantime. Su Anthar Mira Dieren picked up immediately. Yes, Anthar. I hope you're calling to let me know we can slow down now. I'm afraid not. I need you to help me pull off something I theorized about at the Academy. A jump method that should get us out of here. Kale cleared his throat. Can we expel engine waste and ignite it during a jump? Mira scoffed, her voice clearly showing serious disdain for the idea. It's possible, but beyond dangerous. There's a good chance it would go up before we left the system, and that would disable our engines for sure. I assume that we're moving fast because we have to be, and if that's the case, 
then stopping would definitely be detrimental to our survival. We have to pull a trick, Kale explained. There's an entire enemy fleet on us. In fact, I've made sure they won't let up. Plus, I've given them a false impression of where we're going. I need to delay them so when we reappear, we'll have time to jump again. Believe me, this is a desperate hour, so I'm going to need you to be as flexible and creative as you've ever been. Mira hesitated for a long moment, but finally let out a sigh. Yes, I can do it. It'll take just a moment to prepare the purge, but when I do it, we'll be ready to go. Do we have a course laid in and ready for the jump? Kale turned to Othan, who nodded. Yes, we're ready to go. Okay, begin the countdown, Mira said. Twenty seconds, and this will be one of the more spectacular things anyone will see this side of the galaxy. Thena, I believe we can let up, Kale said. Those cannons will spoil our plans if you keep shooting. Yes, sir, Thena leaned back. The lead ship has fallen back. They are firing at us, but they're doing so half-heartedly. I guess Wena's message worked. They want to disable us, Kale said. They have no intention of losing what we've got. Not if they can help it. Kale braced himself for their departure, prepared for the worst. They had to buy the behemoth time, but he had no intention of sacrificing his ship without at least trying to get away. Much as he wanted to stick around and fight, the numbers were overwhelming. The data from the research facility might go a long way toward the war effort, but it didn't have to come at the cost of all the Alliance ships in that region. The enemy started taking additional pot shots at them about halfway through the countdown. Kale held his breath hoping they'd be away before any appreciable damage came their way. Mira's voice crackled over the speakers near the tech officer, indicating the waste had been expelled. The highly volatile substance would cause a massive explosion the moment they initiated their jump. If any enemy ships were too close, they'd likely go up, but Kale couldn't hope for taking any of them out. All he wanted was the sensor interference such an event would cause, granting them time to get out of there. The theory earned him top marks in school, but he'd never had an opportunity to implement the idea. The exact right circumstances never came up until that moment. As he throttled the ship toward the dangerous maneuver, he closed his eyes for a moment, asking the faiths to be kind. Not only to the crystal font, but the behemoth as well. They'd done a lot of great work together, and he looked forward to seeing them again. We made a good team. Please don't let this be the last time we're together. Initiating jump sequence now, Othan said. Hang on, everyone. This will definitely be a little rough. Kale held his breath as the ship began to hum. Something shook the entire vessel, nearly tossing him from his seat, but it ended as swiftly as it began. A familiar sense of nothingness washed over him, but instead of clearing up, it seemed to linger. He tried to inhale, but his lungs would not respond. He couldn't close his eyes, couldn't divert his focus from the bright white wall ahead of him. Sound fled. All sensation lifted, and he began to wonder if he'd crossed over. Had the ship exploded? Was he dead? Where was everyone else? Maybe the jump was simply taking longer than expected, but they were supposed to be instantaneous. In all his years in space, He'd never spent more than a few brief moments in such a state. How long can this possibly last? Forever, I suppose, though it's not as comforting as I always thought it would be. Why would it be? It became harder to think, harder to cling to his identity, difficult to even be. But he knew, if he let go, he might never come back. Kale struggled, but deep down he recognized the futility of fighting. I can't give up. I won't. No matter what. The Present Clea on Twofall sat in her quarters as they approached her home world, excited for an opportunity to relax after their recent mission. Despite her sincere desire to get out and finish the war, having been involved in a major action to stop the civil conflict left her somewhat spent. Her own people had faced such strife in their past, and she knew what it could do to a people. Though she knew they wouldn't have a lot of downtime, the opportunity to put her feet on solid, safe ground sounded like a tremendous luxury. She had reached out to her parents to see if they would be available to see her, but she discovered they were both away on their own assignments, away from the capital. 
Clea wouldn't have time to visit them, but then again, she'd seen them a great deal the last couple times she was there. A night in her family apartment wouldn't go amiss, even if it happened to be alone. She checked the chronometer and saw she had several hours left before they'd dock, plenty to catch a nap. Her shift started when they arrived, but Captain Gray Atwell already gave her leave to go planetside. She took a deep breath and started to doze just as her computer started dinging, indicating an incoming message. Clea, Gray said, I've got an incoming transmission from Siva. She needs to talk to you and I directly. Really? I was almost asleep. Can't this wait? All the thoughts drifted through her head, but instead of voicing her annoyance, she merely tapped the receive button and said, I'll be there momentarily. Crawling out of her bunk, she put her uniform back on, straightened her hair the best she could, and headed for the captain's office. There, they'd find out what the next unreasonable ask intelligence had for them. Clea preferred straightforward action. She hated having to lie to the various crew members about their last mission, and they still hadn't been able to tell those involved what they were really doing there. Stopping the Civil War was a fringe benefit to Siva's real aim. She probably didn't really care about the Novalat people at all, but had to play nice with high command. I don't like this woman much at all. Clea knocked at Gray's door and he called for her to enter. She stepped inside and straightened her jacket before moving to the seat. He looked almost as tired as she felt. Had he tried to catch some rest as well? Wouldn't surprise her considering what they'd been up to as of late, but their duty seemed to be unwilling to give them a reprieve. Gray started the conversation. Do you have any idea what she might want? Clea shook her head. I'm afraid not. Probably another crazy mission. You know, I find it somewhat frustrating intelligence has operational control over our ship. I'm shocked your government handed it over. They were playing nice, Gray explained. Plus, don't forget we missed the christening of our new ship. They've got a defender even if they're green. There are worse ways to serve. So long as we get our crack at the front lines when we invade our enemy space, I'm fine with wherever they send us. You might not feel that way after this conversation. Clea finally grinned. If you don't mind my saying. Now you've got me nervous. Gray tapped the computer. Here we go. A few moments passed as they established a connection. Siva's image appeared on the screen, and she grinned up at both of them. You have to love this FTL communication, huh? Works great. How are you doing? Uh, we're great, Gray shrugged. What can we do for you? Siva nodded. Right to the point. That works for me. Very well, here we go. I've got some news for you before we get to my point. First up, Miss Antufal, I believe you were promised a rather prestigious title and were merely made a Suanthar. My Gora couldn't go all the way, but you needed something to tide you over, I guess. Clea hadn't even thought about her rank since she achieved it. Even as Siva brought it up, she was surprised. Considering everything going on, their work and missions, she didn't find it important. Regardless of what title they put before her name, she planned to continue serving for as long as it took. Even after the war ended, she wanted to continue to be part of the military, hopefully as they turned to an exploratory path. Rank might not mean nearly as much then as it did during the duress of action. She looked forward to the future, knowing she didn't have the overt danger of weapons being fired at the vessel she crewed. But until then, and at that moment, she was in the present with a war to win and another assignment offered by the Intelligence Division. Here we go. I didn't think it really mattered, ma'am, Clea said. We've had bigger things to deal with. Sure. Regardless, I've been authorized to upgrade your status and grant you the rank of Tothin. Congratulations, though you should have already had it. Thank you for your service, Miss Antufal. Gray smiled. Yes, congratulations. Clea struggled not to roll her eyes and simply accepted the honor with a nod. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate it. Excellent. Let's move along. Siva leaned forward and hit a button, reading from a screen. 
Second up, I wanted to tell you that Earth sent a message stating that they've got their third ship moving along quickly. Our fabrication techniques are doing them right. Thought you'd like to know. Oh, personnel. Maury Higgins has recovered from his wounds and is currently helping with some of the building. That's great news, Gray said. I've been worried about him. I think he wants to come back to the behemoth, Siva said. But considering Durant's taken his job, he'll probably have to settle for working with the newer crews back in your home system. At least for now. By the way, High Command tried to get Durant reassigned to one of their research facilities, but I denied that and ensured he'll stay on with you. That's unexpectedly kind of you, Gray said. May I ask why? I need my crews to be the best, Siva replied. Which leads me to the real reason we're talking over the comm rather than in person. I wanted to give you this information right away so you'd know that time is going to be precious. When you've returned and provisioned, we're going to have to send you right back out. Clea stiffened but kept her mouth shut. What's the assignment? Siva's eyes twinkled. I think you're going to like it. Do you remember the crystal font? Alliance ship you went to the research facility with? Of course, Gray said. How could we forget? Kel Rushin sacrificed his ship to let us escape with the data. Or so we thought. Turns out he didn't, but there's a complication. Of course there is, Clea muttered. You see, we know for a fact that the ship was not destroyed. We received a transmission recently bounced through multiple buoys. It appears they were able to get out of the system through a risky maneuver and were lost for a time. I'm hoping you can help us get them back. Specifically, I want them to come back and work with my team. Adding to the roster? Gray asked. So to speak. Anyone as clever as Kale and his crew are people I need. I heard you worked well together out there, so I assumed you'd like to know someone capable has your back. After all, intelligence rarely has someone they can send for backup. Believe me, they need some right now. I'll help them, of course, Gray said. Anything I can do. We owe them big. Not to put too fine a point on it, and just in the interest of keeping things transparent. Siva paused and let out a sigh. Well, you didn't really have a choice. I suppose we could have allowed you to feel like you did with that last statement, but ultimately, you're under my operational command, and I need you to find the crystal font as soon as possible. It was Gray's turn to stiffen. Clea saw the muscles tighten in his neck, but his expression did not change. He nodded once. Understood. Fantastic. Let's go back to being friends. It's a lot more pleasant. Anyway, I'll see you both when you get back to the planet. We'll have drinks and talk. Then you can take off and save your friends. Bring them back and let them rejoin the cause. I'm pretty sure they're going to have a wild story to tell. Talk soon. Siva broke the connection and Gray shook his head. She's got a lot of nerve. Clea nodded. She does indeed. I wondered when she would remind us of her power and influence. I suppose that was the time. Indeed. Gray stood up and moved to the window, peering out. I am happy we have the chance to help Kale. I can't believe he survived. The man is incredible. I always figured he was too wily to go down the way we thought. Clea rubbed her eyes. I only hope he and his crew are in the condition to do what she's asking. I can promise you this. If our actions turn out to be little more than charity, Siva won't be pleased. Gray shrugged. What can she do about it? For our part, we're going to save those people regardless of their use to intelligence. I think we owe them that much, huh? Yes, we do. Clea stood up. Shall I call a briefing of the senior staff? Please. Gray didn't turn. Make it for an hour. Should give us plenty of time for debate before we put into port. And hopefully, with any luck, we'll get some rest before heading back out to the unknown. I guess that's what we do now. Plunge into the unknown.
If we weren't at war, I'd feel a lot more comfortable about that, Gray said. For now, we'll do what we can. See you in an hour, Clea. Yes, sir. Clea left the room and turned to her computer, setting up the requested meeting. She figured everyone would be chomping at the bit to help the crystal font, especially after the valor they displayed in their previous mission. With any luck, they'd find them in good health and ready to rejoin the fleet. The alternative was too tragic to think about. Gray continued staring out the window long after Clea left. He thought about Kale needing help and it filled him with a sense of urgency. After the jump disaster which thrust them into a first contact situation, he had a full understanding of how bad space travel could go wrong. The behemoth couldn't call for help, but it would have been nice. If Siva had some coordinates, Gray was willing to jump out there right away, but the fact she didn't offer them made him feel like there had to be a catch. Some bad news was waiting for them when they arrived and met with her. At least the woman had confidence Kale and his crew were okay. Gray wondered if Siva would have told them about the crystal font if she didn't think they were worth joining intelligence. She probably would have let High Command take care of it, and that meant Keelan ships. They wouldn't have turned to the behemoth, not for something involving one of their own. They might all be part of the same alliance, but that didn't mean there weren't fraternities. In fact, the military leaders might not be too thrilled they were being cut out of the chance to find their friends. Gray hoped he wouldn't have to deal with any of that type of rivalry or cold shoulder. Someone was going to save those people. That should be enough. Yet deep down, Gray really wanted to be the person that made it out there, that got to the ship first and made a difference. Much as he wanted everyone to take the high road, he understood if someone felt resentment. Leaving the crystal font at the end of that mission was one of the hardest things he'd done, and he thought about Kale a lot. Their roles could have been reversed. Gray thought about responsibility a lot and how a commander might find himself in a position where all the lives and people counting on him might mean less than the objective. Much as he wanted to believe he'd never have to weigh sacrificing his ship for a mission, Kale was a sharp reminder it might happen someday. What a terrible thing to consider. During that engagement, Kale could have gotten away. We were facing the engine trouble. All he had to do was jump out. Lucky for us, he paused and asked some questions, but we were leaving. This next mission is personal. Much like Clea's treasure hunt, I have to bring Kale home. Considering what the Keelan commander did for them, Gray knew Kale would do the same. The man's first command alone made quite the impression on everyone. Gray never heard if they gave him a funeral or not. He didn't know how they treated people who were considered missing in action. At what point would they be declared dead? Maybe no one wanted to give up on them. The idea they could still be alive might be compelling enough to leave the books open. Keelans seemed to need proof of a deed before they believed it. Even the logs of the behemoth probably weren't enough to convince them that the crystal font was destroyed. After all, even Clea said that it could have just been a spectacular jump. I hope it was. Maybe that's why they've been unable to communicate for so long. God knows where they ended up. The behemoth's own jump disaster took them into occupied space, but there were plenty of systems which held nothing at all. If anyone planned to survive in those places, they would need to be resourceful, especially if they were unable to use their jump drive again. Whatever Kale and his crew did to survive and escape must have caused some serious damage. Otherwise, they'd bring themselves home. The thought of them returning all on their own made Gray smile. Depending on their story, they could be considered heroes, men and women of extreme resourcefulness, an inspiration to the rest of the military getting ready to fight a massive war. The benefit of such an event didn't mean as much as surviving. They were all a team, so Gray wouldn't have felt any shame having someone come to their aid. The Keelans did that for them when the enemy invaded Seoul. Humans accepted a lot of assistance over the last few years. It was one of the reasons that Gray never felt indignant about performing tasks for the Alliance. In many ways, humanity owed them a little military service. Helping out meant they had the opportunity to experience the rest of the galaxy, opening their eyes to just how small Earth truly was. 
It also allowed them to settle some of their debt to the people who saved their planet and all their lives. Many people on board the behemoth were there the day they were beset upon by the enemy and remembered the Keelan warships that showed up and fought them off. They remember when Clea came on board and began to help them build their first pulse drive to leave the solar system. Isolationists were a loud faction on Earth, but fortunately, they represented a small part of the population. Most people understood what they'd been given, that none of them would be alive had it not been for the Alliance. Without even leaving the planet, many people were able to fathom the gravity of what that enemy represented, and as a result, they embraced the galactic union of many races. Those who didn't, mostly close-minded bigots, felt they should conduct their own battle. They lived on pure emotion, never bothering to use logic to recognize any culture standing alone in the face of the enemy would surely perish. And badly. Gray had seen them up close and personal on several occasions, and he knew Earth needed allies. So many people continue to fear the unknown, even in our allies. I suspect Commander Everly leans in that direction as well. All those years working alongside Clea hasn't dampened his feelings against the Alliance. I suspect he feels like we should be leading this group rather than taking orders. He doesn't realize how much experience these people bring to the table in regards to space exploration, defense, and combat. Whether Adam truly believed in the inferiority of the Alliance or not, he kept it to himself. However, Gray noted quips here and there that gave him the impression. He hoped his executive officer might come around, but some feelings, some views, were harder to squash than others. Even exposed to the greater universe, encountering factions like Orion's Light didn't necessarily change minds. Like the traitors we had to deal with. Not only Clea's sister, but in her own crew members as well. The sabotage that nearly killed us all and the idiotic council member who honestly thought murdering the entire ship sounded like a solid plan. Gray's computer reminded him he had 15 minutes before his pre-briefing. He wanted everyone to be thinking about the part they had to play in their next assignment. They didn't have a lot of information yet, but each department needed to be prepared for what was to come. He knew some of his senior staff took leaving Kale's people behind harder than others, specifically the Marines. We have a chance to make it right. Gray left his office, heading out to join the others. The moment he entered the briefing room, he'd set in motion a flurry of activity, giving the entire crew a great deal to do. They'd been idling, likely thinking about what they were going to do next, perhaps even dwelling on the major battle to come. At least this will distract them from possibilities. None of them needs negativity right now, and this upcoming mission is nothing if not positive. Clea stepped out of the briefing with Commander Adam Everly and Group Commander Esteban Ravente. The two men looked dour, their eyes narrow with thought, brows furrowed in concentration. They stopped just outside the door and remained silent for several moments before Adam finally spoke up. I can't believe they made it. Glorious survival instincts, Ravente said. I don't know how they did it, of course, but whatever got them out of that mess had to be ingenious. Clea added, The likeliest possibility is that they did something with their jump drive to mask their signature, maybe overloaded part of their engine. It would explain why they couldn't get back on their own. Remember when we thought they might have blown up? An overload definitely has the power to cause such a flash. Adam nodded. Interesting. Good on them. He turned to Ravente. Sounds like your folks are going to be doing some recon work finally. I'll bet they look forward to not having to shoot at something for a change. You have no idea, Ravente replied. My teams could definitely use a break from getting out there. Inertial dampeners only do so much. Their bodies are taking a beating every time they engage in those dogfights. Some of them are going to have to retire a lot earlier than I'm sure they'll want to as a result. Harsh, Adam shook his head. Supposedly we only have one major battle left. Um... Clea cleared her throat before continuing. Even if we win the war, we've got Orion's Light to contend with, among other problems. Those fringe factions out there aren't going to go away with the enemy. The only good news is we'll be able to focus all of our attention on them, and that means they won't have long to operate. Fair point, Ravente said. 
but I have a feeling our friends at the Orion's Light aren't going to be a huge problem after the real enemy's gone. After all, they can't possibly field a fleet as large as the Alliance. With all our members? Impossible. We'd overwhelm them with sheer numbers. But that's not how they operate, is it? Clea asked. No, they're guerrilla fighters causing disorder like the Novalat system, or harassing colonies as they did while looking for the artifact. We're dealing with total scum here, and they have absolutely no rules. Even though they came from my people, they have truly cast off any of our values. Cherry thought, Adam muttered. But we'll be ready for them. Ravente, do you need anything from me? Ravente shook his head. I'm on my way to brief my people. I'll be fine. Thanks for the chat. We'll talk again when we make port. Good. See you then. Adam turned to Clea. What about you? Are you good? I don't have anyone to brief, Clea grinned. I'm going to take the nap I was trying to indulge before we got the call about this mission. I'll see you on the bridge in a while, huh? Indeed. Adam nodded and left her alone. Clea returned to her quarters, rubbing her eyes as she got to the door. Some days she got the impression Adam merely tolerated her, where others he seemed friendly. She never understood where she stood with him, but ultimately didn't care. They were part of a team, and she felt she had no choice but to make their situation work to the best of her ability. Did the commander have a problem with Keelans? Or the Alliance in general? Possibly. Some humans didn't trust them, and she partially understood. After making contact with dozens of alien races, Clea knew what suspicion looked like. Other cultures worried that the Alliance wanted something from them they couldn't necessarily give. What if the Alliance simply took the resources they needed or kidnapped people? Most of the cultures they initially met wouldn't have been able to do anything about it. Perhaps those people would have felt better if the Keelan people had been more aggressive. Kindness sometimes felt like buttering up, preparing them for some hidden agenda. The Novalat people discovered quickly that they were being welcomed into a collective rather than treated as some kind of commodity. They even remarked on it publicly once, thanking the Alliance for their patience and indulgence in what amounted to growing pains. Some of the others were less noble about admitting it, but they tended to come around. Would humanity? Some of them had, or at least made a good show of it. Clea studied enough of their history to know they could be clever outright devious even. Their Machiavelli taught them all sorts of things about how to be underhanded in politics. Depending on how nefarious their leaders were, they may well be trying to take a larger role, perhaps even trying to lead the entire alliance. Something told Clea that Siva knew this and probably already infiltrated the Earth's government. If she hadn't, she must have been in the process of trying. Getting someone in there, able to really watch them and stay involved, might save the partnership the entire alliance was founded upon. The last thing they needed was to be dictated to by total amateurs in the galactic theater. You're still not ready for some things, humanity. Be patient, and you will be. But we've been at this a long time. Don't think we're going to simply let you have the wheel because you're underhanded and sneaky. It pained Clea to think about it in such a way, especially since people like Gray were so reasonable. But then she thought about the council member who betrayed them, and her blood boiled a bit. The man tried to sacrifice all the people on board the behemoth simply to discredit the alliance. His traitors turned on their friends, their comrades, and essentially ruined their own lives in the process. For if they failed and survived, which they did, they looked forward to dying in prison. I can't even imagine accepting such an assignment. One of the men, their navigator, threw away a brilliant career. Astrogation had been his passion. He knew so much about the stars. Clea spent hours talking to him about astronomy and helped boost his understanding of the concepts through her own experiences. Keelan education on the subject vastly exceeded what one could learn in a human school. And despite all their time together, he was still able to make the decision to help sabotage the ship and nearly kill them. He ultimately turned on his fellow traitors and put the entire thing to rest, but it didn't exonerate him from his fate. 
Maybe he got a few less years or some privileges in prison as a result, but none of those three were walking away. That's what happens when you decide your agenda outweighs your friends. Clea flopped on the bed, not even bothering to take her jacket off. She closed her eyes and let out a deep breath, trying not to think of Vora on Tufal, her sister. That was the ultimate form of blind, stupid betrayal. Vora didn't even side with some fringe part of the Alliance, but rather the enemy itself. She led them straight to the research facility and got countless people killed. The government took her away, and Clea hadn't heard what happened to her. She thought about asking Siva, but didn't want to sound overly concerned. The last thing she wanted was to be looked at as a potential traitor. Luckily, Keel and Justice tended to focus solely on the criminal and not blame the family members or close friends. Otherwise, Clea would never have received the Tothin promotion. Much as family meant to their people and how close they all were, when a bad apple revealed itself, it was simply removed and everyone else moved on. My parents sure aren't thrilled about it. In private, during her last visit, they talked about missing Vora. It was an emotional conversation, one they probably needed. None of them asked the obvious questions of how or why Vora could betray her people. The stated reason didn't help, that of them losing anyway. Nihilism didn't become a brilliant scientist, and yet she embraced the philosophy. Clea wondered about her own future with the military. What did she really want to do? Eventually, the behemoth would have to return to the Earth, and they would likely no longer need her. They probably didn't already, considering their service to the Alliance. Still, she enjoyed her time with them, and wanted to remain, at least until the overall objectives were complete. The thought of going back to her own people filled her with mixed emotions. On one hand, she missed being amongst people who intrinsically understood her without having to learn her culture. On the other, she developed quite a few positive relationships amongst the humans. Having Durant around helped. He might have been wildly eccentric, but at least he grew up in the same way. Clea spent a whole lot of time with him, working through puzzles and problems involving weapons and the technology that made the behemoth go. Would she continue in such a capacity somewhere else? The Tathan rank offered many possibilities. Though she might never command a ship, she could run operations or even a tech division. She felt especially suited for such a task. Still, High Command would have to pick the assignment, and she only hoped she'd have some say before they simply stuck her somewhere. After everything she did, all the sacrifices she made to leave home and live with the humans, she felt her own people owed her. Perhaps such entitlement was unfair, and until she knew for sure, she'd keep it to herself. But when the time came, if her new job didn't suit her, she'd definitely play some cards. Maybe Siva could even help. Much as Clea didn't like the woman, she figured the spymaster might owe her a favor, too. Such people were good to keep close and not alienate. They held so much influence, they could take a starship out of active rotation and send it on random missions. If intelligence happened to be her future... As long as she wasn't a deep-cover operative, Clea could see herself thriving in the environment. Analyzing tech data, or even helping to collect it from the safety of a starship made sense to her. What she didn't want was to undergo some kind of spy training and infiltrate enemy factions. She'd performed a couple of ground operations and found it stressful beyond belief, especially after receiving an injury. Clea could fight and defend herself, but that was a far cry from the types of things intelligence operatives were expected to do. They were straight killers, and for her, she only wanted to pull the trigger when absolutely necessary. Only people like Siva put you in the position to make that question an easy one to answer. Shoot or be shot. I don't need it. In any event, I need to stop thinking and start sleeping. We'll be at the port before I even got a half hour. The chime went off, stating they were rapidly approaching the space station. The reminder gave her 15 minutes before she needed to be on the bridge. Damn it, Brain, you are not working with me today. Clea got up and changed her jacket to something that wasn't wrinkled, heading for the bridge. Exhaustion closed in on her, but she knew she'd get some sleep when they got to the planet. She only had to work for another couple hours before then. I'm going to hit the pillow like a pulse bomb. 
Clea leaned against the wall on the elevator and closed her eyes, hoping Kale and his crew were okay. We'll be there soon, she thought. Hang in there. We won't leave you alone. Not this time. Chapter 2 Kale opened his eyes, staring at the pilot's console sideways. He was lying on the floor in front of the Anthar's chair, his muscles numb and his ears ringing. This happened before. He'd been in this exact position. It was before his promotion, during a conflict that took his mentor's life. Once again, he found himself barely conscious, struggling to regain his senses. Are we in immediate danger? Straining to hear, he didn't make out any sounds of concern or stress. The ship remained motionless, no shaking from impacts, nor did the engine make the vessel tremble. Feeling returned to his arms, and he pushed himself into a sitting position, blinking blurry eyes in an effort to take in his surroundings. Others stirred, his bridge crew each coming around in the same slow manner Kale recovered. He swallowed, wincing at how parched he felt. His whole body screamed for a drink, but he needed to take the concerns one step at a time. Assessing the threat around them and finding out where they were, those were the priorities. Is anyone at their post? Kale's question came out as a croak, and he cleared his throat, trying to find his voice. When he tried again, he spoke with more strength. Anyone? I'm up. Othan replied, and Kale watched as the pilot reclaimed his seat. Looks like the computers are rebooting, sir. Thank you. Kale grabbed hold of his chair and hoisted himself into it, settling back as his heart raced and his entire body complained about the exertion. If this keeps up, I'll need to visit the doctor. Lord, that place is going to be a nightmare if everyone feels like I do. When you know our position, report. I'd like some scans. Find out if we're alone, wherever we are. Anthar? Deva Thynok, his tech officer, spoke up. She sounded worried. I think we might have some data corruption. I'm working on repairing it, but... What is it? Kale asked, with more bite than he intended. Um, it's just, well, it can't be right. What can't be? Kale rubbed his eyes. Just spit it out. The time, sir? Deva sighed. The computer insists that we have been in our current position for over a month. Impossible. Kale waved his hand at her. You're right, there's corruption somewhere in there. How's it even verifying that? There's a buoy nearby. Its transmitter seems to be out, but it's still keeping accurate time. Deva shrugged. I suppose it could have been damaged? That's your answer, Kale said. Anyway, scan the entire system and get a damage report on that buoy. I have a feeling we're going to need to call for help, and if that thing's broken, we'll have to fix it. Othan, do you have our position? We're drifting, sir. Othan shrugged. I'll have engine control when the reboot finishes, but for now, I have no idea where we are. This isn't a star that I'm familiar with. I'm checking the charts. This must have been surveyed, or there wouldn't be a buoy, right? Not necessarily, Deva replied. Some of those were sent out as deep space probes, programmed to locate out-of-the-way systems to assist wayward ships. Like ours? They don't necessarily mean anyone's been here before. They just anticipate arrival in case someone gets stranded. I read about that, Kale said. Either way, it won't matter. We'll get it online and report in, once we fix our data corruption. He tapped his console. Engineering, this is the Anthar. Do you copy? No response came back. Engineering, this is Anthar Rushin. Do you read me? Still no response. Someone must have rebooted everything. Othan said. They had to have initiated it. Deva nodded. You're right. Automation was offline. Only life support was functioning, and even that was operating on the emergency generator. Kale's body finally began to return to normal, and he was able to stand without feeling dizzy. Still, he kept a steady hand on the chair and took several deep breaths. When he felt confident he would not topple over, he stepped over to the communication station where Wenna was just getting to her seat. You okay? He asked her and she nodded. Good. First things first, coordinate with the other departments throughout the ship. 
Make sure you get a full report of damage and casualties. Start with medical. They're probably going to be the busiest for a bit. I'm heading down to engineering to see what's going on. Sir, is that wise? Deva asked. I haven't finished scanning our structural integrity yet. It might not be safe. I'll take the chance, Kale said. Someone had to have done it, and if there was a hull breach, they wouldn't have been able to. Besides, we seem to be steady and our drift is pretty light. I think we're in better shape than we should be. Yes, sir, Deva nodded. I'll continue to compile information. Thank you. Kale stepped onto the elevator. Keep me informed through personal comm, just in case shipwide is out. Stay focused on your tasks at hand, and we'll get out of here in short order. The doors closed, and Kale leaned back against the wall, closing his eyes. The downward motion made his stomach turn. Nausea lasted only a moment before settling into a general discomfort. He forced himself to consider their predicament, pushing aside his physical ailments in light of the mystery of where they were and how they got there. Jump accidents were a common topic at the academy. Every astrogation class, from beginner to advanced, talked about the mishaps throughout history. Some of them were outright horrifying, to the point Kale was surprised anyone stayed in the military after they read about them. He wasn't entirely sure when he came to terms with the possibilities and accepted them, but everyone he served with must have done the same. Instructors always tried to couch their lectures with the fact that safety protocols had dramatically increased since the first jump drives were introduced. Back then, parts of ships might disappear, ensuring both sides were destroyed. Some simply exploded. Others ignored the course's input into their systems, appearing inside objects. An old regulation stated no ship was to jump directly to the home world. Even with every safety protocol in place, they were to show up on the edge of the system and fly in through conventional engines. Since that particular little rule never left the books, some should have still been worried. But until a potential mishap occurred, one didn't really think about it anymore. This may not have been a mishap so much as damage, Kale thought. The explosion from the waste could have seriously impacted our engines. Wait. Kale's eyes snapped open seconds before the doors slid to the sides. He stepped off and leaned against the wall in the hallway as his memory trickled back. The brief moment of nothingness he'd experienced plenty of times through jumps lasted much longer than ever before. He remembered fighting it, trying to breathe, trying not to give in to the terror of lingering in that state. The fates certainly tested us all. I wonder when the rest of the crew will recall that struggle. We won't be able to jump again until we can run enough tests to ensure we don't have a repeat performance. The engineering deck tended to have a great deal of activity in the area, but as he refocused his attention, he noted no one was moving around in the hall. He paced toward the door, his footsteps echoing overhead. The scene felt eerie, and he fended off a feeling of dread, like he might find something horrible. As he drew closer to the door, he heard voices and a weight from his heart lifted. He tapped the panel and input his personal code, granting him access. Someone drew a firearm and aimed it at him before they seemed to recognize him. The security guard immediately lowered his weapon. Anthar! The young man pressed his hand against his chest in a salute. Forgive me, we had no idea what was going on. Thank you for not shooting me, Zanthari, Kale said. Where's engineer to Aaron? She's with the other seniors, the guard said, pointing deeper into the engine room. They're checking the crystals. Kale looked at the other engineers, each working on some task at a terminal. He picked one at random, a Vinthari he didn't know. The young man must have joined them just before they headed to Earth. He stepped over and watched his efforts, noting he was working on regulating power throughout the ship. The generators needed some coaxing to properly balance the load when first turned back on. Can you give me a report, Vinthari? The young man didn't look up and continued to work. Yes, sir, when we came to, we were on backup power. The only systems still functioning at normal levels were life support and environmental shields. Those are on backup generators, totally detached from the main engines. We reignited the generators after a systems check and rebooted all systems. Are there any problems left for us to worry about then? 
Chief Engineer D'Aaron is concerned about the crystals. They might be damaged, which would mean we're stuck here until we can fit a replacement. And that's if the setting is all right. Also, our regulators are down, or I wouldn't have to be ensuring power doesn't surge through the system. The last thing we need right now is a bunch of shorts, especially since medical just called down and demanded more power. Understood. What's the ETA for full power? I wish I could give you a good estimate, sir. Most stations are operating at nominal levels, providing they don't tap them out with regular usage. I'll have a proper time frame soon, though, and will certainly let you know. Thank you. Kale smiled, patting him on the shoulder. I appreciate your efforts. Carry on without me distracting you. He stepped away, observing each station in turn. Nothing appeared to be damaged, which gave him a good feeling of how lucky they were. The engines could have taken a serious beating considering what they did, and he wouldn't have been surprised if he showed up to fires and chaos. Instead, he found a calm crew doing their jobs to the best of their abilities. Kale couldn't be more proud of their tenacity and professionalism. Considering Mira literally dove back into her job the second she was up, said a lot about her dedication as well. He'd buy her a drink when they got back to the home world. And that's just a matter of time. First, however, we need to get everything fixed up and safe for our departure. Kale plunged deeper into the engineering room, heading for the crystal chamber. At the end of the hall, he saw Mira working with several others, moving about checking panels and screens. They shouted back and forth, relaying the information they found as a person on the edge took notes. Mira paused when she noticed Kale. Hold up, she said to her crew. Continue to collect the data. I'll be back with you in a moment. This looks dire, Kale said as she approached. How are we doing? Which part? Mira scratched the back of her neck. All primary systems will be back online and functional after the reboot is complete. A few circuits went, and we've got individual secondary units that require attention, but they can wait. Our biggest problem is the jump drive and crystal assembly. I'm afraid the gem might be cracked. Kale winced. Everyone who attended the Academy knew about pulse drives and how they garnered power from their perfectly cut crystal's vibrations. It fed the generators and maintained a constant and clean power stream for the entire ship. Cracked didn't mean it wouldn't give them energy, but the sheer amount required for a jump would probably make it break outright, which would likely result in their immediate destruction. What are we looking at? Replacement, Mira said. Which we can do. We've got the backup stored away, but as you know, that takes time. And when I bring the pulse drive offline to do it, we'll be on generator power for the better part of two shifts. We'll need to be on severe conservation throughout, just in case there are any delays in getting it back online. Understood, Kale hummed. How long before you think we can begin the process? Mira sighed. Another hour before we're back up to full power and all generators are restored to full strength. We're still performing a risk analysis and ensuring we can even take the thing out without impacting the assembly. If that's cracked or damaged, we might be done. I hope you were able to get a message out. There's a buoy, but we're not sure if it's even going to work, Kale shrugged. We're trying either way. Can you give us sensors? There may be something in the area that can help us. A habitable planet or moon? We have thrusters until you take the engine offline, right? Yes. You could move us now if you have to. Mira stepped closer and lowered her voice. I'm mostly worried about the enemy. If they tracked us, we're going to be totally vulnerable to attack. There won't be anything we can do. I know, but... Kale shook his head. Did you happen to note the date? Yes, I'm looking into data corruption from our angle, but... Deva already let me know she's on it. Mira checked her tablet. It can't be right. Can it? I don't know, but if it is, then we may not have to worry about the enemy chasing us. They would have found us already. If we truly were sleeping for a month, then that was some profound stasis. What if we were mid-jump the whole time? Mira smirked. I don't have time to speculate like this, but we might want to get a team in the briefing room to discuss at some point. I'm thinking there's some science here I'm missing. Some precedent for what we might have experienced. If there is, I haven't heard about it, Kale replied. I studied astrogation and jump behavior, too. No records I found or reported on talked about stasis or being trapped in the middle of one. 
Of course, there are countless reports of ships simply disappearing and never being seen again. It's more than possible one of them experienced what we did and simply could not get home. Cheery thought. Mira gestured back at the crystal. With your permission, I'll get back to work. Please, Kale gestured. Can you let me know where you're at soon? We're making progress, so it won't be long. Probably before you get settled back on the bridge. I'm heading to medical now to check on anyone who might have been hurt. Watch out for a briefing meeting. I'll have one set out. Thanks for everything, Mira. Keep it up. Kale returned to the elevator and rode it up two floors. There, he disembarked and paced down the hall toward the medical center. As he rounded the corner, he stopped in his tracks. People were lined up in the hallway, waiting for a turn to speak to a doctor. He approached and checked several of them over, most displaying too much fatigue to even note who he was. They don't appear to be physically harmed, but our re-entry must have done a number on them the way it had us. I'm guessing those closer to the hull got it the worst, but who's to say what impacted them more than anyone else? We're going to need all essential personnel back to operational status as soon as possible. Kale shouldered his way into the room and noted the controlled chaos going on within. Luckily, everyone was too exhausted to make much noise, but the doctors moved about in a flurry of activity. They seemed to not be bad off, but he figured they did something to themselves to operate at a normal level. Kale approached the chief physician, Irkan Niotha, and tapped him gently on the shoulder. The older man jumped, turned, and his irritable expression melted to one of resignation. He moved aside with the Anthar and kept his voice low, greeting him with a nod and muttered hello. This looks bad, Kale said. Are there any injuries, or is this some kind of strange fatigue? They're exhausted, some to the point of near death, Irkun said. I've been issuing stimulants to the worst of them and having those totally spent get some sleep— we didn't seem as impacted by it in here, and you seem okay. He ran a scanner over Kale. Yes, you're reading tired, but well. That's a relief, Kale replied. I'm not sure how this happened, but it looks like it affected the entire ship. Do you need anything else, or do you have this under control? Irkon sighed. To the best of our ability, we do. We'll get everyone, either in a bed or out of here, in the next couple hours— are there any personnel that you need sooner? I might. Kale looked around. I'll let you know and we can fast track them. Thanks for the update. I'll let you get back to work. Wait, what's going on with the engines? When are we going home? Kale offered him a worried grin. I'm afraid that's another problem we're dealing with. I'll address the crew when we know more. For now, focus on the wounded. I'll take care of the rest. He paused to look over the various patients, letting out a sigh. Many of them were young, Zondharis on their first or second tour. It made his heart sting to see them suffer. Good luck. Heading back to the bridge, Kale was bombarded by information the moment he stepped off the elevator. He held up his hands. Calm down, one at a time, please. He gestured to Deva, who seemed the most desperate to update him. You first, report. Captain, scans have picked up some strange readings on a nearby planet, like nothing I've seen before. Deva paused to catch her breath. At first, I was convinced I was just picking up some kind of interference from the atmosphere, or maybe even leakage from our engines, but as I established more data, I discovered a constant and consistent emanation. It's definitely not natural. It must have been constructed. And you don't know what sort of technology might have brought this about? Kale asked. No idea who might be responsible? Deva shook her head. No, sir. We have nothing like it on any database of the Alliance. I don't even have a way to measure what it can do yet, but I'm working on it. So what makes it so special? The consistency and the fact that I'm detecting no radiation, no heat signature, just a constant flow of power without venting. Deva shook her head. It's impossible. Unless whatever created it found a way to re-harness the waste, I can't even begin to guess at how they're doing it. I need to get with the engineering team to look at my findings. One step at a time, Kale replied. For now, continue your solo work on it and get me more information. The engineering staff remains busy. Is the planet habitable? Deva nodded. 
Yes, sir, though I'd recommend hazard suits to be on the safe side. There are readings I don't recognize, some kind of atmospheric anomaly. Okay, get back to work. Kale turned to Othan. What have you got? Engineering, let me know we have full power for now. However, if they're going to take the engines down, we're going to need to get wherever we want to be for a while. If we're going to orbit this planet that Deva's on about, we need to get moving. Our plotted course will take a shift to arrive. Kale nodded. Let's get moving then, just in case there's a good reason to be nearby. He turned his attention to Wenna. Did the buoy pan out? I can't say one way or another, Wenna said. I didn't get any log back for success or failure. It is orbiting the planet and maintaining itself just fine, though it makes no sense. Its engines seem to be offline. Something's holding it up there, and I don't know what. In any event, I recommend we attempt to perform maintenance on the buoy for a proper message. Okay. Thyna, do you have anything? Thyna shook her head. I'm good, sir. Weapons are online until they aren't. There's nothing to shoot right now, though, so I guess we're okay, huh? For now, Kale agreed. Okay, go ahead and get back to work. Kale sat down and brought up what they knew about the new planet. The information was disappointingly light, but Deva would offer more soon. The tech crews in their lab would be analyzing the data as well. If their equipment was capable of determining what they were looking at, they'd figure it out. If not, well, Kale always wanted to explore the unknown. Strange that I have the chance to be part of an expeditionary force in the middle of a war. I just wish it wasn't out of necessity. Orbiting the planet might be risky. When they got closer, they'd be able to determine the viability of the process. Until then, they had quite a while to perform their work and prepare for what was to come. Kale worried about his crew, but deep down, he thrilled at the situation they were in. This is the type of situation that shows what kind of leader you really are and whether or not you're ready for the position. I look forward to proving it and getting us all home at the end. Um, Anthar? Deva spoke up. I've got one more thing to report. Okay, Kale replied. Go ahead. It's about the time. The fact that the date shows differently than we expected? Well, I've confirmed there's no data corruption, Deva sighed. It's correct. We really have been gone for a very long time. Understood. Kale tried to remain calm, but the notion deeply bothered him. Their friends and family would all consider them missing in action, lost in the conflict and possibly even dead. All those people had been put through one of the worst horrors imaginable. They had to wonder what happened to their loved ones. I'll get us back now if I have to give my life. I swear it. Siva waited at the spaceport for the behemoth shuttle to arrive. Captain Gray Atwell and Clea on Twofall were both on board, and they had a lot to discuss before they could rush out and begin the search for the crystal font. Considering what they'd just come from, they probably needed some rest, but there wasn't really time. The folks lost out there needed help as soon as possible. Guards stood nearby. They closed that particular wing of the port for privacy. That and Siva rarely ventured far away from her base. There, she had complete control of the environment. Anywhere else, and they had far too many variables to consider. Criminals, listening devices, bombs, and other forms of violence were only a few, and most of them could not be sufficiently accounted for. I'm too close to success to risk my own life. I haven't picked a successor just yet. The Port Authority nearly had a heart attack when her people took over. He couldn't do anything about it, but he promised to make a formal complaint. Siva ensured his message went to one of her people working in the ministry, someone who would give it the attention it was due. Such small abuses of power felt petty, but she didn't want to waste time explaining herself to high command. Not over something so small as a little civilian inconvenience. That's the cost of security, folks. Siva read through the limited information they already had concerning the whereabouts of the crystal font and hoped the behemoth proved to be as good here as they did when the Orion's light went after the monastery. The message came through clear enough, but they were unable to relay reliable coordinates. Their intended destination might be a good place to start, but then she'd leave that up to the experts. 
As the shuttle swept in and landed, she set aside her tablet and stood. Watching from the lounge, she sipped her drink and tried to remain patient. Maintenance people rushed out and secured the shuttle, the only people she wasn't absolutely certain about, and as a result, each of them had a guard specifically assigned to watch them. When did I become this paranoid? I'm in the capital. But that doesn't mean there aren't those who would cause trouble. The ramp finally dropped and two Terran Marines came down first, each armed. Her guests came down next, each in their dress uniforms. Gray's was white with several ribbons and the golden rank of captain on his shoulder. Clea wore the severe Keelan black with her own set of decorations showing off far more achievements than the humble woman's demeanor ever let on. I like this girl, mostly because I'm pretty sure she dislikes me. She's definitely one of the good ones. I'm glad I've been keeping an eye on her. They were shown up to the lounge, and Siva stepped forward as they entered, shaking their hands. Welcome back. You both look well. Thank you for coming down here on such short and immediate notice. I appreciate it. Considering the news, Gray said, you would have had to keep us away with a gun. Siva adopted what she hoped looked like a sincere and concerned expression. It was one her mother used. Emotions became such a game to her, she only knew how to act them out. Day to day, she felt an abundance of duty more than anything else. As a result, it kept her from getting truly close to anyone. I'm very glad you both feel the same way I do. We need to get those men and women home. Clea's brows raised. Is that why we're doing this? Siva offered a thin smile. The thing about assignments, tasks, and missions is you can do them for any reason you want, providing you get them done. Do it for the families, do it for the soldiers, do it for the military, or me. But regardless of why, we'll save that ship and bring it back here. Of course, Gray replied. Are we meeting here? Siva nodded. Yes, it's away from the base, but we vetted it. Plus, it'll be easier for you to get to high command from here when we're done. I'm sure they want to put you through the paces of a debriefing and all that. However, know that I've got you covered. You won't be there for more than an hour or two. Our ship needs to be resupplied, Gray said. Already underway. I believe someone contacted your executive officer the moment your shuttle departed, and they're arranging everything you need. Plus the data from that weapon you were hit with. We're analyzing it now. Extra medics are on the way to help your doctors scan everyone to ensure there were no lingering effects we have to worry about. Siva patted his shoulder. I take care of my own, Captain. Thank you, Gray sat down. I do appreciate the help. I would like to know why you want the crystal font back so badly that you've turned it into an intelligence matter. High Command certainly wouldn't have sent ships to get them back, right? Undoubtedly, Siva replied, gesturing to her glass. Can I have them get you anything? Water would be fine, Gray said. So you were about to answer? Okay, if you want me to keep things totally transparent, Siva leaned forward. The crystal font just showed up out of nowhere. By the accounts of your log concerning that situation, it was more likely they were destroyed than missing. After all, you saw the flash and they were being pursued by a massive fleet. It stood to reason they all died. The missing in action report was put in to save the family some heartache. Leaving them to wonder? Gray asked. When would they be deemed gone? Clea answered. We have a regulation on the books stating that after one year without contact, a ship and its crew will be considered lost, all hands deceased. Siva gestured to Clea. There you have it. You do know your rules, Miss Antufal. Or should I say, Tothin Antufal? I'm not much for ceremony, Clea replied. Well, that's too bad, because I got high command to go through the whole honor thing. They were going to march you before the council, read some poetry, and have one of those cadets from secondary school pin the insignia on you. Siva sighed. I suppose you'd rather not bother. Eh, uh, are you serious? Clea looked uneasy. Siva realized she still felt amusement, especially when poking at the overly intense officers she often encountered. No, 
Not even remotely. Siva reached into her bag and tossed the young woman a box. That's the insignia. She held up her tablet, showing Clea's official record. The rank increase already was applied. And there you go. Officially on the registry and everything. Again, congratulations. Thank you. Clea opened the box, but only looked in briefly. I appreciate it. Ah! Siva waved her hand. You and I both know your rank doesn't matter. You're not vying for the attention of promotion or trying to get into politics. You just want to do your job and do it well. I was like you, so I get it. We're about the tasks, not the rewards. There's a reason we serve, and it goes a lot deeper than money. Pats on the back or prestige? You still haven't answered my question about why you want this ship back, Gray said. Ah, the captain, here to bring us back to reality. Siva tapped on her tablet. The truth is I want that ship back here. I want to recruit Kale Rushin into the ranks of intelligence and have them run ops for me. Provided they didn't survive on pure dumb luck, I can use resourcefulness like that. Like you have. There's a reason we're talking right now. I still don't know how you've convinced my government of this, Gray said. To put us to work, I mean. It wasn't hard. Intergalactic cooperation, for one, Siva shrugged. And I can pull strings, too. Your council doesn't quite know what to do with itself yet. Just entering into the arena of alien politics. They have to tread lightly and test the waters. Once they figure it out, I'm sure they'll have some demands. Every race joining the Alliance does. Until that time, it leaves them vulnerable to people like me who are able to, shall we say, guide them in the direction I need. Siva paused for effect. And that's where you two come in. I'm able to give Clea what she was promised and keep her on your ship. You're able to provide me with the military might I don't possess without these deals. Together we get things done. How's that for transparent? Pretty good, Gray said. So what happens to us when we get the font back? I hope you'll stick around. I know you want a shot at the enemy's home world, but we've got a lot to do between now and then. Siva lowered her voice. I can give you an update on the deadlock our high command has found itself in regarding battle strategy. They're not sure how they want to proceed, and with all the extra leaders at the table, it's complicated. So you're saying the attack is delayed, Clea said. Stalled, Siva replied. Would be a better term? They'll figure it out, and when they do, I promise my games will not hold you back. You'll be out there in the front lines if you really want to be, but I'm pretty sure even in that conflict, there'll be a better way for you to serve. Another avenue to help the cause. After all, any ship can sit in line to be battered. Few have the experience you do in being where one least expects. Like with Novalat, Gray said, when we showed up to turn the tide and ended up fighting the Orion's Light. Do you think they won't catch wind of where all our ships are going and find a way to be a nuisance? Honestly, the thorn in my side that is Krelon Arvax. Siva shook her head. But we're not here to talk about that somewhat distant future. We're chatting about saving a lot of lives today. People I know you feel close to. I've sent you my data. Now I need you to be fabulous and find them. Any suggestion on where to start? Gray asked. I don't recall you having a lot to go on. I don't, Siva shrugged. She gestured at Clea. But this woman here had a dream and brought us the coordinates of the enemy planet. I'm pretty sure she can do anything. Um, Clea blushed, rubbing the back of her neck. I wouldn't go that far. It was luck, little more. Skill, Siva corrected. Don't forget it. I've watched your career for a while, Miss Antufal, since before you joined the behemoth and were operating as a tech officer. Someone showed me your scores and I barely believed them. I even had a covert investigation go into whether or not you cheated. Clea's mouth dropped. Excuse me? It's true, Siva shrugged. And when I learned you had not, I was all the more impressed. I put you on my watch list, so to speak. 
The good kind, by the way. Not like Creelon or anything. I must admit I was pretty surprised when they sent you to be a liaison for the humans, but it made sense in a way. Top of the class graduate would do more for them than a diplomat. After all, you had to teach them about the tech too, right? They were fast learners, Clea muttered. Sure they were, and they had a fantastic teacher. Siva sipped her drink again. In any event, I think we've done enough polishing of ego, wouldn't you say? Captain, I'll let you get on with your day, and we can meet again before you leave if you have any additional questions. However, I'm pretty sure you have everything and anything I can give. What do you think, Clea? I agree. We'll talk later then, Gray said. Thanks for meeting us here. Best way to catch you right off the boat? Siva shook his hand again. Lovely to talk, as always. Good luck out there. I hope you won't need it, but these days, who knows, right? Indeed. Gray opened the door. Clea? Um, if you don't mind, Siva said, I'd like a quick private word with Miss Antufal. Gray's brows raised, but he nodded once, stepping out. Clea looked uneasy with the offer, but remained still. The two women observed one another, remaining quiet. When finally Siva broke the silence, she prefaced her words with a smile. She needed to get this girl on her side, to make her a friend even in pretense, if necessary. I'm sure you don't appreciate my methods, Siva said. But I would like you to know I do everything I do for the sake of the Alliance. Not merely Keelans, but every race we've embraced as our friends. I want the universe to be a safer place. I know that, ma'am. Clea, what have I told you I wanted to bring you fully into the intelligence fold to make you an officer reporting directly to me? I would be surprised, Clea said. I haven't really done anything to warrant such trust. Haven't you? You turned in your own sister, and I know you could have found a way around it. Siva shook her head. Your work has been beyond the call of duty, and I know for a fact you have a lot more to offer than merely working as a liaison. Even as part of the crew there, your job can be better. I want to give that to you. At what cost? Clea asked. I don't want to be like Trellin. No, I don't think you're a covert operative, and I wouldn't wish it on you. Your fondness for the humans shows you need to socialize without restraint. Siva turned and looked at the shuttle. I have to admit to you, I haven't seen many officers come along with the right attitude to get things done as you and I. Eventually, I have to retire. Or if something happens to me. What are you suggesting? Clea asked. You're an amazing code breaker. You put together pieces of puzzles that don't remotely look like they go together, and you're smart to boot. You know when to take orders and when to break them. I have not found anyone even close to as qualified to take over for me, and since I get to pick my own successor... You want me to... Be my second? Siva looked her in the eyes. At first, still serving aboard the behemoth, gathering intel about the places you visit, being prepared for the main event in this war, but afterward, you need somewhere to be. And I can't imagine a better place than working with me being my eyes and ears out there until such time as you take over. It's how my predecessor did it, and I'd like to think he picked wisely. I don't know what to say, Cleo looked down. It's a generous offer, an incredible one. Once in a lifetime. Yes, Cleo sighed. Can I, can I think about it? Do, Siva nodded. Come back with the crystal font and give me your decision. Really do some soul searching. I think you'd like the perks we have to offer. Clea moved to the door. I need to catch up with Captain Atwell, but I'll talk to you soon. Perfect. Siva sat back down. Thanks for stopping by and good luck. She finished off her drink and hoped the seed she planted would take root. A woman like Clea thrived on challenge and what Siva offered represented one of the greatest. She'd very likely say yes, and if not, well, there were other ways to seduce a mark. 
Chapter 3 Clea found it difficult to concentrate through the rest of her meetings. Siva's comments stuck with her and left her wondering sort of indistinctly. Did she want to be a spymaster? The thought never occurred to her before, but then, who aspires to such a position? It seemed unlikely one could simply decide on the intelligence track. Her friends who joined the overt version of the division didn't apply for it. They were offered the job after they finished their entrance exams, offered some oblique explanation for their eligibility. None of them even had the liberty to tell her where they trained or how long they'd be gone. When they connected again, their conversations were guarded, as if they didn't know how much to tell her about their personal lives anymore. She wondered whether their families experienced the same evasiveness. If so, Clea didn't want anything to do with it. Though after Vora, her sister, betrayed the Alliance, she understood why people with classified info kept it to themselves. Mother and father, though? I guess filtering wouldn't be such a big deal. Where does it stop, though? A little omission here, an overt lie there, eventually one might not even know the difference. Clea wondered if Siva even connected with her parents anymore. Keelans valued their families very much. Clea figured she might be able to ask her potential new boss some questions. Should I ask Gray what to do? The thought of talking to the captain about her opportunity made sense. They'd spent a lot of time together over the past year. But would it be okay? Should he know? Siva made the offer private, after all, and she made a point of it, in fact. That was all the answer she needed. This was one decision Clea had to make on her own. If she took the woman up on the offer, then none of her friends and family should know until there was a reason. The less they knew, the better, in case... Of what? Some random eventuality that involved an enemy? The idea made her sigh, a sound that drew a scowl from the superior officer in the meeting. Someday I might be in charge of your people, Clea thought. So believe me, you prattling on about the budgetary concerns of the war effort aren't really that important to me right now, especially since I have no influence over the people spending the money. Thanks, but I really should have just sat this one out. When Clea had time, she decided to visit the family estate well outside the city. During the early spring months, it tended to sit empty, and she'd be able to really think, put some time to being alone. She needed to focus on the crystal font and how they were going to find them. Gray told her they were going to spend two shifts in port before heading back out. Time might be of the essence, and they needed to hurry if they hoped to save their friends. Clea knew that Ollie and the rest of the tech crews would be absolutely invaluable in the process. They just needed to get out there. And I have to shove aside my future for the time being. Kale and his people deserve my full attention especially after what they nearly sacrificed for us. Kale felt immense pride in his crew for their efforts as they labored through the shift without rest. Their morale may have been shaken by what happened, but they were bolstered by their escape from the enemy fleet. A sense of strength defied their worry. They felt like they could do anything. Fate truly felt on their side. This didn't mean their obstacles were simple to overcome. As they moved toward the planet, Preparations for replacing the crystal had the entire engineering team on edge. Repair crews throughout the ship continued to find minor systems that failed upon their jump recovery, and the medical team was stretched beyond thin. As Kale read through the various reports, he felt their exhaustion and sympathized. Unfortunately, he couldn't let up on them. All their lives depended on continuing on, finishing tasks and preparing for escape. They built in a rest schedule, but few people actually wanted to leave their post. The sense of ownership hit them all, and no one wanted to be the weakest link in the chain that might eventually lead home. If the medical team hadn't been so tapped out, they would have certainly pushed for enforced rest cycles. Those already in the sick bay likely wouldn't be allowed to leave, ensuring at least half a shift worth of fresh faces in the event of an emergency. Kale got to the quartermaster report and had mixed feelings. On one hand, they were well-stocked for the next three weeks without rationing. Food supplies could be stretched to at least five weeks if necessary. They had far more severe problems, but feeding the crew would matter pretty fast once they had to tighten their belts. If the jump drive could not be repaired, they would be stranded for far longer than any amount of supplies could manage. 
They'd have to start foraging on any habitable worlds they could find. Making a long trek to another system with a buoy that might bounce their communications far enough for someone to hear. And even when they do hear, we'll have to hold out until they can send someone. They won't be able to drop everything and instantly hop out to us. We're going to have to hold out as long as we can. Maybe this planet will be our salvation. If it proves habitable, then we'll have no problem with resources as we wait for a rescue. Sir, Deva caught his attention. We're near enough to the planet that I can get some better readings. I still have no idea what that energy is that we're reading, but I'm able to scan the surface. Readings are all well within safety levels. Foliage, water, and oxygen content are nearly ideal, which, well, that worries me. Yes, it does feel like quite the coincidence. Kale rubbed his chin. Do you have any theories you'd like to share? Deva sighed. Only a wild one? Our sensors have picked up some strange metallic content in the soil and rocks. The databases have nothing that match them compositionally. Combine that with the unknown energy, and I'm curious if we've encountered a construct? A planet built by intelligent life? Othin scoffed. Impossible. No one has the technology to build something so large. And how would it be sustained? Their calculations would have to be miraculous to determine the exact distance from the star here. Deva sat up straighter. Interesting thought, Athen. She began tapping away at the console, her eyes narrow and focused. A few moments later, she grinned. My theory has been given some weight. I believe this planet may have a variable orbit pattern, possibly modified by the energy reading. For what purpose? Kale asked. Idealizing the atmosphere for whatever people are visiting, Deva said. Why they would have made such a world, I can't say. But if I'm right, then they've created a wonder. If we can study what they've done down there, then we would be able to forward our understanding of planetary reformation by generations. That's a bold statement, Othin said. For something which I doubt is even remotely possible. Anything is possible, Deva said. Your ten times great-grandfather didn't believe moving faster than light would ever happen, and here we are. Believe me, if someone can think a thing, it can become a reality. Don't get me wrong, if there's another explanation for what I'm seeing, I'll be excited to find it, but right now, with the science we have available, I'm making some guesses. Fair enough. Kale closed his eyes and thought. I want you to perform some additional scans, see if you can get an idea of how dangerous this place might be. Animals, sentient or otherwise, would be good. Poisonous foliage, anything you can pull. Also, we'll need to analyze the water and discover if there's anything edible. I'm on it, sir, Deva paused. Gravitational pull seems unusually light, far less than a body of that size should have. My calculations suggest we wouldn't even be able to achieve a traditional orbit because it wouldn't hold us. Thyna huffed. Seems like debris would have leveled this place by now based on everything you've figured out. I know, Deva replied. The planet's energy emissions may also act as a repulsion beam, but how does it know what to keep away and what to allow close if I'm right? Honestly, I'm even guessing about that. We really need to go down there and learn more. This may be one of the greatest scientific discoveries of our culture. Kale frowned at the screen, peering at the blue world they were approaching. The continents were clearly visible through light cloud coverage, and vast seas made up a good part of the surface. His gut told him to be cautious, that they were walking into a dangerous situation. Before the additional facts came out, the place represented an oddity. Now the unknown factors started stacking. He didn't want to risk people unnecessarily. I need further analysis, Kale said. I'm not comfortable sending anyone down there with that unknown power reading, and where would we even land? These questions need answers before we go. Deva didn't seem pleased. I understand, but many of the questions we're going to have will require on-site study. This place defies many of the conventions we take for granted. Wouldn't it be irresponsible to leave before we at least got a few answers? Kale replied, Our first order of business is keeping the crew alive and saving the ship. We can always come back to this place. I just... Deva paused, biting her lip. Yes, I'm sure you want to be on the list of early discoverers. 
You have already cataloged more about this planet than anyone else. Kale stood up and approached her station, patting her shoulder. And you have time to conduct further studies from up here. Until there's a reason, we're not heading down there, though. Yes, sir. Deva still sounded disappointed, but she returned to her duties. Kale understood her passion. He was curious as well, but considering what they were up to and against, it seemed crazy to take risks, especially when they were about to conduct one of the more difficult and complicated field repairs a starship could indulge. I'd still like to know how the crystal broke. Kale had seen them fracture before and during combat, but the ship didn't take any fire on their way out. The drive wouldn't have worked otherwise. Still, they'd lost a lot of time and anything could have happened. They were all unconscious during their re-entry, so no one knew just how rough it might have been. Kale checked the computer logs, but power was on minimum with pretty much all systems down. Their fate directly after the jump remained a mystery. He grunted, annoyed by the unknown all around them. Part of him wanted to have Deva start investigating the effects of the waste they dropped to escape, to see if their strange time loss might be repeatable. Something told him it wouldn't be, that they were simply unlucky in that moment. Too many variables went on at the same time. Their velocity, the way the waste ignited, their proximity to a specific planet, and all the debris floating about may well have created the perfect environment for their unplanned disappearance. One thing helped. The enemy certainly couldn't have tracked them. And if they did, they never would have found them. A small favor, but one that saved their lives. Kale considered his computer for a long moment, wondering if anyone had been through the system looking for them. Would the enemy have stopped at this strange world? Deva, have you been able to scan the surface for any crashed ships? Kale asked. Any tech that shouldn't be there? The metal in the rocks and soil makes it a little hard to distinguish that, Deva replied. But I'll check. The thought might have been a long shot, but nothing would have surprised him at that point. A communication came through from the medical bay, a text message warning him he needed to take a rest period. Ah, they must have caught up if they can start worrying about that now. He was exhausted and agreed with them, but there were several things that needed to happen before he could turn over temporary command. He reached out to Mira. How are you doing on preparations for the crystal swap? We've got the new one prepped, and we've nearly finished the risk analysis. I'll be filing my report in an hour, but I have to be honest, I'd rather not do this before my people can get some downtime. Believe me, we want everyone alert and hardy for this procedure. Any mistakes can strand us here for a very long time. Understood. Kale rubbed his eyes. Okay, finish the analysis and pack it in for a shift. When you're all back, fed and rested, revisit what you did and see if you missed anything. We'll reconvene mid-fourth shift. Yes, sir. Thank you. The line closed and he turned to Othan. How are you doing? I'm fine, sir. A little tired, but nothing I can't live with. I'm going to turn over temporary command to you while I take a rest period. Let's not make any rash decisions while I'm gone. Business as usual. Wake me for any emergencies, but otherwise, we remain close, but not too close to the planet. Deva, finish up what you're doing and head to your quarters as well. We'll take turns until everyone's refreshed. Kale stood and felt his back complain. He hadn't been up long, but waking from the strange event left him feeling as if he'd been through hard labor or a severe illness. He waited until he boarded the elevator before he stretched and rested against the wall. The thought of sleep overwhelmed all his worries, and he felt thankful for the fact. If his mind didn't let him turn off for a while, he'd be in for a long set of shifts. Considering what he'd been through he'd likely call one of the doctors for a sedative. Much as he didn't want to drug himself, being exhausted wouldn't be much better. Trellin Endall found himself in a difficult position. This wasn't unusual for him considering recent events, but frustration gnawed at him regardless. After escaping the doomed Orion's light vessel, he found himself on one of the Novalat moon colonies carrying stolen plans for a new weapon something the authorities would do anything to get back. Considering all he'd been through to make contact with the terrorist group, he could not be caught. Even landing proved to be a difficulty, avoiding scanner contact and evading notice by the military presence. 
Fortunately, the conclusion to a civil war kept them all busy, so he managed to land his escape pod on the outskirts of an inhabited territory. Though the moon orbited one of the larger planets, it was big enough to have its own breathable atmosphere. Trellin disembarked and made his way into town, keeping a low profile as he sought a way to escape the place. He needed a ship, or at least passage out of the system, and he had nothing to trade. All his personal items had been lost on the ship that exploded, including his weapons. Now, in a gray jumpsuit with a wrist computer and stolen property, he had to pull off the impossible, leave the moon without attracting enough attention to get him chased or caught. Then he'd be back to the next impossible mission, making a second contact with Orion's light. I must not like anything to be easy on a spiritual level. There's no other explanation for my luck. Arriving at the spaceport was easy. He traveled along with every other person on their way to work. However, once he arrived, he observed how tight security had become. They may not have been watching the skies carefully, but on the ground, their people were watchdogs. Every civilian had to provide identification and a biometric scan. Two things Trellin lacked. How am I going to get any of that in short order? I can't even steal a ship without getting through the first layer of security. Even if I do get in, there's bound to be additional checkpoints. How do I keep things subtle while still getting in there? A niggling thought tickled the back of his mind. He could always call out who he was and gain their cooperation. If they found out he worked for Alliance Intelligence, they'd be obliged to give him what he needed and get him on his way. But he couldn't risk it. They had no idea how deep the Orion's light talons dug, and if some informant put word out about him, the entire op, not to mention his life, would be in jeopardy. No, I have to approach this problem like a criminal and run with it until I have no other options. Trellin looked himself over and wondered what he must look like. The jumpsuit gave him a mechanic vibe, but he didn't have any tools to pull off the look convincingly. If he wanted to mug someone for their cash or goods, he'd have to do it with his bare hands, which meant beating someone. A civilian didn't deserve that, which left the guards. They don't deserve it either. Taking them out might not be hard, but even if I do, what sort of trouble will the poor bastard be in? I already screwed up some of their boys back on the planet. How many more do I have to sacrifice for this assignment? The answer came to him quickly. More. He didn't like it, but the truth was if he wanted to leave, he'd have to turn to some level of violence, even if it involved hurting an innocent. Orion's light represented a threat to the entire galaxy. Knocking someone out would pale in comparison to what inaction might accomplish. Okay, so who? And where? I don't know this place, so dumping an unconscious body won't be easy. Maybe a distraction's a better way to go, but the louder I get, the more people I'll put in harm's way. Trellin sat in a public area and forced himself to look casual. Resting felt good. He hadn't been able to take any real downtime for several shifts. Even with the stress of what he had on him, he was able to let his muscles loosen up and take a deep breath while evaluating his situation. The most important thing to remember was they were not actively looking for him. This meant any police or soldiers shouldn't pay him any mind. The foot traffic of everyday civilians was dense enough to let him blend in. No one could remember every face and all the cameras were closer to the port entrance. A legal route off the planet is not an option. Escaping with his stolen plans would be impossible if he tried to go through security the proper way. They'd search him, both electronically and physically. Even if they didn't know what they had by sight, their scanners would show what he had. Local ports had a habit of checking for stolen data since so many people tried to smuggle it around. Trellin didn't have time to work with a computer to obfuscate it, so he was stuck with a live drive that would immediately tell any computer operator that he was carrying stolen goods. He was back to the illegal route. Not only did he need to get past security, but he required a ship that was jump capable. If he fled the moon and anything else, they'd catch him in no time. If he got through and launched without clearance, he'd need to plot a course and be away in less than 20 minutes. Anything longer and he'd be facing their military. Distracted or not, they'd definitely make time to catch a pirate making off with something so expensive, and it would be compounded if they suspected he carried those plans. After an hour, he left the area for fear of being suspicious for loitering. 
His stomach growled, and he desperately wanted a little sleep. Unfortunately, neither requirement would be easy to fulfill considering his situation. He found himself wandering down a side street near a couple of restaurants when he saw a security officer stumble out of a bar. That might just work, at least to get me inside. The man leaned against a wall, struggling to maintain his footing. Trellin moved closer and looked around, noting they weren't quite alone, but the population was a lot thinner in that part of town. Apparently, whatever shift was happening there didn't afford a lot of patrons for the shops. A security guy might have an easier time slipping in, providing they don't all know each other, but I'm going to take a chance here. There are enough people roaming around for there to be far too many authority figures to keep track of. Sorry, guy. I have to get out of here. Trellin stepped closer to the man and gently took him by the arm. The security guard looked at him with a startled expression, but didn't try to pull away. I didn't do nothing in there, he slurred. What? What do you want? Come with me, sir. Trellin urged him toward the alley. We need to talk. What for? I already said I didn't do anything. Leave me alone. I just need to get back to the barracks. In a minute, Trellin used more force and the man stumbled after him. They paced halfway down the alley to the darkest part. The guard constantly muttered the whole way, mostly gibberish. If he was nervous, he did a fantastic job of hiding it, but the booze must have fortified him. When they reached a dumpster, they stopped. Oh boy, you're not going to hit me, are you? Trellin frowned. Afraid so. You'll be fine in a couple hours, buddy. He drew back and clocked the man square in the jaw, the force of the blow knocking the inebriated man out immediately. As he began to collapse, Trellin caught him and propped him up against the trash and stripped him of his uniform. The whole process took several minutes, and every second made Trellin more and more nervous. He knew that anyone who happened to glimpse down on them would see what was going on, and the whole plan would be ruined. There were few places to go beyond the settled part of the moon, and without knowledge of the area, he'd get lost fast. Why do these guys have so many buttons on their shirts? Seriously, this fashion is ridiculous. Trellin tore off his own jumpsuit and forced himself to calm down, pulling on the garments slowly. He didn't want to rip anything or the whole exercise would be wasted. The man's boots were too small, but the rest fit reasonably well. He hoisted the naked guard and deposited him in the dumpster, strapped on the guy's firearm, and steadied himself for the dangerous part of his plan. Security guards themselves may have been searched, as well, when they entered the facility, but he hadn't noticed any during his hour-long observation. Chances were good they had a side door, one he might slip through and into the port proper. Whatever came after would be a mystery he'd have to address on the fly. The planning phase ended, especially since it was only a matter of time before the man he assaulted woke up and raised an alarm. Trellin rushed back to the courtyard and slowed down as he came in contact with other people. Blending in, he walked confidently beside them and noticed he was given a wide berth. Luckily, the uniforms didn't have any name tags on them, but they were pretty obvious in their light gray with black piping. The firearm also contributed to the overall look. Unfortunately, Trellin hadn't shaved in days, but at least his beard was filled in enough to look intentional. Three days earlier, he wouldn't have been able to pull off his disguise in the slightest. Approaching the stairs, he cast his gaze around for a sign indicating which direction he was expected to take his staff. Panic gripped his heart as he drew closer until he caught the thing he was looking for. Security on duty were directed to go around to the left. A security card would be required, but it didn't look like anyone got searched. All the better. He drew out the man's ID and swiped it, causing the door to buzz before it swung open. He paced through as if he belonged and continued down a hallway. No one was around, but he figured a camera picked up his entrance. They might be running facial recognition, so once again, he felt the crunch of time. The schedule gripping his chest made him nervous, but he forced himself to remain calm taking regular breaths and walking without urgency. A guard started approaching from in front of him, and Trellin wondered if he might need to defend himself. The guy nodded to him as they passed one another, barely taking heed. As he reached the second door leading into the port, he didn't hesitate, opening up and stepping inside. 
People milled about, carrying out business as usual. Trellin watched for a brief moment, trying to decide how best to get himself on board a ship and out of there. He needed a computer, one that he could access for several moments without interruption. They'd have a manifest of all visitors and whether or not they were interstellar crafts. A nearby public terminal looked like it would do the trick with only a little coaxing. Trellin approached casually and tapped the screen, bringing up a couple of options. One was for visitors and another offered access for security or maintenance personnel. He tapped security and was forced to swipe his card. A screen appeared, letting him know it was accessing the required information. He glanced around, noting that no one seemed to be paying attention to him. The terminal beeped once, indicating it had information ready for him. Menu items offered security footage as well as lists for visitors and currently docked ships. He tapped the silhouette of space vessels and held his breath, suddenly aware that there may not be any interstellar visitors. Luckily there was, and it didn't look like it would be too difficult to pilot alone. It was at Docking Bay 16, not too far from his current location, but due to leave in two hours. The owners might be there. The thought of robbing some people of their property, especially something so big as a ship, made his stomach knot. He had to get it done, but they'd be stranded, inconvenienced at best with a worst-case scenario involving bankruptcy. He might be able to get the government to help them out after he left. He'd have the ability to send messages again and catch up with Siva. Maybe they'd have another plan to deal with Orion's light, and he'd be able to go home. Trellin wouldn't let that hope blossom, but it sat in the back of his mind, taunting him with the possibility. Stranger things had happened. Someone behind him cleared their throat, and he looked to see a well-dressed businessman tapping his foot. You going to be on there all day? Performing some maintenance, Trellin replied. I'm all done. He cleared the terminal and stepped away. There you go. About time, the man muttered, going about his business. Trellin moved toward the hallway leading to the docking bay, arriving at the door when he heard someone shout. He ignored it, not even bothering to look, but he did pick up the pace just a little, allowing urgency to compel him. Another cry, this time more insistent, made him glance. Someone was waving in his direction. What do they want? Trellin waved back and they nodded, gesturing for him to come back. He ignored the command and opened the door, stepping through and closing it behind him. Engaging the locking mechanism, he noted the cameras in his peripheral vision. Time to really move, I guess. Trellin picked up the pace, jogging down the hall while reading signs. Various doors led off to different bays, and he had to go nearly to the end to reach 16. He was halfway there when the door he came in through opened up and several people came spilling in. He shifted to a sprint. You there, someone shouted. Stop, what are you doing? How'd they figure it out? Trellin's mind spun up, trying to think of what might have given him away. Had the guard woken up? Did their facial recognition kick in? Did he step out of place? It didn't ultimately matter. He'd been caught. Getting out of there might be a miracle, one he knew he'd have to create himself. The map he pulled up indicated he was getting closer to the ship. Tech crews should have been done prepping it for launch. They were just waiting for their window to depart, and the crew, however many of them there might be, would either be on board or nearby. That meant he'd have to come on pretty strong. Trellin burst through a door into the open air, the ship sitting less than a hundred yards away with the sky above them. I'm really damn close. People looked startled as he came in and he decided to play up his costume for all it was worth. I'm with station security. We've got a fugitive on the run. You see anyone come in here recently? He counted five people total, two women and three men. They were near the ramp to the ship and could easily board. If they were able to do so before he got close, they'd lock it up and he'd be done. If Trellin could distract them long enough for him to get close, he'd get out of there. Otherwise, the guards would overtake him. Just you? The largest of the men spoke up, taking a step forward to greet him. We just got an alert on the comm about something going on. It's pretty bad, Trellin said, trying to buy time as he continued walking. He knew the closer he'd get, the more obvious it would become he was out of place. Covered in sweat, exhausted and unkempt, 
His disguise was only meant to confuse enough for him to get into the place and find a way out. Have you heard any racket? Should we board the ship? One of the women asked. Maybe we can lock ourselves down until the situation is resolved. Not a bad idea, Trellin said. But have you all been here the whole time? Has someone always been watching the ramp? Our suspect may have boarded when you weren't looking. Unlikely, the big guy replied. Look, I'm going to need to see some ID. Just then, the door behind them burst open and the real security personnel came in. Get away from that man, the lead soldier barked, pointing in their direction. Trellin was only a few paces from the civilian. He dashed forward and grabbed the man by the wrist while drawing his weapon. Placing it to the side of his hostage's head, Trellin started moving toward the ship again. Drop your weapons or I'll shoot. Put your gun down, station security ordered. We won't tell you again. This is going to get bad if you don't comply. Already looks pretty bad, Trellin said. Now I need the civilians to step away from the ship or I'll start shooting people. Believe me, this is not the sort of disaster you want in your hands. If I hurt a bunch of innocents because you don't comply, then what's your superior going to say? How do you think you'll answer the hard questions? I can't let you take that ship. Take our ship? The other woman spoke up. Are you kidding? Shoot him already? Lyra, Trellin's hostage, cried out. Have you noticed I'm right here? Trellin glanced over his shoulder and noted he was within 20 yards of the ramp. Luckily, the spacers were too stunned to take any action. They could have locked the thing down and he'd be dead in the water. Instead, they gawked at the spectacle, buying him a little more time to make his miracle. Listen, Trellin muttered to the man he was holding. I'm very sorry about this, believe me. If there were any other way, I wouldn't be doing this. But I have to leave this place. Just settle down, sir. The hostage kept his hands raised as he spoke. Please, we didn't do anything to you. You should surrender to the security people. They'll shoot you otherwise. Put the gun down. Security shouted again. We are not going to keep warning you. But you're not going to shoot me either, Trellin replied. Not with the hostage in the way. Back off or he dies. Whoa, Trellin's hostage cried out. Come on, I don't deserve this. No, you don't, Trellin said. Believe me, I know. He approached the ramp and the sense of desperation increased in the security people. They knew the moment he boarded the vessel he'd be difficult to dislodge, and if he launched, they'd have to turn over his capture to someone else. The rest of the crew tried to bar his way, standing in front of the ramp. We're not letting you on our ship, the one called Lyra spoke. Give up already, this is ridiculous. I'm going to shoot this guy in the head, Trellin said. And maybe I'll get shot shortly after, but I'll tell you what, the next person who dies is you, Lyra. The comment made her gasp. Yeah, I'm sure you're not used to people telling you like it is, but there you go. You will be the second person to go even if I'm next. Now back off. Someone pulled her aside and they gave him space to go up the ramp. What are you doing? Security shouted. Stop him! That's your job, Lyra yelled back. Don't let him get away. Trellin backed up the ramp, pulling his hostage with him. I doubt you want to come with me, he said. When we get to the top, you've got five seconds to get back down there. Understand? Please, you can't take our ship. This is our home, our livelihood. Sincerely, we'll take you where you want to go, I swear it. You and I both know you're not able to be honest in this situation. Security came close enough to see, so Trellin took two shots, driving them back. He saw the panel to close the door. Okay, get going. This is your last chance. Start shouting at them not to shoot or they might get trigger happy. Go. But please. I said go. Trellin booted the man in the rump, propelling him forward. The poor bastard stumbled and nearly fell, shouting as loud as he could for them to not fire at him. Someone grabbed him and dragged him out of the way, firing into the ship just as Trellin hit the button to seal it. As the ramp went up, the shouts of his pursuers became muffled. He rushed to the cockpit and checked the controls, thanking the fates that they were getting ready to leave. The engine was primed and ready for takeoff. He kicked on the shields and engaged the thrusters, lifting off. The radio lit up from tower control, demanding to know what he was doing. Trellin ignored it, directing the vessel at an angle before departing. 
He felt tempted to hit the burners for a swifter getaway, but he knew the people down there might get incinerated in the process. They were likely already uncomfortable, and he'd done enough damage for one day. The moment he cleared the area, though, he kicked the burners on and broke atmosphere in a few seconds. Ships hailed him, demanding answers to his swift departure. It wouldn't take them long to figure out he'd stolen the ship and wasn't simply a defiant spacer wanting to get moving. Trellin plotted a course for an out-of-the-way system where he could provide an update to intelligence. From there, he'd be able to hop over to one of the old pirate hangouts and take some downtime while trying to find the Orion's Light again. He had to fight frustration about starting over from scratch, especially when he'd been so close. Fighters on his radar cast aside concerns as he focused on evasion. The navigation computer didn't want him to go to his destination, warning it was in the middle of nowhere. He had to initiate an override, which took almost a full minute. Plenty of time for fighters to get close enough to engage. As they drew nearer, he picked up the comm, hoping to buy some time. Star Skimmer, this is the Novalat Police? The voice crackled in his ear. You are instructed to power down your engine and surrender immediately, or we will blow you out of the sky. You'd rather destroy the ship than give it back to its owners, huh? Trellin asked. Seems a little wasteful to me, don't you think? What guarantees do I get if I surrender? How will I be treated? That shouldn't really matter to you right now, since you're facing death, came the reply. Power down immediately. We will not give you a third warning. I'd like to negotiate. Trellin looked at the course, and he had less than twenty seconds. Will you feed me? I had to steal the ship because I'm starving. That's it. Pulse blasts flew past the ship, and he initiated an array of evasion maneuvers, doing his best to keep ahead of them. Unfortunately, the merchant ship wasn't meant for combat, and he was lucky to keep it flying straight, let alone avoiding incoming attacks. The shields flared twice, and he knew he wouldn't get a third. The computer chimed, letting him know it was ready. Slapping the panel, he engaged the jump drive and held his breath. I hope you people had decent equipment. The shouts of the security people rang over the comm as he winked out. Trellin escaped. Chapter 4 Two hours into their trip toward the planet, Kale received an update from the engineering team. They would be ready to make the transition for their crystal at the beginning of the next shift, nearly three and a half hours away. Right around the same time, they'd arrive at the mysterious planet and have some options in the event the jump drive was too severely damaged. Kale had Wena engage a shipwide comm, leaning toward the mic to address the crew. He'd been rehearsing some of what he intended to say since he promised Irkon he'd talk to them all. As he opened his mouth to speak, most of the prepared speech disappeared, and he had to improvise. This is Antar Rushin. I know you've all been operating with little information about our current situation. I'd like to offer you some now. First, our departure from the research facility proved to be both a success and a failure. The ploy to use waste from the pulse drive damaged our jump capability. We are currently stranded in this section of space. Before you begin to worry, however, please note that engineering is working on repairing the damage. They will begin the process in around four hours. Until then, we are speeding toward a planet in this system which appears to be habitable. A buoy is orbiting the world and we plan to ensure it is online to send a request for help. As we approach our problem from multiple angles, I need you all to stay focused on your tasks and do the best job you can do. We've come this far together, and I fully intend to get you home. Please direct any questions to your section heads. I'll be hosting a briefing for them shortly. Thank you. Othan glanced over his shoulder. Well done, sir. Thank you. Kale replied with a smirk. I'm glad you approve. Deva, do you have anything to report? Not really, sir. I believe when we arrive, I'll be able to pull a lot more data from the planet. Engineering has repaired all minor damage throughout the ship. There are no more outstanding work orders for assistance at this time. Medical reports people are returning to their posts or quarters. All in all, if not for the jump drive, we'd be at near 100%. Kale nodded and returned to his own computer, reading through the reports she mentioned. As he finished, 
he turned his attention to the view screen and the planet ahead of them. He wanted to know more, but as they approached, he knew in the back of his mind he would not be sending anyone down there. The risk was too great, and without the support of the Alliance behind him, he wasn't taking any unnecessary chances. It would probably break Deva's heart, but maybe she could be part of the next visit they made. Until then, though, their sole focus had to be getting the jump drive back and fixing the buoy. Their lives depended on one or the other. His eyes began to burn, and he realized he needed to take the advice of the medical team. Even if it was a short nap. Still, he didn't have time. The briefing he promised would probably eat up a third of the shift. Then, they'd be switching out the crystal, and he couldn't be sleeping then. Looks like I'll be taking a couple stimulants after all. The thought didn't make Kale happy. While they certainly kept him awake, they'd always left him with headaches in the past. Today would likely be no different. He leaned back in his chair and tried not to relax too much. On his way to meet the section heads, he'd visit medical. Fully outfitted and ready to go, the behemoth made their departure from port, heading toward deep space for a jump. They didn't have a destination as of yet, but Clea, Ollie, and Paul Bailey were working on it. As they congregated in one of the tech labs, their computers ran through dozens of options for where the crystal font might have jumped to. The problem, Clea began, is that they could have made multiple jumps by now. However, an emergency hop tends to only be a system away, like a slightly longer micro jump. We could start in those systems nearby and look for any sign of them. Chances are good such signatures have dissipated, though. Ollie hummed. What if we went to a central location? He brought up a star map and pointed at a system adjacent to the research facility. If we go here, we can systematically grab data from all the buoys. If the enemy didn't take theirs out, it might even have course data. Clea shook her head. It won't. Standard procedure when fleeing an engagement is ensuring no data is transmitted. Otherwise, the enemy could have just followed them, and considering they thought they had the research we were trying to protect, I guarantee they would have. Fair point. But at least we'd get the buoy data from other points. Paul spoke up. I've got a question. When the crystal font left the system, we thought they exploded. I read the report. Now we know they didn't, so what could have caused that impression? What could they have done to make us think they blew up? Clea smiled, grateful for the young man's insight. Good question, Mr. Bailey. There are several things that come to mind. They likely wanted to buy themselves some space. They could have jettisoned explosive cargo. Bomb ordnance, for example. What else makes such a spectacular explosion? Ollie asked. I think detonating one of our pulse bombs so close to the ship would be too risky. They're designed to take out installations and would easily chew through shields. Lord knows the enemy was hammering them, too. It would have practically been suicide. I'm running a simulation, Paul said. Typically we recycle pulse waste, but it takes a while for the stuff to be usable. It's pretty volatile for several days. Could they have used that to make their escape? Dumped a whole bunch and jumped out on that? Would have definitely distracted the enemy. Clea felt skeptical, but couldn't outright deny the idea. It seems unlikely, only because no one could predict what the stuff would do. It could interfere with coordinates, and that's the most subtle problem. Still, if they did that, there may still be traces today after all this time. Of course, we'd have to use long-range scans to do any of the work. Because the enemy might still be there, Ollie said. Clea nodded. An adjacent system would give us an opportunity to get the most detailed scan possible. However, confirming they did something crazy doesn't necessarily get us closer to finding them. She brought up the communication Siva shared with them. This came through the main buoy of our home world. Let's tap into the network and see what we can come up with. They put their heads down for some time, each attacking the problem from a different angle. Clea knew they needed to get something from the buoy before they reached their destination. Gray would expect a destination when they were in a position to jump. But the vastness of space made the prospect intimidating. Hundreds of thousands of messages went through the various buoys on a daily basis. The cash was dumped every hour and a half. 
The good news was Siva's people made a backup of all the activity in the time immediately before and for 30 minutes after the Crystal Font's message came in. Clea brought up the data and looked at timestamps. Everything followed a strict sequence, being routed and delivered by a triply redundant software package. They were broken up into multiple categories. In-system messages came from no farther than the space station on the border near the furthest planet out. Out-of-system messages could come from anywhere, but they did have a range limit. Clea wasn't sure what specific parameter was used, but a third category came from distant places. These were messages that likely had to bounce from buoy to buoy to make it back to the planet. They could be only a few days old or pushing months. Her heart hammered as she checked the backup logs. This has what buoy the message came from. Clea checked, but her shoulder slumped. The last buoy the message touched was an adjacent system where several colony worlds operated. If the crystal font was there, they would have already received help. Furthermore, they couldn't follow the message because the buoy may well have already purged the message. Still, there's a chance there. Even if the message has been deleted, we know it came from that place. Ali, Clea said, bring up all buoys adjacent to this one, here. She tapped her tablet and brought up the system over his buoy. Show me the network from that point spanning outward. I'm on it, but... Ollie paused to work. I'm not sure how it's going to help. These messages could have come from anywhere. How can we narrow down the one they came from? Oh, Paul spoke up. Check it out. There has to be buoys that don't get as much traffic. Those might not have purged the data yet, right? A distinct possibility, Clea said. Definitely an option for us to check. We also know they aren't in a high traffic area, or else they would have already received help. Finally, they must be in some system with a buoy to have sent that message at all. They may have been there this whole time, stuck, too. And it could have taken so long for their initial message to reach us. I just wish they had been able to say more, Paul said. Like some coordinates would have been nice. Too easy, Ollie replied. Anyway, we've got this. Durant Vi Purin stepped into the room, carrying his tablet. His white lab coat fluttered around him as he took a seat at the head of the table and launched into an update without so much as acknowledging them. I've done some analysis of the message we received from the font. The interference should help us locate them. How so? Clea asked. Initially, I thought the static was simply degraded quality, bits lost in the digital transfer. But when I took a closer look, I found that I could clean up the message sufficiently to remove all the potential noise. When I isolated that, I discovered a steady rhythmic wave, some kind of energy reading. Durant grinned. And my favorite part is I have no idea what could generate it. Is that good? Ollie's brows lifted. I mean, if you don't know what it is, that sounds bad. It'll be fascinating and we'll definitely learn something on this trip, Durant replied. Anyway, I had the computer compare it to every form of engine and machinery in our database, but nothing came close to matching. It truly is a mystery. How will that help us find them? Paul asked. Durant hummed, through the process of elimination, we can rule out systems that do not have the energy reading. How far out can we get that information? Clea asked. Because we don't want to go hopping all over creation. I'm not sure. I'm still writing a program to detect it. Durant shrugged. But for now, what have you come up with? We're checking the buoy network, Ollie said. I finished mapping it out, and we can take a look now. Clea tapped the received link and watched the network form outward from the home world, reaching far and wide. Ollie marked all the buoys that were in remote systems, and the number was much higher than she hoped. Her vision was they might have a dozen or so, but as she watched the numbers climb, she realized they'd have a hard time collecting from even half of them. They needed a way to limit their searches, to narrow the parameters. Clea decided to assume they only jumped once until they had evidence to the contrary. The idea that they hopped out, then found another system to go to, seemed unlikely, and if they did, 
They might be flat out impossible to find without another message. Taking a look at the research area, she noted that the buoy there was still active. Also, it was off the civilian grid. Only their military software even located it. She squinted at the screen and filtered by the least used buoys in the area. Seven began to blink. Three were in close proximity to the compromised research facility. These buoys are interesting, Clea said. They barely have any use, especially since the research facility fell to the enemy. Didn't the military shut that off? Durant asked. If not, they should have. Anyone in close proximity could hack into it? Learn our coding methods? No, Clea replied. They just take it off the standard routing. By leaving it on, we retain a valuable tool. For example, if we wanted to spread some disinformation, we could turn it back on a few days early, route some gibberish through it, then send the falsehood. Our enemies would pick it up and have to second-guess whether or not we were telling the truth. Ah, Durant nodded. This is why I'm not in the military, I suppose. In any event, we can use it to determine if the enemy is still in that section of space, but we have to be closer. Clea rubbed her chin. At least one system away, at one of the adjacent buoys so we can connect up to it and send the activation code. We can observe the research system and get scan information to determine how the crystal font actually left the area. You think there's anything left to scan? Paul asked. It seems like it would have dissipated by now. Ollie added, Not to mention the fact we had a pretty big engagement there. I'm guessing any debris will interfere with our scans, especially with something as rudimentary as the buoy. We can get all we need, Clea replied. And if they did what we think, then the signature will not have dissipated. That waste material, even ignited, stays around for a long time. It takes a while to recycle for a reason. So you recommend we go to one of these three adjacent buoys, Durant said. Scan it for information, then check the compromised system to determine our next move. Clea nodded. Exactly. Sounds reasonable, Paul said. I can get behind it. Me too, Ollie added. I'll talk to the captain, Clea said. You'll want to get back to your posts. When we arrive, we're going to have to be on alert. This is dangerous territory we're about to enter, and if we have to fight, you should be ready. Kale woke as his computer chimed, indicating he had a communication. He checked, noting the caller as Mira. He sat up, rubbed his eyes, and tapped the button, doing his best to sound awake and refreshed. The way his voice cracked, he failed miserably, but couldn't muster too much concern, at least in that moment. Anthar Rushin here. Anthar, Mira began, I'm sorry to have woken you. We have a bit of a problem. I'll be down in a moment. Kale killed the connection and washed his face, drying it quickly before throwing his uniform back on. Checking himself in the mirror, he knew he had to continue to look his best despite the circumstances. The crew needed to see him as dauntless if their morale was to remain positive. He headed down to the engineering section and paced inside, looking around for anything overtly out of place. People continued to work, moving about the area between panels, taking care of different tasks. He found Mira by the crystal assembly chamber with several other technicians gathered around. She broke away and joined him. The crystal's ready to put in, Mira said, but I've performed several tests and I'm afraid we have to spark it. Something happened in the jump and the container became unsealed. Kale knew the term well. It essentially meant they needed to give the jam enough juice to power the jump drive, a procedure typically performed in port. The last time it was done on a ship he worked on, He'd been a pilot. He remembered the stress around the situation then, though the gravity of it then wasn't what it was now. If they didn't find a way out there, they'd be stranded. I understand. Kale scratched the back of his neck. Do you have a plan? Any thoughts on how we might go about it? All our generators combined can't generate that kind of power, Mira said. But I spoke with Deva, and she believes the energy on the nearby planet could work. I ran some simulations, and I have to agree with her. There's plenty down there. We just have to figure out how to harness it and pump it into the crystal. There are a lot of ifs in that plan, 
Kale pointed out. Not to mention the fact we might not be able to survive on the surface of that planet. None of us has any clue what we're getting into down there. The risks are outweighed by the potential benefits, Mira said. If we don't try, there's nothing we can do up here to spark this. What about using the other crystal? The moment it leaves the assembly, it's going to drain fast. The cracks are bad. It'll be useless in less than ten minutes. The only reason it hasn't given out already is the chamber it's in, storing that power to ensure it doesn't simply dissipate. Kale nodded. I understand. It does sound like the planet might be our only hope. Unfortunately. I'm afraid so. But Deva has done some outstanding work cataloging the place. She knows a great deal about the energy field, the foliage, the surface, and the water. And I can spare a tech crew to help find a way to harness that power. Kale smirked. I would hope so, considering the situation. Mira shook her head. A standard response for a non-standard situation. But in any event, how long before we send someone down? When will you put the new crystal into the assembly? When we have a method to spark it, Mira replied. The generators can't keep us going for long. At least we're operating right now. Understood. Kale looked at the broken crystal, considering the situation for a long moment in silence. Several things needed to happen before he felt comfortable having anyone set foot on that world. The first of which involved recon outside of Deva's scans. He turned to Mira and patted her arm. Thank you for the assessment. I'll contact you when we're ready. We're poised and ready to take care of it the moment we can, Mira said. Good luck, sir. Kale headed to the bridge, feeling pressured by fate. Deva was probably right. They needed to know what was happening down there and how the planet came to be. Their investigation for the power source would likely gather other answers as well. So far, the place seemed rather accommodating. Now to find out if that's actually true. Kale stepped off the elevator into the bridge and immediately approached Deva. It seems you'll get your wish. We're going to have to go down to the planet. Sir? Deva's eyes widened. But you said... I know, Kale interrupted. We've got a problem with the replacement crystal. It needs to be sparked. His comment led to several groans throughout the ship. I know, but Mira has a plan and it involves using the energy source on the planet below. We just have to go down there to determine how we can harness it. Deva, have you found any dangerous plants or animals? No, sir, Deva shook her head. But honestly, as I mentioned before, it's hard to get too fine of detail due to the metal in the rocks and soil. I will say this, it is unlikely we would be able to grow food down there. It would have to be done in greenhouses with heavily filtered dirt. At least... That's my assessment. Let's hope we don't have to start a farm, Othin muttered. Thank you for the commentary, Kale said, returning his attention to Deva. We're going to launch several fighters to scout the area. I want you to coordinate their efforts and tap into their scanners. They'll be able to get closer, which should help, I assume. Get them to narrow down where we should go to find the power source. It's a big planet, and we don't want to wander too much. Yes, sir. Othan, get us a little closer, just on the verge of their gravitational field. That's practically right on top of it, Othan replied. This place is weird. Now you admit it? Deva asked. Never denied it. I just don't believe it's what you think. Enough, Kale said. We can debate this place after we have more facts. Arguing opinions is pointless. Thyna, get those fighters launched. Wenna, open a comm net for the various parties that need to talk. Mira's preparing a team, so we should as well. I want ten soldiers to accompany whoever goes down there. Deva raised her hand. I volunteer. Othin chuckled. Your eagerness is ridiculous. Don't you want to know more before you risk your life? That's how we're going to learn more, Deva replied. I'll be selecting the people who go, Kale said. Focus on your duties, both of you. We've got too much going on for this kind of banter. Sorry, sir. Othan began moving the ship, and Deva tapped away in silence. Kale knew he had to pick those who wanted to go on the mission. There would be plenty of people who weren't interested. The soldiers tended to be good sports about any sort of trip. 
but any others, technicians or people like Deva, were less enthusiastic. As the fighters launched, Kale hoped they found what they needed with minimal effort. Flying around down there might even be strange depending on the atmosphere. They'd learn a great deal from a few passes. Luckily, that's all they needed to decide how to progress to the next step. Deva, have you been able to analyze the buoy? I've been working on it. As I said, it seems to be functioning. Seems to be. I still say we get someone out there to work on it. Understood. Kale hit the comm and brought Mira online. I need you to get a technician who can fix a comm buoy. The one in this system is acting up. They'll be ready to go shortly. I'll have them report to the hangar. Perfect. Kale turned it off. Thyna, prepare a second shuttle for the repair of that buoy. We need to be hitting our problems from multiple angles if we're going to get out of here. Okay. I'll be quiet and let you work now. Let me know the moment you have something to report. Vinthari Alma Ilvar had been flying a fighter stationed on the crystal font since long before Anthar Rushin assumed command. She started her career as a Zanthari and took a promotion just before their ill-fated trip to the research outpost. The whole mission left her with a bad feeling, and the gravity of their jump out of the system confirmed her fears. Arriving in the unknown sector with a broken-down buoy and a strange planet didn't do much to improve her confidence. Her duty, along with two other fighters, was to perform recon and gather additional scan data before a team landed on the surface. She didn't envy them, especially since she had no particular desire to see what happened when they broke atmosphere. They departed the ship in a group of six with a shuttlecraft in tow. All of them escorted the larger vessel to the buoy, flying at a somewhat leisurely pace. The shuttle didn't have the thrust of the fighters, and even if it did, the technician aboard likely had no desire to have a thrill ride. Alma struggled with boredom, watching her scanner, half wishing they were on a combat mission. Her wingmen included Zanthari Rahan Tivane and Zanthari Hilot Vadoth. They'd flown with her since they joined the ship two missions prior and proved to be quite good, especially during the action over the research facility. The crystal font was their first assignment, but they shed their green status quickly. The shuttle slowed and attached itself to the buoy, and its primary escorts took up positions around it. Alma and her two companions departed, heading for the planet at a quick pace. She patched into the bridge, communicating directly with the chief tech officer, who could guide them if necessary. We're approaching the surface now, Alma announced. Can you give me a safe vector? I need a window. Actually? Deva's voice crackled in her speaker. You don't. Double check your scanners before committing, but from here, it looks like you can just fly right down there. That seems impossible, Alma replied. Are you sure about your figures? As sure as I can be, considering the place and how strange it is. Do what you can, please. Keep your scanners on full so I can acquire the data. Alma felt extremely skeptical, but didn't argue. She increased speed, closing the distance to break atmosphere. As they approached, she expected heat to react to the shields, but nothing happened. Not for some time. The scans didn't make sense. They hadn't even hit an oxygen patch yet, and when it happened a few moments later, the reaction was mild, to say the least. The shields barely flared up. This is bizarre. The briefing said strange, but that's an understatement. The sky turned blue and she broke through light cloud coverage, revealing a vast landscape of glistening hills, forests, and a sea off to the east. Rahan gasped into the calm. This place is spectacular. He spoke in awe. I didn't expect it. Not from the briefing, Hilot said, sounding far less impressed. I expected it to be a little more... Mechanized, I guess. We're looking for a structure, Alma said. Something that houses the power we need. My scanners aren't picking up anything like that, so I guess we're doing some flying. Spread out for maximum coverage. Deva's going to want as much data as we can get. She took up the center with the others falling out until they were barely within visual range. Alma relaxed into her seat, allowing the computer to collect all the data they needed. She directed her attention to the water. 
it stretched off to the horizon, not broken up by islands or any other obstruction. It reminded her of an ocean near where she grew up. Her father taught her to sail there, and the memory made her a little sad. She hadn't visited home in a while, even before the jump incident. Pretty much everyone on board prepared to die when they drew the enemy away from the Earth ship. Despite the tactical necessity, the Onthar didn't realize how sour some of the crew had become over the decision. Making such a call is his job, but it didn't have to be popular. Her scanner pinged, drawing her attention back to the monitor. Four dots appeared, moving quickly toward them. Are you two picking those up? Affirmative, ma'am, Rahan said. I'm trying to get some details now. There, now, Helot cursed. Those are enemy fighters. The enemy? Alma couldn't believe it. That's not possible. The font would have picked up a battleship out there. This literally can't be possible. I'm afraid it is, Rahan replied. Deva? Alma asked. Are you picking up any enemy capital ships overhead? Negative, Deva replied. What are you seeing? Alma sent the data up to her. They would close to firing range shortly. Combat shields up. I think we're about to be engaged. Are they on course for you? Deva asked. Yes, Rahan answered. They're flying right for us. We're on this, Alma said. If more come through, we're going to need reinforcements. I'm on it, Deva said. Just be careful. Hardly an appropriate wish, considering what we're about to do. Alma saw the vapor trails of the fighters ahead, grayish-white streams signaling their approach. They still weren't close enough to see, but they'd be there soon. They flew in an attack formation, picking up speed. They couldn't maneuver as wildly in the atmosphere as space, but they'd definitely push some Gs to get an advantageous position. Follow my lead, Alma said. I'm going to dive, get closer to the surface, and draw them after me. You take up the rear and get a firing solution. We need to at least even the odds as quickly as possible. Do not hold back. Understood. The other pilots answered together, both climbing as Alma plunged her flight stick forward. The force pressed her into her seat as she rocketed toward the ground. Shortly, the sky left her vision and her altimeter began warning her about collision. At less than 200 feet, she pulled up, leveling out to fly toward the mountains to the west. Her companions would fly around up above waiting for the enemy to make their move. And they didn't have to wait long. All four fighters went after her, closing in and firing the moment they were in range. Alma's shields doubled up in the back and she performed evasive maneuvers, dodging left and right to avoid their blasts. She remained calm, forcing herself into a state of severe focus. Blasts struck the rocks ahead of her, and she banked left, skimming along the side of the mountain and keeping it to her right. The enemy flew after her one of them bouncing off the rocks. Its shields flared as it tried to recover, spinning out of control for a moment before leveling off and rejoining the fight. He was rewarded with two missiles from one of Alma's companions, both striking him from the top. The ship exploded, bits of debris scattering throughout the forest. The other three didn't give up, continuing after Alma with all the determination of a hungry child. She continued her maneuvers, finally taking a pair of shots that knocked her shields down to 60%. Diving again, she went below 100 feet, then had to climb to avoid a set of particularly tall trees. One of the enemies trimmed the tops of the tallest branches and broke formation, flying off to the south. He's trying to get behind us, Rahan said. I'll take him, Alma replied, banking hard to find a firing solution. The other two didn't give up on her, staying on her tail, but as she came around on their companion, they tried to close the distance. Fortunately, Alliance fighters seemed a little faster than theirs, and she kept them away. Her computer gave her tone, and she fired missiles and guns, laying into the enemy just as he fired some blasts. He never could have hit Rahan or Hilot. They were barely even in front of him, but his random shots struck the rocks and scattered bits into the valley. Alma's attack, on the other hand, obliterated him, causing his core to explode. The other two broke and started to run, flying back the way they came. After them, Alma shouted, but don't shoot. Let's see where they're going. What could they even be doing down here? Rahan asked. This doesn't make any sense. I know, Alma shook her head, but we have to figure it out. 
If there's an enemy presence here, this operation just took a dramatic turn. Stay on them. They can't go far. Onthar? Deva turned in her seat to address Kale. Our fighters have engaged enemy ships on the surface? What? Kale stood up. Are you sure? Deva put footage on the main screen for him to see, and they all watched as the fighters began a massive fight. While that went on, she checked her console to see whether or not the shuttle was in any trouble, but so far, it seemed fine. The technician was working on the buoy, unaware of the violence going on below them. Do you have any enemy capital ships on the scanners? Kale asked. No, sir, nothing. We're the only ship in this system. They must have crashed down there, Othan said. And now they're trying to defend themselves. If they crashed, they'd be insane to attack us, Kale replied. Once we find their main camp, they'd be helpless to bombardment. Why would they even reveal themselves? Maybe they knew we'd find them one way or another, Deva said. I can get a firing solution when we find them, Thyna added. Give me some coordinates and we'll go to town. Hold on, Kale said. If they're holding the power source we need, we can't destroy the entire area. We have to take a step back from this. Consider what's going on and what we need. This is bigger than a fight. How are our pilots doing? They've taken two down, Deva paused. Sir, they're pursuing the others. Vinthari Ilvar has had her pilots stand down so they can determine where the enemy came from. Good, Kale nodded. I'm glad she's thinking that way. Stay in contact with her and put the shuttle's escorts on alert. Alma might need some help if they encounter a larger force. In fact, have the rest of our fighters get out there just in case. I'd rather be overkill in this situation. Considering how far out in the middle of nowhere we appear to be, prudence doesn't seem wise. Alma and the others chased after the enemies so far that they ended up in the middle of the night on the planet. Her scanners picked up a strange formation of rock ahead, towering up higher than the mountain itself. Image enhancement showed it to be smooth, as if carved out of stone with openings all across the surface. We found what we're looking for and our enemy is already here. Fantastic. She fed it back to the ship and collected as much data as possible. The energy readings were off the chart. Whatever created the constant pulse of power came from inside that place. Flying over, she noted that there were no enemy ships down there. No shuttles, no wreckage. The two fighters they chased seemed to wink off radar as well. They must be using the energy signature to mask themselves. Deva, we might have a problem. As you can see, we've got a structure, but it must be blocking our scans. I can't even see the people we were chasing now. Understood. Please return to orbit and await further orders. Are you sure that's a good idea? Alma asked. It seems like we should be patrolling the area just in case. We're working out a strategy right now, Deva replied. Thank you for the suggestion. Get back to orbit. Yes, ma'am. The thought carried sarcasm, but her response remained professional. On our way. She directed her two wings to follow her and they left the area, climbing away from the surface. Alma thought the situation felt odd when they arrived, but looking at it now, she felt considerable alarm about it all. If the enemy got hold of the type of energy that planet seemed to be producing, if they could somehow apply it to the war effort, then the Alliance would very much be in trouble. Considering Anthar Rushin's penchant for doing whatever it took to keep the enemy from key objectives, Alma began to worry about what might happen to them all if they were truly stranded out there. She hoped he didn't decide to detonate the ship and the planet with it to prevent them their prize. Chapter 5 Gray felt serious reservations about moving so close to the system they left a large enemy presence behind in, but he agreed with the tech crew's assessment. They needed to gather data, and what better place to do so than from the place they left? Returning to the scene of the crime would have been the best route, but impractical. As they winked into the quiet system, Ali immediately performed a system scan using the buoy in place to check for any ships that might have recently jumped in. They were alone, with only a few uninhabitable planets nearby for company. The tech team dug in to gather their data, and Gray did his best not to focus on the bad feeling rising in the back of his mind. He didn't fully understand how the Alliance buoys worked, but based on what his people were trying to do, 
It made sense that the enemy might be able to use them in a similar way. If that were the case, they might be monitoring those around that centralized secret research facility, and if so, they'd know that someone just hopped in nearby. It wouldn't take them long to investigate, so the situation became burdened with urgency. Adam had Ravente ready the pilots, and they were on standby in the event of needing to launch for an attack. Search and rescue crafts were prepped as well for when they found the crystal font. They might be dead in space, unable to travel at all, and in that case, Gray had to be prepared to save lives. The medical centers were also fully stocked and on alert standby. Gray prepared for the worst and prayed for the best, but considering how long they'd been alone, he could not quite muster much in the way of positivity. When the behemoth suffered a jump failure due to sabotage, they were back in less than three days. Months seemed impossible to recover from. If not due to damage or attack, supplies could have run out. They might have starved to death long before any other peril took their lives. The thought that they escaped destruction only to die through some lingering means filled Gray with rage. The unfairness of it stuck in his craw. Captain, I've finished the assessment, Ollie announced. The adjacent system has been abandoned. There are no enemy ships to speak of left. They must have looted everything they could and departed. What about the anomaly we were looking for? Clea asked. Did you find anything to do with that? Paul's feeding us data back now. Gray watched Clea focus on her tablet for a long moment, nodding several times. They did dump their pulse drive waste, Clea announced. There's so much radiation in that area, it might even be impacting the planet's surface. We'd need to send a cleanup ship to make that area safe. Shields might not even help for long. Wow. Gray shook his head. I'll keep that tactic in mind. And the repercussions. So we know they did it, Ollie said. But what's that mean for us getting their location? Unfortunately, with these readings, Clea sighed, they could practically be anywhere. It might have thrown them off course to another galaxy, as far as we know. Our only hope now is to find something in the buoy. I guarantee the system here doesn't get much traffic. I'm downloading the logs now. Will that lead us to them? Gray asked. I'm assuming it will lead us to the next buoy, sir, Clea replied. We have to follow the breadcrumbs, as they say. Ah, you learned our fairy tale, Clea shrugged. Seemed a good place to start. Captain, Ollie interrupted, his voice urgent. I've got someone jumping into this sector, who we just activated. On screen. They watched as a ship winked in, a medium-sized cargo vessel that had seen better days. Gray checked his computer to see what ID it was using, but the information came back garbled. Pirate. That ship's armed, Ollie said. No identification. They're hailing us. Oh, this'll be rich, Gray said. Put them on. Maybe they've seen the crystal font. This is Rigus Tor Ere, a male's voice piped through their speakers. We don't have a quarrel with you. We'd like to just go on our way. We're not looking for you, Gray said. But considering what you're doing, we can't just let you leave to torment some unarmed ship elsewhere in the galaxy. Look, we're not pirates, Rigus replied. We're just doing some salvage runs on the down low, trying to make a little extra money. You know how it is. It's hard making a living out here without you guys giving us a hard time. Have you salvaged an Alliance ship? Gray asked. Specifically a battle cruiser? Rigus laughed. If we did, do you think I'd tell you? Or that we'd be flying around in this hunk of garbage? That would have been a big prize. No, we were checking out rumors of some research facility in the nearby system, but it was totally ransacked and destroyed. Nothing there to take. Gray cut the signal for a moment and turned to Ollie. Check their story. Check the database for any reports that might match this ship for piracy. If they're just scavengers, I think we can give them a pass. But I don't trust this guy. On it, sir. How would they hear rumors about that secret location? Gray asked. Clea shrugged. Anyone could have leaked info about it after our trip. The soldiers, some of the researchers. If they even told a loved one, it could have turned into a hint. So much for secrets. Gray turned the comm back on. 
You didn't find any hostiles in that sector, huh? How long were you there for? Two days. Nearly ran out of supplies, so we're heading back to a friendly port. That's a legal place. Not with that ID, you're not, Gray said. You know as well as I do they won't let you dock anywhere without a legal registration. We, Regis coughed, we have one. Uh-huh. Don't try to leave. We're confirming a few things. Gray turned off the comm and looked at Adam. Battle stations, but keep it subtle. I don't want these guys trying to run before we can secure some information. Adam nodded and turned to his own comm. Ollie glanced back. Sir, I do have reports of a ship that matches this description attacking the shipping lanes. Last week, they took down an ore shipment being sent to a colony that needed it pretty bad. They killed the entire crew, stole the goods, stripped the vessel, and let the hull drift. Bastards. Gray scowled, then contacted them again. Listen, Rigus, we know you've been out pirating. This is how we're going to play this. Surrender to us and you'll be arrested. No one gets hurt. If you choose not to, we will open fire and judging by the size of your ship, well, let's just say I'm pretty sure you won't get a day in court. We've got more bite than bark, Rigus replied. You don't want to do this. So I'm guessing that means you don't want to surrender? Gray asked. Are you sure about that? We're ready to repel you, Rigus said. Good luck. The calm went dead. They're powering up their weapons, Ollie said. Scanning. They seem pretty standard. No credible threat. Redding, Gray said. Light them up. Yes, sir. Redding opened fire, letting loose a barrage from the cannons. The pirate retaliated at the same time, laying into them with their own blasts. The impact caused the behemoth's shields to flare, but no appreciable damage. They didn't so much as tremble from the blow. In contrast, when the behemoth's pulse blasts struck the pirate's port side, their shields flared and winked out. Six blasts struck the hull directly, carving neat and perfect holes into the metal. Flames bloomed out, perfect globes of orange quickly dissipating as some emergency measure sealed the breach. They want to talk, Agatha announced. They're hailing us. I bet they do, Gray nodded to her. Put them on. Rigus spoke the moment the comm connected. Okay, so hold on, just hold on. I think we can come to some agreement. Let's just slow down. Are you prepared to surrender? Gray asked. Ollie lifted his hand. Sir, they're priming their jump drive. They're looking at less than 20 seconds to departure. Redding target the drive and fire. Um, they've shot something, Clea said. Ollie, check those. I'm reading unstable mass. Pulse bombs, Ollie shouted. They fired them from their ship. Sneaky bastards. Belay the last order, Gray said. Target those bombs and take them out. Now. AI turrets are already engaging, Redding said. Three down. Make that four, five, six. What did they do, unload their entire payload? Adam turned to his monitor. That's it. They're done. Gray watched his own monitor as the shockwave from the bombs slammed into the pirate's vessel. They listed, careening to starboard and began to drift. Their comms dropped instantly and the lights on the surface went out. If anyone survived the attack, they likely had less than a few minutes left to live. Ollie, Gray asked. What have you got? Major hull breach, minimal life support, engines are totally offline. Ollie shook his head. They're on generators, sir. I'm estimating they'll be out of power in less than 20 minutes. Life signs? Also minimal, Ollie paused. I'm reading 10 people. He glanced over his shoulder. There were 40 when we did our initial scan. Gray nodded. Understood. Agatha, get a message to them. We'll take them aboard. Adam, launch search and rescue to bring them aboard. There's a chance their core might melt down, Clea said. If so, it's going to blow. That could put our shuttle in jeopardy. I get it. We'll make it fast, Gray turned. Did they reply to us? They're ready to comply, Agatha said. They're making their way out of the ship in their escape pods. Excellent. Collect them. Gray gestured to Clea. Make sure the tech team takes advantage of this downtime with those buoys. We'll be here for a short time. 
Figure out as much as you can before we're ready to go. Maybe we'll get lucky with the crystal font. Get to work, folks. We're going to have a busy shift. Paul joined Ollie on the bridge, carrying his tablet with him. They spoke quietly, performing a variety of checks on the buoy. Outside, search and rescue moved to assist the pirates, their efforts full of far more stress than the two tech officers experienced. Ollie tried to ignore it, but despite the fact that the men were criminals, he couldn't handle the thought of them suffocating. They could have died in a massive core explosion. At least those ten lived, though they might be pretty bad off. I think I found the message, Paul said. He played it at a low volume. This is the crystal font requesting immediate assistance. We've experienced a jump malfunction and are currently located. The message was cut short, just before they could offer the coordinates. They exchanged a look. Okay, good. So we know it came this way. Ollie checked the cache, and unlike the one in the high traffic area, this one barely had any messages at all. Certainly not enough to purge them any time soon. He hoped they were tough to crack. They had access codes, but if anyone had the ability to hop in and track people, these things represented a serious security breach. He brought up the list of buoys in the area, all connecting to this one. The research facility came up first on the list, but luckily, it was off and could not have been used. Another one, in an even less inhabited system, linked up to this one going even further out from the core of Alliance civilization. Such places might be brought into the fold of colonization in the future, but at least for the time being, they were impractical to protect. In recent years, the only places the Alliance bothered to settle were close enough to a military presence there quickly. While jump tech allowed a ship to arrive in time to help, messages were not instantaneous. Of course, that didn't matter to the colonies the Orion's light took out. Ollie got the coordinates for the next buoy and sent them over to Ensign Leonard Marcus, their navigator. He'd have to come up with a decent jump point entry so they could check the next buoy. How many would they have to try before they tracked down the crystal font? Ollie worried they would eventually come to a high enough traffic device that the trail would go cold. This trail of breadcrumbs had its own thread of birds to eat. You okay? Paul asked. Ollie nodded. Just thinking ahead. Or trying to, at least. I understand. Paul scratched his head. This seems pretty intense, but at least we have another place to check out. So far, so good. Ollie glanced back at Clea and considered giving her a quick briefing. She was busy coordinating the retrieval of the pirates with Commander Everly. Their new prisoners probably all needed medical attention before spending the rest of their time in the brig. He decided to leave her be and sent the report to her mailbox. We've done our part. I'm heading back to the tech lab, Paul said. I'll try to come up with another way to track these messages. I'm not confident, but hey, we found stranger things, right? Every time we leave space, Doc. Ollie grinned, but the expression was forced. See you later, man. Ollie, Gray called out as Paul left the bridge. I trust with Mr. Bailey's departure you have a new destination for us? Yes, sir, I sent it to Leonard. Very good. Gray clapped his hands. Where are we with grabbing those pirates? Nearly done, sir, Adam said. The last escape pod has been collected, and they're bringing them on board. I'd say we've got another fifteen minutes. Any chance to shorten that? Adam shook his head. Not safely. The shuttle's towing all those in. It's simply going to take that much time to get back to the ship and land. Okay. Leonard, I want a course by the time they're on board, as soon as they report in. Redding will initiate the jump. Agatha, give the crew a heads up that we're getting out of here and report in the derelict ship drifting out here. I'd rather our people scavenge that thing than risk another pirate crew coming in here for an easy mark. Ollie went to work, his stomach doing flips. The time pressure weighed on him heavily. Every minute and hour that ticked by, the crystal font might be lost. Worse, in the back of his mind, he knew they might already be gone. It had been far too long for a starship to survive out there without support. Much as he didn't want to admit it, he felt like they were chasing a ghost ship. Ollie never bothered to pray before, but as they prepped to jump out of the system, he took a moment to put out some positive energy. 
he affirmed his hope that they'd find their companions alive, perhaps battered, but otherwise well off. Even without precedent or facts, he tried to will it to be true. This feels a lot better than being pessimistic. Come on, guys, don't let us down. You showed so much spirit when we were fighting over the research facility. That kind of will can't simply be killed by something as paltry as being lost in space for a while. We'll find you, one way or another. Just hang in there. Kale stared at the imagery taken by Alma's ship. The structure they discovered climbed into the sky some sixty stories. The land around it appeared to be cleared away, flattened and void of trees. None of the snapshots the pilots took, none of their video revealed enemy presence, but they knew they were down there. Somewhere. He sent a patrol around the planet to ensure they didn't miss something, checking for a hidden vessel. Maybe they came up with a way to trick sensors since we've been gone. There aren't many explanations, but the enemy fighters didn't go back to orbit. They disappeared around the structure. They might have been destroyed, but there was no evidence to support the thought. According to scans and surveillance, the four enemies didn't even exist. Deva couldn't even find the debris of the two downed vessels, but they saw the video footage of the fight and knew it happened. Without the in-flight cameras, Kale might have questioned Alma and her team's sanity. Hell, she was already second-guessing what happened. Whatever happened didn't make a lot of sense, but they knew three important facts. One, they had to get down there to get the power necessary to leave. Two, enemy presence complicated the mission. Three, they were dealing with a relatively small bit of opposition. After all, how many of them could be down there without their ship giving off some sign? A capital ship couldn't have landed on the planet anyway, and if it crashed, the place wouldn't be nearly as well off. Kale decided they would make their move, but it would be with a large force of soldiers, ready for whatever action they might encounter. He stood and joined Wenna at the comm station, tapping into the whole ship. This is the Anthar speaking. I'm sure some of you have heard we encountered an enemy presence on this planet. We have performed extensive scouting in and around the area, but have not located a capital ship. Whoever is down there, they are alone and cannot be numerous. We must take the area and get what we've come for. This is our way home. I intend to get you there. It will require a team to go to the surface, and I'm putting together those people now. Please continue to focus on your duties, and I promise you, we'll get out of here as soon as possible. Direct any questions to section leads, and they can contact me directly. Thank you. Kale killed the calm and turned to Deva. This is against my better judgment, he said but I need you to go on this mission. What? Deva's eyes went wide. Are you serious? You're letting me go? You've got the best chance of figuring anything out down there. The best chance to get us that power source. But there might be fighting, Deva. Deva nodded. Understood. Her enthusiasm dipped. I... I've never been in a combat situation before. Not on the ground. I know. You'll have plenty of support. And if things are too crazy, Kale shrugged, we'll bring you back and find another way out of here. There is no other way, Othin said. Right? Not that we've explored, Kale replied. How's the buoy work going? Deva snapped her fingers. Let me check in with them. Wait, they've sent a report. Sending to your station now. Kale read the information, frowning. He half expected the news. The buoy should have been operating normally. Nothing about it indicated damage or malfunction. The power source was good, and it definitely took their message. However, it did not say whether it transmitted it, nor had it received any messages for some time. Perfect. It might have worked, it might not have. Much like those enemy fighters. They were there, we have proof, but now they're not. We can't be cautious, not now. It's time to act. Go ahead and get ready, Deva. I'll have Vares take your place. Deva offered a quick salute and hurried off the bridge. You made her career, Thyna quipped. She joined the military thinking we were in another era, Kale said. She's an explorer first, a soldier, maybe third. But don't worry, she'll get the job done. I'm not worried, Thyna said. Terrified about being stuck? Yes, but worry. 
I can't remember when last we had the luxury of something so low-key. Kale smiled and shook his head. Well put, Thyna. I'm going to see the team off. Often, you have the bridge. Search and Rescue spent two hours retrieving the various pirate escape pods. When they brought them on board, all but two required serious medical attention. They were secured in one of the medical wings under guard until they could be safely transported to the brig, where they'd wait to be transferred to Alliance authorities. Gray got them out of there the moment everyone was stowed away, jumping to the next buoy on the list. Tech crews once again stripped everything they could from the sector and followed the breadcrumbs to the next location, which continued to lead them further away from any civilized space. After five jumps, they needed to slow down and take a shift for the crew to recover. Even with the enhanced drive and improvements made by the Alliance and later Durant, there was still a cost to so much FTL travel. The downtime gave them all a chance to evaluate what they'd learned so far, while attempting to make an educated guess about their destination. Adam took the bridge so Gray could get some rest, but he had a hard time falling asleep as he considered their mission. Seven total jumps meant an entire day's worth of shifts so far. He didn't expect to locate the crystal font quickly, but that didn't quell his sense of urgency. Every hour they spent looking was another that might end with them locating a ghost ship. It seems strangely convenient that the message ends the way it does. Having the coordinates cut off felt suspicious, but Gray didn't know what the purpose would be. Other than to waste someone's time looking, the government may not have even sent anyone. The fact that they were out there on a scavenger hunt couldn't have been anticipated. And if an enemy wanted to ambush someone, they needed to tell the potential rescuers where to go. Gray fell into a fitful sleep and woke feeling worse than when he started. After a quick refresh, change of clothes, and a meal, his overall mood improved, but he had to fight hard against a sense of helplessness. He could not show his crew that he didn't believe in the mission. They had to be devoted to the search, or it would be a futile effort. When he arrived on the bridge, Adam relinquished command and gave him a quick update. Clea and the others have found our next destination, he said. Leonard's put in the coordinates and we're ready to go on your mark. Gray sat down and took in a deep breath, putting on his best, confident expression. You heard them, Redding? Let's get out of here. Deva sat on the shuttle trying not to tap her foot, feeling a mixture of excitement and anxiety in equal measures. She'd visited alien worlds before, but they were always colonized or somehow tamed. This one, a place so shrouded in mystery, might have been the single greatest find of her generation. And she would be one of the first Keelans to set foot on the surface. The others around her, six soldiers, were well armed with assault rifles, pistols, and grenades. They were prepared for serious war with the enemy, and their silence made her feel like a fool. Each person around her exuded more quiet determination than any thrill. The threat of combat did strange things to people. She turned to look out the window just as they broke atmosphere. She marveled at the minimal impact the shields took from the venture, and as they leveled out into the clear sky, her curiosity only increased. Checking the scans, the readings once again defied any science she understood. As Othan said, without some resistance, the planet should be a wasteland, pockmarked with meteorite strikes. Instead, the surface looked like a preservation park back home. Besides naturally occurring damage from space debris, Deva still didn't have any sign of a crashed ship. The enemy could not have landed there, so how did they cover up what had to be a tragedy? Trees covered the horizon rising up the hills and into the valleys. Imagery from the pilot's recon showed that the ground around their destination was cleared out, flattened and mostly dirt. There must have been something beneath it, perhaps even concrete or ground down stone, but they wouldn't have proof until they landed. The structure came into view, and Deva gasped, using the camera on her helmet to grab footage as they flew in. She wished she sat in the front to get a better view. The height of the thing, the grandeur almost made her cry. Keelan's built things just as impressive in a way, but this held a majesty to it, a glory enhanced by the secrets hidden within. Vinthari Lahar Shireth 
commanded the soldiers. He was technically Deva's peer, but on the ground, he would have operational control. She gladly accepted his leadership in this regard, especially if weapons started firing. They gave her a rifle, but she hadn't fired one since her last fitness test over a year ago. Taking us in near those rocks, Lahar said. Have our escorts continue to check the area. I have a bad feeling about this landing. It could be an ambush. Everyone, Vindari Thainok is our VIP. She's the only person who can get what we need out of this trip, so I want her protected the whole time. Vali and Nirsa, she's your responsibility. Deva never met the two. Vali was a big guy, someone who clearly worked out. In his suit, he looked like a giant. Nirsa, in perfect contrast, was a wiry woman who looked capable of snapping a person in half. They didn't reply verbally, just nodded and exchanged looks. Deva was grateful she couldn't see their expressions through their helmets. Something told her that escort duty annoyed these people. The rest of you will be on fire first duty, Lahar continued. If you see the enemy, there's no hesitation. Whatever they're doing down here, we'll figure out after they're dead. Take aim, fire, and make your shots count. We've got work to do down here, and if it's not completed, we don't go home. You get me? The five soldiers shouted in affirmation at the same time, making Deva wince as the speakers in her helmet crackled. If this is what it's going to be like to be in a fight, I'm not prepared. A little fear tickled her anxiety and excitement. The shuttle descended suddenly, and Deva grabbed the handle over her head, wondering if they'd been hit. Were they about to crash? Had something happened? Why did she feel an impact? A thousand possibilities entered her mind before she thought to use her scanner. But by then, it was too late. The ship lurched again, this time slowing down. The back ramp dropped and their safety harnesses disengaged. Lahar began shouting, Go, go, go! Each of the soldiers leapt into action, rushing out of the ship and out onto the surface. Deva hesitated, watching them go as they lifted their weapons and started securing the area. This isn't break time, Thynok, Lahar yelled at her. Go! Deva stumbled to her feet and rushed out, having to hop at the very end of the ramp, which hovered over the ground a few feet. She nearly fell, but strong hands grabbed her by the arm and dragged her to the nearby rocks, depositing her in some cover. The shuttle took off and fighters circled overhead. We're really doing this? Deva tried to control her breathing, desperate not to hyperventilate. Adrenaline threatened to overwhelm her. She could barely see, wondering if someone with a gun might be aiming in her direction at that very moment. Do I need to scan or get out my weapon? Contact, Nirsa yelled. Northwest, motion. Oh, fates, this is happening. They're really here. But how did we not see them? How? I don't get it. This planet must be masking their presence. Deva forced herself to look at the scanner, tuning it to the new position on the surface. I have to figure out what's going on and focus. The soldiers continued shouting around her, moving into position. This is going to be tough. Lahar didn't look forward to the assignment. He'd run many missions involving alien worlds, fighting in places he never set foot on, but he was never a pioneer. When they landed on that planet, his briefing warned him they might encounter the enemy, but it didn't make sense. How did they get there? Regardless, he went ready for a fight. However, contact within seconds of the shuttle lifting off? That shocked him. They took cover as pulse blasts shattered rocks around them, cutting into the walls. Lahar gave quick hand gesture orders, directing his people into different positions while keeping their heads down. He checked his scanner without revealing himself, remaining in cover to see what they were up against. It took the device a moment to catch up, then showed him seven foot soldiers in a scattered formation, something that struck him as odd. They never stood in one place. They ran around, quick and swift in their motions. This time they stood their ground, popping shots at them. Trias, Lahar shouted. Put down some cover fire. Blisi, use it to flank. Once you're in position, the rest of us will hit them. Go! Trias popped up and opened up, peeling off several bursts. Blisi counted to five aloud, then dashed away from them, moving to the next rock formation over. Pulse blasts caught the ground around them, nearly taking him out. 
He dove, hit the ground, and rolled into cover, pressing his back against the stone. You call that cover? He shouted back. They don't care that I'm shooting at them, Trias replied with a grunt. Not sure what you want me to do if they're ignoring me. Lahar looked just in time to see her catch one of the enemies in the face, knocking him to the ground. Blood pooled around him, and his death made his companions break off, finally moving for cover. This gave Bleasy his chance to get to his position, and Lahar took the opportunity to direct the other soldiers to advance. They broke free, all but Nirsa and Vali, who remained with Deva. Each of them led with their weapons firing in an attempt to keep their opponents' heads down. As they rushed forward, pulse blasts cut into the ground around them. Uris took a shot to the side and was tossed through the air, landing hard behind them. He remained still, not even wallowing in pain. Lahar fired a shot at the top of one of the enemy's heads, the only part peeking out from behind stone cover. One of his three blasts connected, searing off the armor and melting through the top of his skull. Flopping backwards, his weapon went flying and skid on the ground, sliding toward a flight of stairs. Each of the Keelans made it to another set of rocks for cover, just as Bleasy opened up on the enemy's flank. Screams filled the air as he took down at least a couple of them. Lahar called into his calm to back off, to take cover again, but Bleasy seemed determined to finish them off on his own. Lahar stood and fired as well, ordering the others to cover him. It didn't work. One of the aliens caught Bleasy in the chest just below his neck, dropping him to the ground. A strangled cry rang out and he went still. Quite dead. No! Lahar shot the one who killed his soldier, finishing him off before aiming at the next. He noted the bodies on the ground and counted them. Eleven? What? There were only six. Deva, what's going on? Where are they coming from? I don't know, Deva shouted back. They just appear on the scans. New tech, Volley offered. It must be. Some kind of ability to bend light and keep themselves invisible, right? No way, Deva said. Not in the short time we've been gone. We would have seen prototypes. They would have used during the fight at the research facility. This is something else, I guarantee it. Lahar checked his scanner and noted there were still four enemies out there. Fifteen. That's more like what I would have expected. Another one went down and the other three made a break for it, running for the stairs. Wait, they're running? Lahar felt incredibly confused. Shoot! His men fired, taking down the rest of them as they went. Each body collapsed on the stairs, sliding down to the base. Lahar approached the nearest corpse and nudged it with his foot. It's real enough. He motioned for the others to approach. Deva, get over here and scan this. What am I looking at? The tech officer hurried over, crouching the entire way. When she arrived, she dropped down to a knee and looked all around, especially checking the rocks above them. Lahar rolled his eyes, but he knew she had good cause to be nervous. There could be more out there somewhere. The fact they hadn't attacked while their friends died, though, made it unlikely. Um, this armor is strange, Deva sighed. I don't know what this is. It doesn't appear to be one of the enemies we've ever fought before. What are you talking about? Lahar asked. That's impossible. It must be. It's... Wait! Deva stood up suddenly as the body seemed to dissolve into thin air. It's gone. Oh my, it's... It's pure energy. This thing was a construct of energy. That doesn't even make sense, Nirsa said. How could that be possible? Deva shrugged. I have no idea. I... I should check the others. Lahar stopped her. Vali can handle the medical stuff. You focus on what we need. We didn't come down here and potentially lose two people for you to waste time. Find the energy and figure out a way for us to tap it so we can get out of here as soon as possible. Understood? Deva nodded. Yes, sir. I'm on it. Good. Lahar turned to the others. Form a perimeter. I'm going to report back to the ship on what we just discovered. Faiths know they're going to love this. It's definitely not what anyone expected. And now we know there's no way to anticipate what we might encounter next. Stay on your guard. It might get uglier. Chapter 6 Clea sat in her room working on a computer, trying to piece together where they should go next. 
The same garbled message greeted them at every location they visited, proving the caches of these buoys rarely got purged. After half an hour, she felt no more confident about saving their friends than she had when they started. A knock on her door made her sigh. She didn't feel like distractions at the moment, but called out for the person to come in. Durant entered and immediately sat down, looking smug. Her mood must have showed because his expression melted and he sat up straight, clearing his throat before speaking. I've analyzed the schematics for that weapon those terrorists used on us. It's pretty ingenious. I have to give props to Novalat. I'm sure they'll be thrilled, Clea replied. Have you countered it then? Well, it's harder to do that than you think, Durant said. The shields already have to be down for it to work. That means we need to do something with our armor if we want to reflect it. I've got the computer going through the different options on how that might work, but I have to be honest, retrofitting armor is a lot harder than reprogramming shields. Meaning it won't be as easy to prepare for this one. Correct, Durant leaned forward. What are you working on? Trying to figure out where the crystal font is still, Clea shrugged. I've been at it for hours, too, but we're just plunging deeper into space. I want some more certainty, Durant. I want to know where they could have possibly gone. Already, we're seventeen systems away from the research facility. I really doubt they planned this far of a jump. They probably jumped again as soon as they appeared. Not if they jumped so close to their trap, Clea pointed out. Perhaps, but we can't know how much damage they experienced. It might have been minimal, and it has been a long time, relatively speaking. Yes, but... Clea looked at her screen and paused. She'd been searching for buoys that might have the message, but considering they didn't get the entire communication, an idea hit her. What if they are somewhere with a malfunctioning buoy? Because we don't have the complete message? Clea nodded. Maybe something's wrong with it. I mean, they clearly tried to send more. Why would it send only part of it? It might have shorted out halfway through and been done, holding on by a thread. Clea tapped on her tablet for several moments. I'm searching for any buoys that are reporting erratically or infrequently. This might get us closer. You could be right but that might lead us into an ambush. Pirates like to pull that kind of nonsense. They do it so someone can't call for help, Clea pointed out. The one we're looking for is actually broken. Besides, no one thinks to check the buoy before they go to their next location, and many civilians don't have scanners capable of such long-range activity. One buoy began to blink nearly seven systems away. A massive jump. If the crystal font made it all the way to such a remote location, they really went all out. Durant may have been right about a second jump, too. However, going so far seemed like a really bad idea, unless they were directly pursued. Furthermore, if they really did jump twice, why go deeper into empty space? Maybe it was all an accident. I have to tell the captain, Clea said. We need to investigate that location. You know, we might want to slow down a moment, Durant replied. Why is the buoy damaged? Age, perhaps? Who gets out there to maintain it? Or environmental problems? Durant shook his head. The place might be flat out dangerous. We'll hop into the edge of space there, Clea said, and perform our sensor sweep. If we find them, great, but if not, we can fix that buoy while we figure out our next move. Believe me, someone would thank us in the future. If you got stranded out there without the ability to communicate, you'd be done. I hope you're right about this. Durant rose and moved to the door. I'm going to finish my simulations with this new weapon. Let me know if you need anything from engineering. Will do. Clea grabbed her tablet and joined him. With any luck, we'll be collecting our charge soon and heading back home. Maybe we can get away without having to fire the weapons again this mission. But something tells me that would be too much to hope for, huh? With this ship? Durant laughed. 
Yes, it would be far too much. See you soon. Kale listened in on the tactical channel as both the ground force and air support coordinated together. The hot moment when those soldiers set down, they were beset upon by enemy troops. The question of where they came from danced around in his mind, and he knew Zanthari Vares was desperately seeking an answer. Having replaced Deva on the bridge, the young man seemed a little nervous. Until that moment, he'd been working out of the tech labs. Sitting on the bridge for the Alliance military could be intimidating, especially in the midst of a crisis. Listening to the fight over the speakers probably didn't help much either. Thyna was running the action, and Kale kept his mouth shut to let her. What's happening now? She asked, watching the cameras from the different soldiers. There was a slight delay in what she was seeing and what was actually happening. Is everyone all right? No, Lahar replied. Lisi is dead. Yoris took a shot to the side, but he'll survive. We've scanned one of these bodies and... Well... What is it, Vintari? Thina insisted. Kale doubted the soldier needed pushing often. Whatever he saw must have really shook him up. Report! The enemy body disappeared. Deva believes it was made of pure energy. Contact! Alma's voice exploded over the speakers. She led the air support that flew over the site. Fighters incoming! Fighters now again? Kale shook his head. They must have a base to be resourcing these things. Vares, have you found anything yet? Vares looked back at him helplessly. I'm so sorry, sir, I just... There's nothing. No familiar energy readings, no hulls, no organics that match the enemy. They have to have some kind of new technology blocking them. He yelped. Sir, I think I know where they're coming from. What? Kale stood from his seat. Show me. Vares put an enemy capital ship up on the screen, coming from around the planet. It was one of their smaller warships, something that usually traveled in twos. Kale scowled as he took it in, but didn't hesitate long. Thina, raise our shields and fire when ready. Full alert. Othin, get us moving. I want bombers out there right away. As the bridge crew sprung into action, Kale couldn't help but think about the report, suggesting the body might have been pure energy. Perhaps the enemy figured out a way to create lethal projections. It sounded far-fetched, but technology could do wondrous things. And these bastards were nothing if not industrious. They're closing to attack range, Othin said. Thyna, that's all you. I'm on it. Thyna worked her console for several moments and their cannons began to fire, splashing into the enemy shields. Direct hits. No appreciable damage. Their shields drop to... 8%? And they're back on the rise? Kale's calm began to buzz and he slapped it as he sat back down. What's going on up there? Mira's voice sounded strained and exhausted. Please tell me we're not in combat. I'm afraid we've been attacked, Kale replied. Enemy warship came from behind the planet. We finally know where the troops and fighters have come from. They've got some kind of base down there, perhaps even a colony. While that info is likely very important, I have some bad news. Extended fighting is not advisable, not with our crystal in its current state. Suggestions? Kale replied firmly. Uh, perhaps we can flee? Without a power source to spark our new crystal, we'll be fleeing to nowhere. And they can chase us. Unless I'm very much mistaken, they seem fully functional. The ship shook from an enemy attack. Kale scowled and turned to Thyna. Shield strength? We're at 90%. They don't have the accuracy I'm used to. But we're not recharging as fast as I'd like. What can you do about that, Mira? Kale asked. Mira scoffed. Pray? We're not in a condition to do much, Andar. Understood. Do what little you can to keep us alive and we'll do the same. Kale, out. He clicked off his comm and checked the damage reports. No one reported anything yet. He felt some anxiety slip away, but not much. Mira was right. They didn't have a lot of fight in them. Not with all the problems they were currently facing. Thyna fired again, this time smacking the enemy right in the bow. Oddly enough, their attackers were still advancing on them. Kale got a bad feeling about proximity. He gestured to Othin, ordering him to put them in full reverse. Give us some distance. They can't get too close. Where are our bombers? 
They're launching now, Dinah said. They were ready, but the hangar's having some power issues. Apparently our crystal fracture is causing more trouble than I would have guessed. We're at 85% energy output, Vares said. So, I can see why we'd be having trouble. Just get them out there, Kale sighed, and keep firing. I'm on it. Dinah fired again, this time a blast that wasn't quite at full power. She called out that the enemy's shields dropped to 60%, but they didn't even slow down. They counterattacked, and their weapons were all direct hits. The lights flickered overhead, but the shields held. Probably just barely, Kale thought. We have to finish this fight quickly and hope there aren't more of them. Where's your partnership? You never go out alone. He wanted to ask Vares to keep scanning, but knew it would be pointless. Perhaps their sensor equipment had been impacted in a way they didn't realize by the jump disaster or the crystal fracture. There were so few explanations for why they couldn't detect the people they were fighting. He wanted answers, but first, they had to survive. Fight first, investigation later. Alma's wing engaged another squadron of enemy fighters just moments after the ground crew claimed they secured the area. The ships came rocketing from around the back of the structure, their engines making a high-pitched whine as they accelerated into action. Though six total enemies entered the fray, this time the crystal font pilots were not outnumbered. The odds were even, but they had to be conscious of where debris might land. If they fought directly over the operational zone below, they could jeopardize the soldiers trying to secure the power needed to get home. Alma ordered her people to draw the fighters away, even if they were only a kilometer off. It would make the whole situation safer. Drawing back put them in a compromising position, and they had to evade a wild amount of enemy cannon fire. Alma took a shot to the rear. Her shields held and she climbed, entering into full dogfight mode. The others did the same, trying to spread the enemy thin as they worked into a steady combat rhythm. Alma spun, her inertial dampeners screaming from the sudden motion. They didn't quite alleviate all the G-force, especially in atmosphere, and she strained against the urge to pass out. When the maneuver finished, she took several deep breaths, zeroing in on the target before her. Taking to the enemy's rear, her targeting computer got tone, and she opened up. Blasting the enemy with a full barrage, the ship didn't even try to evade. It took the attack. Its shields burst and the fuselage ignited. A massive explosion resounded, and fiery pieces plummeted to the ground below. Another boom caught Alma's attention to the left, and she pulled up to rejoin the action. Four enemies remained, and they started to fly more as expected, climbing and dodging as the Alliance pilots had seen through every battle in the past. This time it proved much more difficult to get a firing solution, and Alma cleanly missed the first couple shots. Another Alliance ship screamed by dropping a missile, which chased its enemy into a canyon. The ordnance caught the tail of the enemy just as he tried to pull away. The nudge sent him into a wall, and his shields did nothing for the dramatic impact. As his core ignited, a huge chunk of the rock wall crumbled and fell, causing a massive dust plume to rise nearly 200 feet into the air. Two Alliance ships teamed up on an enemy, but it reversed its thrust, dropping behind them and firing. Alma tried to intercept, but that wasn't in time as a full spread struck one of her people, knocking their engines out. The pilot ejected just as the entire ship went up, more debris crashing into the ground. Thank the fates I moved us or the soldiers would be cursing our names right now. Alma fired and though she missed, the enemies broke their formation and left the remaining Alliance ship alone. Another pair of ally vessels joined her and let a spread of missiles go, chasing their targets down and blowing them out of the sky. Alma checked the scanner and saw only one left. He broke, heading back toward the structure. They must have a base back there. Get him before he's over our companions, Alma said. Everyone chase him down. She opened her channel. Search and rescue. We've got a pilot down. He ejected over the following coordinates. She fed them back to the crystal font as they rocketed after the final enemy, each of them taking shots, trying to lead him away from his destination. All the ordnance proved too much for him to avoid, and he began to spin as his shields went up. His burning vessel flew past the structure, and a column of fire erupted from behind it, lasting for almost twenty seconds before black smoke replaced it. Alma flew to the wreckage, 
convinced she'd find an enemy base located below. Instead, she only saw the smoldering remains of the fighter. Only trees spread out on the ground below. This is getting beyond strange. Crystal Font, this is Vintari Ilvar. We have defeated the enemy fighters. Area secured. Stand by, Thina replied. We're engaged with an enemy battleship up here. We might be calling you back, but for now, maintain air superiority. You have to hold the area until we have that power, understood? Affirmative, Alma said. Good luck. Enemy battleship, Alma thought. Where were they hiding? They had to be close by. Regardless, I suppose we know where they were this whole time, and where they're coming from. If we take that out, we can expect to see no more action, I suppose. Thank the fates. I'd really like to get out of here soon. Lahar grabbed Deva, Vali, and Nirsa, pulling them aside from the main group. The three of you need to get up those stairs and figure out if we can just walk in or not. Be careful. I don't want to lose more people on this world, but we're going to have to take some risks. Will Eurus be okay? Vali asked. Yes, when the shuttle gets here, we'll load him up and he can get out of here. Lahar checked his comm and kicked a rock. I just received a report that there's an enemy battleship up there fighting with the font. That means Eurus has to hold on a little longer. I'll send Trios with you as well. The faster we finish our job, the quicker we can get home. Understood. Volley called over to Trios. You're coming with us. Let's move out. Where are we going? Trios hurried over. Up the stairs? Deva nodded. The energy readings are coming from within there, but I can't tell if there's a door up there or not. If so, we're going to have to find a way in. I've got plenty of explosives, Nirsa said, in case we want to go in that way. I'm hoping we don't have to be destructive, Deva replied. We might cause some kind of chain reaction. Let's treat this entire place as volatile until we know for a fact what we're getting into. Sounds good, Lahar said, but move out. You're wasting time and we need you up there quickly. He moved over to Eurus and checked him over. The man was unconscious, but his wound looked ghastly. The armor had melted into him, fusing with flesh and clothes. Physicians had their work cut out for them, and that was if they got to him soon. No basic first aid would cut it for this. The shuttle came back in for a landing and he determined to put his man on board, then join the others. Gripping Eurus by the scruff of his armor, he dragged him over to the ramp and up. The co-pilot assisted him and they set the man down on one of the stretchers, securing him in place. Sir, the pilot's voice popped in his ear. We've got contact moving on the stairs. Enemies seem to be pursuing our people. Where did they come from? Lahar asked. Did you see? Negative, sir, but there's five of them. Lahar sighed and dismounted the ship, rushing toward the stairs. Get back in the air, he ordered the shuttle, then redirected his comm. Trias, you've got contact rear coming up the stairs. How far are you up? Halfway, Trias replied. Whoa, there they are. We have no cover up here, so we're going to keep moving. You in pursuit, or should I open fire? I'm only halfway to the stairs. Fire until I say otherwise. Understood. Hope you get here quick. Me too. Lahar broke into a sprint. Me too. Deva stumbled up the stairs, struggling to maintain her footing as they rushed along toward the entrance above. From the air, the place appeared tall, but as they tried to mount it, she got a much better perspective on its size. Some of the buildings back home were so large, but they offered elevators rather than stairs. Halfway up, she panted like she'd been running half her life. Even with clean air from her suit, her lungs labored. Trios shoved her from behind and she collapsed on the stairs just as enemy weapons fire filled the air. Another attack? Really? How? Deva glanced back down and saw her companions open fire on their pursuers, five of them at least, who just arrived at the stairs. Deva took aim but hesitated to fire. Her companions were in the way and she didn't want her first time pulling a trigger to result in a friendly casualty. She turned and began crawling her way up, peering at the daunting distance she had yet to cover. It might take her an hour to get up there on her hands and knees, but at least she was able to catch her breath. A pulse blast struck the stairs above her, and she ducked until the chin of her helmet tapped the stone beneath her. Cursing, she glanced back again and saw there was at least one body near the bottom. 
Words burst into her ears, but she couldn't process them. Her mind was in a state of fight or flight. When she finally calmed down, she realized she was hearing Lahar giving orders for them to spread out. He was about to flank the enemy and didn't want to get shot by one of his own. Trias grabbed Deva by the arm and yanked her hard to the left, dragging her to the edge of the stairs. Alliance weapons fire rose above the noise of pulse weapons and the enemy started screaming. Terrible, nightmarish noises Deva figured she would never forget for as long as she lived. How did they cry out so loudly? She shouldn't have been able to hear them from her vantage point so high above the valley floor. Yet their deaths were felt by each of them. Lahar started up the stairs, shouting for them to move. Again, the enemy bodies began to disappear, disintegrating into thin air. More of that strange projection thing that we talked about. Deva wondered about it as she was pulled to her feet and compelled upwards. The enemy must have found something here to supplement their military. They arrived at the top with explosions going on overhead. The pilots were engaged with enemy fighters, dogfighting some kilometers off. Their engines tore through the sky, piercing the heavens with high-pitched whines and sudden booms. Deva flinched after every sound, until she was practically crouching while they approached the massive portal leading inside. Deva checked her scanner and frowned. A black door barred their path made of some stone material never cataloged by their science. An access panel sat to the left, aged and covered with dust. She approached and examined it, surprised to find it somehow familiar. This couldn't possibly be our tech. A quick scan indicated the age to be... Millions of years. But that sounded impossible. This was far too advanced for such a thing. She calibrated her sensors and tried again. Same results. Furthermore, her computer claimed their universal code should allow her to translate and use the terminal. It can't be that easy. None of this can. What is going on? Contact! Deva looked up as Trios shouted, firing to their right. Lahar joined her while Nirsa and Vali watched their flank. Two enemies flopped on the ground, killed before they could get a shot off. Another one took cover and fired once, before being shot in the face. Get back on the console, Thynok, now! Deva cursed and returned to her duty, running the universal code and tapping her foot in anticipation. She watched, wondering exactly how long it would take, but when it came back less than a minute with a full instruction set, she simply shook her head. Thank the fates this is all recorded, because no one's going to believe me otherwise. I'm in. What? Lahar asked. I didn't copy. I said I'm in, Deva shouted. I'll open it when you're ready. Stack up. Lahar gestured to the others, and they took up positions on either side of the door, weapons aimed in. Don't for a second think they aren't in there. Go, Deva. Open it. Deva held her breath and tapped the screen. Nothing happened immediately, and she wondered if the translator made a mistake. A moment later, the ground began to rumble beneath them as rock grated against rock. I did it. It's opening. I got it. Relax, Lahar snapped. Stay back, too. If they're in there, they'll certainly start shooting right away. Deva noted that the energy readings increased noticeably as the door slid to the right. The spike might have been from the requirement to open, but she didn't buy it. Something else was going on, something tapping into the power feed beyond a need to move a big old rock. Maybe the enemy was redoubling their efforts to get at them. Possible. Their energy projections, or whatever those are, certainly would draw some power. But why do they scream like they're dying? Is it some kind of virtual reality where the user feels the pain of their avatar? Movement distracted Deva from her thoughts, and she watched the soldiers slip inside, gesturing for her to follow. She stepped into the corridor, running another scan. Nothing new. I thought for sure the outer wall would be causing interference. Sensors aren't getting anything new. This doesn't bode well for when we get to the source of power. The cavernous passageway extended some thousand yards ahead of them. Ten men could have walked abreast without touching the walls, and the ceiling was bathed in shadow, making it impossible to tell how tall it was. A scan indicated more than fifty feet. Their footsteps echoed noisily, even as they tried to be quiet. Deva, Lahar asked. Do you have any life forms? Negative, only us. Deva tapped her computer. 
This seems impossible. The enemy must be down here. They could be anywhere, Trias said. Those things we killed out there weren't real, probably from their ship. Which just seemed to show up, Deva hummed. We better hurry. The source of power is coming from below us. There must be an elevator or more stairs. Pick up the pace, Lahar directed. Double time it. Deva groaned internally at the thought of running. She was already exhausted. Picking up the pace made her legs complain and her back ache all the more. When we get home, I'm requesting some serious leave time. This mission is undoing me. The enemy might be waiting for them, but she had to put the thought out of her mind. I have to focus on finding a way to transfer this power to the font. Fates know they won't have an adapter down there. Kale watched the report come in. Bombers were away and flying toward their objective. They would have a firing solution in moments, and hopefully their attack would slow the enemy down enough to buy some distance. Considering some of their previous tactics, they all knew that this particular enemy had no qualms about sacrificing vessels to take an objective. And considering what they've been up to so far, I wouldn't be surprised if we were worth a quick kill. The report from the surface about the bodies disappearing and the lack of wreckage on scans concerned him. Whatever technology they used couldn't have been developed in the short time the crystal font had been in limbo. This whole planet must have been a testing ground for it, and Kale's crew just had the bad luck of stumbling on them. Which would explain their interest in taking us out. If we got away, we could tell someone about what they have, and then we might come up with a counter. Kale figured his own government might consider sacrificing a battleship to save such a secret as projecting warriors on the battlefield. Risk nothing and gain an army. But if that were true, why did they show up in such small numbers? Why not project a hundred men and kill the landing crew? Why not fashion a thousand fighters and take down the pilots? Limitations? Or maybe we're totally off base. What's another explanation? Another direct hit shook the ship, and Thyna cursed loudly. Can you please perform those evasive maneuvers, Othin? I'm not dancing over here, Othin grumbled back. I'm trying. They're good shots. Damage report, Kale said. Shields are at 45%, Thyna said. Bombers report they are ready to fire and are deploying their ordnance as we speak. Kale crossed his fingers silently praying to the fates that this might give them the edge they so desperately needed. He tapped a button and brought the bombers up on his screen, their missiles streaking through space toward the enemy. There was no way they could avoid the attack, nothing they could really do but try to shoot them down. But they didn't seem to even notice, nor react. They continued firing at the crystal font, pressing forward with all the insistence of their suicidal companions from previous encounters, when the bombs hit, they flared brightly, causing the screen to compensate by falling dark. Thyna cried out for Othin to punch it. The ship lurched as the shock wave hit them. All the lights went out and flickered back on a moment later. Thyna stood up, pointing at the screen. They're gone. Look, they've been destroyed. Kale couldn't believe his eyes. He anticipated the bombs might have disabled them, or at least knocked out their shields, perhaps slowed them down, but obliterate them? Debris flickered around them for a few lingering moments before the chunks seemed to wink out of existence. One moment they were there, the next, they simply vanished. Did you just see that? Othin asked. I did, Kale replied. Thoughts? Varez shook his head. I have no idea. What we just witnessed is physically impossible. We've been dealing with that a lot lately, Thyna added. I think. Anthar, Vares interrupted. I've got new readings. Report, what are they? Oh my, are you? No. Vares slammed his fist into his console. More enemy battleships. Plural. Thyna slumped in her seat and silence fell over the vessel. Kale knew why. If there were even two out there, they couldn't hold them back. There was no chance. Without the ability to jump or run, they would lose this fight. It was just a matter of time. How many? Four, Vares swallowed hard. Coming in fast. All eyes fell on Kale. 
He didn't want to show them despair, but he didn't have much positivity either. I'm in a nightmare. The sense of doom plunging down on them made his entire body ache, but he didn't show any outward signs. He couldn't buckle, not now, not after everything they'd been through. Get ready, Kale spoke in a calm but firm voice. It was the best form of confidence he could convey. This will be rough. Chapter 7 Gray cross-referenced the coordinates Clea provided with their star charts. She proposed they go well beyond any settled space, somewhere a buoy happened to be without a single colony anywhere nearby. None of the adjacent systems or even their neighbors had been colonized or frequented by anyone willing to report in. Once they performed a jump into that space, they'd be on their own. He didn't anticipate finding the crystal font, but they may well locate some pirates or other criminals hiding out. Those types might even have a base or colony all the way out there. Even with the breadcrumb trail Clea followed, it began to feel like a true wild goose chase. You have our coordinates, Leonard? Gray asked. Edge of the system? Yes, sir. Course laid in and ready. Leonard gestured to Redding. You should see green. Jump is ready, Redding said, taking a deep breath. Ready to engage. Do it. Gray gripped his seat as she hit her panel. Space outside warbled for a brief moment, and they winked into existence. Leonard and Ollie sprung into action, tapping their consoles, pulling data from the surrounding area. Leonard called out confirmation that they'd arrived where intended. Ollie announced he was scanning the system, pending a ping. Gray felt like pacing, but remained in his seat, giving his people a chance to work. Clea sat beside him, rigid as she waited as well. She and the tech crews worked feverishly on this assignment, so every jump must have weighed heavily on them, as they hoped their research paid off and didn't conclude with a buoy that had cleared its cache. The buoy seems to be online, but I'm getting strange readings from it, Ollie said. Trying to get the message. Wait, I've got ships, multiple vessels. What? Gray stood up. What do you mean? How many? Five, Ollie replied. Four Devaran battleships and... The Crystal Font! We found her! Gray felt a sense of relief and concern in equal measure. Enemies out here? They must have traced them somehow, but after so much time. This seems like the worst luck a captain could have. I trust they're in the middle of a fight then? I'm reading problems with the Crystal Font's core, Ollie said. Some kind of power issue? They're not engaged yet, but when they are... They won't last long, Adam finished. I'll get all pilots ready for launch. Should take less than five minutes. Leonard, get us a micro-jump course nearby, Gray ordered. I want us in position to attack immediately. Leonard frantically worked his controls, making the complex calculations required for such an endeavor. He'd gotten pretty good at it from their last few assignments. Not quite as proficient as his predecessor, but certainly getting there. The young man probably never imagined a promotion to bridge staff would come so early in his career, but he'd carried the responsibility well. Course ready, Leonard nodded to Redding. Go for it. Weapons are hot, Redding said. I'm good. Go. They jumped again. This time, the experience was far more jarring. Micro jumps seemed to really hit hard, but the ship especially complained after having just done so moments before. As they appeared nearby, Gray gestured to Agatha, having her reach out to the crystal font immediately. While he did so, Engineering contacted him on his comm. Gray brought it up. Atwell here. Captain, this is Durant. I hope you're not planning on pulling another jump in the very near future. We'll see, Gray said. There are four Devardan ships out there and we found the crystal font. Dedicate power to the weapons and hope. Atwell out. I've got the font, Agatha said, putting on screen. Kale Rushin's face appeared, looking a little more exhausted than the last time they spoke, but otherwise the same. Captain Atwell, he said, you have impeccable timing. We're in a bit of a mess here. We can see that. Gray nodded to Redding, gesturing for her to accelerate. We're closing for battle. What's your situation? 
We've already taken down one enemy vessel, Kale replied. Then these four showed up, and when I say that, I don't mean they jumped in. They literally appeared. Have you heard of some new technology where they can create energy projections of their forces? Gray shook his head. No, uh, what do you mean? We have a team on the planet and they encountered troops which disappeared when they died. Same with enemy fighters. If your tech officer scans the planet, he'll find a strange energy reading we've never seen before. It's off the charts. Unfortunately, we needed to spark our extra crystal so we can get out of here. I wondered, have you been here all this time? Months? No, a jump anomaly. Kale paused. I think we'll need to discuss this part after we survive. Agreed, Gray nodded. We're launching fighters and are in position to open fire. Let's keep communication open for coordination. Agreed. Kale finally smiled. Thank you for coming, Captain. We appreciate the help. Any time, Anthar. Gray motioned for Agatha to cut the screen. Open fire when ready, Redding. Adam, ETA on fighter deployment? Less than five minutes, Adam said. Bombers are also ready. We'll have them deployed momentarily. Fantastic. All right, you bastards. Let's see how you like throwing down with a ship that isn't practically crippled. Wing Commander Megan Pointer and her Panther Wing launched from the behemoth, preparing to escort a group of bombers. Once they cleared the ship, her eyes took in the objective, and an involuntary gasp took her. Four battleships, grouped up and on rapid approach to the crystal font, powered up weapons for an assault. What is so important out here in the middle of nowhere to warrant that kind of action? My God, Squadron Leader Mick Torin muttered. Where are their fighter screens? I'm not picking anything up on scans. Shouldn't they be trying to defend against what we're about to do? I would have thought, Megan replied. She clicked over to Wing Commander Rudy Hale's comm. Where are you? We're ready for an attack run. I'm out, waiting for the rest of the wing, Rudy replied. We're going to have to be conservative with that many ships. Hope for a chain reaction. I don't think we're going to have time for a reload in this fight. Probably not, Mick added. And if they all launch their fighters, we don't have enough people to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. Then let's make sure they don't have time to launch any, Megan said. She accelerated to full speed, moving forward to scout ahead. They must be jamming our scans somehow. There has to be fighters out there. Mick's right. Not even these animals would risk a bombing run unprotected. Even a little closer, she still didn't pick up anything on sensors. The ships were definitely powering up weapons. She could see their barrels burning red. But they held their fire, allowing the crystal font to hammer them with cannon fire. The behemoth let their weapons fly a moment later, pummeling the lead vessel. Shields flared and she flinched as the forward defenses fell, Another barrage might cause some serious damage, but if they could get their bombers in place, that might take one down completely. Even if the entire wing wasn't ready, the opportunity seemed like something they shouldn't waste. Rudy? Megan said. Can you get someone over there to launch a couple bombs at that thing? Yep, I saw it too. Rudy sighed. Get on my wing, Broussard. Let's take that thing down while the others assemble. We're going in. Megan fell back to allow them to catch up. Even on afterburners, they weren't as fast as the fighters. The massive ships lumbered up to her and continued on as two more panther fighters fell in beside. The behemoth fired another volley, this one tearing through the armor on the hull and ripping through key systems. Orange-blue flames leaked out for a moment before some emergency system must have cut off the breach. Scans didn't indicate if the shields were up or not, but they appeared to be. Even if they weren't, providing Rudy and his wings staggered their attacks, they should be able to cut through the defenses and tear them down, eliminating the threat. Twenty seconds to launch, Rudy said. Are we sure there aren't any fighters out there? Giant control, Megan called out. Do you have anything on scans, fighters, shields? My screens are practically coming back with nothing. I'll pat you through to the bridge. Ravente sounded confused. I don't trust what I'm seeing either. Great. That's not a good sign. Megan checked her chronometer and noted that Rudy and his partner would be firing any second. It might not matter if you don't hurry, folks. Uh, Panther One, this is the behemoth. Ollie's voice filled her cockpit. 
I've got scans on their shields, but no fighters. We have taken down their primary defenses. Another pass should disable the vessel. However, I do see you're with a couple bombers. We will redirect our attention to one of the other ships and let you finish that one off. Over. Thank you, Megan said. You heard him, Rudy. It's all yours. Rudy fired first. Three bombs that rocketed away from his ship and headed straight for the damaged cruiser. A count of ten saw the next volley off, and all of their ships pulled away, hurrying back to their rally point from launching. The computer suggested the estimated time to impact was less than thirty seconds. We'll still be flying back to the others when they detonate. Megan glanced over her shoulder just as the first three bombs struck the hull and exploded. The impact caused the battleship to list, then various explosions pockmarked the surface. Another three hit it on the belly, tearing through and creating a massive chain reaction. The entire ship went up a second later, a bright flash filling space, then going dark just as fast. Megan checked her computer for the shockwave impact, but nothing showed up. Frowning, she patched back over to Ollie and asked him what happened. What's the safe minimum distance? And did that explosion bother his buddies? Um, Ollie sighed. I have no idea what to tell you. There's no shockwave, no detonation to worry about, and the other ships seem completely unaffected despite their proximity. This makes absolutely no sense. Let me do some research, but... Well, it's not for me to say. I'm turning over any other orders to Commander Everly. Okay. Megan switched over to private calm with Rudy. You ever see anything like that? Negative, Rudy replied. Definitely new to me, especially since we hit it with six bombs. Those alone should have caused some trouble. If not for them, then for us. I mean, they weren't all that far from the behemoth, but even our vessel didn't seem too troubled by that explosion. Ollie said they're doing some research, Megan said. I think we're standing down for a moment. Sounds good. Rudy found a way to audibly shrug. I don't know what to tell you. The rest of my wing's here. We're ready to attack. I've got something on scan, Mick interrupted. Looks like they finally decided they need some fighters. Of course they did, Megan sighed. All right, get ready for intercept. I'll tell Giant Control and we'll do what needs doing. Rudy, you'd better hang back with the others and wait for us to cut you a decent path. Otherwise, this will be a quick trip. Happy to let you lead the way, Rudy said. Never much minded watching your behind. Cute, Megan shook her head. Panther wing, form up on me. Tiger, stand protect the bombers. Giant control, we're ready for intercept. Give the go word and we'll engage. Hang tight, Ravente said. We're not there yet, but I'll give you the news momentarily. There's a lot of strangeness going on with these readings, and I don't want to send you in without a better understanding of what's going on, especially if we've just encountered a new kind of technology. Lord knows this won't be for the best. Ollie felt confounded. The readings and scans made no sense. How could they have absorbed the shockwave from the bombs and prevented the ships around them from experiencing the attack? Was it a new kind of containment to avoid blowing away a fleet when one ship went up? Even so, he couldn't even imagine how such a technology would work. A safety protocol for total breakdown of the core? Not from the type of trauma they were put through. He had no good explanation for what he'd seen. The readings he received didn't help. Nothing really explained the event, and no matter what program he put the data through, it all came back the same. Unexplainable. Ollie patched into the crystal font and got their secondary tech officer, Vares, on the line. He posed the problem to him, hoping the Keelans may have already determined their enemy's advantages. Unfortunately, they were just as confounded. Whatever strange power came from the planet must have something to do with the enemy's newfound abilities. And that might mean they've designed some kind of new power unit to do God knows what. Apparently anything. But I don't buy it. They would have employed all this by now. We would have heard about it, encountered it during a fight, not found it in some remote place that the crystal font just happened upon. Captain, I don't know what we're seeing, Ollie reported, but it's beyond unnatural. Even the font doesn't quite understand, and they've been here a while. Apparently the fighters on the surface did the same, and bodies are disappearing. If that battleship somehow did the same thing, and more importantly, 
Where did our bombs go? If they detonated, there should have been some kind of feedback. But they just winked out, too. Any theories at all? Gray asked. Clea? Ollie? They have created a projection device, Clea said. Capable of creating carbon copies of themselves and their vehicles, which in turn can fight and cause real damage. That's a theory? Adam smirked. Sounds like fact, the way you put it. Clea shrugged. It's one possibility, but certainly not the only one. Ollie, do you have any thoughts? Ollie's mouth dropped open and he shook his head helplessly for a moment. I don't really know. I, I mean, the project ideas sound... It might explain the latency in their attacks. They're not nearly as quick as we're used to. They didn't even have fighters out there a few minutes ago, and now they do. After we took out their first battleship. And four more showed up, Gray said after the crystal font dealt with one of their cruisers. Interesting how that's working out, Redding said. Like they're not sure how much power to use to take us out. If it's even them, Agatha said. All eyes fell on the communications officer and she blushed. What I mean is, maybe the enemy isn't responsible for all this. It could be something to do with the planet instead. How? Ollie asked. I don't know that, Agatha replied. I was just offering a theory. A good one, Gray added. After all, we can't assume the enemy's involved in this. They might be, but if they're not, we need to be looking elsewhere. What made you think of that, Agatha? I tried to pick up their communications, Agatha answered. But there's no radio communication between the vessels at all. Not even coded. In fact, I read only one mappable frequency, and that seems to be an energy source. No shields, no chatter, and no interference from their mass. Nothing. Wait, energy source? Ollie turned back to his console and tapped away. Can you feed it over? It's sent. Ollie really focused for a moment as the cannons fired again. They were struck by a blast, but he ignored the rattling and shaking, drawing more data from the surrounding area. He had an exact duplicate of what Agatha found, and it was from the energy source on the planet. As he put them on top of one another, he confirmed that they were indeed the same. Either the enemy is on the planet, or the planet is the enemy. Ollie relayed his opinion to the bridge crew, and none of them spoke for a moment. Clea joined him, checking his findings and scrutinizing the data. She nodded once and confirmed what he suggested. I agree. These ships are directly related to the planet somehow. We need to establish some facts, Gray said, right away. Clea, I want you on that. Ollie, focus on the battle. We need scans of the ships during the fight. How's the font doing? They've taken a bit of a beating, Ollie said. But they're doing okay. Shields holding, but Hull took a licking in the last barrage. Enemy fighters are ready to engage our people. I'm recommending we take them down so the bombers can work some magic. Can we send them in? I'm on it, Adam said. Keep hammering away at them, Redding. They're moving closer to the font, Ollie said. Intercept, Gray ordered. Redding, do not let that ship get up on them. Focus all firepower on them right now. I didn't come all the way out here to lose our allies now, and they certainly didn't survive so long just to die in a senseless battle in the middle of nowhere. Keep efficient, but let's make things a little faster, folks. For all our sakes. Megan had plenty of experience battling enemy fighters. She'd flown countless simulations and then engaged them multiple times in the last several months. Their style and tactics were well known to her. They tended to fly in groups of three, covering each other throughout a fight and maneuvering in unpredictable ways. This meant taking one of them down could be a serious challenge. Megan's people proved highly successful against them before they upgraded their inertial dampeners. Engaging them now meant making full use of their new advantage and she thought it might be necessary since they would be dramatically outnumbered. So when she shot down her seventh fighter in less than five minutes, Megan knew something was seriously wrong. Yes, the enemy flew wildly and took shots at them, but they didn't seem to be really trying. They lacked whatever passion drove them on in a serious conflict, and though they had several close calls, none of the behemoth fighters had even been damaged yet. Either we've gotten really good or they fielded their C-team. A moment after the thought crossed her mind, one of her opponents attempted to collide with her, 
and as she banked away from him, he slammed into his own wingman. The two enemy vessels exploded and winked out of existence. Simply gone. Megan didn't have time to really think about it, and kept her head in the game, acquiring a firing solution on her next target. Anyone wonder why this isn't a little harder? Lieutenant Kelly Parson, Panther 7, asked. I've got nine kills already. Right there with you, Lieutenant Paris Tullifson, flying in Panther 5, replied. They're shooting, but not nearly as often or heavily as they do in simulation, or back at the research facility. Mick responded. Won't matter if we can't whittle their numbers down. Scans indicate they brought in reinforcements. Another twenty. Twenty? Megan groaned. And I thought I was doing well over here. I would have sworn they'd have launched everything by now. A missile flew by her, nearly connecting with Mick's ship. He managed to avoid it, but the projectile started chasing him. He hit the afterburners and Megan closed behind him, acquiring a firing solution and letting the computer get tone. As it buzzed, she fired a short burst and ordered him to climb. Her shots took out the missile and would have smacked him in the tail had he not gotten out of the way. Thanks, Mick said. I would have thought he'd have followed that up, though. Something's wrong. This feels like... Megan paused. Like an easy simulation. Those missiles sure seem real enough, Paris said. And I took a shot from one of their pulse cannons, Kelly added. Sure didn't feel like a simulation to me. I've got minimal damage, by the way. Megan admired her scans for a moment, disengaging from combat. Oddly enough, no enemy fighter pursued her. As she left the fight and climbed out of the general chaos, she pinged the enemy battleships and tried to get an accurate count of the fighters flying around. Her computer showed blips, but they faded in and out, some vanishing entirely. I hope the behemoth's on this, because I have no clue what that means. Megan noticed a couple of enemy ships trying to close on one of Tiger Wing's tails, so she flew down to assist, firing missiles just as she got into range. One of them went down in an instant, and the other broke away, fleeing the attack. At least they sometimes seem worried about dying. Another battleship exploded, the one closest to the crystal font. As the light brightened space around them, Megan winced. I hope the shockwave doesn't damage them even worse. But when the core finished, the ship was simply gone. No wreckage, no hull, no burning debris. Like everything else, it simply ceased to be. Did you see that, Mick? Kinda busy, Mick yelled back. In fact, I could really use some help over here. My bad. I'll be right there. Megan twisted her controls and engaged in the fight again, taking her mind off the high-level problem and focusing. She rocketed closer just in time to watch a blast of cannons cause mixed shields to flare. Pulling the trigger, she perforated one of the enemy ships, tearing through its shields and littering the cockpit with weapons fire. That craft spun out of control and went spiraling toward the planet. She redirected her attention to the other one who pulled an outrageous maneuver, practically flipping in place to take some shots back at her. Megan disengaged, diving to avoid the attack and hitting her afterburners to gain some speed, but the enemy remained tight on her tail. Going full evasive, she veered around his shots, narrowly avoiding a full blast several times, even as grazes caught her shields and nudged her with their impact. Need some help, Megan called into the comm. Anyone available? I've got it. Flight Lieutenant David Benning said. He flew in Panther 3. Makes a little busy. I stepped in for him. Please bank left, ma'am. Megan felt a hint of annoyance at how casual he sounded, but she complied, moving the direction he requested. When nothing immediately happened, she wondered what he was doing, but just as she decided to say something, an explosion behind her explained. The enemy blip disappeared from her scanner. They formed up together and headed back toward the main fight. Thanks, Megan said. Appreciate the assist. No problem. Looks like they launched another ten. They have to run out sometime, Megan replied. Listen up, Panther. We're putting in some overtime on this one, but if you need to reload, let us know and get back to the ship. They're prepared for hot transfers. Just don't let yourself run out completely. Getting back won't be fun. But as we're in for the long haul, good luck and keep reporting in. We've got this.
Gray watched the first battleship go up, leaving three behind. They were barely putting up a fight. I bet that one was going for a self-destruct. I wish I could say this was predictable behavior, but in this case, they're hardly putting up a fight. Even in numbers, they have to actually use their weapons to win. What's going on? As if to answer his question, all three enemy cruisers opened up, firing volleys of cannon fire. Shields flared on their ship, and he noticed the crystal font was experiencing the same fate. He frowned, wondering what suddenly changed. Why didn't they do this before we took down their companion? Ollie, Gray leaned forward. Try protocol seven on target number three, the one on the starboard side. Reading target and fire on his mark. Sir, Ollie glanced over his shoulder. We, we know it doesn't work anymore. Try it anyway, Gray shrugged. What's it matter either way? Okay, Ollie began tapping away. Shield's holding at 80%, but they're really pounding us. Too heavily, in fact. I thought they had to refresh their weapons more often. A moment later, the enemy barrage ended. Weird. They're recharging. Ollie shook his head. Protocol 7 ready. I'm sending it now. He watched his scanner and his eyes widened, jaw dropping. It worked. Redding, fire. Redding opened up, letting everything they had go. She coordinated with the crystal font, who also gave them a full blast from their cannons as well. The combined force against an unshielded ship caused catastrophic damage. Massive explosions marred the hull and the core went up in a spectacular light show. But the ships nearby didn't so much as have their shields flare up and the behemoth didn't feel any shockwave from the destruction. I have a feeling that won't work again, Gray said. Though you're welcome to try on the next ship. Why wouldn't it work? Adam asked. That thing couldn't have transmitted information to its buddies. These ships must have been off the network for so long they didn't get any update about our weapons. Gray shrugged. A hunch? I'm starting to piece together the puzzle, but it's still the same damn color. Agatha, how's the buoy? Can we get a message out? There are people performing maintenance, Agatha said, still working through it despite what's going on. It needed serious maintenance, and they took it offline to do so. We can't send anything yet. Fantastic, Gray muttered. Keep checking. The second they get it back, so we can call for help. Sir, Ollie said. I've got another six enemy battleships incoming, and they're leading with their best foot. They're opening fire. I hope Clea figures this out soon. Gray stood up. The odds just got terrible. Agatha, work with the Crystal Font on an evacuation plan. If we can get them over here, we can jump out of here and avoid further conflict. Make it fast and efficient. We can't handle the odds if they continue to multiply like this. Clea joined Paul in the tech lab and used several of the computers to run simulations, trying to identify the signal and see what exactly it was doing. The planet seemed to be emanating more power than it had when they initially arrived. Comparing it to what the crystal font sent them upon their arrival, it had been pumping out only a low level of energy then. Something's pushing it now, some kind of operation. If the enemy's down there, they must be using more and more to fight us off. Tapping the comm, Clea brought up the crystal font. This is Tothin Antufal of the Behemoth. I need to contact your ground crew on the surface. Can you please give me the frequency? This is Anthari Wena Fi Devo, the response came back. And yes, I'm sending it over now, ma'am. Please let me know if there's anything else I can do. Thank you. Clea sat back in her chair and turned to Paul. Keep monitoring the signal and check whether or not it is somehow being cast into space or if it's localized. At first, I thought it might be surrounding the world only, but maybe I was wrong. The sheer magnitude of it is overwhelming our sensors, so we might have to take down the fine-tuning. I'm on it. Paul worked quickly, but it would still take a few moments. Clea sat back and waited to connect up with the ground forces. Their perspective might well answer a lot of questions, depending on how dangerous it was down there and what they were facing. As the ship shook from an incoming attack, the urgency of the situation amplified. Sorry, Gray. I'm going as fast as I can. Deva and the others arrived at what her scanner suggested was an elevator. Another panel blocked their way, but once again, the universal code got her in quickly enough. 
She tapped away and the doors opened, this time with far less noise than the front area. As they stepped inside, she marveled at how massive it was. Once again, nearly 50 feet high and vast in each direction. They must have hauled some serious gear down here. Deva turned to the panel. They couldn't have been giants, or that would be a lot bigger. And higher. The elevator began to move, but it was subtle enough that they could only tell by the tiniest vibration in their feet. Lahar and the others took the best cover they could and held their weapons at the door. Deva moved behind them, aiming her weapon toward the floor with her finger off the trigger. This thing is a last resort. Deva? Wena's voice in her helmet made her jump. Do you copy? I'm here, Deva muttered irritably. I'm a little busy down here. What's going on? I'm patching in Tothin Clea on Tufal from the Behemoth. She needs to talk to you urgently. Oh, wait, the Behemoth's here? Hope gripped her heart and she felt a sense of excitement rise in her. That's fantastic news. Patch her through, quickly. Did you just say the Behemoth's here? Lahar asked. And how far are we going down anyway? They're here, Deva nodded. Give me a moment. The connection established and Clea spoke first. Hello, Vintari. We don't have a lot of time, so forgive my lack of greeting. I need a better understanding of what you're finding down there. Do you have any more data about the energy readings we're picking up? Do you know what's causing it? What's creating it? I have some information, Deva said. I've scanned one of the bodies we killed that disappeared, and it proved to be pure energy, no organic material whatsoever. Furthermore, the energy has been increasing as we've pressed closer to the core. Whatever's controlling it might be working harder to protect whatever we're about to find. Understood. We're finding a similar pattern with the battleships up here. Wait, battleships? As in more than one? Deva swallowed hard. How many? Eight, right now, Clea replied. Which seems rather impossible. However, they are causing damage when they shoot, and our ordnance is definitely hitting something when we fire back. We need to know what they are and how they've been made. The key must be down there where you're going. I agree, and we're getting closer. Deva checked her scanner. We're on an elevator going deep into the planet. I'm guessing the power source isn't the core of the world itself, but it might have access to it. Let me know the moment you find something. Lahar immediately began questioning Deva, and she did her best to answer his questions, but they primarily revolved around the attacking forces. He believed if they could leverage the kind of numbers against them that those starships represented, they could land a number of troops and outnumber them with ease. In fact, he expressed confusion as to why they hadn't done it yet. If this facility belongs to them, they should have already taken us down, Lahar said. We have killed quite a few, Trias said. Maybe they didn't have that many people down here to begin with. Deva allowed the military people to talk about the odds and numbers, devoting her attention to her scanner. The power output had increased considerably, and as they got closer, she realized that they were standing on more directed energy than she might have measured in six battleship engine cores. This place could take care of the entire capital back home without running out. Clean power forever. The elevator slowed down and stopped, bringing her back to the moment. Stress gripped her as the soldiers aimed their weapons at the door. Deva took up a position between Trias and Lahar, pointing her gun outward as well. She kept her finger off the trigger to prevent a mishap, but knew the second the door opened, she might need to fire. This is the moment of truth. If this place is protected, we may well not survive the next 60 seconds. Fates, I hope you didn't lure us down here only to die. We're too close to escape. The door began to open, and she held her breath. Here we go. Chapter 8 Gray gripped his seat as the ship shook violently, a reaction to a series of blasts from several enemy vessels. Shields held, but he knew they wouldn't last long. Not under that punishment. Worse, there was nothing he could do to make any of their plans move faster, and everyone was already doing their jobs. Evacuating the crystal font would take time, and they'd have to risk a lot of people trying to make the trip over the behemoth. This wouldn't allow them to save those on the surface either. With eight enemy warships, they technically should have cut bait and run. But Gray couldn't do it. Not when they came so close to their objective. At a certain point, I'll have to do so. If only to get some backup out here and stop the enemy from whatever they're doing. 
A flash on the screen caught his attention. Two of the enemy went up, exploding in a spectacular burst of light. He took a deep breath, unable to feel much enthusiasm for their success. Two down, six to go didn't mean much in this situation. He turned to his tablet, checking for reports, but nothing new had come in. Adam leaned close, keeping his voice low. Our pilots report additional units are joining the fray. Our bombers are returning for reload. It's getting worse. Sure isn't getting better, Gray replied. We have to buy time, for us and them. You might have already thought about this, Adam said, but we should seriously consider jumping out of here. Get some reinforcements and come back. The buoy won't be back online in time to help us. There's no point in dying out here. It won't serve anyone. Yes, I've thought about it, but I'm not ready to give up. When it looks like we've got no other choice. Gray stood up and moved to Leonard. Plot a course out of this system. Get us some good jump coordinates. We need to be prepared. I'm on it. Gray heard the hesitation in the young man's voice. He didn't want to leave. Taking off at that point would mean they failed, that they lost the people they were there to save. Adam's practicality might have been the right thing to do, but it certainly didn't feel like it. Another volley splashed against their shields. The ship trembled and Gray grabbed Leonard's chair to stay on his feet. Shields? Fifty percent, Ollie said. Though honestly, I don't know how we're doing so well. Their weapons should be doing a lot more damage. Gray agreed. The ridiculous odds would have been more than enough to take out both vessels, even if the crystal font had been fully functional. The puzzle became more complex, and Clea needed to provide the key to solving it. Maybe they'd figure it out in time to save everyone. But confidence began to slip. Lahar opened fire, executing two enemy soldiers waiting outside the door. The hallway narrowed in comparison to the one above, and the ceiling was barely twelve feet high. The doors didn't open as much as they could, just enough to allow them to depart. They'd have to step over the bodies to get in. Is this the only other floor? Lahar asked. No, Deva said. Yes? She checked the panel again. Okay, there are others, but they seem to be maintenance corridors. Shorter. They might not even be big enough for one of us to get through. I tried to get us as close to the power reading as possible. The core of this place. My scans say we're close. The end of the hallway, there's a room. We have to get there. Your scans show any more enemies? Trias asked. Mine's coming up empty. No, Deva said. Nothing but the core. Can we go? Lahar sighed. Dying doesn't make us faster. Trias, you and I are on point. The rest of you are with Deva. Let's go. He dashed forward, keeping his weapon in front of him. If someone came out at the end, they'd be helpless. He had to be prepared to fire, to take a head off if one peeked out. The walls seemed to close in on him as he moved along, the narrow corridor proving to be a dramatic contrast to the one they'd entered through. A silhouette appeared, and he pulled the trigger, the stock of his gun biting into his shoulder. Something screamed, their voice echoing off the ceiling. Trias tapped his arm, taking his place in the lead. Lahar hoped Deva could figure out what they needed when they got to the end, but despair threatened to overwhelm him. Even if they figured out how to tap the energy, it wouldn't necessarily matter. They couldn't swap out the crystal in the middle of a space battle, and if there were more than one of them out there, the mission they were risking their lives for meant nothing. Success, failure, life, death, all came to the same end. As they reached the second doorway, the elevator closed down the hall. Trias cried out, aiming her weapon in that direction. Are we trapped? No, Deva replied. The panels were working just fine. Why did it close then? Lahar asked. Maybe someone else summoned it? Deva shrugged. Elevators close on their own back home? I don't know. Trias grabbed her arm. You really need to start putting some pieces together. We're putting our lives on the line on your word. Settle down, Lahar ordered. He peered through the door, ignoring the fact that the body he'd shot on the way down had already disappeared. Lights burst to light overhead, and he fell back, taking aim. You're getting twitchy, he thought. Relax. Is this where we want to be? Deva stepped past him into a room roughly twenty by twenty. The walls appeared smooth, like polished stone, and there were no other exits. 
Illumination came from panels overhead, each glowing sky blue. The soldiers stepped inside and took position around the door, and Lahar left them to guard it as he followed the tech officer. Now we know the enemy's pulling some kind of technological marvel, Lahar said. That guy I shot had nowhere to come from unless he was already in here. We knew they were using a marvel when they disappeared, Deva replied, tapping her computer. The walls are monitors, I think. We've come to some kind of control room. Lahar grumbled. How do you know? I'm getting the same readings I did from the panel by the elevator. She hit a button and the wall opposite the door burst to life, showing a variety of messages and some foreign language. Lahar marveled at it for a moment, but looked away, peering over the rest of the room. Yes, I can access this. Um, Trias drew his attention to the door. Looks like the elevator's opening again. Great, Lahar grumbled. Can you close this up, at least partially? I'll try, Deva said. I need to communicate with Tothan on Tufal as well. We can figure this out, Lahar. We'll get out of this, I promise. Lahar didn't have the heart to tell her his opinion. He figured he'd rather go out fighting regardless, but her enthusiasm, her naivete, nodded his stomach. If she came to the same realization he had, she might well give up. They may well be facing the last moments of their lives anyway. He didn't see any reason to spend them in useless despair. Then hurry up, he aimed down the sight of his weapon, waiting for the first person to step out in the open. Time's wasting, as they say. Clea watched the feed from Deva, desperate to do more than watch, but helpless at the moment. The transmission showed they arrived in a control room, some kind of central nervous system for the complex, probably. If so, it may well be the way to manipulate the power source the crystal font sent them for. But how exactly could they tap it for sparking their crystal? There didn't appear to be any way to plug into the thing. Maybe they need to get those monitors on and tell the computer to transfer some energy to a portable device. If my calculations are right, they won't need much, but an engineer should definitely take a look. She sent a quick message to Durant, providing him the information she had. He'd be able to give them an accurate and quick response on what they needed. Of course, both he and the engineer aboard the Crystal Font were likely busy trying to keep them alive. The behemoth was holding its own, but for how long? I wonder if Gray is thinking about leaving. Two ships could not be lost out there. It didn't feel particularly heroic, but she understood the notion. Deva has to hurry. The camera feed was delayed by a few moments, so when a monitor burst to life, Clea figured it must have been on for a good five seconds. What did you discover? Clea asked. Voice was real time. I've tapped into the computer network of the complex, Deva replied. I'm analyzing it now and sending back the data as I record it. I think I understand what's going on, and more importantly, I can confirm that the enemy is not present here. Take a look at this. Please confirm my conclusion. Clea watched as translated data filled her screen. She gestured for Paul to join her, but he needed to go to his own terminal and translate the Keelan language. Whoever built the complex left behind instructions on how to utilize their facility. A help file, for lack of a better term. They wanted someone to come along and use it. But why are we under such heavy attack, then? Contact, Lahar shouted, from the elevator. Gunfire erupted over the comm and Clea had to turn it down. She read quickly, doing her best to ignore the action. Deva must be stressed beyond belief. After the research facility, Clea knew how frightening field operations could be. Yet she left the ship another time while they pursued the recorder from her previous ship. One does what they have to. Paul broke her thoughts. This is fascinating. I can't believe we found such a thing. I only hope our discovery will be something we can share. Megan fought exhaustion and pain lancing through her muscles. The constant dogfighting was wearing her down, and she knew she wouldn't last much longer. Two of their ships had been disabled but not destroyed. There was no explanation. The enemy simply stopped shooting at them. The bombers had to return to be reloaded and hadn't returned yet. Panther Wing likely needed to do the same with their missiles. As Megan dodged an enemy that tried to collide with her, she fired a burst on another one and took him out. Flying through the explosion, 
she had to spin to the left to avoid another attack and hit her afterburners to get out of a particularly nasty brawl. Mick called out to her, asking for her position. She told the computer to send it to him, focusing on her flying instead. They'd link up again and work together. Everyone got separated for a short period of time. The action out there made the craziest simulation look like easy mode. There were so many enemy fighters, they practically didn't have to aim. Another fighter on Tiger Wing went down, disabled. Two bomber wings reported they were back on the field and heading for their targets. More of the battleships. They'd proved to be fairly easy to take down, and Megan risked a chance to count them. They were down to five. Considering the odds, she couldn't believe they'd been so successful. This will definitely go down as our most bizarre engagement to date. Three enemies got on their tail and she groaned, performing a dive. Mick let her know he was on them, scattering the enemies and giving her some breathing room. She pulled a wild maneuver, spinning to get a shot off on them, and her left shoulder flared up, shooting pain down her back. Not the time. Pulling the trigger, she ended another one. If not for the computer, Megan would have lost track of how many she shot down. Mick took out the other two and they formed up, prepared for the next wave. How long can this possibly go on? Why are they not experiencing any fatigue at all? It's not like this is easy on them. You're all about to have a worse day, Ravente said. Reinforcements are incoming. Are you kidding me? Megan clenched her fist in frustration. Thanks, great news. We're on it. Captain's about to order you to withdraw, Ravente replied. Start working your way to a position to disengage. All ships, prepare to disengage. Bombers will deploy your payloads and head back. Acknowledge. Acknowledged, Megan replied. They mean to jump out of this sector. Without the crystal font, we'll have come out here for nothing. And we won't be able to get our disabled pilots either. This is a cluster. You heard them, Mick. Start falling back. Even if it is going to stick in my craw for a long time. Kale checked the statistics of his fighters and noted that they were doing quite well despite the sheer numbers out there. Shields were holding on the crystal font as well, a miracle worked by Mira for sure. His people worked hard to survive against overwhelming odds, odds which would certainly end them eventually. Deva's report suggested they made it to the control center of the facility they located. Unfortunately, the soldiers were once again engaged with enemy ground forces. Kale already knew the result of their mission. Even if she found the power source, they couldn't spark the crystal and replace it while under attack. The second the crystal left the assembly, they'd be down to environmental shields only. Weapons would tear through that in seconds. Furthermore, the behemoth wouldn't be able to stay for much longer. They couldn't risk being destroyed out there. He knew they were on the verge of abandonment, and he didn't blame them at all. We don't both have to die. The fact they were down to five battleships out there shocked him as well. Thyna clapped her hands. Direct hit. Kale looked at what she was talking about and noted she'd managed to get their weapons through an enemy's shields and cause their core to overload. They hadn't blown up yet, but the reaction was obvious on their scanners. That ship was done. Fantastic work. Kale's heart wanted to start hoping, but practicality beat it down. Knocking them down to four meant they'd already done the impossible. Bombers from both sides were engaging again, preparing to fire at the remaining ships. They might even take two down. If that was the case, then the behemoth just might be able to finish the rest off. Fighters wouldn't be as hard without a base. I can't say anything, but this just might work. The entire ship shook, as if to dash Kale's hope. Report! Varez held onto his console and shouted back, Bomb hit us! Shields are at 20%! Kale slapped his own console. Mira, can you get us more power? The crystal fractured again! Mira replied. I'll do what I can, but if we're being honest, this thing has maybe ten minutes of combat left in her. Conservatively, I'd assume five. Five minutes. This ship will be lost in a matter of minutes. Understood. Do what you can. The battle's going far better than it should. Squeeze whatever you can out of that thing. On it, sir. Did we get the bomber dealt with, Thyna? Thyna nodded. Turrets took the others down before they could release their payloads. We were very lucky. That seems to be going around. Kale narrowed his eyes. 
He'd studied space combat extensively, and yes, a few battles had seemed to embody the definition of fortune. Most came down to simple tactics and numbers. Whether they lived or not, if someone reported on what happened, it would go down in the history books. If anyone's ever allowed to talk about it. We don't have a lot of time, Thyna, Kale said. Make it count. He turned to Deva's report and started to read, hoping for some good news. Deva glanced over her shoulder and wished she hadn't. She couldn't even count the number of enemies in the hallway, but the bastards had no cover. Lahar and his people cut them down easily, tearing through their ranks with quick bursts. However, she knew they'd run out of ammo soon. Then it wouldn't matter how easy they were to shoot. Turning back to the screen, she began reading the greeting. Welcome, visitor. Thank you for visiting the Vakalin Sanctuary. This state-of-the-art facility was designed for study, learning, and leisure. All root species have been considered, for as designers, we know our labors in the far-off parts of the galaxy will eventually leave their systems and travel the stars, just as we did so long ago. This facility and everything in it has been designed to ensure our visitors are able to function and survive on the surface. Please note that hostile action against other living beings will result in disablement. We have a glorious safety record in regards to public order and companionship. It would be a shame to lose our rating over a simple misunderstanding. This is crazy, Deva muttered into her calm. Are you seeing this, Miss Antufal? I am, Clea replied. The rest seem to be regulations for the facility. Try to click through so we can find the exact purpose, or even better yet, a menu. Deva tapped her own screen, interfaced directly with the machine. A moment later, she saw a menu appear with six options. The terminal had to translate them, and she tapped her foot, anxiety compelling her to motion. Behind her, the conflict raged on. She dared to look, and the numbers did not seem to diminish at all. I'm out, Trias shouted, switching to her sidearm. Deva hurried over and gave her a magazine and set her rifle down beside them. I'm good again. Keep it up. Lahar said, but be as conservative as you can with what you've got. Deva hurried back to the terminal and swallowed hard. Maybe I should close the door. She didn't think the enemies could get in, not for a long while. Of course, what would happen when they had to leave? She'd give Lahar and his people a chance to tell her when to do so, and instead focus on the task at hand. The menu finished translating, and Deva squinted up at it. Despite the size, the words were hard to make out against a dark blue background. The font was an off-white color, with the top box flashing. An animated background made it all the more confusing, as yellow lines pulsed in various seemingly random directions. Status, power core, relays, planetary alignment, log files, messages. Deva tapped the power core button, and a wall of technical data appeared. Her computer translated that much quicker as it didn't seem to be an embedded graphic. It expressed that the energy supply was operating at 88% efficiency and with a little maintenance could be back to 99 in short order. Apparently, the relays needed adjustment, but all things considered, Deva figured they didn't need to worry about that yet. Show me the log files, Clea said. Wait, check status. I would have assumed what we just read fell under that option, so this will be interesting. Deva complied, tilting her head as a message sprawled across the screen. All projectors are online and functioning normally, scanning thoughts, worry, fear, terror, adjusting accordingly. What's that mean? Deva hummed. Log files now, Clea said. Hurry! Deva tapped those instead and stepped back as another wall of text displayed. Situation one. Worry about the enemy they are warring with. Calculating? War class fighter Devarin Elatha. Forming and deploying. Situation two. Elatha not performing as expected. Calculating? Adjusting tactics based on known behavior. Situation three. Wondering where the enemy might be coming from. Advanced culture. They have blocked all thoughts of the simulation for immersion. Calculating? Deploying Devarin Warband. Situation 4. Continued concern about source of enemy. Poor rating expected for experience. 
Calculating. Deploying Devarin Battleship. Situation 5. Skepticism. Poor rating guaranteed. Calculating. Deploying additional Devarin battleships. Situation 6. Arrival. New space vessel has entered system. Odds have turned. Calculating. Deploy more forces. Ground. Deployed. Air. Deployed. Space. Deployed. Double them to provide challenge. Situation 7. Prepare survey for opinion results. Offer apologies for the slow turnaround of many services. Apologize for not creating accurate simulation. This is a game, Deva shook her head. The enemy wasn't projecting. This thing was doing it. How? That doesn't matter, Clea said. Go back to the main screen. Hmm. There's no button that says stop. Deva checked her computer for any additional information, but that was it. What do we do? Hit relays, Clea replied. Hurry. Deva tapped the button and a map of the planet appeared with glowing points, presumably showing where the relays were. Another set of commands showed at the top, each representing the different facilities. When she tried one of them, it offered her several options for adjustment. She clicked one, but a message appeared. Must be in maintenance mode to proceed. Deva heard Clea chuckle. That's it, Clea said. The far left. Click that button. It said administrator. She tried it and various selections came up. Reboot, maintenance mode, standby. She tapped the second one, but a message came up. Active simulation in progress. Are you sure? Yes, I'm way sure. Deva tapped it again. Negative survey results are guaranteed. Please confirm. Come on, Deva hit it again. Yes, go, go, go. Soft shutdown initiated. Please wait. No. Deva looked around frantically for another way to proceed. Slow down, Clea said. I know you're stressed down there, but think about it for a moment. If it just shut down suddenly, it could cause some damage to the power core. And since you're standing on it, believe me, you want it to take the time it needs. I'm going to check the scans up here and see if it's working. Hang tight. Hold on, everyone, Deva shouted. We might have something. What could it possibly be? Lahar asked. A miracle? Deva replied, unable to stop smiling. A real miracle. Megan zeroed in on another target, getting tone. She was about to hit the trigger when the thing literally vanished. Oh, come on, she shouted. Are you flipping kidding me right now? Mick, did you see that? Yeah, just happened to me too. Ships began disappearing all around them, winking out of existence. Half the enemy fighter fleet was gone in an instant, while the rest flashed out over the next several moments. They were suddenly alone out there with the four battleships, and that was it. Incredible, Megan thought. What happened? Deploying bombs, Rudy called over the comms. All payloads. That'll put an end to those battleships. Megan looked around, regaining her wits. Giant Control, we need search and rescue out here to grab our disabled pilots. It appears that the fight is over. Acknowledged. Return to the behemoth for further instructions. You heard them, Megan said to the rest of her wing. Confusion still clung heavily to her as they started flying back. I hope someone knows what just happened, because that will definitely go down as the strangest moment of my military career. Won't get an argument from me. Mick replied. If the bombers successfully take out those ships, we might actually have won this one. Quite a miracle. Megan shook her head. She ached to the bone and couldn't wait to get out of her cockpit. If half the pilots in her wing felt the same way, they all needed some serious downtime. Not just physically, either. Witnessing what they had, seeing those enemies disappear, it would stick with them. Lord knows we'll be asked for a psyche, Val. Can't wait. Adam tapped Gray's arm, drawing him from his own reports. All enemy fighters are just gone. They disappeared. Incredible. Gray looked up at the screen. The enemy battleships were still out there, still firing. What about them? What's going on there? Our bombers have just deployed their payloads, Adam replied. They should make contact. 
he fell silent as the ships disappeared. Not exploded, but were simply gone. Vanished like the fighters. There. We won. Leonard slumped in his chair in relief, but Ollie kept working hard. No one on the bridge seemed to have a celebration in them. Gray stood up, frowning at the screen. I assume Clea will have an explanation for what we just witnessed. Definitely one of the more intense moments of my military career. Captain, Ollie said, I've got some bad news. Those ships disappeared before our bombs made contact. Okay, Adam shrugged. So what? They're heading right for the planet. How many? Gray asked. More than a dozen, Ollie grunted, tapping at his terminal. I've done some calculations. Whatever power cord is down there may be destroyed by such an attack, but if so, it will detonate. And what's that mean for us? Adam asked. As in, how bad will that be? It's basically the most powerful power plant I've ever seen, Ollie replied. Means we'd have to jump out of here before it goes up or we'd all be dead. The people on the surface would be vaporized and any fighters out there wouldn't be able to escape the shockwave. It might be so big of an explosion, it could eventually mess with the gravitational motion of surrounding systems. Bad, then, Gray said. Have the pilots docked with the ship? Adam shook his head. They're on the way, though. Deploy them back. They have to take out those bombs before they make contact. Captain? Adam leaned forward, eyes wide. That'll practically be suicide. We can't let this place be destroyed, and if there are only twelve bombs, a full wing should be able to knock them out. They won't explode, correct? They're set for contact detonation, Ollie said. So if they shoot them in the engine, they should be able to stop them. There you go, Gray gestured to Ollie. Adam, give the order. We need them to hurry. The next few moments will determine what happens to the crystal font and the people that I suspect saved us all down there. I'm not going to let them die simply for the convenience of flying off after all they did. Get to it. Chapter 9 Alma and her wing wrapped up the last of the fighters on the planet's surface and maintained a patrol pattern, prepared to support their people should they need cover to escape. It grated on her, listening to her colleagues in space, battling overwhelming odds while she remained idle beneath them. We should be up there right now. This is ridiculous. Another squadron of enemies came from around the rise, but they were met with swift and decisive action. Alma's people went after them aggressively, leading with cannon fire. Though one managed to survive their initial attack, the way it spun away exposed its tail. Rahan put it down, dropping a continuous stream of fire until it erupted in flames. Updates from within the structure also frustrated her. The soldiers dealt with a constant stream of ground forces, and though they seemed to be making good progress, she didn't envy them the constant action. I'm glad to be behind the flight stick, but I wish there was something we could do. We don't even know where they're all coming from. When they arrived at the control room, Alma wondered what it meant. Even if they brought out power, would they have the capacity to use it? Maybe the behemoth could screen them. She listened to the battle, noting that they had taken down several of the enemy battleships. It seemed impossible, but perhaps they were witnessing a real miracle. It might be nice for a change, considering our normal poor luck. Alma, this is Vares. That particular tech officer always acted too familiar with other officers, and she didn't like it. The man expressed precious little discipline, especially for a Zanthari. It was as if he didn't truly mean to join the military, and would have been happier on board a merchant ship where rank didn't matter. Do you read? I'm here, Zanthari. Alma emphasized his rank. What's going on? Vares didn't seem phased. The enemy fighters have vanished up here. They're simply gone. Alma frowned. How? Why? I hope we have an explanation coming. Instead of asking him any of her thoughts, she simply acknowledged the information. He likely had no better idea of how it happened than she did. Maybe Deva and Lahar figured something out. Either way, it meant her friends up there were no longer in danger. That's a victory. Is the shuttle incoming for pickup then? Alma asked. Affirmative. It's on its way to collect the ground team. 
Varez paused. Um, hold on. I don't really have anywhere else to go. Alma felt grumpy from the entire situation, but she hid it behind a deep breath. What could be happening now? Can we really afford any more bad news? I have some bad news, Varez said. Of course you do. Alma gritted her teeth. What is it? Well, the battleships just winked out as well. How's that bad? I would imagine you guys didn't feel like brawling with them anymore. Yes, but, well, a lot of bombs were thrown at them. Is that how they winked out? Is this a new colloquialism I should be aware of? They disappeared, Alma, but... Varez cleared his throat. They did so before the bombs hit, and now... The ordinance is heading for the planet. Alma sat up straight, eyes wide. How many? A dozen. Are you joking? That's enough to shear a continent if it hits an atmosphere. Yes. So, that's where you come in. Let me guess, you want us to intercept. You have to take out their engines before they wipe out everything in that region. And yes, I've done the math. They'll hit about six kilometers from the structure where our team is currently located. This is absolutely incredible, Alma sighed. Rahan, Hilot, let's go. We have some work to do with some bombs. She filled them in on what was happening, so they understood not only what they had to do, but what was at stake as well. You have to be careful what you shoot. Hitting the front would cause a lot of damage. I'm ready, Rahan said. This sounds fun. Not the word I'd use, Hilot added. But we'd better hurry. Varez jumped in. You'll be meeting two human pilots, so please work together. We know what we're doing, Alma replied. Just get us on their comm net so we can talk and we'll take it from here. In fact, maintain silence unless you've got an urgent update. Hilot and Rahan, gun it and keep up. This is going to be one of the fastest departures we've ever made. I want to break Atmo in less than a minute. Megan got the message from Ravente just moments before she requested landing clearance. When he spoke to her, she instantly had a bad feeling and didn't hide her groan. The fact he called at all meant there was trouble. He never bothered with the basic tower control nonsense. I'm not going to like this. You're not going to like this, Ravente started. Megan rolled her eyes. We've got a serious problem. Those bombs we fired at the enemy ships, they're still active and they're on a direct course for the planet. Why do we care? Megan asked. I mean, it's uninhabited, isn't it? While that may be true, we're not in the habit of destroying worlds unnecessarily, Ravente said. Besides, our calculations put the impact points near enough to a Keelan ground crew that none of them would survive. They need that power to get their ship out of here. We have to take the bombs down. Of course we do. Megan closed her eyes and shook her head. My wing can probably do it. What are there, twelve at most? Yes, a dozen, but you can't bring everyone. If there's a mistake, you know how it is. Too many cooks in the kitchen. The bombs are pretty tightly clustered, so it wouldn't do to have a whole bunch of cannon fire out there. So how many do you want me to take? Just you and Mick. Megan hesitated to reply and just shook her head again. Are you insane? Two of us to take down twelve bombs? You'll be met by three Keelan pilots. Tell them to go home and I'll bring Pantherwing with me. We'll each take one and that'll be eight down. The last four will be cake. The three Keelans are closer and will likely get there first. I need you guys for hop-up. Stop the engines and don't let them collide. They'll detonate on contact. Ravente drew a deep breath. You know I wouldn't ask this of you if I didn't think it was necessary. That doesn't make it better. Just so you know, Megan frowned and spun her ship around. Come on, Mick. The rest of you land. We've got a quick chore to take care of. Ravente, get me in touch with the Keelan commander. I'd like to coordinate this so we don't blow each other up. Fair enough. I'm batching you through to their comms right now. Good luck, and, um, don't mess up. Too much at stake and all that. Yeah, I know. It's not like this is any different than the last ten missions I've been on. See you back on the ship. I hope. Alma and her crew broke atmosphere far easier than she'd ever experienced on another planet, further emphasizing how strange the place proved to be. 
She didn't have time to think about it, focusing on the glowing bombs barely 6,000 kilometers away. They all popped up on her scanner, 12 of them, hurtling toward the planet at a rapid pace. Estimated time to impact, less than seven minutes. No pressure, she muttered, switching to the comm. She cleared her throat. Human team, this is Vintari Alma Ilvar. Do you read me? Wing Commander Megan Pointer here, came the reply. We're on our way. We are focusing on those closest to the target, that being the planet. Alma cleared her throat. As you're not here yet, you can pick up the rear. Is that agreeable? Works for me, Megan said. Good luck. Alma shoved the throttle forward, giving herself all the speed her fighter could produce. The others kept pace but spread out, preparing for the attack. Each of the missiles glowed from their engines, providing a beacon for what they were after. They moved around to get directly behind them before advancing further. The action shouldn't have been a challenge. They were targets that wouldn't fire back, after all, but a mishap could be deadly. A wrong move meant detonating one of the warheads, and at such a close proximity, it wouldn't go well for the smaller ships. For that reason, Alma reduced the power to her cannons and sent the message to her colleagues. We don't have to kick them to turn off those engines, Alma said. Earth pilots, please note our tactic with our cannons. You need to vary your pulse blasts so you don't cause too much damage. I'll take the first shot. Hang back in case I make an instant hash of it. Alma let the targeting computer search for a lock, closing the distance to speed up the process. As it began to beep, she knew she was close. The targeting reticle closed around the thruster, then held a long tone. I hope this works. She tapped the trigger, sending a pair of blasts directly into her target. The weaker blast struck the missile harder than expected. The ordnance spun until it faced up and away from the planet. The engine sparked, bursting a quick thrust which carried it a good distance away before fading out and drifting. Alma let out a breath she didn't even realize she was holding. One down. Turn down your weapons even more. That was a pretty hard hit and you saw what almost happened. Helot chuckled over the line. You tend to be more forceful than is absolutely necessary. Alma scowled, shaking her head. Cut the chatter and focus. She banked hard to the left and spun, coming in behind the next missile in the line. The estimated time to impact was five minutes. This didn't necessarily mean hitting the ground and causing damage, all they needed to do was break atmosphere, and the mission would be a failure. Even knocking out their engines wouldn't save the world then. We need to be a little more extreme, I think. Eyeballing the shot, she fired three times, striking the next missile hard just above the engine near the guidance panel. Fire flared out of it, and the entire back popped, sending shards of debris in every direction. The warhead spun to the left, no longer plunging for the surface. Without hesitation, she continued down the line, taking shots. She missed three of them, but caught the fourth, bringing it down safely. By the time she finished flying the line, she and the others took down six of the twelve. This is not going fast enough. The time to impact was only at three minutes. We're here, Megan called out. Weapons have been scaled and we're moving into attack. About time, Alma thought. We'll circle around for an assist. At this point, we need to make attack runs to finish this off. I'm on it. Alma watched Megan's ship fly past her, firing controlled bursts at the various missiles. She knocked two down in short order, but the other four remained unscathed. Helot came after her, taking his first shot. He missed, but in the worst possible way. His blast tapped the warhead. Alma was lining up for another attack run when she heard him gasp, but she'd seen what he did. The bomb went off exploding in a spectacular display. Hilot was far too close. His fighter's shields flared up, then dropped. As his craft was tossed backwards, he drifted a good hundred yards before his core went up and obliterated the entire ship. No, Alma called out. He didn't have the chance to eject, but likely died the second the kinetic force struck his vessel. Fall back, everyone get out of there. The Earth fighters, Rahan and Alma, all hit their afterburners and rushed away as the other three bombs went up. The explosion was nothing short of shocking, and though they were already well away, the shockwave knocked Alma off course. She struggled with her controls, fighting to regain control and not run into one of her colleagues. 
The others seemed to suffer the same, but they were far enough apart to avoid a collision. Scanners went from a frantic beeping alarm to silence, stating they had reached a safe minimal distance. Alma turned her ship in a slow circle, looking back over what happened and where her squad mate died. Is everyone okay? Thina's voice came over the comm. How many detonated? Four, Alma replied. And no, everyone is not okay. Zanthari Hilot Vadoth was killed in action. Thina didn't respond immediately. I see. It appears the threat's been eliminated. At quite the cost. Please return to the crystal font for a debriefing. Thina out. I'm sorry. Megan's voice came over her calm. I know what that's like, and all I can say is, I'm sorry. I appreciate the sentiment, Alma replied. Thank you for the assist in coming here and with the bombs. Goodbye. She banked back toward the crystal font and increased speed, trying to race off the anger she felt, the rage. Rahan gave her some space and didn't say anything, but she knew he and Hilot were close friends. I lost someone under my command, but those two were inseparable. What a loss. The fact they had the opportunity to get home felt bittersweet. Doing so without one of their own, without even a body to properly honor, made her heart heavy. At least everyone else gets to return. You made a noble sacrifice, Hilot. Even if your bad aim got you killed. I'm sorry, my friend. You'll be missed. Deva turned in time to see Lahar and the others lower their weapons. The enemies in the hall had disappeared. Power readings returned to what they were when they first arrived in the system. Directing her attention to the massive monitor, a new set of words appeared. Simulation complete. It was not real, Deva shook her head dumbfounded. None of it was real. Uris might disagree, Lahar said. Those wounds were nasty. A flash of light made Deva yelp before she could reply. A man appeared by the monitor, dark-haired and dark-eyed, wearing a white robe. He held up his hands as the others aimed weapons at him, and he offered them all a smile. Please, I do not mean you any harm. Also, I am not like the other projections. I am incorporeal. Wait, Deva held up her hands to the others. I'm on this. She turned to the man. My name's Deva Thynok. I'm with the Crystal Font, a starship from an alliance of many races. We're here in peace. Welcome. You may call me Bin. I do hope you enjoyed the game. I'm here to take your survey of how the facility performed. Are you kidding? Lahar scoffed, advancing to stand beside Deva. You nearly got us all killed. We throttled the difficulty of the simulation based on performance, Bin replied. As you struggled, we adjusted accordingly. Do you feel that we successfully met your expectations for a challenging, and interesting event. Lahar walked away, reaching out to the ship. Deva watched him go for a moment, but Bin repeated his question. Um, sure. Yes, you did. Excellent, Bin smiled. Were the details of your opponents accurate and expected? Yeah, they seemed pretty real to me, Deva shrugged. Ben, I appreciate that you need to ask us some questions, but I really need some help. We have to have a power core to leave the system. It seems like you've got plenty to spare. How do I tap into it and bring enough back to my ship to go home? Bin blinked several times. I am supposed to finish the survey, but I can be flexible in my programming. We do have portable units for setting up simulations in any environment the planet can offer. We were required to shift orbit by nearly seven degrees to accommodate you physically, so some of the realms are not prepared yet. Example, 
If you are interested in snow, we will not have enough for another full day. That's totally fine, Deva said, her eyes wide. We just need a couple of those portable things, if you don't mind. A panel in the floor opened and two massive boxes slid out. You may take these. How do you intend to use them? Spark our crystal to go home, Deva offered. Do you know what that means? Yes, we have evaluated your ship. You will need to fabricate an adapter. Please download the power core schematics from the middle terminal in order to make this work. Can we return to the survey now? Um, later. When I return these, okay? Bin hesitated for a long moment. That will be sufficient. Satisfaction is our aim. We cannot improve without feedback. Thank you for your participation in our game. Wait, Deva held her hand out. Who built this facility? When? The Ella race built this facility at the height of their technological prowess. As they traveled the galaxy, checking on various experiments, they realized they were going quite well and would one day need education and entertainment in equal measures. This facility was built with that in mind, tested by generations of Ella warriors and thrill-seekers. Wait. The Ella? Deva shook her head. I've never heard of them. Ella extinction occurred nearly 100,000 years ago, 10,000 years after this facility was constructed. Do you have any historical records I can download? More information about the Ella? Affirmative, Bin smiled. Please access your computer and take the data you want from option number three. Thank you, Deva complied, watching a percent meter quickly climb to 100. When she had the records, she turned back to Bin. I appreciate your help and cooperation. I apologize for any inconvenience the game may have caused, and look forward to the rest of your feedback. Farewell, Keelan, and good luck. Bin vanished, and Deva held her hand against her head, addressing Clea. Did you hear all that? I did, Clea hesitated. I'm stunned. Good work getting the information and the power cores. I have to contact my own ship now for pickup, Deva replied. Thanks for your help, Tothin on Twofall. I appreciate it. I look forward to talking to you more about all of this while we get your ship ready to go, Clea replied. See you soon. Deva turned to the others and directed them toward the massive boxes. We have what we came for. Let's get up there and make them work, huh? About time we got out of here, Trias said. I took one to the arm at the end of that fight. Armor's dented. It hurts like a relin. Colorful, Lahar muttered. Shuttle's on the way. Let's find out how heavy these things are and get back to civilized space. It's safe to say I'm pretty much done with games for the foreseeable future. Possibly forever. Kale took in the various reports with a mixture of feelings, but relief trumped them all. He felt terrible for the pilot, Helot. Losing anyone was frustrating. The injured soldier, Yuris, would recover and have little scarring somehow. The physicians truly were artisans to pull that one off, considering how badly the armor had melted over him but they received the power core and would return with a major archaeological find. Deva was thrilled beyond belief and requested time to speak with Clea on two fall in person. He granted it during the time they would be swapping out the crystal. She would not be needed for that process. He returned to his quarters and contacted Captain Atwell on the behemoth, asking for a brief, private conversation. The other commander agreed, and a moment later they were face to face, at least over a screen. Seems like a lifetime ago when I told you I'd cover your escape, Kale said. Thank you for coming for us. It was the least we could do after the research facility, Gray replied. But based on the information you shared, it sounds like you might have made it without us. Maybe, but there's no guarantee. 
Kale shrugged. In any event, as soon as we spark the crystal, we can all get out of here. I'll owe you a meal. Perhaps on the home world, if you're coming back with us? We are, Gray said. There's something I should tell you about our arrival. We didn't know you'd survived, to be honest. Your message was garbled and missing the coordinates. Alliance Intelligence gave us the task of finding you. They thought we'd be motivated and were right, but their reasons weren't entirely altruistic. I see. Kale frowned. Are they expecting something in return? Gray nodded. They're going to recruit you. Kale smirked, turning away. Interesting, but not unexpected. A jump mishap and a couple of close calls makes us eligible and qualified for intelligence work. I'm assuming this is not the type of opportunity you say no to, right? We haven't been able to, Gray said. My government lent us out, but it hasn't been all bad. We got to come here and we stopped a civil war, fought terrorists. We're building up to the final battle with the Devarans, too. Kale raised his brow. I feel that I've missed a lot. You have, my friend. Gray leaned back in his chair. Let me tell you about some of it. I hope you've got something to drink. This is going to take a while. Epilogue Siva was on her way into the base when she received a text communication from the behemoth on her private comm. She paused in an awning, allowing her bodyguards to take up positions on either side. The message appeared, decrypting in real time. The fact they adhered to security protocols gave her confidence in the offer she made before they left. Siva, the crystal font is secure and will be coming home in roughly ten shifts. We'll need medical attention for some of these folks, and I'm thinking a few of them will want leave. I've attached a full report of the situation, but I request that you leverage a quarantine to this sector of space. It is not safe. Please let me know if you have any questions. Signed, Clea on Tufal. Good girl on Tufal, Siva muttered. Excellent work. One more ship for the cause. As she boarded the elevator, Siva felt particularly pleased. Having a second military vessel at her disposal meant so much to her operations. Now that they were on the verge of a full-scale attack, she needed people to take care of the oblique threats, the dangers that weren't quite so overt. Arriving at her station, she acknowledged Clea's remarks and made the requested arrangements. Then she opened up her operations board and started planning exactly what to do with the crystal font and the behemoth in the coming weeks leading up to the big fight. Considering their successes, they both might need some downtime, but it would have to be quick. We have a war to win after all. Several, in fact. And I don't intend to let a single one of these threats go by without opposition. I hope you're ready for a real challenge, Kale Rushin, because I'm about to give you one. Trellin set his ship down in a pirate port he'd been to on several occasions, heading immediately for the portmaster. The portly man leaned against a wall, dozing. A tap to the side of the head made the poor bastard scream, and he nearly collapsed, glaring with such rage it was good looks couldn't kill. Glad you're so aware, Trellin muttered. I feel like my stuff is safe with you watching it. Shove off, the portmaster said. I don't have to take your guff. What do you want? I need to stay here for a while, and I've got goods to trade. Who do I see about the exchange? Go to the market. The portly fellow moved over to a chair and plunked himself down in it. I don't have time for you. Okay, then. Trellin departed and headed deeper into the port, looking around for where they might take his goods. He needed money for weapons, a change of clothes, and, sadly, he had to sell the stuff the civilians had on board. All for the cause. It's nothing personal. Wow, my conscience is really getting to me this time. He'd stolen plenty in his time undercover, but for whatever reason, this last theft really bothered him. Those people were the exact type he was sworn to protect from Orion's light and others. 
Instead, he, at the very least, complicated their lives, and at the worst, ruined them. I've become what I'm hunting. A couple hours later, he'd sold the goods and changed into something more casual. Fully armed again, he felt more himself and took up at a hotel for a bath and some downtime. Men and women shoved into the bar, and he found himself amongst them that evening, hoping for a meal and some relaxation. Then, a Garin started boasting about his combat prowess and someone promised to shut him up. Blows were thrown. Trellin found himself in the tick of a full-on barroom brawl. After knocking out a freighter pilot and one of his crewmen, he realized he was the only person in the place that was alone. Slipping outside, he decided to take a walk. Hurrying down the street to nurse a blow to his chin he didn't remember taking. This life is something else. Chaotic and predictable. I can't wait for the assignment to be over. No one can live like this for long. Not without losing their minds. Or worse. Hey, a voice called out, drawing his attention from across the street. You looking for work? Saw what you did back there, and you can really handle yourself. Will it always start like this? Depends on the job, Trellin said. I'm looking for a cause, not just some easy money. Then, brother, do I have something for you. I can't talk about my employers, but believe me, they're all about the cause. Then let's talk. Trellin joined him and gestured down the street. Maybe over a drink? I've had a long day. This is the end of Book 8, but the story continues with Offensive, Rise of Mankind, Book 9. Keep listening after the credits for a free preview. You have been listening to Rise of Mankind, Publishers Pack, Books 7 and 8. Produced by Greg Lawrence. Associate Producer Emily Durr. Text Copyright 2017 by John Walker. Production Copyright 2017 by Podium Publishing, all rights reserved. Prologue A cause. The pirate headhunter promised his employers weren't just standard criminals looking for trouble. Trellin Endall knew a lot about the galaxy's underworld, and there were precious few organizations who cared about anything but money, weapons to get more wealth, or ships to transport their stolen property. Orion's light. It has to be them. On the verge of galactic war with the greatest enemy the Alliance had ever known, a highly efficient and homegrown terrorist group rose up to behave like jackals. Their leader, a former Anthar with the Alliance Navy, served time for war crimes before escaping. He formed Orion's Light in answer to how he'd been treated and managed to keep it a secret for years. And when he came out, did he ever... They'd been responsible for the murder of civilians, the destruction of colonies, piracy, and inciting civil war. Trellin had been assigned to break down their organization, but it wasn't as simple as showing up at a recruitment station. They took on recruits in only a few ways. Many men were pressed into service. Volunteers had to prove themselves. So Trellin went around doing jobs for pirates, 
always talking about causes and how he wanted something more out of his life. It took a long time, but he finally got on a crew working for Orion's Light. He even made it so far as to one of their ships before it was destroyed and he was forced to flee. Nearly at square one, this time he had a bargaining chip, something to speed up his recruitment. During a civil conflict, Orion's Light stole some weapons plans which would give them the ability to knock out a crew once the enemy's shields were down. Trellin came into possession of them just before his ride was destroyed, and he had to get in an escape pod. Now, he just needed to find them and offer it up to the right person. This new idiot, a pirate headhunter who called himself Remus, seemed intent on selling this whole cause thing. Trellin began to wonder if the man was a liar, but he didn't have anything better to do at the moment. After the last few days, he really needed a break, but for the moment, he was stuck running on fumes. It's a simple job, really it is, Remus said for the seventh time. My people just lost one of their trigger men, so we need you to do the gunman thing. Trellin nodded, sipping his drink. He had a feeling intoxication would be a bad idea considering what he was hearing. Where's this happening? And how much are you going to pay? I thought you were in it for the cause, Remus winked. If you define a cause as getting money and shooting people, then we have nothing left to talk about. Trellin started to rise and Remus touched his arm, drawing a scowl. Oh, come on, slow down. I was just giving you a hard time. Give me a break here. It doesn't have to all be heavy talk and seriousness, Remus sighed. Come here, lean in close. Trellin lifted a brow but complied. Remus whispered, We've got a gig from Orion's Light. Trellin smirked as an idea sparked in his head, something that might expedite his own plans. Do you now? Remus nodded. Straight up. To be honest, they've been recruiting hard. They seem to be gathering a lot of stuff and they need it delivered. We've been contracted to get 40 tons of raw metal, stuff that goes into starship hulls. And you intend on stealing it? Yeah, we have a reasonable source saying there's plenty over at this shipyard. Like guards, no one seems to know it's even there. This one will be the easiest of the jobs. Forty tons is a lot. You have any idea how long it will take to load that up? Remus shrugged. Won't matter when everyone's dead. We've got the transport logs already, so we know when new ships will arrive. We'll have a six-hour window to get everything on board. And I'm not just talking about the metal, either. We can steal whatever we want. I'm sure there's something else precious there we can sell to other parties. Trellin almost pitied the various pirates he encountered. If Orion's Light ever came to power and had control over the Navy, they would never stop hunting people like Remus. And there wouldn't be trials and prisons. They'd be executed outright. After using them to get what they wanted, they'd recognize their danger and start killing them. You're all marching toward your own end and you don't even realize it. All right, I'm in. Trellin made the decision quickly, but then he didn't necessarily plan to do the job. But I don't want to be on this forever. Where exactly are we going? What do you mean? Destination. What's the planet with the metal and where are we taking it? Oh, Remus waved his hand. We have coordinates on the ship. Our destination after getting the goods is somewhere pretty far out. Some kind of colony base the Alliance abandoned years ago. I need some specifics. Trellin didn't want to be too overt for fear of giving away his plan, but Remus seemed like enough of an idiot to spill his guts without suspicion. There are a lot of abandoned places. When we get to the ship, I'll show you, Remus shrugged. Will that work for you? Trellin nodded. And my cut? Fifteen thousand. Trellin made a show of thinking about it, but he'd already made up his mind. After several moments, he nodded again and stood. Let's go. I want to meet your commander and see what they think of your supposedly easy plan. Chances are it won't be quite as simple as you put it, huh? I'm sure it will be. 
Our operations tend to be successful, Remus grinned. And at least we won't be hurting for cash when we're done, huh? Follow me. I'll get us where we're going. Trellin forced himself to loosen up, trying desperately to wear a casual look. Inside, he ran through tactical variables, worrying about whether or not he'd be jumped when he arrived. It happened before when he first started working for thugs like this. A crew thought he might be an easy mark, then found out he didn't have any money to easily steal. It gave him his first taste of caution. Prior to his assignment, he'd been a trusting man. He hadn't become cynical yet and believed the best of people. Less than a week undercover and his illusion of civility vanished. The base nature of the people he encountered showed him just how low sentient life could get. Remus led him into the port area and they went the opposite direction of Trellin's stolen vessel. At the far end, well past where even the most desperate vendor set up, they entered one of the docking bays. A relatively nice ship was parked there looking like they genuinely did their best to keep it in good shape. They'd even recently cleaned the hull. They must have military background. This might complicate things, but only a little. Nice ship, Trellin said. Looks like it holds what, 15, 20 guys? Oh, capacity is 30, but we run a lean crew, Remus shrugged. That's why we need you. Yeah, how many? Nine, normally. And I don't go on the operations. I'm strictly the business guy. Recruitment and money? Trellin looked the slight man over for a moment. You always stay here? No. We visit many of the other dens all over the galaxy. I've got us operational buildings in each. Took some doing, but well worth it. I don't have to tell you how important it is to be able to get away from a ship for a few hours rest, am I right? You are. Trellin turned back to the ship as two beefy-looking men approached. Each were armed with pistols at their sides, dressed casually with sleeveless shirts. They were covered in grease and looked pretty unhappy. These guys the welcoming committee? We don't tend to post guards, so you censors, Remus said. He waved to the crewman. Hey, guys, I found our tent. You should have called ahead, Remus. The one on the right spoke up first. You could have been shot. Remus waved his hand at him. Settle down. I knew no one was going to bother us here today, and you were supposed to be adjusting the stabilizers. Why are you out here? Sensors went off, left one said. His voice sounded like he gargled with broken glass. So we had to stop what we were doing and check it out. Where's everyone else? Planning the job? Wright said. He sized up Trellin. So who are you? A guy with a gun, Trellin replied. You? Kaz, he replied. This is my brother, Colm. Trellin nodded and introduced himself, first name only. Can I get on with this? I've got things I could be doing if this won't work out. Colm chuckled, but it was a hideous sound. Trellin figured the man must have suffered a serious throat injury to sound like that. I like this guy's attitude. He'll fit right in. Kaz didn't seem as sure, but gestured back toward the ship with his head. Ramps down. Remus will take you up. They all started back toward the ship when Trellin spoke up again. You guys have a problem with the stabilizers? They just needed some maintenance, Kaz said. He held up a filthy hand. They were dirty, too. No idea how they got so bad. We're usually pretty good about this stuff, Colm shrugged. Our bad, I guess. They outside the ship? Trellin asked. No, we were in engineering, but there's an escape chute down there that we used to check you guys out. Kaz smirked. Makes for an easy getaway in port, but we're not sure why it exists, practically. I guess you could throw on an environmental suit and jump out, but might as well eat a bullet, in my opinion. Undoubtedly, Trellin muttered. The chute might prove troublesome, but he'd have to improvise. They all boarded the ship with Kaz and Colm taking off to the right. Remus led him through the cargo bay, which looked capable of carrying 40 tons of metal, and into an antechamber with a desk. 
Two men were there, staring at a screen intently. Trellin had a hard time picking their age. They were both covered in grease. The one behind the desk was wiry and tough-looking, his face lean and hair wispy about his head. His companion boasted larger muscles and no hair as he looked up at them. His orange eyes burned with suspicion. The other man looked up, blue eyes appearing far friendlier. He even smiled. Remus, Tiny spoke first. This our final man? He is, Remus replied. Trellin's his name, Gunman. Done a lot of crazy work. I even knew the name. Trellin wondered if he was making that up. They didn't talk about any of his exploits either. So perhaps he had made enough of a name for himself that someone like Remus would have heard of him. But he didn't think so. He'd checked authority boards and asked Siva, but she didn't get back to him with that particular piece of information. Maybe she thought it would go to his head or that he'd get arrogant about it. Honestly, he just wanted to know how cautious he should have been and whether or not people might recognize him if he went to civilian ports. Either way, if Remus was lying or there was some truth to what he said, it served him at that exact moment. Good, Tiny straightened up. I'd shake your hand, but I don't want to get grease all over you. My name's Gar, and I run this ship. He gestured to the lug. This is Pre, my second. Pre didn't say anything, but continued to look suspicious. He nodded by way of greeting. I understand there are nine total men, Trellin said. That we're going to take a port in between shipments, correct? That's the plan, Gar said. Then load the stuff up and take them out to some derelict base. I just got the coordinates to it earlier today. Trellin nodded. And you expect some trouble there. Pre spoke up. Yes, you won't be getting free money, gunman. He used the professional title like an insult. Got it. What kind of opposition? Trellin bought himself some time, observing the area and glancing out into the cargo bay. It was totally empty at the moment, leaving plenty of room for what they wanted to steal. And do we have the supplies to stick around there if we have to? We're doing all right, Gar replied. But we expect a pretty standard security detail. Ten men at the most, and not all at the port at the same time. They'll be in the building while we land where all the stuff is kept. I got a false ID code to get us through their automated orbital scans. Normal operating procedure for us. You in? When would we leave? As soon as those idiots finish the maintenance on our stabilizers, Gar said. We'll have to track down our pilot, but he can't be too far. Probably at the watering hole around the corner. Some lady bartender caught his fancy. Trellin nodded. But you said there were nine of you. Does that count Remus? Gar chuckled. No, Remus stays behind. He whines too much when he has to go on missions. The others are out and about. Gunmen like you or general starship crew. The kind of guys the military gave the shaft to earlier in their careers. You know how it goes. They're stand-up men. Well, for criminals. And just to be clear, we're planning on killing the security detail on the planet? Pre glared. You ask a lot of questions. Trellin met his eyes without hesitation. I don't risk my life without knowing what the job's about. What if I assumed you wanted them all dead and walked off your ship shooting? I could kill four guys before one of you could mention we were going to take them prisoner. After all, slaughtering authorities tends to make their friends all the more motivated to track you down. Gar put his hand on Pree's arm. Relax. He's got a good point. He's never worked with us, and he has no idea how we do things. Listen, Trellin. We don't like violence unnecessarily. But these guys at the port, they're not going to let us just load this stuff up and steal it. The war efforts got all this stuff pegged for, well, other things. Trellin nodded. Please speak plainly. We're going to have to drop a few bodies, okay? Gar shook his head. I'm not happy about it, but that's the truth. Understood. Trellin glanced down at the map. How bad are the stabilizers? Gar hesitated to answer. Just an annoyance, really. We had time, so we finally got them fixed up. Good. Trellin drew his gun in a flash and shot Gar, catching him in the forehead. The man's eyes widened as he flopped to the ground, dead in an instant. 
Remus cried out in shock, but Trellin silenced him with another round, placed right between the eyes. Pre lunged at him, grabbing his arm and directing the pistol away. Trellin drew him in and drove his knee into the man's solid gut. It didn't do much more than draw a grunt from his target, so he had to be more creative. He only had a few moments before the others would come to see what happened. Rotating his wrist, Trellin found the weak spot in Pree's grip and yanked his left hand free. Tensing his fist to brace his thumb, he drove it into Pree's eye, making the man immediately fall back with a strangled cry. Unfortunately, he managed to take Trellin's gun with him, but it fell to the floor and danced a few feet away. Trellin kicked the man in the groin and blocked a feeble punch thrown in retaliation. As Pre dropped to his knees, Trellin grabbed his chin and wrenched his neck back and to the side. The swiftness of the move made something snap, and the lifeless, limp body of Pre dropped to the ground with a loud thump. Trellin recovered his gun and took cover behind the door. He heard footsteps on the deck. Two sets. Gar. Cone's terrible voice called out, sounding like some kind of lizard given the ability to speak. Pre, what's going on? That's Remus, Kaz shouted. Look at that foot. Oh no, Cone cursed. Must have been that. Hey, come out. You got nowhere to go in there. Trellin turned to his computer and brought up a scan of the room. The tactical program was one of his own, a modified application of the Alliance military. He didn't have access to such things before, but the computer he stole from the security officer on Novalat provided him the building blocks for it. He noted the position of the two men out in the open cargo hold. Trellin knew aiming would be tough, but he'd be able to get a decent idea of where they were at. They'd have to come in for him eventually, but he didn't have time to wait. Instead, he took a deep breath and prepared himself for the riskiest part of stealing their vessel. I said come out, Colin barked. Last warning. Or what? Trellin wanted to ask the question, but kept quiet. They weren't going to throw a grenade in there. They didn't know if their boss was alive or dead. Trellin drew Pree's pistol from his holster and blind fired it out the door. The gun kicked like crazy, jarring his elbow, but it had the desired effect. The two men cried out, and when he heard them hit the deck looking for cover, Trellin emerged from the room and aimed his weapon at each of them. They stood quickly but didn't lift their weapons. He definitely earned some glares, but neither of them spoke up. It surprised him, really. How are the stabilizers? Trellin asked. You're going to a dark place for what you did here, Kaz said. We didn't do anything to you. Why would you do this? I've already tried to do a job to get close to the Orion's light. Don't really feel like doing another on the hope I find them. Trellin frowned. Besides, you murdering bastards don't have a lot of moral high ground to stand on. Now answer my question. Did you finish the stabilizers? Cone smiled. Find out yourself, scum. Trellin nodded. Okay. He fired the weapons, taking them both out with well-placed headshots. As the bodies hit the deck, Trellin dropped Pree's weapon and holstered his own, rushing outside to check their work. Fortunately, they hadn't taken anything apart and were simply cleaning the area and running the diagnostics. Thank the fates. Trellin rushed back on board and checked Gar's body, taking his computer. He plugged in his decoder and cracked the feeble security quickly locating the codes to launch the ship. It was a larger craft than the one he had in the port, but this one carried the coordinates he needed to complete his mission. Finally, time to get moving. The others would be back soon, and he didn't want to be there when they arrived. Trellin closed up the ramp and started his pre-flight check. Pirate bays didn't care when you left. They were only worried about you landing on an already docked vessel. No one even questioned the engines powering up or the unscheduled launch. By the time the other pirates came back, he'd be long gone, and once he achieved orbit, he could jettison the bodies. Orion's Light didn't need to know he stole the ship, or that this one's particular purpose involved stealing metal. All he planned to tell them was that he survived the battle over Novalat, and he still had their prize. Those weapon schematics were his way into the inner circle. Time to make this happen.